Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 20 Madara was undoubtedly an outstanding fighter, but he had an extraordinary ability to use words and to use them to his advantage. Without the help of his clan's own illusions, Madara Uchiha knew how to handle words as skillfully as he used a sword. He liked to compare himself to the adage, the pen is stronger than the sword, because he knew that with his charisma and the power he had over others, he could exercise any kind of mental or psychological manipulation without any problem. He therefore had the ability to deliberately use his oratorical talents to lead his interlocutors to have a different perception of reality and above all to influence or even control their thoughts, choices and even their actions. To do this, psychological manipulation brought into play a relationship of seduction, suggestion, persuasion, and non-voluntary or consenting submission. The Uchiha thus relied on this invisible weapon, his ease with words, to positively influence the thoughts of the crowd in front of him. Indeed, just as a rumor spreads in the blink of an eye, an idea and a conviction can be spread even faster. With a simple sentence or an act done at the right time you can make an idea germinate in people's minds. That same idea will be thought about, nurtured and consolidated by people. And this is what Uchiha Madara wanted to exploit. Day 189 for several days they had been traveling from Tsuchi no Kuni the land of earth towards Hai no Kuni the land of fire in order to conduct guerrilla raids. The Shodai Tsukikage had been formal, war would soon be declared and it was necessary to do as much damage as possible while Hai no Kuni was unaware of anything. So several teams, including his own, were sent to burn crops, set up ambushes, take prisoners of war, all without making themselves known. Stealth was paramount in this operation. His group had already raised four villages between Tsuchi no Kuni and Hai no Kuni and they had almost reached a larger village. This one was closer to being a town than a village, however it was too small to have an armed force or even shinobi. If a ninja was there it would be by pure chance or because he had family here. But in any case, what could a single ninja do against his unit of ten soldiers? Because of the danger of the mission there were no genin in his squad, it was mostly composed of Chunin and some Jnin. Only he, Fuji, was an elite Jnin to oversee this operation. He was not just anyone, he was one of the disciplines of the great Raitenbin no Noki, himself a disciple of the highly respected M. Sama, number one contender for the title of Naidane Tsuchikich. Of course he was not yet of their level, but was more than competent in the ninja arts. Only a few fighters in the world would be able to stand up to him. He didn't count the Kages of course, they were out of class ninjas that he wouldn't stand a chance against and he was ordered to run away when he saw them. Fuji raised his arm in the air before closing his fist, signaling to his entire squad to stop advancing, they had reached their destination. From the edge of the forest where they were, it was easy to see the large village in the distance, smoke was billowing from the houses, some people were in the fields finishing the last harvest. For yes, Hai no Kuni was lucky enough to have a temperate climate for a longer period of time, allowing for larger harvests spread out over time. You too, Fuji pointed to two shinobi dressed as earth ninjas, go around and once you're in position, step aside and prepare to receive any escape from the villagers. As agreed, no prisoners. Hi, said the two concerned, who disappeared in an instant to take up their positions. Nanako, do you sense a source of chakra in the area? The squad leader asked, turning to a teenager. He was one of the newly appointed Chunin, he was part of this squad because of his sensory ability, which was an indispensable asset in this kind of mission. No, for the moment there is nothing in the whole village and its surroundings. Keiko and Kenshir are positioned according to your orders, the ninja replied, his eyes closed to concentrate. Fine, we won't destroy the grain silos, or the granaries, Fuji announced once more as he turned towards the village. Let's go. And so, eight Tsuchi no Kuni ninjas charged towards a village and the carnage began. A villager who was chopping down wheat with a large scythe had no idea what was going on and never saw the blade that decapitated him in an instant. He felt no pain and it was with complete incomprehension that he saw his body a meter away from him. Then, after a few seconds, darkness invaded his thoughts due to the lack of oxygen. And he died. They were trained to kill, 
they were professionals, they had done this all their lives, so the villagers didn't stand a chance. The men were killed, the women and children too. Dotan, Turumi! exclaimed one of the shinobi as he performed seals before placing his hands on the ground. The release of chakra into the ground caused it to collapse nearly fifty feet, collapsing four houses with their occupants onto themselves. Ah! Run away! shouted one of the villagers before collapsing to the ground with a kunai stuck in his back. Fujisama! The sensory ninja shouted. Fuji stopped what he was doing and quickly turned his gaze to the one who had shouted his name. This had never happened before in the middle of an assault, so it must have been important. Especially when he saw the look of terror on his subordinate's face. The latter's eyes were wide and he was shaking like a leaf. Who is it? Fuji asked quickly as he approached while the others continued their mission. Two sources of chakra are approaching at full speed in our direction, the shinobi explained. Threat level. Fuji asked quickly, he hadn't planned on facing ninjas, even if it was a risk. Level S Fujisama. Exclaimed the concerned one who was shaking more and more. Fuji froze for a moment as he heard the threat level. Very few people in the world had an amount of chakra that could be called S level. This was not good, this was really not good, most of his squad was mere B level and only two of them were a level. How long before they get here? Fuji asked. The sensory ninja didn't have time to answer as a surge of foreign chakra was felt in the village. It was so large and different that it could be felt by anyone who wasn't a sensory guy. Barely a second later he saw the body of one of his soldiers being blown away, dead. He immediately turned his gaze towards the threat ready to defend himself. In this situation he had to either flee or buy his squad time to retreat. But would that be possible? Order 10. Fuji shouted to his men signaling that a threat was among their ranks and that the previous mission was being interrupted to deal with the new threat. There were two of them, a tall man dressed in a kimono in brown, a straw hat on his head, there were also two swords on his belt until he drew one. This one had very long hair that reached his buttocks and was black as night. The other person was A. Fuji blinked twice as he saw what was in front of him. Was he in a genjutsu? In front of him was a pink-haired woman in a combat outfit, a sword at her back. He couldn't mistake the two newcomers, they were ninjas. However, they didn't seem to be affiliated with any village as they had no protective headbands. Deserters? Perhaps, or they were inhabitants of this village and that would be really bad luck for Fuji's squad. The two protagonists had a hard, closed look on their faces. Fuji didn't have time to think any longer as the two split up and attacked his troops. It wasn't two seconds before two of his men were dead. One was simply decapitated, while the other had an arm ripped off and was thrown against a building. When Fuji saw this, he knew they had no chance. He didn't know who they were, but they had to run if they didn't all want to die. Retreat. Direction point A. Fuji ordered before charging towards the shinobi. He wanted to buy time for his fellow shinobi before he fled himself. Sakura-san, you take care of him, I'll take care of the runners, Madara ordered as he saw the others fleeing towards the edge of the forest. He channeled Chakra into his legs and propelled himself forward. It didn't take long for him to catch up to the first fugitive, whom he decapitated in one fluid motion without stopping his run. He's chasing us! shouted one of the earth ninjas. Three kunai were thrown at Madara from three different sources. The dark-haired man in turn threw a kunai that hit one of the approaching weapons, deflecting it from its trajectory. With his sword he blocked the second before shifting to avoid the third weapon. All this without ever stopping his run. He jumped towards a tree in which one of his assailants was standing. He dodged and parried the earth shinobi's sword, then with a graceful swing of the sword, he aimed the chunin's own weapon into his throat, killing him. Thanks to his active Sharingan he had seen the movement of one of his enemies who was preparing his arm just before he turned his back to finish off the shinobi with his sword. Without turning around, he shifted to the side and grabbed the kunai that was aimed at him. He spun around before throwing the weapon at its owner. The ninja dodged and prepared to flee, but Madara's intelligence and his overzealous use of simple e-rank techniques were not enough. 
Once the kunai was behind the soldier, Madara performed the kawarimi no jutsu with the kunai. Many ninja used this technique to escape a deadly technique or blow. But Madara used it as an offensive technique. With this move, he switched places with the kunai, teleporting behind the shinobi who didn't understand what was happening to him as his head left the rest of his body. Two of the earth shinobi were jumping from tree to tree before they came to a clearing. They were running for their lives after hearing Fuji's order. They had ignored the cries of their comrades behind them, meaning they were clearly being killed. They were running for their lives, after all they were mere chunin, what could they do against these two people? Nevertheless, the two of them stopped immediately once they reached the middle of the clarion. There. In front of them was one of the two enemies. He was moving slowly in their direction, his weapon drawn along his body. He was taking his time to instill fear in his enemy's bodies, he had after all just killed five ninjas without any difficulty. He let out some of his killing intent and both Chunin shook with the knowledge that death was near. The sensory type literally fell to his knees as the effect was increased tenfold, he could feel the chakra of his opponent. Once within range of the two earth ninjas Madara raised his head to reveal his face to the two completely stunned people. When they saw the man's face, they knew they had no chance from the start. In front of them was Uchiha Madara, one of the shinobi gods normally presumed dead. Had they been lied to? Was it Kanoha's strategy to make it look like Madara was dead in order to force them to attack? So many questions that could never be answered because both were killed without scruples by the Uchiha. W.H. Why? Asked one of the shinobi as the life left his body. For peace, Madara replied as he twisted his blade through the soldier's body, finishing him off. Madara made a quick motion with his arm around him to remove as much blood from his blade as possible, then he pulled out a piece of cloth and cleaned his blade before returning it to the scabbard. All the while Sakura had been fighting Fuji. When Madara had gone towards his fellow soldiers Fuji tried to hold him back, but the one called Sakura stopped him. He had to move aside to avoid a fist aimed at his face. Why had he avoided this blow? She was just a common woman, but strangely enough his sixth sense had been screaming at him to avoid her. He also had the sensation of having escaped death. He quickly aimed his katana at the young woman's neck in an attempt to decapitate her, but the young woman conjured a kanai in her hand with a puff of smoke. She parried his weapon at the same time. Normally the force put into the movement would have allowed that even if he was parried the blade would continue its trajectory. But no, it felt like hitting an iron post and the impact of the blow spread through his whole arm, it was really painful. Seeing the cloud of smoke he understood that his opponent had some knowledge of finjutsu. The pink-haired shinobi was once again directing her fist towards his face. He quickly channeled chakra throughout his arm and a layer of stone covered it to use it to take the punch. It was the worst idea in his life and he knew it immediately when he felt the blow hit his arm. The stone shattered in an instant and he felt the bone inside his arm break, causing him to cry out in pain. He channeled energy into his legs to get away from her. Damn it! Who the hell are you? Asked Fuji, who still couldn't believe that he had been overpowered in an instant by a vulgar woman. He received no answer, however, except that she charged him again. He had to run, or he would die. He jumped once more into the air and saw the young warrior hit the ground this time where he had been standing before. A crater formed under the impact which made Fuji's eyes widen. What kind of force is this? Said the squad leader before running towards the edge of the forest hoping his comrades were alright. Sakura correctly positioned her kunai in her hand to throw it at the runaway. She took her bearings and threw it with her legendary strength. However, Fuji dodged it at the last moment and it went to plant itself in a tree. Or rather, it went through. No, destroyed the trunk of a tree more than 30 centimeters wide. Fuji was thus speechless when he saw the tree fall to the ground. If he had been hit by this attack he would have died for sure. Realizing this, fear began to invade Fuji's heart, especially when he saw the second protagonist coming out of the forest, a sign that his comrades were probably dead. He didn't have time to think any longer about what to do as the dark-haired man in front of him charged and stuck his blade into his body. He was going to die, that was a certainty. He was exhausted, the pain was overwhelming him and the blade in his body was numbing him. 
he dropped his own weapon and tried to remove the straw hat to find out the identity of his captor. Madara did nothing to stop him and Fuji was able to recognize the legendary Uchiha Madara before he died. They should have fled from the beginning. Once Fuji was dead Sakura turned to the villagers who didn't know how to react. It's alright. We're friends and we're here to help you, Sakura shouted to reassure them and put a smile on her face. Hearing this the peasants breathed a sigh of relief and ran to the injured and dead. Sakura heard moans and cries of agony coming from one of the buildings. She didn't waste a moment and quickly cleared the rubble to see two people. It was a woman and her child. The mother had positioned herself so that her child would not be her, but the child had landed on her legs with one of the beams of the house. Sakura lifted the beam with ease and pulled the young woman out. She placed the injured woman on the ground and immediately activated her IRY ninjutsu as the residents looked on in amazement. She must have been an envoy of the gods to have healing magic. It'll be fine, the pain will go away miss, Sakura reassured her as the bone structure fell back into place. There had been no damage to the nerves or tendons, it was just the bones in her legs that had cracked from the impact. Who? Who are you? Asked the brunette who must have been in her mid-twenties in a very small voice. Me? I'm Sakura, Sakura answered with a soothing smile, this should be good, you should be able to stand up. And indeed, the young woman managed to get up without any problems. She just couldn't believe it, she thought her life was completely over because she would never be able to walk again. Thank you, thank you very much. Said the brunette before bowing. It's all right miss, get up, Sakura said before turning to the other villagers who were staring at her wide-eyed, while others were mourning their dead, are there any more injured? She got no response from the people of this village. As she looked around she saw Madara return with two bodies in his arms and pile them up with the others. He was gathering up the bodies of the Tsuchi no Kuni Shinobi before heading toward Sakura. How can we thank you for saving us strangers? Asked a man who seemed to be the village leader due to his advanced age. By living. Madara exclaimed loudly to get everyone's attention. What you have suffered today is only the beginning. A worldwide war is coming and you will be the first to be targeted. Small villages will be looted, ravaged and will be the battlefield of the coming war. What? But that's awful. Exclaimed the village leader as a great hullabaloo broke out in the crowd. I don't want to die. Said one of the men of the village to his colleagues. We should run away. Said another villager. Silence. Madara ordered, putting a tiny bit of killing intent into his voice. It had the desired effect and everyone around him fell silent. He was truly a born leader, he was no longer the person who had to hide. He was Uchiha Madara. We know a safe place where you can live in peace and security. We are here to warn as many people as possible before this war comes. We come from a country that has been granted neutrality for the upcoming war, he declared forcefully. Where? Asked the old man. Was it the fear he had witnessed? Or the presence of this man? Or was it the fact that he had seen them do unusual things that made him trust this man? Heading northeast, towards Haiwa. You will be housed, fed, have a new home, a new job and a safe place to live in peace. Madara argued with great emotion in his words. You can also stay here and die, but I advise you to take as much of your belongings as you can carry and head for Haiwa. The choice is yours. Then, without giving any more details, Madara walked over to the corpses of the ninjas. What do we do, chief? Asked many of the villagers. It was common knowledge that the village headman was the one to turn to in such matters. He was currently thinking, should they stay here? Should they warn Kanoha? Or should they accept this man's proposal? After all, what did Kanoha care about their village? If what this man said was true and war was near, why hadn't he sent anyone to protect them? So with all these questions in mind, the village leader made a decision. Gather your things, for our safety, we are leaving. The man announced and the villagers each went to their homes to collect their belongings. What do we do with the bodies Madara-san? Sakura asked as she saw the earth shinobi before her. Let's get all the headbands and leave one here. That will leave a message to Kanoha that there is something wrong, 
Madara replied before untying said blindfolds from the enemies. Should we burn the bodies? Sakura asked after sealing the blindfolds in a prepared scroll. No, you're going to seal them as well, they'll be useful for another time, Madara explained before lining up the bodies to make Sakura's job easier. Sakura conjured up a large scroll in a cloud of smoke and unrolled it on the floor. She sat cross-legged in front of it and began a long series of hand signals before placing them on the large scroll. Finn! Sakura exclaimed, sealing the ten bodies in the scroll. You understand why I wanted us to start moving? Madara asked as he watched the young woman make the large scroll disappear. Yes, I admit you were right about that, Sakura admitted as she straightened up. She never thought the land of the earth would act so quickly. After all, the history books spoke of the war in broad strokes, without giving much detail. Within an hour, a makeshift caravan was set up by the villagers with the help of Sakura, who did her best to appear friendly, kind, helpful and concerned for everyone's welfare. She answered people's questions about this town called Haiwa. Sakura walked up to the village headman as they were about to leave and gave him information that only he heard. Head for Ta no Kuni and its capital. When you get there tell one of the guards you're coming for true peace, Sakura explained with a smile. Hi, thanks again for all the strangers, the village head thanked. Let's go. Then nearly 180 people left the village. They had no time to mourn their dead, their safety was at stake. I'll leave you to go seal up the remaining supplies in the attics and silos, I'll search the rest of the village and gather anything that might be useful. And so Sakura headed for the food supplies that the caravan had failed to bring with it as it disappeared in the distance towards Ta no Kuni. And it was when she saw the amount of reserves that Sakura congratulated herself for having learned Finjutsu, for that would have been a huge waste of resources. She once again made a large scroll appear and placed it on the ground. This time she had to place all the boxes and barrels around the scroll. It took her a good hour to do all this and it was with a relief of satisfaction that Sakura uttered the word. Finn. There were enough supplies here to last a whole winter and then some. At least for a village of 200 people, but anything was good to go when a war was on the horizon. She found Madara moving the bodies of the villagers to various places in the village. Why are you doing this? Sakura asked curiously. I don't want anyone to understand what happened here, so I'm spreading the bodies out so that it looks like the others were taken prisoner, Madara explained as he placed the last body next to a house. Are you done, Sakura-san? Hi. Fine, I'll leave you to destroy houses and do as much damage as possible, use as many doton techniques as you can to discredit the land and draw suspicion towards them, the dark-haired man said before heading towards the wheat fields. Once there he channeled chakra into his lungs while making two signs with his hands. Katan, Gokaku no Jutsu, Madara said before a tidal wave of flames engulfed the field and it burned for several hundred meters. With such heat and flow, the flames would spread across the field in no time. At the same time he heard Sakura do several doton techniques and even saw the attic explode into a thousand pieces due to the use of explosive tags. God he loved this woman and her ways. Heading to one of the vassal countries so as not to be around when Kanoha comes here. Hi. Chapter 21. Day 198. Take it easy. Said a man in his forties to his subordinates. It had been ten days since their daimi had ordered the name of the capital of Ta no Kuni changed to Haiwa. Many were surprised by the name change, but many approved, showing the rest of the world what their positions were. Initially, after Madara explained the need to develop the city, the construction of new buildings and shops was started but these were only lambda projects. Apart from the amount of new buildings, which was surprising, the various projects were still projects that any growing city could usually undertake. But the day after the announcement of the change of name of the city, the city became active in a completely different way. One, two, three, pull. Announced one of the workers before pulling a rope with all his strength with two other people. Indeed, for some time now the city had been moving in a different direction, as if it was preparing for something that would change the face of the world. First of all, many jobs had been created and all of them were extremely well paid. Either the daimi was a very generous person, or the country was richer than one might suspect. 
Then, the young Daiki Shita had appeared one day with a large number of architects to launch a revolution in the capital. First, they put up many signs along the road and in several areas of Tano Kuni to indicate the route to the capital. Then, plans for the construction of a wall were brought in. Release. Ordered the foreman as the huge block of stone was positioned. This was no mere palisade to be built and the forty-year-old looked up in surprise, these plans were for a wall for a real fortress. In short, it was a project of a lifetime, in terms of funds, resources and manpower. And he, Midori, a master craftsman, was asked to take charge of such a project. He accepted immediately because it was the chance of a lifetime, but more importantly because he was recognized as the best possible choice for the realization of this titanic project. Pull! shouted someone again before pulling the rope that was connected to a hoist. This made it possible to lift very heavy loads with little manpower. Put down a support beam! shouted another man and two people ran over with the requested item to put the stone block on it. Don't let go yet! Second hoist! Pull! And a second group of people lifted a second block of stone supported by ropes to a height of over five meters. Yes, more than five meters high, because this was a colossal project and this was not the only place where such directives were heard. The construction site was in full swing for hundreds of meters around the city. Put it down! shouted the foreman again, allowing the two stones to be called up by weight and balance. Prepare the next ones, you'll have to consolidate this. Pass me the mortar quickly, said a dark-haired man to a young man who brought him a bucket filled with mortar and another filled with small stones to fill the gaps. Behind them were several ovens that heated the place. From these places bricks were made. Indeed, the wall was not only made of stone blocks, it was also made of stones, bricks, mortar, sand, earth, reeds and willow wood. All of these elements were used to create a sumptuous building. If such a project were to be done on a countrywide scale over several hundred kilometers, it would take thousands of years and hundreds of thousands of arms to complete such a structure. But this project was limited to one large city. Pass me a brick, said the dark-haired man to his son, who hastened to hand it to him. The wall was built every day in small pieces to give time for the fragile areas and the mortar to dry and consolidate. If everything was done at once, it would collapse. Only some areas were already five meters high, these were special and strategic locations such as towers or the main gate. The rest of the structure was not even one meter high and other parts had not even been started. Caravan in sight! shouted a soldier posted on a makeshift watchtower. Since the work began, the vigilance of the soldiers had increased and so had their numbers. It seemed that most of the Daimi army was present in the capital. They were either helping with the work or protecting the area. Which way? Asked another soldier below. Two directions. One from the east and one from the south. The one from the south seems to be very big, explained the soldier in his tower. The second soldier wasted no time and ran towards the main building of the city, the very place where the Daimi and his council were located. The council had been living in the capital for some time and their family had also moved to Haiwa. In a few minutes, the soldier arrived at the building and immediately went to one of the guards. He took a few seconds to catch his breath before delivering his message. Two caravans approaching, one from the eastern road and one from the south. The southern one is quite large. Well, put the weapon down and follow me, the guard ordered before going inside. No one challenged the orders of one of the Daimi's personal guards. Only Suzuki and Hashiba had authority over these men. To be part of this guard you had to have proven yourself and above all have an unwavering allegiance to your lord. So it was in the middle of a council meeting that the guard accompanied by the soldier greeted two of his colleagues posted in front of the door. He made a military salute against his chest which the other two imitated. There was no need for words, his presence alone meant that they had a message to deliver. There were two knocks against the door. Come in. The man opened the wooden door and stepped towards his lords. They bowed before speaking. Repeat what you told me, the personal guard said to the sentry. Two caravans approaching, my lords. One appears to be one of ours, and the other is unknown and unusually large, detailed the soldier, his hand resting on the hilt of his weapon. 
Could this be our last caravan from Mizu no Kuni the land of water? Asked Taisho, the country's richest advisor. Maybe, after all it's been a while since this one left, added Riku, stroking his goatee. The caravan from the south. What do you mean abnormally large? Rumaji worried. At least twice as big as Suzuki-sama's when he left for Hai no Kuni, except this one seems to be poorly organized, the soldier quickly replied. Estimated arrival? Suzuki asked. Probably an hour, my lord. Hashibasama, if I may. Suzuki asked, having already risen to his feet ready to leave. Please do, my friend, the daimi replied immediately, wondering what kind of caravan would come with the approach of winter. It might be possible, but it was rather rare, and this type of convoy was much better organized than what the soldier had described. Follow me, Suzuki ordered the messenger. The three men-at-arms walked out, leaving the council in their thoughts. Do you think this could be what Uchiha-sama and Haruno-sama told us? Daiki asked, for after all a few families had already come and settled in, all saying the same phrase. We come for true peace. It's not impossible, Daiki, Rumaji agreed. But why so soon? War hasn't technically been declared yet, so why act so quickly? Planting the seed in people's minds, Hashiba said, staring into space. Uchiha-sama was skilled enough to make people believe his own death. And I don't doubt for a moment that he's capable of carrying out our plan. If it really is another group sent by them. It will only accelerate our ambitions. As he finished his sentence a bird flew into the room through a small passage in the window. It landed gracefully right in front of the daimi before looking in his direction. There was a scroll case around his neck. Could this be from Uchiha-sama? Daiki asked. I don't think so, Uchiha-sama uses a falcon to communicate with us, the lord replied before reaching for the scroll case. He opened it and pulled out a good quality paper, it could only be an official announcement. Daimidano Hashiba Shita. While stabilization is taking place throughout the elemental nations, a most disturbing event is taking place throughout the world. I hope I am wrong, but I would be foolish not to take appropriate action should the need arise. Through our long-standing friendship, I propose an alliance between your country Ta no Kuni and my country Hai no Kuni for the prosperity and security of both our nations. A potential war is on the horizon and it is time to put away our tools and take out the banners of war again. Tobarama Senju, Naidame Hokage of Hai no Kuni. War is near, Hashiba said as he let the scroll rewind and put it on the table, giving the council members a chance to read it. Hashiba closed his eyes, realizing that Madara Uchiha had not lied to him and that war was near, except this time it would be a world war. Tanaka, the daimi began after a long moment of silence. All the members of the council had time to read the scroll. The concerned one immediately looked up at his lord upon hearing his name. Hi Daimi-sama. Prepare an official scroll, Hashiba replied. I think this letter means we won't be sending any more caravans back to Hai no Kuni until the war is over, Umaji remarked. No, I think we have enough reserves to last, Hashiba replied as Tanaka placed the scroll correctly. I'm listening Daimi-sama. Naidame Hokage Tobarama Senju. As the harshness of winter begins, I hear your concerns about a possible harshness coming. However, my people, like yours, have suffered too much internally, and I do not wish to spill any more blood than has already been lost. We are a humble country, living by the hard work of the rice which is our wealth. The path of war is not our predilection and I wish to maintain this neutrality in the eyes of the world for the sake of my people. Moreover, due to a very bad harvest, I cannot provide you with anything. The only thing I have would be men, but what is an army against a single train shinobi? So I must refuse your proposal of an alliance between our two countries. I still intend to keep our friendly agreement in place and will leave it to you to contact me when you judge that the situation is more stable. Thereafter, I pledge not to divulge any of your concerns to any of your potential enemies. Hashiba Shtadayami of Tano Kuni. Bring me a blank pen Tanaka, Hashiba ordered after dictating his message. Blood signature. Asked Rumaji, stroking his white beard as usual. Hi, technically we're not going to tell the rest of the world that Hai no Kuni knows what's going on. And that'll leave us in the dark, 
Hashiba explained, taking a small blade to lightly nick his thumb. He dipped the quill in before signing his title on the parchment. He applied his ring to his thumb and placed a blood seal just below it. I think Suzuki will agree with me, but with the war looming, we should consider setting up lookout posts on the hills surrounding the valley, explained Romaji, who knew the valley and the location of the capital to be strategic. If you could get word as soon as possible that an army was approaching, you would be better prepared. As he said this, Romaji realized that his old friend had given way to the warrior who had long been sleeping inside him. To be a lord when your kingdom is at peace is one thing, but to be a lord when it is on the brink of war is quite another. And for some time now, the man at rest had given way to the old warrior. He was more serious, more meticulous, he left nothing to chance. Because after all, their lives were clearly in his hands and in the councils. One mistake, one piece of information leaked and it could ruin all their plans and especially that of achieving true peace. That's a good idea, Ramaji, Hashiba agreed, frowning. He was thinking about where to place them. Meanwhile, Suzuki and the soldier walked briskly through the city streets towards the barracks. People moved aside as they passed, after all he was one of the most important people in the country. You, ring the cavalry corps. Suzuki ordered as he walked towards the stables to a man standing guard. Yes, sir. Replied the man before running in another direction. My horse. Suzuki ordered, raising his voice. A man came towards him very quickly with a brown stallion. This beautiful animal was equipped with a black leather saddle, but a relatively light armor was placed over much of its body. Unlike many horses, this one did not have a blinker. It was what we call a war horse. Trained to be dangerous in the fray, to kick and not to run away from predators. It was very difficult to train this kind of animal and very few were able to ride them. There were only two war horses in the capital and Suzuki was riding one of them. He gave his mount a quick pat before mounting it and pulling the reindeer as a long, low horn sounded throughout the city. The sound reverberated even through part of the valley. Yeah. Suzuki announced, kicking his heels lightly on either side of the animal's chest. With a low whinny, the beast took off. As he rode through the town, the main road was cleared with the sound of the horn, signifying that the cavalry was requisitioned and on the move. It was also a warning to any outside patrols to join the main road. And that is what was happening, a gathering of fifty horsemen plus Suzuki was trotting through the main driveway of Haiwa. Once through the main gate, the troop of riders galloped towards the main road where about twenty lone riders were joining from different directions. There was no watchtower or outpost yet, but there were already patrols to relay information or possible threats. So no less than seventy horsemen galloped towards this strange caravan coming from the south. It was both for the protection of Haiwa, because if there was a potential threat, it would be dealt with outside the city and the civilians. But it was also a method of intimidation. And the least one could say was that the caravan sent by Madara and Sakura was absolutely in that frame of mind, intimidated. After all, they weren't soldiers, they were just simple peasants who wanted to live their lives in peace and had to flee their homes. The horsemen would soon be in range. The caravan stopped in its tracks and the leader of the old village stood out to be the one to speak. Hopefully they would not kill them without reason. The horses made a large circle around the caravan so that everyone could see it. Suzuki walked with two of his men towards the one who seemed to be the leader of this. Caravan. What brings you to this territory? Suzuki demanded forcefully. Their lives were in his hands. This man was not joking and if his answer did not suit him, they would probably be executed. So the old man hurried to answer what the pink-haired woman had advised him to say. We come for true peace. Hearing this sentence, which he was beginning to hear more and more, Suzuki straightened his head to look at all these people. There were many of them, much more than the usual three or four people. And seeing this Suzuki had a thought about Madara. They hadn't lied. Day 205. Are you being formal in what you are saying? Asked a man with short gray hair to his subordinates. This man exuded a poise and power that few people in the elemental nations could boast. He was one of the shinobi gods who was reputed to be the greatest user of Swayton techniques. He had made his reputation by his name, by his family, 
by his feats of arms, by his exploits. He was Toborama Senju, the current Naidame Hokage of Hai no Kuni and he was looking on with gravity at a team of three who were reporting. Hai Hokage-sama Confirmed one of the leaf shinobi as he stood at attention under the inquisitive gaze of the Senju. There was no sign of any survivors, everything suggested that they had been abducted or left. Unfortunately, the road was so well traveled that it was impossible to determine if they had left willingly or not. Tobarama crossed his fingers in front of his face and frowned. This was the fourth such report he had heard in the last few days. Entire villages were deserted, crops completely looted, buildings destroyed as if there had been a battle. No. War rather. But each time, there were no corpses and that is what disturbed Tobarama the most. There was fighting, he was sure of it, but who would take the trouble to defend Hai no Kuni without reporting to Kanoha? Moreover, the first report had been that a banner of the land of the earth was found at the scene. Had they really attacked his territory? Or was a third party hoping to create a diplomatic incident between two great nations? It's a pity we didn't have a member of the Inazuka clan with us, remarked one of the men on the patrol. The sense of smell and the companions of the Inazuka clan would have been perfect to know who was responsible for this guerrilla war. Or at least it would have told us where the people were going, prisoner or not. After the third report of an attack on Hai no Kuni lands, Tobarama had increased patrols on the border and had begun to think that it was time to build alliances. Tobarama was far from being a stupid person. The present world was created on the blood of victims and there might be beings tempted to do the same thing as in the past. But on a global scale. Dismissed, said the head of the Senju family with a wave of his hand. Hai Hokage-sama. Said the three men before exiting the office to leave the man alone in the room. Humph, sighed Tobarama who hated not having the answers to his questions. Still, he had managed to forge an additional alliance with the land of water in addition to the one that already bound them to the land of whirlpools. This alliance was the result of the marriage between Hashirama Senju and Mito Uzumaki. However, he had not succeeded in having an alliance with Ta no Kuni. Despite this refusal, he had still obtained confirmation that this country wished to be neutral, and this by a blood letter. A document that remained very rare in these troubled times. Where are you Hashirama? Tobarama whispered, thinking of his brother. To him, his disappearance was very suspicious and raised many questions, who would have been able to make him disappear or even kill him? Unfortunately, the only person who would have been capable of such a feat was killed by his brother himself. And in a way, it wasn't so bad that Achiha Madara was dead, Tobarama had always hated that individual. But the current Hokage had doubts about his brother's death. Yet the signs were there. But he wanted to believe it, he couldn't accept that his brother was just gone. Or was he getting his hopes up? Bear, said the Nidame and a second later a man appeared in front of him with an arm across his chest. He was dressed in the traditional attire of the Umbu of Kanoha, a red tattoo was present on his left arm and a mask covered his face. Hokage-sama, the soldier said humbly, waiting for orders. Take two of your best men with you, plus a member of the Inazuka clan and find out who's behind this, it's an S-rank mission. Tobarama announced, writing the mission on a scroll in front of him. Restrictions? The soldier asked before grabbing the scroll held out in his direction. You have white card. Hi. The umbu greeted before disappearing in an instant as if he had never been there. Day 210. They should have been back more than a week ago, something must have happened to them, said a man in his thirties. Do you doubt the skills of your student Anoki-san? Asked a deep-voiced man whose body was completely covered in bandages. I don't doubt Fuji M. Sama's skills, but it's enough that they have fallen on someone a little too dangerous for them to be overwhelmed, answered Anoki to his master. He had trained his apprentice very well, Fuji. But if you were ambushed you had almost no chance of getting out alive. However, from what little I heard, he would have sacrificed himself so that his comrades could return to announce the news, added Mao, scrutinizing his own apprentice. It's true, either they were ambushed, or they ran into Tobarama Senju or. Or Kanoha has more competent ninja under him than we think, replied the little man who floated slightly above the ground thanks to his jintun techniques. There are two other people who could have handled Fuji without worry, that Saratobi and that Danzo. 
Two very talented people who were taught by Tobarama himself, M explained before turning his gaze on the rest of the assembly. They were in the middle of a meeting. Because of his announcement that he would be the next Suchikage, M was taking care of the meetings concerning the security of the country while the current Suchikage was resting. He was getting old and had to preserve himself as much as possible. Moreover, he had blind confidence in his student. Do you think Kanoha is aware of our plans? Asked an advisor around the table. The latter immediately lowered his head as the future Tsuchikage turned his gaze towards him. I don't think so, we've been very careful, the bandaged man replied. Yet this isn't the only team that suddenly disappeared from circulation, the advisor added. Indeed, several of their ninja teams in charge of guerrilla warfare in the fire territory had simply disappeared. Compared to Fuji's team, which should have been back by now, three quarters of the others had stopped writing their reports out of the blue. Perhaps a third person, because if Kanoha really knew about this, you can be sure that Tobarama would be at our doors with his troops, M reassured him, knowing that this shinobi should not be taken lightly. Should we accelerate our action plans? Yes. Chapter 22 Day 220 After dismantling several small raids sent by Tsuchi no Kuni, Madara and Sakura had been able to obtain information about the next planned attacks. Few of the shinobi had any concrete information beyond their current mission. But one of them had hinted that the Land of Rain would be a potential target. That was all it took for Madara to decide to leave the Land of Fire and head west, especially towards the second largest city in the Land of Rain. Going to the capital would have been useless and stupid, not because of the shinobi loyal to Kanoha. But because it would be an unnecessary expenditure of energy and would force them to reveal themselves to the wrong people sooner than expected. Furthermore, during their journey through the various elemental nations, Sakura and Madara had redirected many villages towards Haiwa. And this was possible either by saving them or by manipulating them. Indeed, Madara made the people do what the Uchiha wanted. No one had forbidden the use of the Sharingan when an entire crowd was watching him give a speech. Madara was using this advantage to emphasize the threat and the need for these villages to join Tano Kuni and its capital Haiwa as soon as possible. Madara and Sakura were currently in one of the largest cities in the Land of Rain, one of Hai no Kuni's vassals. They were getting closer to their next destination. Do you really think this is a good idea Madara-san? Sakura whispered as they moved through the crowd. Yes, Madara replied as people moved out of their way. They were armed and they weren't hiding it. Also, Madara was tall and could be seen from a distance. Why here? Sakura insisted as she walked beside him, keeping an eye on the surroundings in case of an attack. Because I've learned to develop my sensory affinity, the dark-haired man answered, who was almost at the edge of the city. This one had a small wall and you could only enter through two gates. Of course as a ninja, that kind of wall was a joke and wouldn't stop you. I thought it was an ability that had to be innate to use, the surprised young woman said. Let's just say the Sharingan has its advantages, Madara added mysteriously with a small smile. What do you mean? The doctor insisted. They arrived near the main gate where there were many guards who looked at the two ninjas with suspicion and at the same time fear. Few people had the opportunity to see ninjas or even know what they looked like. And it was the officer who determined that the tall, dark-haired man was probably a shinobi. Or at least a samurai by the swords on his belt. Manipulation, illusion, security. With these three things I can get all the tongues wagging, the Uchiha began as he stopped in the middle of the large doorway, half blocking the passage of civilians. Make my target believe she is safe at home, use her own memories to force her to reveal to someone close to her, the information I desire. You stole a sensory shinobi's understanding? Sakura said more in affirmation than in questioning. It was even a given that that was what he had done. What range? When we're in a place without civilization, Miles. And the more chakra the person has, the easier it will be to spot them, Madara replied as he looked straight ahead before undoing his long cloak, revealing more of his weapons to the people around him. Seeing this gesture, the civilians moved away from him and the soldiers took their weapons in hand. Oh my! said the officer as he approached the two warriors, accompanied by a dozen men. No trouble in this town. Madara and Sakura said nothing, 
they both looked towards the horizon and ignored the people around them. Hey! I'm talking to you. The man snarled as he reached for the hilt of his own sword. Put your weapons away if you don't want to get hurt, Madara threatened, releasing a tiny amount of killing intent. And that was enough to make the men surrounding them take a step back. How many do you count, master? Sakura said as she resumed her role as apprentice with the people around them. A little over a hundred. Looks like that Tsuchikage is going on the offensive, Madara replied as he watched a thin cloud of dust looming on the horizon, a sign that a troop was approaching in that direction. What are you doing? Demanded the officer who didn't like the way things were going. We're saving your life. Madara said before moving forward while talking to the pink-haired woman. If a shinobi gets too close to the city Sakura-san, kill him. Hi. What the hell are you talking about? Ordered the man who didn't understand what was going on before a steady bell sounded throughout the town, they were under attack. Madara moved slowly as the civilians began to run towards the city gates in order to get the protection of the city walls as well as the soldiers. Everyone ignored the Uchiha, but no one bumped into him, as if what he was giving off was enough to not want to mess with him. The fight would be faster if the young woman accompanied him, but he wanted to test her abilities. Thanks to Sakura's uncommon skills and abilities, Madara Uchiha had recovered his second Sharingan and he intended to use it to its fullest power. As the troop from the land approached, Uchiha Madara activated his jutsu. There were just over a hundred of them, Madara counted a large number of chunin and genin. From the regulation and their chakra reserves, he estimated six chunin. Probably the leaders of the attack. The patriarch took a deep breath, then exhaled for a long time to regulate his body properly. Then suddenly he saw them. They were straight ahead of him, about a hundred meters away, running directly towards him. The dark-haired man also began to run, slowly at first, but then gradually accelerating. There were only twenty meters left. Ten meters. At this distance, all the shinobi of the land had seen the man charging them. Madara could see surprise in their eyes, and mostly incomprehension. After all, who would be suicidal enough to charge an armed force full of shinobi? But this incomprehension was perfect for Madara to take advantage of. A dozen projectiles approached him, he deflected to his right while drawing one of his weapons to position it at his neck. He deflected, one, two, three kunai before lowering his blade towards his left lung. Two more clangs were heard as two shuriken struck the Uchiha's blade. He had just neutralized the attack of ten enemy soldiers in two movements. Five meters. Madara calculated the trajectory to kill the one in front of him. It was one of the leaders. Two meters. One meter. The Jnin cocked his arm with a war cry, except that for Madara's trained eyes, he was too slow. He swung his weight to the side and avoided the blade before decapitating the shinobi in one fluid motion. The first blood was drawn. Parrying, dodging, acrobatics, everything was used by Uchiha Madara who was worse than water to grip with his hands. His eyes were analyzing so much information in advance that no ninja had a chance against this man. He felt like he was slowing down time and could move as he pleased. Parry. There followed a fluid and graceful movement towards the opening provided by a third person. This simple gesture sliced off an arm before decapitating another person. Dodge. Madara contracted his abdominal muscles to lean back. The enemy, wanting to skewer him, stuck his blade into the shinobi behind his original target. That was the dangerous thing about a well-trained Uchiha, every attack directed at him could backfire on his attacker. Or a third person. Barely twenty seconds had passed and over forty ninjas had just lost their lives. Squad 1 continued towards the city. Shouted what appeared to be one of the leaders of the attack. Jenin stay back and support. The other submerged. Arg. The Jnin didn't have time to finish his sentence as the enemy appeared right in front of him to plant a kunai right in his throat. Madara didn't linger any longer before pulling the sharp weapon from the flesh, finishing the Jnin off in the process. Meanwhile, on the small city wall, the soldiers were completely stunned by what was taking place before their eyes. A single man was single-handedly wiping out an armed shinobi force. It was absolutely unthinkable that a living being was capable of accomplishing such a thing. 
archers. Make ready, enemy approaching. However, at the bottom of the wall about twenty meters from the entrance, Sakura was pacing back and forth, her gaze focused on the battle. Waiting. When she saw a dozen shinobi approaching she reacted quickly. In front of the town's entrance was a crossroads where a large menhir was positioned as a directional sign. Sakura grabbed it with her hands as the soldiers looked on in amazement. She raised it above her head before throwing it with all her might towards the approaching shinobi. Two shinobi had no time to dodge and perished instantly as a loud thud was heard when the menhir landed on the ground. The young woman flashed her chakra so that the ninja in front of her would understand that they would have to face her before they had a chance to enter the city. Boss? What do we do? Asked one of the archers who had his bow bandaged and his arrow ready to go. Wait! Shouted the officer who saw the young woman running towards the enemies. He wanted to see what this person was capable of as an explosion of fire and screams could be heard in the distance. He had expected many things, but not that this woman would be so devastating. She seemed to move faster, more easily than her opponents. No enemy attack seemed to reach her, unlike her own. She used no lethal blade except her fists. And her fists were more than enough. Every parry, every block, every punch Sakura made was deadly to the owner or the target. For every time she hit, a body part was torn off or a person perished. With her agility and speed, Sakura swept her last opponent off his feet and onto the ground. The man could see the pink-haired woman direct her fist directly at his chest, and then everything went black for him. The energy released went through the soldier's body before spreading into the ground, causing cracks to appear for a dozen meters around. It took Sakura less than eleven seconds to neutralize the entirety of Squad 1, leaving only one child alive, who couldn't have been more than twelve. She was a chocolate-eyed brunette and was transfixed by the pink-haired woman's presence alone. There was a reason for that. Put away your arrows, said the officer after a while, still in shock at what he was seeing. That man in the distance and his apprentice outside their door were exceptional beings and they were saving their lives. Your name? Sakura demanded in a cold tone to the girl. Emma the young brunette replied in complete fear. You're going to stay here, if you ever try to run away, I'll kill you. Have I made myself clear? Sakura explained, clearing her throat of killing intent. H. Hi. Very clear. The girl replied quickly, and even if she had wanted to, she wouldn't have even tried to run away. Then Sakura left the young woman alone before walking towards the Uchiha who was still causing havoc. There were hardly any enemies left and it was more like a game of cat and mouse as the remaining survivors were running away rather than fighting. Who the hell are you? Said a panicked man who was crawling backwards as the dark-haired man advanced towards him with his weapon drawn and dripping with blood. Your executioner, Madara replied, thrusting his blade into the body of the ninja who had just enough time to see two Sharingan looking at him. This was one of Madara's pleasures, making his enemies understand who he was just before they died by his hand. How do you feel Madara-san? Sakura asked as she joined him and the dark-haired man cleaned the edge of his blade. I've rarely felt this good, said the Uchiha with a smile. No eye pain. Sakura asked as she stepped over the bodies to position herself in front of her patient. She didn't even wait for him to answer as she placed both hands on his face to examine his eyes. Madara did nothing to stop her, he enjoyed the rare contact between them. Her skin was soft and delicate, and every touch sent a soft tingle through his body. He then looked into her green eyes as her hands became covered in green chakra. The young woman could not help but blush at the intensity of Madara's gaze. It was just like the other times, he was looking at her with a look that no other man had used on her. It was confusing and Sakura didn't know how to react. If it had just been a look of desire, she would have completely ignored his looks. But there was something else going on. Something more intense, something deeper, something more sincere, and Sakura was afraid of what would happen if she accepted what Madara was trying to convey. It seems that the healing went well. Using your jutsu didn't alter anything, Sakura said after a few seconds. Did you use a genjutsu with it? No, Madara replied as he sheathed his weapon before sensing a source of chakra larger than a civilian near the wall. But it looks like I'll be able to test. 
did you take a prisoner? If you will, the young woman replied as she walked towards the city with the Uchiha. You could say that war is practically declared. As you say, I think it's time to make ourselves known, the Uchiha added as he approached the young woman who was shaking like a leaf at the sight of the two protagonists who had just killed all her comrades. Madara grabbed the young Mina by the neck and lifted her off the ground. She clutched both her hands, trying to loosen his grip as she gesticulated. Look at me. Madara commanded before activating his two Sharingan. His tomos began to spin rapidly as the young brunette stopped moving completely trapped in the dark-haired man's genjutsu. You will return to your kage and explain what happened here and you will be unable to describe who we were except that there were only two of us. I, the young woman replied, she didn't seem to know what she was doing. Madara set her down on the ground and she headed in the opposite direction of the city to accomplish her mission. Once the informant was out of sight, Madara and Sakura walked towards the city gates where everyone looked at them with fear and respect. Respect because they had saved their lives and fear because there was absolutely nothing they could do if they decided to attack them. Open the gates, Madara ordered. The officer did not order the doors to be opened in any way and many heads turned in his direction. Did they have to open the doors or not? If we wanted to hurt you, you'd be dead by now, the dark-haired man added, understanding the feeling towards them. Open the doors, said the officer, who had to admit that it was totally true. Once the doors were opened, the two shinobi were greeted by a crowd cheering and shouting their enthusiasm for their two saviors. Sakura responded with a gentle smile and a few hand signals to all of them, while Madara walked unperturbed through the crowd, which slowly moved aside to let them pass. They walked towards the largest square in the city, followed by practically the entire population. After all, this was going to be a day of celebration for having been saved from the invaders. There was a large fountain in the center of the main square, Madara channeled Chakra into his legs and jumped to the top of it for all to see. People of Aim no Kuni. Madara spoke loudly for all to hear. The cheering and clapping stopped to hear what this man had to say. As he spoke, Madara activated his Sharingan to immerse his entire audience in snippets of Genjutsu. Each word he spoke would plant an idea in the mind of the listener, making them believe that what he was saying was the pure truth and that everything should be done to go along with it. Today, the country of Tsuchi no Kuni tried to attack you. To take your wealth and kill you. Where are your allies while your country is being invaded? They are hiding in their comfort, letting you sink into their false promise of alliance. This is an outrage. Shouted one member of the audience who was agreed by many others. While Hai no Kuni ignores his vassals for his own profit, Ta no Kuni comes to your aid. Because what happened today is only the beginning. Tomorrow others will come, and the day after tomorrow even more. But there is a place where you will be safe, a place where you will be protected by people like us. You will be welcomed by people who care about your protection, your future. Madara exclaimed as his gaze swept over the entire crowd to make sure everyone met his gaze. Where is such a place? Asked a weak-minded person who was completely immersed in the Uchiha illusion. Haiwa. Capital of Ta no Kuni. We are a place of peace where war is outlawed and neutrality is valued while the rest of the world kills each other. The choice is yours, leave for Haiwa and live. Or stay here and die tomorrow. For we will leave here tomorrow. Madara finished before stepping down from the fountain, letting the idea germinate in people's minds. He had placed the powder, the fuse and his speech was the spark to create a chain effect. The crowd effect is more powerful than anything else, and there are more people than there are people. No one had a death wish, and the idea, augmented tenfold by Madara's Genjutsu, created the largest caravan ever seen in the elemental nations in just three hours. It consisted of over a thousand occupants bringing as many resources as possible. Take this, ma'am, Sakura said, holding out a small wooden stick with kanji of finjutsu glittering on it. What is this? The lady asked as she held her baby in her arms. It is to protect your child. Place it in his cloth and it will protect him during your journey, Sakura lied so the mother would take the object. It was a creation made by Madara and herself. A set of finjutsu seals mixed with genjutsu made by Madara. 
As long as this object was held by someone, anyone within the perimeter of effect was rendered invisible to the world. Anyone who came close would have the irresistible urge to go elsewhere. Thank you miss. Said the mother of the family before taking the small wooden stick and placing it in the blanket in which her son was wrapped. Once you get close to Haiwa, throw that stick to the ground and break it, Sakura added. This shouldn't cause any problems in the capital. Thank you very much. Let's go everyone. The officer shouted. Within fifteen minutes the second largest city in the land of rain was completely abandoned, leaving Sakura and Madara in the middle of it. Tell me Sakura-san, will you try a ninjutsu duel? The dark-haired man asked with a small smile. Here. Right here. We need to make this place a real war zone before we scatter the earth shinobi all over the city, Madara explained and began to compose hand signals. Day 225. What's up? A man asked his colleague as he finished climbing the ladder. They were currently on one of Haiwa's observation posts. This location provided a very good view of the entire valley. This was until the watchtowers were set up in the surrounding valleys. Nothing to report that merits our attention, replied the man in his twenties before sitting down on a small stool provided for that purpose. He placed the spyglass he used to observe the surroundings on the wooden ledge. How are you otherwise? Yes. Still surprised at the turn of events, but I'm not going to complain, replied the forty-year-old who still had a hard time seeing everything move, but at least he had a job to feed his family. It's still better than what we had in the past, said the younger man, thinking back to the provincial wars. As you say, young man, the older man nodded before taking the spyglass in his turn. He brought the object to his right eye before pointing the lens towards the eastern road. The main road was used by people here and there. There were also a few carts, and an army rider on patrol, nothing unusual to report. How is your wife? Asked the soldier as he opened his water bottle and brought it to his lips. She's doing well, now that our children are autonomous, she's been asked to come at the request of the daimi, explained the man before pointing the spyglass towards the southern road. Is that so? Yes, it seems that our lord has set up some sort of medical group. Probably they need manpower for whatever, he explained before carefully adjusting the lens of his instrument. The road to the south stretched for several miles and passed through many villages before reaching Haiwa. There were the same type of people using the southern road. There was nothing unusual and he was about to put the spyglass down when something caught his eye. In the middle of the valley, there was someone walking briskly towards the capital. Except that he was wearing a hooded cloak, his face completely camouflaged. Potential suspect coming from the south, he said to his colleague, who looked up. Should we send a group for an inspection? Asked the young man who had learned over time to trust his colleague's suspicions. The man concerned said nothing, his gaze fixed on the individual who did not slow down. Then, at a given moment, a strong breeze blew the wanderer's cloak away and, at the same time, part of his hood. For a moment the soldier saw the man's face, accompanied by a reflection of light. Shit! said the soldier before hurriedly turning towards the outpost bell. Clang clang clang! It was a very small bell that could only be heard a hundred yards away. Everyone near the outpost turned around, especially those posted at the main gate of the wall. Nukunin. The forty-year-old shouted before immediately returning to his post to watch the deserters' actions. It was just their luck, they were not prepared for this kind of threat at all. The land of Tano Kuni had no shinobi forces besides Sakura and Madara. But they were both outside the country. After the sentry's announcement, the city swarmed militarily and many soldiers climbed to the top of the half-built walls armed with bows and crossbows. How long before the target is there? Shouted one person from below. In about thirty minutes it will. Shit. It's gone. The man panicked as the Nukneen vanished from his sight. He scanned the road with his spyglass in the hope of finding him. There. He seemed to have made several quick trips down the road. Within fifteen minutes, boss. Alert Suzuki-sama said the officer to a man on horseback who rode off at a triple gallop through the city streets. I want three dozen archers placed up there. Crossbowmen placed here and here. And clear the civilians from the main gate. 
as soon as the orders were given, everyone sprang into action. This was the first time they had faced this kind of threat and hardly any of them had ever faced a shinobi. Ninjas were just a legend, a myth to the civilians, but to the soldiers they were a reality. They were made to understand very quickly that such individuals existed and that they were capable of anything. Many soldiers in the service of Ta no Kuni saw their daimi as well as Suzuki using semi rank techniques during the provincial wars. Proof that all this really existed. After ten minutes of preparation, Suzuki arrived on the back of his warhorse dressed in his battle armor, his sword drawn. His face showed extreme concentration, he hoped with all his heart that this ninja deserter had not come to eradicate the city. Close the portcullis. Suzuki ordered before stepping forward as a line of soldiers moved into place. Everyone cheer up. Then everyone waited in fear as the threat approached. Everyone could see him now, even more so when he brought one of his hands up to his neck. He undid the lace that attached the cloak to his garment before discarding the garment and throwing it to the ground. Anyone who was close enough could see that he was indeed a shinobi, his armor, his weaponry, and his forehead protector were proof of his status. He was a former ninja of Tsuchi no Kuni the land of the earth, his headband was crossed out at the symbol and he would be at the city gates in less than thirty seconds. Halt! Suzuki shouted, but the deserter pretended he hadn't heard anything and kept walking. His face was neutral, even though he was looking at all the soldiers in front of him. In one look he realized that none of them seemed to know how to use the shinobi arts, it would be so easy to annihilate them all. I said, halt. Suzuki shouted this time and the man stopped in front of everyone not ten meters away. What do you want? No answer. The deserter walked slowly around the wall and the surrounding area, he was counting and this did not reassure Suzuki. Then, having gone around, he raised his right hand to his head. Don't make another move. Or you'll be dead before you know what's happening to you. Threatened Suzuki, who only received a black look from the protagonist. He released some of his killing intent, stunting a large part of the army in front of him. When he was sure that no one would be able to shoot him, the ninja resumed his movement. The Tsuchi no Kuni deserter undid his headband before grasping it with his full hand and stretching it forward. He remained like that for a few seconds before dropping it to the ground. I come for the true peace promised by Uchiha-sama. Chapter 23 Day 230 I don't care about your excuses. Said the Nidame Tsuchikage before disintegrating part of the council table out of anger. Everyone was shaking in their fury for fear of dying at the snap of a finger. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. I want results and you tell me what. W what. There. Has been a lot of water. One of the counselors tried to say. Keep stammering like that and I'll get you. M threatened his advisor, who swallowed, knowing what was likely to happen to him. The advisor continued before most of the council room was covered in blood. The newly promoted Tsuchikage since the death of his predecessor had just imploded him with one of his gene ton techniques. Will someone have the balls to tell me to my face what I've just been told? M demanded as he looked around. Many had blood splattered on their clothes and faces while the remains of their fellow soldier lay on the ground. There have been many attacks on our borders and no one knows who they are, Noki repeated. M's apprentice had no desire to see another bloodshed. Moreover, his master would not dare to kill him too, that would be to lose a precious element in his eyes. Is this about Kanoha? Or did Tobarama manage to convince the Kazakage to join him in an alliance? And thus turn it upside down? The Kage said in his own thoughts. He couldn't understand what had happened. The vast majority of the troops they had sent to do guerrilla warfare had simply disappeared, and now they were the ones being subjected to guerrilla warfare in their own land. The land of earth had allied itself with the land of sand and the land of lightning against the land of fire. As soon as it was announced that Uchiha Madara and Hashirama Senju were both dead, the first and second Suchikage had contacted the other countries to take advantage of such an opportunity. Could this be Tano Kuni? Asked one of the advisors timidly. They have no army and the last letter sent by the daimi of the rice country confirms that they want peace. After all, no one offers that much money unless they really become a neutral country, replied Mon, rubbing one of his eyebrows. 
maybe we'll make them a vassal after our plans for Hai no Kuni. Should we bring back the Tsuchikij Sama troops? The same counselor asked. No. That would be a waste of time and resources, especially at this time of year. No one is attacking at this time of year, so this is the ideal time, replied the leader of the land of the earth. Besides, by now, the land of rain must have fallen into our hands. Would you like me to take a troop and investigate, master? Asked Noki who was just as upset as his teacher. Civilians and comrades were disappearing, fellow soldiers had probably been killed by an unknown enemy. So do it, Noki. Began M before being interrupted by someone knocking on the door. The door opened and a guard bowed before speaking. Nidane Tsuchikich, I'm sorry to disturb you, but a genin from the armed force sent to the land of rain has returned and she wishes to speak with you urgently. She says the safety of your operations is at stake. Send her in. M ordered immediately, having a bad feeling. If a genin was present, there must have been a problem. No Jnin would have allowed a member of their troop to return home, let alone desert. If this person was telling him lies, he would know quickly. And he would have no qualms about executing him for wasting his time as well as for leaving his post. The young Mina entered the council chamber with many emotions on her face. Not only was she still afraid of what she had seen on the battlefield, but she was facing her superior officer, which was very impressive and unsettling. Finally, as there was blood in more than half of the room as well as on the council members, it provided an even more overwhelming atmosphere for the genin. What are you doing here? Why aren't you at the front conquering the land of rain? Demanded the bandaged man in the direction of the young brunette teenager. Goman Tsuchikich Sama, I. I'm the only survivor of the armed force sent to conquer the land of rain. This sentence had the same effect as a bomb in the middle of a city. Explain yourself said that Tsuchikij who couldn't see any trace of deceit in her eyes and that's what worried him. Report. The man's shout startled everyone in the room, especially Mina who was not used to being put under so much pressure and murderous intent. This was different from what the pink-haired woman had imposed on her. We headed for Shizuoka, the second largest city in the land of rain, the young teenager began to explain. Our regiment eliminated the leaf and rain shinobi on patrol before attacking said city. However, when we launched the assault on the town, we were attacked in turn. How many? Who? Demanded M who needed to know who they were fighting. I don't know and. There were only two of them. Are you really saying, kid, that two people wiped out a regiment of 130 ninjas by themselves? Noki replied sarcastically. Would you take us for fools? Never, Noki-sama. I would never allow myself to do that. They. They. They were so fast, so agile, none of our attacks could reach them. I've never seen anyone fight like that, Mina explained in fear as she remembered with dread the man tearing her fellow soldiers apart. Describe them, M said in a softer voice in order to reassure the genin, for he seemed to believe her and wanted to know more about these mysterious assailants who were supposedly so powerful. One had long brown hair, rather tall, with a kimono in the browns, he wielded a sword, although they also used my comrade's weapons against them with ease. I didn't see his face. He was wearing a straw hat, said Mina, who strangely could not remember the face of her attacker. She had seen him up close and personal. But no, she couldn't. Is that all? Not even a bit of his face? Insisted M who could see in the girl's eyes that she was doing her best to remember the physical details of the attacker. No, I don't remember. And the other one? M asked then. She had. She had. Mina began before being interrupted by the night named Tsuchikich. She had. Are you saying that the other person was a woman? The man with the bandages asked suspiciously. Not that he doubted the fighting ability of the weaker sex, but to have the ability to wipe out a hundred battle hardened ninja seemed far too unlikely. Mina nodded positively before continuing her description. She had pink hair, a bright red outfit with a sword on her back. But I never saw her use it, she didn't even need it. What do you mean? M asked, more and more intrigued by these words. I've never seen anyone with such strength, she said, swallowing as she saw the images of the rose in battle again. 
can you quantify his strength? M asked, totally surprised by the reactions of the genin in front of them. I can't say, M Sama. If you were to compare her to the Rakage who is considered the strongest man in the world. Added the Kage patiently. I would say that the Rakage is a small child compared to her strength. What did she do to make you say that? M asked suddenly very attentive. After all, it wasn't every day that one heard that a shinobi was stronger than the rakage and especially if it was a woman. It lifted a three meter high man here, probably weighing 300 kilos, and threw it over a distance of 80 meters, smashing two of my friends to a pulp. I saw it hit my squadron leader right in the chest and a 10 meter crater opened up. Just with a punch, explained the girl who had tears in her eyes and was beginning to tremble as she remembered these two characters and their actions on the battlefield. A distinctive sign. Asked a man from the council. I don't remember, she replied with a look of concern that she didn't have more details to provide, but her memory wouldn't allow it, although she was aware that she had seen these two warriors up close. Could it be that these two people are the same ones who have been waging guerrilla warfare in our territory? Noki asked his master. Unlikely, but your idea is not impossible. If they are capable of managing an armed force of shinobi on their own, Maybe they are responsible for the disappearance of our troops on Hai no Kuni. Or maybe they were just two ninjas from the land of rain defending their home, M reasoned, having several theories brewing in his head. How is it that you are still alive and they are not? Did you flee? Demanded Anoki, letting his killing intent burst forth, he hated cowards and deserters. No. They. They let me go by ordering me to tell you what happened in Shizuoka, Mina defended herself, trembling. Why do you want to tell us that they did that? M wondered. Is it a threat? Or is it a way of saying that Kanoha is aware of our actions? Suggested Noki to his master. Whatever, that Tsuchikage said with a wave of his hand before pointing at the girl. You. You will follow my apprentice Noki, guiding him to the place where all this happened. Hi. The genin replied. Yes master, Noki replied mechanically before moving away. Send messages to our allies, we are accelerating our plans. Shall we make it official? Questioned the scribe in his corner. Hi. War is declared. Day 240. It had been two days since Sakura and Madara had returned to Ta no Kuni and in particular to the young woman's house. The war was near, Tensions were palpable and at their peak. Everyone was suspicious of everyone else, especially since the last time the two protagonists had acted in Shizuoka City. Alliances had been formed in all the elemental nations, troops were on the move on all sides, it was only a matter of days before the first great shinobi war was declared. For safety's sake, Madara had preferred to return to the country while waiting for the first movements to be made. This would allow him to intervene if the rice country was attacked by a potential traitor. Moreover, it was necessary to preserve oneself before any other offensive or defensive actions. Exhausting themselves against entire armies was not the solution to their final project. So Madara and Sakura had established a small routine over the past two days. Meditation, training, planning and rest. However, one of them was currently in a most awkward position. Sakura had been torturing her mind for days. No weeks. If not months. She was finding it harder and harder to suppress what she was feeling, and she suspected she was lying to herself. She had discovered over time that Madara was a remarkable man, one who had flaws like any human being, but was a unique person. He was a man with honor, ambition, charisma, beauty, and courage, as well as being one of the most powerful beings on earth. He also wanted to bring peace to this rotten world. But most of all, he looked at her like no one else had ever looked at her before. So, after all this thinking over several months, Sakura came to the conclusion and finally accepted what she felt inside. She was in love with Madara Uchiha. But was she ready to tell him? That was another story. She wished that her master Tsunade Senju was there to advise her, or her mother. Her mother. She who had loved her father from the beginning, she would have had the words to guide her on how to reveal herself to a man in a sentimental way. What to say? How to say it? So many unanswered questions that the young woman found it increasingly difficult not to ask herself in silence. 
especially since she had this major stranger, what about him? Did he feel the same way about her or would she have to face a one-sided love once again? Then she remembered a detail, she knew someone, maybe two people, who would be able to advise her and give her the beginning of an answer to her questions. Madara-san, I'm going to go see my friend Hitomi, Sakura announced as the man sat on a chair reading a book Sakura had written. See you later Sakura-san, Madara replied absent-mindedly as he was engrossed in his reading. So it was with determination that Sakura made her way to her friend's village below her home. The young woman was so deep in thought that she quickly arrived at Hitomi's house. And once in front of the door, she realized that her stomach was in knots before she knocked. Yes. Said the brunette woman as she opened the door before a smile appeared on her face as she recognized who had knocked. Oh Sakura. You're back. The woman's cheerfulness gave Sakura courage and a lot of energy. She had hardly anyone to relax with at this time, or just to chat with. So she gladly accepted this good mood towards her. Hello Hitomi, how are you? I'm fine and you? Did your trip go well? Hitomi asked. Yes, our trip went well. But. Tell me, do you have a moment for me? Sakura asked a little quickly. She didn't want to dwell on their outdoor missions, which might scare her friend away from everything they had accomplished. Yes of course, would you like to come in? Hitomi offered politely. Are you alone? Sakura asked, wanting to talk one-on-one -on -one with the forty-year-old, and especially one-on-one -on -one with the woman. Yes, Hitomi replied before opening the door wide and turning around. It was a very modest house and you could tell from the furnishings that the inhabitants of this house had few financial resources and led a very simple life. Some tea. Please Hitomi, Sakura nodded before settling down at the table in the main room. So what brings you here Sakura? Hitomi asked as she put the water in a container. No need to put the water on the fire, just bring me the teapot. And if not, I'm here because I need some advice, Sakura admitted as the brunette approached with the teapot. Me? How can I advise you? Hitomi asked in surprise as Sakura dipped her fingertips into the water. She activated her chakra and the water quickly heated up to the desired temperature. How did you know your husband was the one? Sakura asked bluntly. As soon as the young woman finished her sentence, Hitomi couldn't help but grin up to her ears, for she knew what this question meant to the pink-haired young woman. Furthermore, the blush on Sakura's cheeks only confirmed Hitomi's doubts. You're in love, aren't you? The brunette asked without beating about the bush. Please answer my question, Sakura replied shyly. First of all, I was lucky enough not to be part of a big family, otherwise I would have been married to a complete stranger. Then we grew up together so I had my whole life to know he was the one, Hitomi said as she poured tea into two cups. He was my best friend before he was my lover and husband. But I would say I knew he was the one when I saw the look on his face. Sakura understood what Hitomi meant. There is nothing more powerful to a woman than the way a man looks at her. When she sees in his eyes that she is not just a piece of meat. When she understands that through his eyes he really sees her as she is, as the woman she is, it is something powerful, intense and rare. And Sakura felt very lucky to be looked at in this way by Madara, who had denigrated the female gender for so long. You love him, don't you? Hitomi insisted gently with a thin smile. Sakura took her cup of tea in her hands before looking up at the forty-year-old's eyes. She didn't answer verbally, but nodded, Yes, she did love him. She had come to understand over time that the love she had for Sasuke was true, but that it wasn't very good to love someone who only felt disgust for you. Whereas with Madara, what she felt was totally different. It was so intense and most importantly, it seemed to be mutual. Did you tell him? Hitomi asked softly. No, I didn't. What are you waiting for? The brunette asked, blowing on her cup. To have courage. Sakura answered more for herself than for Hitomi. Because after all, it wasn't nothing that Sakura was trying to do, confess her feelings for the most powerful Uchiha. Courage. You lack courage. The brunette exclaimed. I've never seen a woman like you Sakura. I've never in my life met a woman who could stand up to a man without receiving his wrath. 
and I have never seen a man listen to a woman when she openly opposes him. You have the courage, don't doubt it, and don't forget that even if Uchiha-sama is handsome and imposing, he is like all men. They're weak in the face of the fairer sex, Sakura laughed as the forty-year-old grinned. Exactly. I'm scared Hitomi, the pink-haired woman admitted, remembering what Sasuke had done to her. I don't want to suffer, I don't want to be wrong, I don't want an illusory love. Like all women. But you have the chance to be a strong woman. The question to ask you my dear Sakura is, does he love me for what I am? The brunette explained before taking a sip of her tea. She wished she had a little sugar in it, but unfortunately she didn't have any like Sakura. Does he love you? Sakura didn't answer right away, she looked at her faint reflection in the liquid before her. Did Madara Achiha love her? That was the real question after all, what were the man's feelings for her? Maybe. It is better to live with remorse than with regret. Life is too short and it's better to live with the fact that you tried to have a beautiful love affair than to have not tried at all, Hitomi said wisely. Sakura smiled at this sentence. She only had one life, and the Rikid Sanin had allowed her to have a whole new one by going back in time. Did he know that she would eventually fall in love with the Uchiha? Had he seen it in his predictions? Hadn't he even suggested that she charm the Dark One in order to obtain that long for true peace? Arigato. You're always welcome Sakura. And I want to be there for the wedding. The forty-year-old retorted with a big smile. Hitomi. Sakura snarled, not wanting to get married anytime soon. I'm not planning on getting married now. We'll talk about it later, sweetheart. Now get out of here and go declare yourself to your Prince Charming. Hitomi ordered as she stood up and grabbed Sakura's hand. But. No buts, you're ready and loaded, so from now on, go see this man and tell him what's in your heart, beautiful. Meanwhile, in Sakura's house, Madara was reading her book and waiting. With his sensory ability he could feel the chakra of the young woman in the village. Once he determined that she was far enough away he closed the book he was reading and began to gather information. In the past he had only been able to get information in this house in episodes because Sakura was always there. But today he had an opportunity to get information about who Sakura was and whether her doubts were justified. The patriarch stood up before heading to the desk of the Finjutsu Virtuoso. There were many scrolls talking about seals and containing various formulas. A few books were piled up on the upper right corner of the desk, but they were not interesting. He walked around the desk before directing his gaze to the bookcase to quickly read all the titles with his Sharingan. The possibility that Sakura and her mother were from another continent was reinforced as he read all the titles in front of him. There were so many subjects he had never heard of, but there was no data to identify who this woman was or where she came from. So he headed for the one room he had never visited, Sakura's room. He slid the door open to reveal a small, modest room, three pieces of furniture in addition to the bed. He looked around the room as his nostrils were flooded with the smell of the young woman. Madara closed his eyes for a few seconds to enjoy the scent of the woman he longed for and loved. After coming to his senses, Madara opened the closet to find all the normal stuff, clothes. The other cabinet contained the same thing though he held back a blush when he saw all the underwear. Then his eyes were drawn to a wooden frame on the bedside table. There was a painting inside. What's that? Madara said softly to himself. It was something he had never seen before. Either the painter was a virtuoso in his field, or this was something totally new. Photography didn't exist in the Sengoku era and seeing such a detailed image impressed Madara. It was a picture of Sakura at the age of seven surrounded by her mother and father. It was a beautiful picture and Madara finally had a face to put on Tsunade Haruno. He could finally say that he had never seen her before. After a good minute of looking at the painting, Madara put the frame back on the bedside table in the exact spot he found it. He pulled on the handle of the bedside table drawer but it did not open. There was no lock, but a small finjutsu seal. Madara realized that Sakura was hiding something here that she did not want discovered. The dark-haired man crouched down so that he had the seal in front of him before activating his Sharingan to analyze the mathematical series and unlock it. 
It took him almost five minutes to figure out what was in front of him before he deactivated it. Once the seal was neutralized, Madara tugged on the drawer and it gently opened and the dark-haired man's eyes widened as he saw what was inside. The patriarch reached into the drawer and pulled out another picture frame and a small metal plate. It was a plate normally placed on the headbands. Except this one had the symbol of the village of Kanoha on it. He turned the plate over to see the license plate and frowned, it wasn't a license plate he was used to seeing. Perhaps it confirmed the fact that she was from Kanoha, or perhaps she had stolen that headband from someone. However, the second picture frame disturbed Madara greatly and he didn't know what to think. There were four people in the picture, Sakura in the center, a dark-haired man to her right who had all the characteristics of an Uchiha and in his mind that could only be the Sasuke that Sakura had told him about. To her left was a blonde man who had an outfit that screamed kill me. But the worst part was the man behind them. He had the Hokage hat on. Who are you? Madara questioned as he left the room with the metal plate and the picture frame he never took his eyes off of. Countless scenarios ran through Madara's mind. This picture disturbed him to the core, as questions were now being answered, but another thousand questions had just taken place in his mind. He was so focused in his thoughts that he didn't feel Sakura return and it was the sound of her footsteps on the floor that made him look up. The Uchiha saw the surprised and panicked look on Sakura's face as she recognized what he was holding in his hands. Who are you? Madara asked politely. He wanted answers now and he was going to get them, but since he had respect for this woman and also feelings, he chose the gentle way. However, Sakura remained stunned, she didn't know what to do. She really didn't expect Madara to find out what she had hidden. The dark-haired man wasn't known to be a very skilled finjutsu player, but it seems she underestimated him. Answer me. Madara repeated, staring into Sakura's eyes as she thought hard. She was thinking about what to say, what to do, she was just afraid that everything would be ruined by this simple discovery. This silence and especially this lack of answer seriously started to irritate the Uchiha and it put his nerves to the test. He could see that the young woman was thinking hard and the longer she took to answer him. The more he had the impression that she was trying to figure out what to say to avoid answering his questions, and this was inconceivable for the Uchiha. No one manipulated Madara Uchiha so brazenly, let alone could afford to think they could fool him. Anger roared within him more and more intensely. He realized that he had been weak, that he had allowed himself to be lulled by new feelings, and that angered him to no end. Or rather, he didn't dare admit that he was hurt and wounded in his pride for having let her do it. He regretted the fact that she had managed to get into his heart. He had learned to love the young woman as he had never loved another woman. He recognized her value as well as her skills as a shinobi. She who had managed to hide her true life from him. But who was she? Who are you? Madara shouted as he released all of his killing intent and chakra ability while activating both of his Mangekyo Sharingan. The shockwave that erupted from the Uchiha spread throughout the house. Furniture flew in all directions, windows exploded, scrolls flew as if a tornado was blowing through the room, the megaphone shattered on the floor, and even some of the walls of the house cracked under the pressure. The only thing that didn't move was Sakura who suddenly had her warrior look in place. Madara had activated his jutsu to the higher rank and that kind of ward was not to be trifled with. I am Haruno Sakura Jnin of Kanoha no Sato born in the year 82 after Uchiha Madara was defeated by Hashirama Senju at the Valley of the End. And I sacrificed my time and my world for the chance to stop the cycle of hatred. Sakura replied, raising her voice. She had wanted to confess her feelings, but she had failed. She now found herself revealing who she really was to the most dangerous man in all the elemental nations. Time travel is impossible. Madara retorted, despite the fact that she had just found almost all the answers to his questions with this simple sentence. If she was from the future everything made sense, but if she was from the future, why save him? Madara tried to put the young woman into a jinjutsu to get all the answers he wanted, but it didn't work despite all his attempts. This angered the Uchiha even more, how could she possibly resist his pupil power? Nothing is impossible Madara-san, Sakura replied as she felt the Uchiha's Jinjutsu attacks against her. And she inwardly thanked the Rikid Senin for upgrading her frontal seal, 
allowing her to resist any Jinjutsu done by the Sharingan. You manipulated me. Madara asserted harshly. From the beginning you manipulated me. At first yes. I manipulated you, Sakura admitted without looking away. Why? Demanded the Uchiha who despite the situation couldn't help but be impressed by the woman in front of him. She was standing up to him and his Sharingan was useless against her. In order for you to fulfill your destiny. What destiny? Madara asked curiously despite the anger he felt and held back because of or because of his feelings for the young woman. The one that the child of the prophecy must fulfill, to bring peace, Sakura admitted, somehow relieved to finally be able to get it off her chest. She was afraid, but at the same time it was a liberation for her to no longer have this burden on her shoulders. She had carried it for too long and to be free felt good. The seconds passed, all very heavy. And as they stared at each other in silence, Sakura realized what she stood to lose, Madara. She felt deep down that everything would depend on how he would take this information. The young woman couldn't help but feel that she would surely lose the man she loved once again. After Sasuke. She was losing Madara. At the thought of it, she couldn't help the tears that were slowly forming in the corners of her eyes. But that was before, Sakura whispered, lowering her eyes slightly. Before what? Madara asked, still digesting the information. He could hardly define what he was feeling at the moment. In a way he felt betrayed for being manipulated like that. But what disturbed him even more was to consider that everything this woman had probably told him was false. In order to get him to go in the direction she wanted, and because of all this he felt pain in his chest. Madara didn't understand this pain, he had no physical injury, so what was it? Was this what they called the wounds of the soul? Those wounds inflicted because of the feelings you have for someone? Before I find out what kind of man you really were, Sakura began and decided to unpack her bag, even if it meant unpacking it completely. Before I fell in love with you. It was done, Sakura had done it, she had just confessed to Uchiha Madara that she was in love with him. However, he said nothing, he stayed put, his face closed, his killing intent still present. Gradually Sakura's heart tightened and a tear rolled down her cheek as she thought that everything was probably ruined because of her secrets. Once again she had lost the man she loved. Madara deactivated his Sharingan before walking towards the pink-haired woman. However, he didn't stop in front of her, he walked past her and headed outside, ignoring her completely. Once outside the Uchiha channel chakra into his legs to propel himself away from that house. He didn't see Sakura collapse to the ground crying in the middle of all the mess he had made in the house. Madara hopped from tree to tree for many minutes before coming to a clearing where he leaned against a tree to think. He closed his eyes, trying to calm the pain in his chest. Hello child, said an elderly voice. Chapter 24 Hello, child, said an elderly voice. Madara instantly opened his eyes upon hearing the voice. He had not heard this person, let alone perceived this being. Therefore, he could only be a dangerous person. No one in the world was capable of approaching him in this way without him realizing it. And yet. In front of him, less than two meters away, was this individual looking at him. It only took Madara a moment to realize that the being in front of him was extremely powerful, surely more powerful than himself. He wore a white kimono with Magatama around his neck, evoking the tomos of his Sharingan. In his right hand he held a uniquely shaped staff and six black balls floated behind him. But what impressed Madara the most was the man's eyes, Rinnegan. The Rinnegan was a legend that hardly anyone had heard of, and more importantly, no one could testify to it in his lifetime. Madara had been able to learn a little about it when he used his Mangekyo Sharingan to decipher the Uchiha clan's plates. But without this ability, he would have been like the vast majority, ignorant of the existence of this type of eye power. And this man in front of him had two Rinnegan staring at him. Who are you? Madara asked as he stood up in an instant, ready to fight for his life. Yet the man gave off no chakra, no particular intent, much less murderous intent. But his sixth sense told him that he was far more powerful than his long-time rival, Hashirama Senju. I have been given many names, many of which have been forgotten. Even dismissed as myth and legend, the old man began cryptically. 
Get to the point, ancestor, Madara added, almost activating his own jutsu. I am known as the hermit of the six paths, or the sage of the six paths, or the rickets and neem, the old man replied as Madara's eyes widened in realization of who was before him. But I was named Hagoromo Tsutsuki. Time seemed to stand still for Madara, he stared the hermit in the eyes and there was no doubt that he was telling the truth, he was who he said he was. He remembered the stories he had been told as a child, the legend of a being who created the world in his own image, shaped the moon with his own thought, ruled the human race for his entire life before disappearing. Impossible. Madara whispered in shock. Nothing is impossible, my child, said the old hermit, who saw in Madara a reflection of his former son, Indra Tsutsuki. Why do you call me my child? Madara asked, not knowing what this being was doing here. Because all humans are in some way my children. But you more than the others Madara, the old hermit answered with a very thin smile. What do you mean? Nevertheless, the old man did not answer. At least not right away, he seemed to be thinking about what his next words would be. Don't blame Sakura, Hagoromo finally said after a moment of silence. I know you feel betrayed for what she did, but don't hold it against her. It's you isn't it? Madara thought as he heard this request. If he was asking her that then she had been sent by this being. Why did you send her to manipulate me? What do you want from me? Madara was frankly getting annoyed, he was tired of being in the dark, of being in the unknown and especially of being manipulated by so many people. He was used to being in control, not the other way around. I sent her into the past to guide you my child, not to manipulate you. And what I desire is the same as what you desire most within yourself, peace, the old hermit explained before pausing for a moment and looking up at the blue sky. Then he returned his eyes to the Uchiha who was tense at the words of the enigmatic individual in front of him. Hagoromo then added, True peace. Where the cycle of hatred will finally disappear from this world. How do you know she did it for that purpose? Madara asked suspiciously. I am rarely wrong in my choices my child, and while Sakura may have hated you at first, what she just confessed to you is something that is sincere, the hermit reassured. Just as she wishes to bring peace, now she wishes to bring it by being by your side and not by guiding you. So I was not mistaken about her feelings towards me when she saved me from certain death. But then, what are the reasons for her hatred towards me? Asked the dark-haired man, wanting to understand how the young woman could have gone from hatred to other equally opposite feelings. Only she can answer you, my child, he replied calmly, leaving Madara without answers once again. Madara was not discouraged and continued to question himself after this individual's first explanation. In that case, why her? Why me? Come with me, the hermit said, turning his back on the Uchiha and walking slowly across the meadow. It would have been a perfect opportunity to stab him in the back, but Madara didn't do it. Besides, as strange as it may seem, he began to follow this being who was compared to a god. Ever since the world began, war and the cycle of hatred have been ever-present. For as long as human beings have existed, war and violence have existed. Then one day, a person ate a fruit that gave him the powers of a god. That person was none other than my mother. Your mother. Madara repeated incredulously, stepping over a root in his path. I will not speak her name. But with her powers she did set up a kingdom where all living beings lived in peace. However, circumstances made my brother and I depose her and I was the one who ruled this land. Except I didn't have her omnipotence, the ricket explained, leaving out a lot of information that Madara didn't need to know, for his own safety and for the future of the world. I had two sons, Indra and Azura. One inherited the Sharingan and the other my physical power. They were two opposites, one believed that peace would be achieved through love and the other through strength. As he finished this tirade, the Rikid turned his face slightly towards Madara. I feel like you're describing Hashirama and myself, the Uchiha couldn't help but say as he looked at the Rinnegan man. That's about right, the old hermit admitted before walking around a huge oak tree. When my sons were old enough to succeed me, and mine no longer allowed me to carry the burden, I gave the responsibility to Azura. Unfortunately, there followed a war between my two sons for power. 
one became the leader of the Uchiha clan and the other of the Senja clan. Madara now knew the origin of this endless war between his clan and the Senju clan, it was probably centuries in the past. By some chance that I cannot explain myself, the essence of my two children are always reincarnated to war and perpetuate the cycle of hatred, but with the intention of bringing peace, the hermit continued before being interrupted. Are Hashirama and I the reincarnations of your two sons? Madara asked intuitively. This made the hermit smile as he recognized his eldest son's intelligence and quick thinking through Madara. Exactly, and before Sakura went back in time to change things, it was once again the reincarnation of Azura that won. And in the future, my sons will be reincarnated once again to perpetuate the cycle of hatred. Over and over again, the old hermit said wearily. If you sent Sakura back into the past, it was to stop the cycle of hatred. But what's the point? You yourself say we're doomed to kill each other over and over again until the end of time, Madara asked and stopped walking. They had just reached another clearing on the edge of the mountain. The horizon was most magnificent and lost in an infinity of white snow. The child of prophecy was designated three times in the reincarnation of my son Azura and not once in that of my son Indra. As the world teeters on the brink of destruction in Sakura's time, I think perhaps this child of prophecy resides in you, my child, Hagoromo explained, staring into Madara's eyes. After all, for all these centuries, the world had been ruled only by war because the world had always been too soft. No one had really had the guts to impose a lasting peace. Why didn't you intervene in our fight between Hashirama and myself, then? If you are able to defy the notions of time, why not use that power to impose your peace? Our peace? Madara asked. Because I'm just an arbiter, I won't participate anymore, I've lived my life and it's not my place to tell the world what to do, the hermit explained, looking at the horizon. You are a bit hypocritical in what you say, old man. You say you don't want to tell the world what to do, but you influence the world in the direction that suits you, the dark-haired man remarked sarcastically. Seeing several centuries of war, death and cycles of hatred make you realize that you are never better served than by yourself. So what's wrong with blowing an idea here and there? Asked the Rikid Sinin. H.N. Madara could not help but say, understanding the old man's point of view. There was no harm in guiding someone if it was for their own good. The world needed to be shown the way, a child needed guidance, a shinobi needed to be led. In conclusion, everyone needs to be shown the way on the path of life. Usually I don't interfere, but today was an exception to the rule, just like when I made Sakura sacrifice her entire world for a chance to bring peace, the Rikid continued, trying to soften Madara's heart. He wanted him to understand that this young woman had made the decision to never see her loved ones again, her entire world and her time for a small chance to succeed. But today, I did it for a completely different reason my child. What was that? Madara asked with her arms crossed. Let's just say that some people particularly wanted to talk to you, the old man explained with an enigmatic smile as three small voices shouted from the forest. Oni-san. Those voices. No way. He couldn't believe it, so much so that his heart missed a beat as he immediately turned his head towards them. It was absolutely impossible and yet everything was right in front of him. Madara wondered for a moment if he was in an illusion, but a burst of chakra in his brain confirmed that what he was seeing was indeed there. Three little brunettes in their nine or ten year olds were running towards him with smiles on their faces, while a little further away his brother Izuna was approaching, followed by his mother Yumi Uchiha and his father Taijima Uchiha. Seeing the six of them again had the same effect as the pain he felt the day he unlocked his Mangekyo Sharingan. Seeing them in front of him, he felt distraught as he realized that he was indeed alone in his life. And that this state had lasted for far too long. There was so much he wanted to tell them before they died, so much he wanted to hear from them. But his thoughts were cut off when he felt three pairs of arms around his legs and waist, his brothers were holding him tightly. Madara was slightly speechless and at the same time transfixed by what he was seeing. The emotion was intense and he had to fight to contain his tears. Then a small smile appeared on his lips. Not the usual smile, a smile he'd hardly ever had in his life, the kind you reserve for your immediate family. Madara placed his hands on his brother's hair. 
they were real, though he knew that was physically impossible. But in this moment, the important thing was that they were indeed in front of him. We missed you Oni-san! exclaimed one of the three who had his head buried in Madara's clothes. You too, Madara couldn't help but say, realizing that he was enjoying this hug from his younger brothers very much. When he was younger, he remembered that he had never really had the opportunity to hug them like this, except for Izuna. Indeed, that was the time when he had little time for such things, everything was training in war. Love had no place in this environment. Say Oni-san. When are you coming home with us? Another child asked with a small look on his face. It was a most innocent question and Madara felt his heart clench as he heard it, forcing him to wonder if after life the spirit stopped growing or if it remained as it was when he died. Going home. The Uchiha knew what this place meant, but his time had not yet come to join his younger brothers. He still had so much to do in this world. When I finish what I have to do, Madara replied, thinking of his main goal, peace. When is that? The young boy continued before being interrupted by another family member. Come on boys, give our brother some air, said Izuna who was now facing his older brother. The three little boys let go of Madara before returning to their mother and father. The two shinobi virtuosos looked at each other for a long time, neither one knowing what to say. On the one hand, there was nothing to say and at the same time so much to talk about. Then, after this suspended time, the most natural action to take came, the two brothers embraced each other in a brotherly hug. And in this embrace there was love, longing, regret, sorrow and pain. Don't regret my death brother. Izuna said after a moment. He did not need to hear his elder say a word against him. They were brothers, they had been very close, so Izuna knew exactly what was bothering Madara. He couldn't help but regret not being able to save him from death. Just like he regretted not being able to save his mother or make his father proud. I wish you were here, Madara replied, breaking away from the embrace. Izuna placed her hand on her brother's shoulder with a big smile. I know brother. But one of us has to look out for mother, Izuna reassured him humorously. He had always been like this with Madara, doing everything to make him smile and reassure him that everything would be alright. Hi, you always knew how to take care of mother, Madara admitted, regretting that he hadn't had the opportunity to have more of those moments with his mother. Don't worry brother, she's proud of you, Izuna reassured him before his face slowly became more serious. It was rare to see this man with this expression on his face when he was just with his family. Brother? Madara asked, she could tell Izuna had something on her mind. Just a favor brother, Izuna finally said as she looked into his elder's eyes. Do it, Madara replied, willing to do anything to fulfill his brother's last wish. Tobarama. At the mention of this simple name, Madara's eyes immediately narrowed. He understood by this simple name what his brother was asking of him. No need for more words, Madara was sure of himself. He had wanted to do this for so long that he would take great joy in gutting his brother Izuna's murderer. It will be done. Madara replied, receiving a nod from his brother before he took one step back. And then two to make way for a beautiful woman in her forties, his mother. What to do? What to say? Madara had no idea. After all, he hadn't been trained in how to deal with her feelings. Luckily she made the first move and hugged him with the love of a mother for her son. There were no words, no specific gestures. Just an embrace between a mother and son during which everything was passed from one to the other. Comfort, support, protection, gratitude and above all love. Both had their eyes closed, they were enjoying the moment. Had he been a teenager, Madara would have loathed this embrace. But he was now almost thirty and he finally understood the meaning and importance of such an act. He felt so much love in this gesture that it was disturbing. He realized that no matter what children might do in their lives, mothers would always love them with the unique love that binds a mother to her child. Yumi pulled away slightly from her son who was now a man before looking into his eyes. She had a radiant smile and tears in her eyes. She placed her hand on her son's cheek. You've grown into a beautiful man, Madara, Yumi whispered to his son as she detailed Madara's face from every angle. 
After all, she had died when he was in his late teens and hadn't been able to enjoy watching her son grow into a man. Madara placed his own hand on his mother's which was resting on his cheek and he enjoyed the touch. I'm sorry mother, Madara apologized, still regretting his mother's death. I told you before, Madara, never regret anything, Yumi said with a smile still on her face. Don't regret the dead. Rather pity the living who have to live in this world filled with hate. I know, mother. And Madara. I want you to know that I'm extremely proud of the man you've become, the brunette began, stroking her son's cheek with her thumb. And I know that you are in good hands. How so? Madara asked, not seeing what his mother was getting at. Sakura. You have my approval, she's a wonderful woman and I know she'll make a perfect wife for you son, Yumi explained with a bright smile as she took both of her son's hands in hers. My role as a mother is now complete. My son has found a woman he loves and I know she will make you happy. Madara didn't know how to respond to his mother's admission. A woman he loved. He was still too torn by the feeling of betrayal in his heart. She had dared to lie to him with impunity for almost eight months, and he couldn't ignore that so easily. And this despite the new elements in his possession about Sakura's previous actions against him. But on the other hand, Madara had to admit that if the matriarch of the Uchiha clan gave her blessing it meant a lot, especially in the Sengoku era. Such maternal approval was priceless when it came to a wife. However, the dark-haired man didn't answer anything and enjoyed seeing his mother so happy. After a moment, he felt his mother put something in the palm of his hand. Madara then looked down at the object and it made him slowly open his mouth and widen his eyes. What his mother was giving him was not only of great sentimental value but also traditional. Mother. Are you sure? Madara asked as his gaze shifted from his mother to the object in his hand. I've never been more serious, son, Yumi replied as she closed the dark-haired man's hand, her wedding ring in it. Indeed, it was a tradition in the Uchiha family for the matriarch to give her son her wedding ring when he found his future wife, the one who would in turn take on the role and responsibilities that came with that position. The woman stood on her tiptoes to place a soft kiss on her child's cheek one last time. I love you Madara, Yumi said before stepping back slowly. I love you too mother, Madara whispered as he watched his mother join his brothers as his father walked up. Seeing the man in front of him his eyes immediately narrowed. He showed an implacable look towards the man who had raised him and made him the man he was today. He knew he was far more powerful than his father, but strangely enough he was apprehensive about what his father would say. Like all children, Madara, despite his adulthood, still cared a great deal about what his parents thought of him and especially how his father felt about him. Taijima Uchiha stood for a good minute facing his son with a closed face without saying anything. He seemed to be putting him to the test one last time, even though everything was already clear to him. The former clan leader held out his right arm towards Madara, his hand open as he looked on in surprise. This simple gesture meant so much, especially to Madara. Never had his father shown pride in his children, never had he complimented them. So to see his father extend his hand as an equal disturbed the older boy. However, Madara in turn reached out to shake his father's hand. Their handshake was brief but firm, neither too muscular nor too soft. Through this gesture alone many silent things were exchanged between the two men. I am proud of you my son, Taijima finally said and nothing more was needed for this man. With this sentence he had just done his best. Indeed, for a man of his ilk, showing his feelings was forbidden, so telling his son that he was proud of him was a huge speech. Hearing this one sentence from his father made Madara feel extremely good inside, he had his brother's forgiveness, his mother's approval, and his father's pride. Taijima let go of his hand before stepping back to return to his family. The time for this meeting had come to an end as the members of the Uchiha clan slowly began to disappear. The three little brown boys waved, her brother and mother smiled delicately, and her father nodded approvingly. Then his family disappeared in the wind. Madara remained in this position for quite some time, looking out into the forest at the spot where his family had been just moments before. Had all this really happened or was it a trick of the Rikid Senmin? Was it real? Madara asked uncertainly, though his heart was relieved by this exchange. Who knows? 
Normally one could not bring the dead back to life, but life had taught him that nothing was impossible. Sakura's time travel, the existence of the Rinnegan, the presence of the Rickett Senin, what was bringing the dead back to life compared to all that? Besides, hadn't Tobarama himself developed a resurrection technique? The Edo Tensei had indeed been created by that scum Senju. But today, this family meeting was nothing like that jutsu. For Madara had some sort of proof that his family had been present before him, his mother's ring was still in the palm of his hand. The existence of this object alone proved that Madara had not been dreaming and that he had not been subjected to any illusion technique. You explained why me. But I'd like to know why Sakura. Madara asked again, turning to the hermit. Have you ever met anyone like Sakura in your life, child? Rickett asked with a small smile. The sage already knew the answer without the Uchiha having to answer. Indeed, Madara had to admit that he had never met a woman like that in his life. No. Sakura is the most powerful and capable woman of her time. Just as you are the reincarnation of my son Indra, Sakura is one of the few people who can claim to come close to the power of my sons since the world began, Hagoromo confessed without going into detail. It wasn't his place to reveal the young woman's secrets after all. Madara could only admit this truth, from what little he had seen of the young woman, she was an extraordinary woman in the field of shinobi arts. I understand. And don't forget my child, behind every great man, there is a woman as competent as him, if not more. She often remains in the shadows, but sometimes she steps forward to the man's side when he loves her enough to let her be his equal, the Rickett added, looking Madara in the eye. Like my son Azura, I love my son Indra, and he unfortunately did not have the chance to discover what love was. Was this all premeditated? Madara questioned, still resenting the idea of being manipulated like a puppet and led in someone else's direction. Interpret it the way you mean it, child, the hermit said before stepping towards the dark-haired man. Hold out your right hand palm upwards please. The clan leader who, even though he was suspicious of this individual, could not help but do as he was asked. He held out his right hand palm upwards before the ricket put his own hand on it palm against palm. The latter closed his eyes for a few seconds before finally opening them again. He withdrew his hand and in Madara's palm was now a finjutsu seal glowing slightly blue before turning completely black. What did you do to me? Madara asked, even with his Sharingan activated he couldn't make out the seal on his hand. What you and Sakura hope to accomplish is no small matter, the Rikid began before turning around and heading into the forest slowly. Let's just say that this seal will only activate under certain conditions. Then the creator of the world slowly began to disappear in the same manner as the dark-haired man's parents had a few minutes before, leaving the Uchiha alone behind. Oh, one more thing, the Rikid added, raising his right hand and turning around in profile. Yes. Tell Sakura this the celestial path of the six paths will open up thanks to the symbiosis of the two. After this enigmatic sentence, the Rikid disappeared in a breeze, leaving the leader of the Uchiha clan alone in his thoughts. He finally had the answers to his questions. He was no longer completely in the dark, he now knew what the world expected of him. He didn't like the idea of having been manipulated like this, but he was willing to do anything to obtain this peace, it was ingrained in him. He then channeled Chakra into his legs to return to the one who had changed his life, Sakura. He jumped from tree to tree thinking about everything he had just experienced while clutching that ring in his left hand. After a few minutes he arrived back in front of the house. He could hear light sobbing coming from inside the house. He walked with a sure step towards the window door which had been completely blown out by him. There were shards of glass all over the floor and every step he took made a cracking sound which stopped the sobbing. Entering through the door he found a standing Sakura with a kunai in one hand and a picture frame in the other. Her eyes were reddened and her cheeks were covered in tears. She seemed surprised to see him standing there. Sure, she was surprised, but at the same time she was worried about what he would do with her. Would he try to kill her for daring to manipulate and lie to him? That's why she didn't let her guard down with the kunai, ready to fight for her life if it came to that. Madara continued to walk slowly toward Sakura, still thinking about his mother's words that went round and round in his mind. He had his mother's approval. He stopped just in front of the young woman, 
his gaze locked before he reached out for her kunai. She made no move, allowing him to gently grasp the weapon before dropping it to the ground. Once this was done, he looked into the eyes of the young woman with pink hair. No words were spoken. Only their respective breaths could be slightly perceived. They stared at each other without moving any of their muscles. Then, after an eternity for Sakura, Madara took the first step and took her in his arms. He cradled Sakura's head against his chest before hugging her lovingly, he loved this woman. Chapter 25 Sakura didn't know how to react to the Uchiha's gesture at that very moment. She was enjoying this embrace from the man she loved, but was still afraid of what was to come. She didn't want to lose him and was willing to tell him almost everything about her past if it meant she could keep him with her. She allowed herself a moment of weakness as she buried her face in Madara's clothes. She took a deep breath, intoxicating her senses with his scent. Then the Uchiha gently began to stroke her pink hair in a gesture of comfort. Don't worry, Madara said softly, continuing his movement. I have every reason to worry. I know, Madara added to Sakura who didn't understand what he meant by that. What do you mean? Let's just say that some people opened my eyes and the Rikid Senin's arguments were enough to convince me, the patriarch said and Sakura immediately felt extremely relieved. She no longer had to hide her secret, there was now someone on this earth who shared it with her, someone who would take part in her mission, someone who understood what she was doing. And that was priceless to Sakura. Was it the Rikid Senin's plan to wait until Sakura was born to send her back in time? Was it her destiny to return to that time? Was it her destiny to love and guide this man? Was it for all these reasons that the Rikid Senin had helped her by calming Madara? When Sakura was left by the creator of all things in the Valley of the End, she never thought she would see him again. So Sakura was very surprised to learn that he had spoken with Madara. She thought to herself that maybe she would see him again and he would answer her many questions. Gomen, Sakura whispered, burying her face even deeper into Madara's kimono as her fingers gripped the fabric more tightly. What was that like? Madara asked, he too wanted to apologize, but he couldn't because of his upbringing, and Uchiha never asked for forgiveness. Yet he had reason to, he had destroyed much of the furniture in the room, the doors and windows were in ruins and many cracks were visible on the walls. The future. Sakura questioned unsure of the meaning of the question as she broke away from the brunette's embrace. Hi. Not very exciting, Sakura said before pulling herself completely out of Madara's embrace. She suddenly noticed that it was very cold in the room. And as she looked around, she saw that the door and windows were completely destroyed. As a result, the cold snowy wind was blowing into the house. The pink-haired woman turned her back on Madara before walking towards one of the building's supporting beams. At first glance, the carvings on the beam were decorative, but if you concentrated harder, you could see a series of finjutsu seals. Sakura placed her hand on the beam while channeling a small amount of chakra. After a few seconds, a cloud of smoke appeared, followed by a huge scroll of parchment. Seeing this, Madara realized that she still had many secrets, especially when he saw the huge scroll appear in the young woman's hands. Was it so horrible that you would sacrifice everything? Madara continued as he watched the shinobi place the large scroll on the table in the main room. Opening it, Madara saw one of the greatest finjutsu formulas he had ever seen in his life, if not the greatest. A fanatic was directing the moon at the earth. Despite winning the Fourth Great Shinobi War, the cycle of hatred was slowly taking its place once again, Sakura said wearily as many memories came flooding back to her. But she stopped her train of thought when she heard the brunette exclaim. The Fourth Great War. Madara repeated with surprise. You mean the Shinobi world has only known armed conflict? No one has sought peace in the world. Even in your future. Sakura was surprised that he could have this reaction, what did he think? Did he think that if she hadn't intervened to save him from death, the world as he left it would have been peaceful indefinitely? She hesitated for a moment and then added. Right now we are living through the first great shinobi war the world has ever known and indeed. Before the Rikid Senin brought me back into the past, I had participated in the fourth great war and we were going to face an enemy of earth again. But that would take far too long to explain the young woman paused before lowering her head to the open scroll before her. 
Tell me about it, Madara asked in a calm voice as Sakura placed her hand in the center of the Finjutsu formula. She turned her gaze to the man she loved and hesitated until he added the words, please. What exactly do you want to know? Sakura finally gave in as another puff of smoke emerged this time from the scroll. Once dispersed, the smoke gave way to a large pile of neatly arranged planks, complete with nails. He thought for a moment as she picked up some boards and moved towards one of the windows. She laid out the first wooden plank before driving in an iron nail. With the strength of her fingers alone. As if it were the simplest and most natural thing to do. The strength of this woman will never cease to impress him. Tell me about your life's journey, Madara asked as he picked up some boards and placed them next to the young woman. Sakura sighed slightly as she thought about her past life, finding it nothing exciting. She grabbed a new board and placed it below the previous one. I was born in Kanoha a few years after the Third Great Shinobi War. I've lived most of my life in peacetime and I come from a civilian family, Sakura began to tell the story, hammering in a nail with her thumb again. The ninja system allowed civilians to become shinobi? Madara asked in complete surprise. The shinobi education system has evolved over the years, the board of directors and the military as well, leading to a civilian board within any organization, Sakura answered accompanied by the sound of iron piercing wood. The many deaths from the previous wars meant that the shinobi clans were weakened and the village agreed to have civilians in its ranks. I'm inclined to say it's not a good idea to give a civilian the opportunity to become a shinobi, Madara remarked as he returned to pick up some more boards. But from what you say, you yourself come from a civilian family and yet you are an accomplished shinobi. Yes, and I'm still wondering myself how I managed to survive my first mission outside the village, Sakura admitted with another sigh. She loathed the child she'd been, useless, childish, carefree. We were at peace, a certain balance was in place, so I grew up safe and secure and I was a child. What I would call militarily useless. Looking at you today I can hardly believe what you're describing, said Madara who had grabbed a broom to gather the snow inside the house. Let's just say that life has made me grow up. Anyway, the picture you found in my bedside table is my team, Sakura continued as she was patching a second window. This is Sasuke, Naruto and Kakashi, they were three of the most precious people in my heart. As she said this, Sakura had a sweet smile on her face. She remembered their experiences, their sharing, their training, and everything they had gone through together. Was it the Sasuke who hurt you? Madara asked, deep down he knew it was. Hi. I loved him when we were children. I loved him when we were teenagers and I loved him when we were young adults. But all I got in return was scorn, insults, and a few attempts on my life, Sakura explained, realizing that it was less painful to know that Sasuke didn't love her. Probably because her heart was now set on Madara. But I can understand that he had some psychological problems considering what he went through as a child. Bullshit. Madara raged, feeling murderous towards this Sasuke for daring to hurt the woman he loved. Nothing justifies such actions. Even though we are soldiers, our clan has always been for the protection of our own. Even if my clan was blind to the Senju clan, if there is still the Uchiha clan present in your time, they probably consider Kanoha their home. Sakura stopped what she was doing before looking at Madara. She was thinking about how she would turn her next sentence. Let's just say that in my time, the Uchiha clan was only two members, Sasuke and his brother Itachi, she finally said and let the information work its way into the brunette's mind. How could my clan be reduced to only two members? Two children on top of that I presume? Madara scoffed as Sakura took a deep breath before continuing. Because you plotted and manipulated your own clan in the shadows to rise up against Kanoha. You manipulated and convinced a third party to attack the village of Kanoha with the Kaibi and this caused suspicion and fear towards the Uchiha clan. A civil war was about to break out as the Third Great Shinobi War had just ended. So. So. Then what? Madara asked impatiently, wanting to know what his potential future self had done to his own clan. So it was decided that your clan had to go, it was thus decimated leaving only two brothers. Itachi who was designated as Nuke Nin for his actions, and his younger brother Sasuke. 
He had to live with the loss of his clan and the trauma of an illusion perpetuated by his brothers Tsukuyami that forced him to live that fateful night over and over again, Sakura explained, knowing what she was talking about. After all, as Tsunade Senju's apprentice, she had had access to the medical records of almost every patient. And since Tsunade was also Hokage at the time, the young woman had been able to ask her about the Uchiha clan massacre. I understand, Madara said after a moment. He was thinking about why he had acted the way he did, and thought that if he hadn't had Sakura to change him, he probably would have done everything she had just told him. Out of revenge, out of hatred. I understand better how you know so much about the Sharingan. Having one of the two survivors of that massacre on your team and falling in love with him led you to learn about our clan and the capabilities of our jutsu. Yes, I had to understand why Sasuke was so eager for revenge. Besides, he and Itachi were the only ones to have access to the Manjiki Sharingan, just like you and your brother. Sasuke even had access to the eternal Manjiki Sharingan, so it's only natural that I know about your skills, Sakura admitted as she had seen this jutsu in action more than once. Still, that doesn't explain how you can resist the illusions of my pupillary power, the dark-haired man remarked, and all he got in response was an index finger pointing at Sakura's forehead seal. Finjutsu is extremely powerful when used in the right way, Sakura explained after she had finished plugging the second window. Madara had to be content with this answer, this woman was still full of mysteries and according to him, the Finjutsu alone could not explain this resistance. Not even the great Mito Uzumaki possessed such power. Still, the dark-haired man considered this answer sufficient for the moment. He encouraged the pink-haired woman with a slight shake of his head to continue her story. Then, in my team, you have Naruto Uzumaki, Jinshiriki of Kaibi no Yoko, the young woman began before being interrupted by a remark from the Uchiha. Kanoha has once again entrusted an Uzumaki to be the host of this fox demon. I guess so, their clan members are the most capable of handling such power, the young woman added. Is that why he wears such a hideous outfit, like a firefly in the middle of the night? Madara asked and Sakura couldn't help but laugh at the comparison. She had to admit that it felt good to laugh like that, and at the same time it helped lighten the mood of the house. It's true that he had deplorable taste in clothing, but he was a great friend and a great shinobi, Sakura said softly, acknowledging that even though she may have hated Naruto as a child, she had grown to love the boy like a brother. I think of him as the brother I couldn't have our early days as aspiring ninja were not easy. Sasuke and Naruto were rivals and I constantly wanted to gut them both for acting like immature jerks, but hey, I wasn't any better on my own. I was just a girl in love with a dark-haired guy who didn't know what being a shinobi really meant, Sakura added as she picked up the door that had been knocked off by Madara's shockwave anyway. They were like my family, then we have our sensei, Hitaki Kakashi no Sharingan, the man of a thousand techniques and current Rokudame Hokage. He doesn't look anything like an Uchiha, Madara said with a frown as he held the door so Sakura could reattach it properly. Do you remember the conversation about the eye transplant we had? The young woman asked and Madara nodded. During a mission in the Third War, his teammate on the verge of death gave him his Sharingan. H.N. said Madara, who felt it was sacrilege for a non-Uchiha to have this precious jutsu. Many Uchiha thought he didn't deserve such a privilege. Isn't that what you think Madara-san? She asked with a slight smirk but without giving him the chance to answer. He was nonetheless one of the greatest shinobi of his time without even using his Sharingan, the young woman continued, gently moving the door to see if it was properly set up. Anyway, much of my early teenage years were governed by small missions and sloppy training. Until the day Kanoha was invaded by Oto no Kuni and Kaze no Kuni. Oto no Kuni. A new village that had moved into the rice country and taken over, Sakura explained, forgetting that the village didn't exist at the time. We repelled that invasion and it opened my eyes, especially when Sasuke deserted the village to get more power. More power. Madara repeated skeptically. Kanoha is currently known as the most powerful village, is that still the case in your time? Yes, it is. Then why is this bungling idiot deserting the village to gain power if his village is the most powerful of all? Madara asked, not understanding why the young Uchiha would choose this path. To put it simply, a man marked him with a finjutsu that affects the host's subconscious like a drug. 
Thus, this man's words became the equivalent of Rikid, Sakura explained, having had the opportunity to study Orochimaru's cursed seal. As he grew older, Sasuke managed to get rid of it and kill its owner. Sharingan. Yes, I agree with you, because he was an Uchiha he was able to resist and defeat that curse, Sakura agreed as she closed the last window in the room. All this to say that my first teammate deserted the village in the second, Naruto, left with another ninja who was more likely to train him because he was a Jinshriki and because he had promised to bring Sasuke back to the village. So, I found myself without a team and I had to find a master to train me. And I was lucky enough to receive the teachings of the most powerful ninja doctor. Sometimes all it takes is one click for our lives to change, Madara said, remembering how it had only taken one small event for his life to change completely. Did the Uzumaki keep his word? In a way. But it took a lot of painful events. But this time was necessary for me to train relentlessly. Oh yes, I trained like never before in many areas and for many years. My intelligence, my self-taughtness, plus having a good master made me a very good person very quickly, Sakura said as she picked up the books and scrolls from the floor and placed them on her desk. Of course I was far from being a shinobi of your caliber and I'm still far from it. That's not what the Rikid Senin said, Madara retorted, remembering the words he had used. How so? I quote, Sakura is one of the few people who can claim to come close to the power of my sons since the world began, Madara recited the creator's words word for word. Sakura couldn't help but blush at such a compliment. So don't devalue yourself Sakura-san, for to me you are a very talented person. Barigato. Please, Madara said as Sakura picked up an inkwell that had survived the shock, as well as a paintbrush before heading for a window. Then the Uchiha remembered something else. By the way. The Rikid Senin asked me to give you a message. I am listening. The celestial voice of the six paths will open through the symbiosis of the two, Madara recited, having absolutely no idea what that sentence meant. He hoped Sakura would enlighten him on it. Any idea what he meant by that? Absolutely not, Sakura admitted as she pondered the meaning of the phrase. The heavenly voice. What does he mean by that? Well, that will come to you in time. But please continue your story, Madara added, snapping the young woman out of her thoughts. The years passed and the beginnings of the Fourth Great Shinobi War approached. It was around this time that Sasuke returned to the village, Sakura said before painting a formula for Finjutsu on the wooden boards. But his return was not a smooth one as he and Naruto clashed once again in a huge fight. Hearing Sakura's explanation, Madara finally wondered if the two boys were not the reincarnations of Indra and Ashura, just as he and Hashirama were. I assume that if you knew the Rikid Senin, he told you part of his story, said the dark-haired man. The cycle of hatred? Sakura asked, wanting to make sure they were talking about the same thing. A slight nod from the man reassured Sakura. They are just like you and Hashirama, the reincarnations of Indra and Azura Tsutsuki. With that added fact, Madara could see the missing pieces of the puzzle falling into place, but if the two boys were the reincarnations that meant. Sakura-san, there's something that's bothering me. Well, several things. What is it? You said the Fourth Great War was about to begin. But. Who against who? Madara asked curiously. Finn, Sakura said, sealing her formula to further insulate the window. Tomorrow she would go to the village for help in repairing the damage to her house, but in the meantime this would do. However, Sakura didn't answer the brunette's question, she was thinking back to the last war. Sakura-san. The whole world. Against you, Sakura announced, revealing one of the most dangerous pieces of information she had. The latter was surprised by such a fact, especially since he was 10,000 leagues away from imagining himself capable of declaring war on the whole world. Why? For peace. But I would have been 110 years old, Madara remarked, quickly doing the math in his head. He would have been an old man and as he did so, a detail occurred to him. If Naruto and Sasuke are the reincarnations of Indra and Azura, the previous host must first die to be reincarnated. Now, you said I went against the whole world in the Fourth Great Shinobi War, Madara explained, trying to understand the logic in this. 
Do you remember that creature before I intervened at the Valley of the End? Sakura asked as she walked to the last window. Yes, I do. His name was Black Zetsu and he was the one who normally saved you from death. Except. He had a completely different purpose in saving your life than I did, Sakura continued before sealing the wood in front of her. He subtly manipulated you into setting up a world of eternal illusion. But there is a but. Isn't there? Madara surmised as he hung on Sakura's every word. Yes, to accomplish such a genjutsu, certain conditions had to be met, and those conditions released the wicked Senin's mother, his true purpose. The young woman admitted as she remembered Madara having his chest pierced by Zetsu, bringing Kagaya Tsutsuki back. He played everyone, including you, and you lost your life, bringing back that woman. Sasuke, Naruto, Kakashi and I managed to reseal the mother of the wicked Senin, just as we had done in the past. Madara was completely silent upon hearing this. He didn't expect to end up like this and be manipulated in this way. But to answer your question, you died of old age and someone who could bring the dead back to life brought you back during the war. I don't know if that was part of your plan at the time, Sakura replied, not knowing the exact intentions of the Madara of her future, only Abito and Black Zetsu knew. I didn't think my life would be reduced to this. To lose my family, to lose my clan, to lose my village and my life like this, Madara said as he sat in a chair with his arms crossed. I understand how you feel, Sakura said before moving towards the fireplace in the room. How? I lost my family, I lost my friends to bring true peace and I saw my village completely annihilated by one man. Sakura explained as she recalled that fateful day when Pain channeled his ultimate technique, leveling Kanoha from the face of the earth. She remembered that light, that breath, that power. How did he manage such an act? Madara asked curiously, knowing that he himself had jutsu capable of accomplishing this kind of damage. He wasn't really alone. They. He. Sakura began before anything else came to mind. Her eyes widened, her mouth parted slightly as she realized her own sentence as well as her thoughts. Sakura dropped the wooden logs in her hands before running at full speed into what was left of her bookcase. It was lucky that the cabinet was attached to the wall of the house and that many of the books were still in place. She grabbed a specific book among many others as she remembered who Pain was at the base, Akatsuki leader, Uchiha Madara's puppet and above all the possessor of the Rinnegan implanted by Madara himself when he was a child. Thanks to this jutsu he had access to the six deva paths of the Rikid Senin. His ward had allowed him to create six individuals who each had the powers dispatched from the six paths granted by the Rinnegan. With her knowledge, and especially as she recalled the past, Sakura remembered that Madara had bragged about unlocking the Rinnegan while he was on his deathbed. Except that the Rinnegan was not an evolution of the Sharingan, but a symbiosis. Sakura opened the compartment book to the only page that could be turned to find a vial. She had placed it there eight months ago without really knowing what to do with it. The vial was covered with a finjutsu seal to keep the inside in stasis, preventing the contents from aging in necrosis. She lifted the container into the air, allowing light to shine through, the flesh was still intact. What is happening to you? Madara asked, sensing the young woman's excitement and adrenaline. What is this? This? That's the answer to Tsutsuki-sama's sentence. Sakura replied as she looked at the vial in her hands. The Celestial Voice of the Six Paths The Rinnegan of the Rikid Senin will be obtained through the symbiosis of the two. Thinking this, Sakura stared into Madara's eyes. She remembered the Uchiha of the future, the one who had a Hashirama face implanted in the location of his heart. This had been possible because he had torn off a piece of his rival's flesh at the Valley of the End. And it was thanks to this piece of flesh that Madara was able to do this implantation. And through this, his body underwent a symbiosis of the two. The cells of the two reincarnations of the Rikid Senin were reunited in a single body. And thanks to this, the Rinnegan could appear. What's in this vial? Asked the dark-haired man who could not see well inside the glass container. Do you trust me? Sakura asked, intending to do the unthinkable. She was aiming to give the most powerful weapon to the man who was potentially the most dangerous to the balance of the elemental nations. Madara thought for a few seconds before giving an answer. 
Yes. Raise the lock of hair over your right eye Madara-san, the young woman asked before pouring her chakra over the central kanji of the formula written on the vial. A slight smoke rose from the glass before Sakura opened the vial and poured the small mass of flesh into the palm of her right hand. It would be so easy, the reincarnations of Indra and Azura had DNA from someone who had given birth to them. The two DNAs would mix with ease and having already done regeneration on Madara, she knew she didn't need many cells to create the Rinnegan. Madara-san. Sakura hesitated as her hand lay flat against the brunette's right eye. Yes. Promise me you'll never use what I'm about to give you to enslave the world, Sakura pleaded, not wanting this man she loved with all her being to become the Madara she had known. Why do you ask? Madara inquired, wondering if she was referring to what had happened in her future. Because I don't want you to become that man I fought in the Fourth Great Shinobi War, Sakura said as a tear rolled down her cheek. Is that why you hated me when we first met? Madara asked more in affirmation than in real questioning. The young woman didn't answer verbally but nodded softly before adding anyway. I hated that psychopathic individual who was willing to do anything for his goal. And who killed thousands of people to achieve it. There was a silence between the two protagonists, where one waited with her hand on the other's face while the latter was thinking about the young woman's words. Madara wanted to bring peace and he was willing to do anything to achieve it, it was something he already was. But his thoughts turned to his recent meeting with the wicked Sennin, as well as his fate, his family, and how he felt about the woman in front of him. She was waiting for an answer from him, for her to promise not to become the man she described. Madara took hold of the hand on his face and withdrew it. He gently stroked Sakura's soft skin with his thumb before moving closer to her. I don't know what I was like in your future Sakura-san, but I know that compared to him, I have something he couldn't possibly have, Madara said as he moved a little closer. His jet black eyes were locked in Sakura's emerald ones, and she blushed at their proximity. What was that? Sakura whispered, her heart racing and her breathing increasing as Madara brought his face closer to her. You, Madara whispered before gently placing his lips on Sakura's in a soft kiss. It was sweet, pleasurable, intense, and so inexplicable for both lovers. Sakura had already kissed Naruto to save his life when his beach was extracted, she had also kissed Ino to practice doing it well when they were very young and carefree. But she had never kissed a man with desire, with love and she literally melted by this simple contact of Madara. This kiss lasted a few seconds before breaking for half a second to make way for a second one that was slightly more daring than the previous one. Madara had never been delicate with a woman. But at the same time, he had never felt this way when kissing a woman in the past. It had always been empty, hollow, uninteresting. Whereas now, he could feel his body vibrating, his heart pounding, his mind sighing with complacency and satisfaction at the gentle touch. By this outburst of sensation in his body, Madara understood what his mother meant about knowing when he would find the woman who would fill him with happiness. He was now convinced that he was in love with Sakura Haruno and that he intended to make her his wife. He placed his left hand on her cheek and deepened the kiss a little more as their lips gently parted. The simple yet passionate kiss conveyed so much emotion that Sakura couldn't hold back a slight moan. And as all things must come to an end, Madara interrupted their first kiss after a while. Their hearts were pounding, their breaths were slightly jerky, and as Sakura opened her eyes, she looked into the Uchiha's. I unfortunately cannot promise you such a thing Sakura-san, Madara began in a deep, gravely voice. What we're doing right now is, in a way, a subjugation of the world. But I can at least promise you this, I want you by my side to bring true peace. Sakura was reassured, but at the same time worried. She was afraid he would do something irreparable in the future like he had done in his time, but at the same time, she trusted the wicked Sennin. More importantly, she trusted her heart. Sakura felt like she was back in her teens, she blushed under the intensity of the kiss they had exchanged, of the dark-haired man's voice as well as their closeness. And besides, unlike my other self from your future, we have your knowledge of the future, Madara remarked as he gently pulled away from Sakura. And that is the most powerful weapon in our project. Close your right eye, Sakura asked after she had regained her senses. 
Madara complied and closed his right eye while holding his lock of hair before feeling her gentle hand on his face. He watched as she closed her eyes to concentrate and then saw both her hands light up with green chakra. She was analyzing the DNA structure of Hashirama Senju's flesh and how she could add it to Madara's. Sakura realized that it was much simpler than she thought. The further she went into her genetic modification process, the more the mass of flesh in her hand diminished, until it disappeared altogether. As Naruto had said, regeneration was based on the formula of the body, and the two bodies were in a way the children of the Rikid Senin. So these mixed easily with each other and gradually Madara's Jedi disappeared. A purple-gray color slowly began to appear and concentric lines gradually appeared until the legendary Rinnegan was left behind. Suddenly, Madara's eyes widened. All of a sudden he had a flood of information invading his mind and brain. Memories that didn't belong to him were surfacing in his head, knowledge that wasn't his to add to his own. New abilities he had never heard of suddenly seemed to be innate to him and most importantly. His understanding of the world changed. Sakura had removed her hand almost thirty seconds ago and was looking at Madara who seemed completely shocked. She went to grab a small mirror and held it up to the dark-haired man who looked at his reflection and especially at the new pupil in his right eye. You now have the legendary Rinnegan. Chapter 26 Day 245 Tobarama Senju, the current Naidame Hokage of Kanoha no Sato was currently overlooking a large plane with his eyes. He had his arms crossed as he was thinking at full speed. Since the disappearance of his brother Hashirama Senju, Tobarama Senju had become the most powerful shinobi of all the elemental nations that no one could expect to defeat in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Just like his brother, Tobarama was considered a shinobi god. But, unlike his brother who had an unrivaled brute strength, Tobarama was the most intelligent being of all time. Even in the Fourth Great Shinobi War, no one matched his intellect. After all, he was a virtuoso at everything he did. He was the greatest creator of ninjutsu techniques of all time and mastered them with such ease that no hand signals were needed to perform them. His mastery of the five elements of chakra made him a completely versatile and dangerous ninja, but his reputation lay in the art of Suetan. Indeed, he was able to create water out of the air, gathering water particles, no matter how small. But ninjutsu was not his only strength. Quite the contrary. He was one of the greatest fighters in kenjutsu, the art of sword fighting. And hardly anyone in the world could match him because of his greatest secret. He was with Ashina Uzumaki, the greatest genius of finjutsu. His most deadly technique was his teleportation time finjutsu which allowed him to beat almost anyone. This same technique would be improved in the future by the Yandame Hokage. All his skills, plus his intelligence, made Tobarama Senju not only a shinobi, but also an extremely dangerous Hokage. And it was because of all his qualities that Tobarama was currently standing in front of this huge plane. For weeks, his troops, as well as his spies, had been giving him reports of an imminent invasion planned by their enemies. So, like the military genius that he was, Tobarama acted accordingly, he prepared himself. He made sure that his country went fishing for information without skimping on means or unscrupulous methods to gather the information he needed. He organized several assassinations to get the information that would allow him to win the first battle. In addition to all his other qualities, Tobarama also had something else that gave him a significant advantage over his opponents, he was the most skilled sensory ninja of all time. His training and dedication to this discipline made him impossible to ambush. His sensory abilities were so acute that he could detect an army approaching his position from several kilometers away. That was why he had ordered his troops to stand back, hidden in the trees, waiting for the next orders. These soon arrived. Everyone to their posts, Tobarama said without uncrossing his arms to his subordinate. Hi, Hokage-sama, Hiruzen Sarutobi replied before jumping up into the trees behind him to give the next orders. To tell the truth, it had been two days since Tobarama had stood in this very spot, staring off into the horizon. He had only stopped to stare ahead to eat or go to the toilet, but that was all. He was not sleeping, not resting. And his troops wondered how he did it and above all, what he was doing waiting like that. But no one dared say anything to him, he was after all their Hokage. There you are, Tobarama said, 
squinting as the first soldiers advanced into the distance. There were nearly 600 soldiers advancing in military line towards them. They weren't all shinobi, but half of them seemed to have mastered the ninja arts because of their chakra reserves. Then suddenly, the troops began to charge in his direction, a sensory shinobi had just spotted him. But at the same time, he had done everything to be detected. As the shinobi quickly approached, Tobarama could see if his information was correct. Kaze no kuni. Suchi no kuni. TCH. Tobarama said in disgust as he recognized the forehead bands of his enemies as the entire army was scattered across the plain before him. He would not make the same mistakes as his brother, he would not be as tender, he would be without pity. Out of love for his brother, Tobarama had not objected when Hashirama had given beige to other nations as a sign of good faith. But for him, it was the same thing as giving a dagger to the enemy so that he could pierce you with it. And it was when he saw these shinobi in front of him that he knew it had been a mistake to have been generous with them. Tobarama Senju was a mixture of Hashirama and Madara, and even if it cost him to admit it, he agreed with the Uchiha's proposal. He would have agreed to it without batting an eyelid, subdue this world before it subdues you. The first shinobi would be upon him in less than twenty seconds, but Tobarama didn't seem the least bit perturbed by that. He swept his gaze over the plain, taking a last look at the work he had been preparing for two days. The Naidame Hokage uncrossed his arms before placing his right hand in the sign of the ram. As he did so, the air in the entire area rapidly charged with chakra accompanied by a strong smell of sulfur as everyone's hair stood on end at such a concentration of energy. Katsu! Tobarama shouted. It was then that several thousand explosive tags that the Hokage had placed during those two days in the plane, exploded at the same time. The explosion was felt for dozens of kilometers and the sound that resulted was frightening. The blast uprooted many trees and the meadow, which was initially pleasant to look at, was now a field of ruins. In the blink of an eye, Tobarama had just killed more than 600 human beings without any effort and above all without mercy. Day 250 For a little more than a month, this group of more than a thousand inhabitants had been moving towards Ta no Kuni. And more particularly in the direction of Haiwa, the city where they would be safe and could live in peace. Strangely and surprisingly, the huge caravan had not encountered anyone during their entire journey. There were no wild animals, no souls living on their way. No banditry, no shinobi. Nothing. Many thought that good fortune was smiling on them, others said that the two shinobi who had saved them from the invaders were around to protect them. But the reality was quite different and no one knew. Every ten seconds, the little stick in the child's cloth that a woman in the middle of this caravan was carrying emitted a wave of chakra mixed with a genjutsu. It was a creation of sakuras with the help of Madara. This formula of finjutsu allowed the genjutsu created by Madara to be spread by a chakra wave to affect everyone around. Anyone touched by this illusion from a mile away would feel the irresistible urge to change direction without understanding why. Furthermore, the genjutsu had a double effect, it created a chameleon effect to the group. And thanks to it, the thousand travelers were invisible to the world as they came into view of Haiwa in the middle of the valley. The woman Sakura had spoken to and entrusted with the stick was playing with her child, who was chirping adorably in her arms. As she looked out over the large city that appeared before her, she remembered the pink-haired woman's words. Once you get close to Haiwa, throw that stick to the ground and break it. So the brunette plunged her hand into the cloth that was wrapping her baby and a few seconds later pulled out the famous little wooden stick with dozens of kanji written on it. It seemed to the young woman that from time to time, the writing became slightly shiny. But it was probably her imagination linked to the swinging of her child in her arms. In any case, the woman looked straight ahead to see the huge valley on the horizon, the mountains surrounding the place and the sumptuous city that was being built. There were huge walls at various heights, proof that it was under construction, while buildings seemed to have been built higher up on the mountainside. And it was while observing all this that she threw the stick to the ground before crushing it with her foot. The wood selected for its manufacture was rather fragile, and the force of the blow was sufficient to break the object into several pieces. While the stick was breaking on the ground, a daily meeting was taking place in the council room with the daimi of Ta no Kuni and a new person to this city, Matsuo. 
Matsuo was the first shinobi to join the true peace that the people of the rice country wanted to bring. He was a man in his thirties but looked much older than his age due to the vagaries of being a shinobi. Half of his left face was covered with a scar that continued down his neck and seemed to continue to the base of his shoulder. It was a right ton technique that inflicted this battle scar on him in addition to causing him to lose the sight in his left eye. He had received this injury for disobeying a direct order from his superior. He had been ordered to kill a child in order to set an example to an enemy clan shortly after the provincial wars. Except that Matsuo also had a young son and he could not bring himself to do this, so he refused. In response, he received this scar and his son was killed to set an example of what happened to those who refused to follow orders. From that day on, Matsuo was a deserter from Tsuchi no Kuni. So when he met Uchiha Madara who explained his plan to bring true peace to this rotten world, Matsuo immediately accepted. On the central coffee table was a map of the land of Ta no Kuni and the new Haiwa ninja was pointing to a location to the north. I dismantled a bandit camp there, after extracting information from the one in command, I discovered that there was a network in place, the dark-haired man with the blue-gray eye explained. Any idea how big the network is? Suzuki asked the shinobi. Bigger than we think, but that shouldn't be a problem for me Suzuki-san, the shinobi replied before continuing. Besides, there seems to be an outpost further north. I think he's using one of the rice warehouses in one of the rice fields Tsubasa controls. What? Tsubasa exclaimed in surprise. Daimi-sama, I assure you that I know of no such dealings in any of my properties. Is there anything other than your rice field in this direction? Matsuo continued, indicating another point on the map. Technically it's one of the middle rice fields, so it's a small village with no more than fifty inhabitants, Tsubasa replied thoughtfully. Daimi-sama, I assure you. I believe you, Tsubasa, Hashiba reassured him, raising his hand. Do you need troops to settle this matter? No. Just. Do you have any enemies from the old era? Matsuo asked casually, and he saw in the Daimi's eyes his answer. My enemies are no longer of this world. Said Hashiba, who with his brother-in-arms Suzuki had eradicated all his enemies in order to take control of Ta no Kuni. Descendants included. Even though he wanted peace, Hashiba was a man of the old days and was extremely cautious. He knew how to be ruthless when necessary. Well, if you allow me. Suddenly, Matsuo stopped talking and straightened his head in the direction of the window. His face had closed, he had frowned slightly because of a sensation. He was sure that a burst of chakra had just occurred. Is something wrong? Suzuki asked as he saw the man staring out the window. I hope not, answered Matsuo before getting up. I'd rather have it straight. If you'll excuse me. The man stood up before heading for the exit. Well, Tanaka, what's next in the meeting? Asked the daimi, turning his head towards his scribe. Your inventors seem to have developed a new defense system that they claim is revolutionary and one of them wishes to present it to you, Tanaka explained, reading his papers. Guards. Show him in, Hashiba continued to one of the guards who was listening to the conversation at all times. The man turned around and opened the door, calling for someone to come in. Two people came through the doors of the meeting room. An elderly person who seemed to be the same age as Rumaji and who walked with difficulty. And a little boy in his late teens carrying a wooden crate. My lords, said the man in a tired voice before speaking to the boy. Put it down there my boy and come out. The boy did as he was told before hurrying out quickly. The old man knelt down with difficulty, but no one rushed him, the elderly were respected in those days. My lords, I come to you at the request of Daiki-sama who asked us to improve your defensive system. And so it is, the old man explained before taking out several objects from the wooden crate as well as some models, toys. Define defensive, demanded Suzuki, who wanted to know if this invention could be used to defend oneself while creating damage in the enemy's ranks. Defense by damage, replied the ancestor, assembling two models into one. His answer could only suit the people around the table. You have our full attention, Hashiba continued. I present to you, the trebuchet, said the old man, pointing to a miniature siege weapon. 
With this siege weapon you will be able to defend the city for several hundred meters to do significant damage to property or people. Doesn't it seem a bit limited by the direction? Suzuki asked, stroking his beard. We have also thought about this problem. All we have to do is place these siege engines on platforms that can be rotated, allowing us to point the trebuchet in the desired direction. Explained the man, gently turning the wooden support, showing everyone that the machine could be rotated. How does it work? Intervened Ramaji. You place the projectile at the base between a hundred kilo and a thousand kilo maximum. Whether it's a rock, a machine gun container, etc. Then you calculate the trajectory before letting the magic of the counterweights work. Rate of fire. Two shots per hour, three if there are enough manpower. But each shot will be deadly devastating, the man replied as the council looked on before being suddenly interrupted. My lords. Said one of the guards, storming in without knocking. His fellow guards had drawn their weapons at such an intrusion. The guard who had just stormed in immediately dropped to one knee in submission. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there are newcomers. Yes, and? It's not the first time that newcomers have come to us, said Hashiba, who was used to seeing newcomers by now. This time it's different Daimisama. There are more than a thousand of them. The guard added, and this sent a shock through the room. A thousand? It was something huge, unbelievable. There had been single people, families, even dozens. But a thousand? Daiki? Yes father? The man concerned replied immediately, sensing in his father's voice the seriousness of a leader who should not be messed with. I am charging you with seeing to it that the architects expand the city in a different way and quickly. At this rate we will have to build several levels of wall. Ramaji, I'll leave you to see with our guest about the installation of this new invention. Suzuki. With me. Said Hashiba Shta, ending the meeting faster than expected. Day 270. To the north. A large chakra source and several smaller ones, Madara announced to Sakura. The two of them began to move quickly towards the north without concealing their presence. Where the two shinobi were headed, many of the leaf ninja had just died against a most unique man. He was standing in the middle of a very small clearing, corpses all around him, with the ground dotted with craters. In his right hand he held the neck of his last opponent, slowly and surely strangling him as he went. Why? The victim asked, gasping for air. Hmm. Why attack our borders? Asked the umbu who had been sent with a team to investigate the various attacks within Hai no Kuni itself. Even though war had been declared, many attacks were being perpetuated within their own country. What do you have to gain? You seem very curious, little shinobi, said the man who wore a mask covering half his face and the entirety of his neck. The top of his clothes were completely shredded and his skin was visible, it was dotted with scars. The scars, so many of them, could only raise the question, how could he still be alive? Why? Asked the Umbu captain once again, feeling his last strength leave him as the individual's grip tightened around his neck. HMPF. Fighting Shinobi this week isn't going to get me much money, said the man who had mastered an Umbu force without much difficulty. Berg, the leaf ninja, complained as he tried to undo that grip around his neck. He couldn't breathe and darkness was surrounding him. Finally, with a wave of his hand, the man in the middle of the clearing broke the neck of the last of his opponents before dropping him to the ground. Then suddenly he turned his head to the right, two huge sources of chakra were approaching. He didn't have time to react as the two people were landing in the clearing. Kakuzu. Madara said, completely surprised to see this ninja in front of him. He still remembered his fight with this man. The man had been given a contract to try and kill him, to no avail. I seem to have killed you. Madara was certain, in his memories Kakuzu was indeed killed by his hand and he had even checked his pulse to be sure. It seems to me that the great Uchiha Madara has also been declared dead, Kakuzu retorted, not expecting to meet such a shinobi. He was actually thinking of a plan to escape. He knew he didn't stand a chance against him, especially since there was someone else in his company. Times are changing, Madara replied and reached for the hilt of his sword. Although I wonder how you managed to get out of the fingers of death, 
it doesn't change the fact that I'm going to make sure you stay dead. Wait. Sakura said in a loud voice as she placed her arm in front of Madara. It was the very first time the young woman had intervened in Madara's conversation in this way, and particularly to tell him to stop. The Uchiha very slowly turned his gaze to the woman he loved and wondered what she was playing at. This was not the kind of individual one should joke around with. Oh, the great Uchiha Madara getting his mouth shut by a woman, Kakuzu scoffed with a mocking smile under his mask. I never thought I'd ever see that. If you want your immortality to continue, you should shut up too Kakuzu, Sakura retorted as she unfolded her killing intent. By this wave of chakra, Kakuzu understood that she was just as dangerous as the Uchiha. But more importantly, she seemed to know his secret of immortality. No one in the world knew that he had gained immortality by stealing a technique forbidden in the land of stunts. He squinted dangerously at the woman, exhaled loudly in the many hearts in his body raced. He wanted to kill this woman to find out about his immortality, but he couldn't do it with two against one. Who are you? Kakuzu spat coldly, he had never felt so vulnerable in his life. His immortality was his trump card and it had saved his life twice. Against Hashirama Senju and against Uchiha Madara. Moreover, without his control, many threads began to emerge from his body. Madara instantly drew his sword while activating his Sharingan. Indeed, he had not appreciated the previous remark and could not take the man and his threatening actions lightly. However, he continued to observe what was going on between Kakuzu and Sakura. The latter also seemed to know perfectly well the abilities of this individual. 5. Is that it? Sakura asked innocently, not in the least impressed by this man. She would have feared him in the past when she was a teenager. But now she was an accomplished shinobi who had the ability to annihilate many an enemy. I don't like you, Kakuzu growled coldly as the woman revealed her weakness. Sakura lowered her arm before taking a few steps forward until she closed the gap between them. She stopped when they were only two meters apart. Kakuzu, you have a reputation for keeping your contracts to the death don't you? Sakura said. Yes, Kakuzu replied dryly, still on guard. He had earned that reputation by perishing against Madara Uchiha in the past. It was supposed to be a sleep assassination, but he had underestimated the ninja's sensory ability. How much would your services cost for a lifetime? Sakura asked bluntly. This sentence had the merit of creating a silence in the small clearing. After all, it wasn't every day that someone came to you and offered you a lifetime contract. Elaborate, the immortal asked suspiciously. A century of your services, replied the young woman. Can you even afford it, kid? Questioned the deserter whose eyes were bloodshot and whose tone clearly expressed the contempt he had for her. At this provocation, Sakura conjured up a linen bag in her right hand in a puff of smoke before throwing it at the deserter's feet. The bag burst open as it landed on the ground and dozens of gold coins rolled to the ground. Kakuzu's eyes widened at the sight of such a sum, it was more than he had ever earned since he had become a shinobi. You're looking at the richest person in all the elemental nations combined. And I'm only going to make you this offer once, Sakura explained firmly as Madara said nothing even though his Sharingan was spinning dangerously, ready to unleash a Genjutsu. Take this bag as a token of good faith on my part. And what should I do for a lifetime of service? Kakuzu asked, though he didn't pick up the money right away. Defend the true peace that we bring to this rotten world. Sakura said before dropping her killing intent. For now continue what you're doing, sow discord on the battlefields, take your bounties, but from now on you'll be talking about Haiwa and how it's a peaceful place to live in times of war. So it's you, Kakuzu understood when he heard this last sentence. You are the two protagonists we hear about everywhere. Hi, during the war you are free to go wherever you want. Once one side wins, meet us at Haiwa and you will receive your first payment, the pink-haired woman replied. The three ninjas said nothing for many seconds. The tension was palpable, the chakra could almost be touched as the three of them exuded it, ready to fight at the slightest sign of hostility. Good, Kakuzu finally said after a long minute. With that answer, Sakura turned back to Madara's side. Oh one more thing. Yes. If you ever meet someone who puts a contract on our heads, kill them. 
And don't forget that I'll always pay more. Sakura added before walking towards Madara. No sooner was she by his side than they disappeared from Kakuzu's view in an instant. The immortal ninja breathed a sigh of relief when he felt the two protagonists were far from him. He had had a close call and was still wondering if this was real. He bent down to pick up the gold coins scattered on the ground and put them back in the linen bag, there were about a hundred gold coins there. Haiwa. Kakuzu whispered, thinking back to the words of the young woman whose name he didn't even know. He opened a bag attached to his belt before placing his new treasure inside. Chapter 27 there is one immutable rule that applies to every living being, and even more so to every human being on earth, life is one long journey with many obstacles. Some of these will be easier to overcome than others, but the notion of ease or difficulty is totally subjective since it undeniably depends on several factors. First of all, the location, because depending on where people are born, the difficulties encountered do not address the same issues. For example, while some may have the benefit of an education and a roof over their heads, others may be left to their own devices, wandering the streets in search of food. Or, some will be able to count on the security of a family, a clan. While others will be exploited, beaten, enslaved or even raped and killed. Then, another factor to consider in a life course is, the human race. Indeed, there are so many inequalities between being born male or female in this world. This has a significant impact on the pitfalls encountered in the course of a life. And there are many other factors that influence one's life path. But in the end, regardless of gender, social background, physical and mental condition, all human beings are confronted with this reality of life, everyone's destiny starts with a single roll of the dice. This randomness cannot be changed, let alone anticipated. Every being on earth is subject to it and unfortunately it is through them that inequalities begin. Because of this, every human being will more or less arrive at this single conclusion on his own. Life is a bitch. And there is no need for more proof of the existence of this random side because, whether it is a well-to-do person, a trained soldier, or a desperate poor person. They all, without exception, have to face the obstacles of life. So you can imagine that in times of war, going through life is much more difficult, because it can bring out the most horrible side of the human being, the animal side. In times of war, the political and military leadership are required on the front line and their mission is to protect the people from enemy attacks while aiming at the success of the main objective, winning the conflict. But because of this, in the very lands that the army is supposed to protect, there is less control, less militia, less law. Less framework in short, and so anarchy can take place. Indeed, if no framework is proposed to human beings, they will have no limits, no barriers, and will end up thinking that everything is allowed. Because in the absence of well-defined rules, he will neither be punished nor chastised for his actions and he will therefore think that all this is normal. And the first great shinobi war is no exception to this constant. Because of this war, well-to-do people started to exploit the weaker ones for their own profit. Trained soldiers deserted their troops and used their knowledge to martyr the poorest. All this provoked desperate people to actions they would not normally have committed. They will no longer hesitate to kill for even a piece of bread. Because when your country is at war, you don't know when your next meal will be, and starvation can cause any individual to go beyond their own rules of conduct and morality. And it is for all these many reasons that Uchiha Madara wanted so much to impose a peace by force. A totalitarian peace. To avoid bloodshed, settling of scores, starvation, rape and many other acts and actions that lead to this bitter conclusion, life is a bitch. Day 280. Kaze no Kuni, the land of sand, was conducting numerous raids on the southern border of Hai no Kuni, but with little success. So far, they have faced the strongest resistance and have not been able to make any more progress than desired. Even if they had the advantage of numbers, no one could deny that the Kanoha ninja had talent and better trained soldiers. And that is why a front line has been in place for a little over a month now after their crushing defeat by Toborama Senju. However, holding a front line required resources, many resources. And that is why soldiers were sent to the four corners of the country, their mission was to collect a new tax. Not on money, but on food resources. And of course these collections were not without resistance and misunderstanding. 
especially since they mainly affected the less well-off populations. But sir, if you take all this away from us, we won't have enough to last until the end of the winter. This is our entire crop that you are demanding and spoke a beautiful young brunette woman in a commoner's outfit. The man standing in front of her had this uncompromising look in his eyes. He was not going to be moved in the least by the words that everyone was feeding him in an attempt to escape this organized racket. What's more, the man was not at all shy about insisting on detailing the young woman's curves with a strong lustfulness. This is war, the man replied in a cold, hard voice. But we're going to starve to death, the brunette pleaded again, desperate to do anything to stop the man from entering her home as he pushed her out of his way. Not my problem, retorted the soldier, who was rudely searching the house for hidden foodstuffs. There must be a solution, a compromise. The young woman tried. She was willing to work twice as hard to provide for her family. She knew that it was war and that she did not have the means to oppose this arbitrary tax, but she found it hard to understand that people could be attacked with such impunity, even if it meant killing them if they opposed it. Hearing the young woman's suggestion, the soldier stopped rummaging and turned towards her, a perverse look and a wicked smile appearing on his face. He did not fail to ogle her up and down and finally said in an unequivocal tone. There must be something you could do in exchange for your food. What is it? She asked, trembling. She could feel the anguish in her chest, the military man inspired an unparalleled fear in her, but she was tetanized. She wanted to flee, to get away from this man who she felt had only bad intentions towards her. No man had ever looked at her like that, she felt like a prey facing its predator. Pull up your dress, the man ordered bluntly as he approached the brunette, who took a few steps back by reflex and the growing fear she felt. So. Sorry. Exclaimed the young woman completely frightened, now aware that she would be the victim of those atrocities described by some women who had already suffered them. She was trapped, at the mercy of this dishonest and ill-intentioned individual. Do you want your food? Said the soldier, grabbing the arm of the brunette who was blocked by the table behind her. So now you're going to pull up your dress and shut your mouth. The young woman was trembling, she was afraid and she absolutely did not want to have sex with this guy. No, she couldn't bring herself to do that, even if it was to ensure her survival and that of her family. Anything but that. No. No, I don't want to. Ugh. The brunette stammered before taking a monumental slap from the man. The slap was so hard that her upper body followed her head before being held by the attacker's arm, who lifted her up to sit her on the table. Who said you had a choice? It's like your food. We'll take what we want, announced the soldier who tightened his grip on the victim's already bruised arm. By instinct and in a burst of courage, she struggled, moving her legs and arms to free herself from this grip that was increasingly tight. However, he was much stronger than her and as she was slightly stunned by the previous slap, she could not do the weight against him. So the brunette did the only thing that remained possible, her only and last hope, to shout. But unfortunately, her attempt failed because a hand was immediately placed over her mouth to cover her cries of distress. Hush! Do not scream little bird, you would not want to damage this beautiful face by accident threatened the soldier by tackling the young woman with the weight of his body to keep it against him. Despite her fear, the brunette tried to hit him, to push him, to scratch him, in vain. The man pressed her against him, sliding a hand under her dress, but as he came dangerously close to her intimacy, the young woman felt her own hand grasp the handle of a knife on her attacker's belt. Her survival instinct made her take the weapon before stabbing it into her assailant's body. Arg shouted the soldier who immediately jumped back as he felt the blade penetrate his flesh. It's a good thing he had armor or it could have been worse, even deadly. This lapse of time allowed the young woman to jump off the table to flee towards the exit, but she was once again held back by the soldier's grip. Come back here bitch! shouted the man who was wounded both physically and in his ego. No. Please, no let me. Urgh! shouted the brunette who received a violent punch in the stomach, making her lose her breath and bending her in two with pain. She could no longer scream and was trying as best she could to catch her breath. The man put her back down on the table and then ruthlessly pulled up her dress with the intention of raping her. 
But, with all the fuss he had made to keep the woman in place, he had not paid attention to the noises outside and did not hear that anyone had entered the house. As a result, he did not see the person approaching briskly behind him. And just as he was about to penetrate the young woman with his sex, Sakura Haruno grabbed the hair on his head to clear his throat and slit his throat like the pig he was. There was little in the world that Sakura disliked. However, rape was one of those things that she absolutely could not forgive. For her, there was no leniency for rapists, no mercy. It was therefore without scruples that she cut the throat of the man who did not understand what was happening to him. He couldn't breathe and felt a warm liquid flowing down his chest, but everything went black before he collapsed to the ground, lifeless. Sakura looked down at the lifeless body on the ground, her face was closed. It was that of the warrior with no visible emotion and she had even less empathy for the abject individual at her feet. But as soon as the pink-haired woman looked at the brunette, her face took on a completely different expression, she was back to being the worried doctor ready to help and comfort others. It's all right. You have nothing more to worry about, Sakura reassured her in a voice so soft that it contrasted with the impassivity she had just shown in killing the soldier. The young woman who had just escaped the unthinkable was still reeling from the emotion. Her heartbeat continued to pound in her chest, her brain slowly analyzing the events, making her aware of the horror she had just escaped. Her gaze dropped to her own body where she saw the blood of her attacker on her clothes, as if to make sure she wasn't in a bad dream. But the pain she felt in her stomach and cheek reminded her of that reality. I don't want to hurt you, Sakura added to finish reassuring the other woman in front of her. Who? Who are you? The villager stammered, still in shock. I'm a friend, my name is Sakura, Sakura said before placing her hand gently on her cheek at the level of the emerging bruise and her second hand on her stomach. Don't be afraid. Despite the advice given, the brunette could not help but jumped slightly as soon as she saw the green glow coming out of her rescuer's hands. Then, little by little, the pain in her cheek and stomach diminished, before disappearing completely. There, you don't have to worry anymore, Sakura reassured her with a warm smile. Why? Asked the brunette as tears escaped from her eyes. Why would a soldier who was supposed to protect us do this? Because men are mostly scum who only think with their dicks, Sakura said, her eyes now neutral. We live in difficult times my dear and men think they are superior to us because we are just women. And as such, they feel we have no say in what they do to us. Indeed, when he should have been protecting you from the enemy, he only listened to his baser instincts and that is why he would not hesitate for a second to rape and abuse you. Considering you then as an object and not a human being worthy of respect. The young woman swallowed hard at Sakura's words. She didn't know what to say and she couldn't add anything else to what Sakura had described. Life was like that for the women of that time. But not all of them are like that, Sakura continued, observing the brunette's silence. There are men who are open-minded and who know how to respect us. Sometimes, some men can even consider you as their equal, in every way. Is this your case? The beautiful brunette asked spontaneously, suddenly curious and intrigued by this note of hope that the rose presented to her. Let's just say I've forced men to respect me, Sakura answered with a knowing smile. Ever since she'd been in the Sengoku era, not a day had gone by without her fighting for respect. Especially since she'd had to do that with the biggest misogynist the world had ever known, only to be in a relationship with him. So yes, she knew what she was talking about and could say that some men were capable of changing their attitude towards the fairer sex. How did you do it? How did you manage to do that? The young woman asked immediately, which aroused Sakura's interest and she stared at her interlocutor. Do you want to be like me? The female doctor asked. Like you? Ah. Uh, I don't know. The brunette hesitated and it was understandable, until now she had never considered saying what she was about to say. The very idea of thinking it scared her. I don't think I'm ready to kill anyone, the woman began, shuddering, troubled to speak her mind out loud. But learning to defend myself to save my life and the lives of my loved ones is. She paused for a moment to catch her breath and continued, I don't want to be scared like I was today, she said still staring at Sakura. The latter had heard the brunette's words perfectly and could totally understand the young woman's state of mind. 
Sakura had chosen the path of the shinobi and was used to the horrors of war. On the other hand, as a doctor, she knew how the human body worked. So, in a way, killing an individual was almost natural to her. Still, she could not force this villager to embrace the ninja path. But still, Sakura was convinced that women were capable, just like men, of defending themselves and even killing an attacker when necessary. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you're weak. You have the right to know how to fight, to defend yourself and thus protect the people you love. I can understand that killing someone is frightening, perhaps even immoral, but sometimes it is necessary, especially when someone is attacking your people or yourself, Sakura explained fervently. So if you ever want to learn the art of fighting, go to Haiwa, the capital of Ta no Kuni. And once there, ask for Suzuki and tell him that Sakura sent you and that you wish to take up arms. Day 290 Sakura and Madara had arrived at a plain where there had just been a battle. The ground was littered with thousands of dead. Thanks to the books from the future, the two protagonists knew where the battle zones were and when they were taking place. Moreover, they had moved around a lot since the beginning of the war. They had saved many victims from death, especially civilians, by intervening in certain conflicts or when a village was raided. But now, as the war progressed, it was time to recruit more shinobi to their side. I hate war, Sakura whispered as she walked alongside Madara through the middle of all those bodies. But it's necessary, Madara replied as his eyes roamed the mass grave. Any survivors? Sakura asked, hoping they weren't too late as she turned her gaze to the dark-haired man. Yes, Madara answered, focusing on the plane around him. But they'll die very quickly, the man added, his sensory ability allowing him to feel the chakra emanating from the bodies lying on the ground. On the other hand, thanks to his Rinnegan abilities, he could anticipate how much chakra the victims had left, allowing him to determine how long they had left to live. None that would be viable. Sakura insisted, she didn't like the idea of leaving victims to die, because if she didn't make sure that at least one person could be saved, it would go against her Hippocratic Oath. And that she could not tolerate. Madara would have found it pointless in the past to try so hard to save a wounded person, but since he had gotten to know the young woman, he understood the meaning of this oath taken by doctors. After all, Madara respected those who had a code of honor and Sakura was one of those people. And uninfluenced by his feelings of love for her, the Uchiha concentrated more carefully and finally said. Maybe one, he murmured as he felt a source of chakra that was more prominent than the others and whose sensation exuded a different will than a normal shinobi. This way, he said as he turned his head towards the spot where he had sensed the different chakra. It took them about thirty seconds on foot to reach the injured man who was in the middle of other fighters. He was a man with blonde hair and blue eyes, something rare for a Tsuchi no Kuni shinobi. He had many wounds, but none of them seemed fatal only the blood loss from all the attacks he had suffered was slowly killing him. With a quick glance, Sakura realized that he would die in about thirty minutes if she did nothing. She was about to kneel down to provide him with care when she felt the dark-haired man's hand on her shoulder. She turned to him, surprised that he interrupted her before she even started. Jinshriki, Madara whispered. Now that they were in front of the individual, the Uchiha could see the nature of the man's chakra more accurately. He concentrated energy in his new pupil hidden by his brown hair, and as the concentric rings of his rinnegan widened slightly, he discovered the identity of his beige, Yanbi. This was a completely different piece of information that completely changed the game for Sakura who began to look at the injured man in front of her. He was watching with fear, but at the same time with defiance these two people above him. Then Sakura knelt down beside him while Madara watched with folded arms, like an inquisitor. He was ready to eliminate this uncontrollably powerful individual if his demon was released. You're going to die, Sakura said sadly after looking over the Jinshriki's wounds. He laughed out loud at the obvious remark. I knew. I died a long time ago, the shinobi said with difficulty. For him, his life had ended when he had been made a human sacrifice to contain the Yanbi. Sakura then remembered what Naruto had told her about the Jinshriki of their time, but also how her heart brother had been treated while carrying the fox demon inside him. Thinking about the Uzumaki brought back some memories of her past life. What's motivating you then? Sakura asked softly, somehow understanding the pain of the man in front of her. 
Nothing. I'm just a weapon. Said the Jinchuriki with disgust and automatism as she thought back to his teachings. A weapon you will be. To protect your own. You are a weapon that exists only to be used. What motivates you? Sakura repeated once more as she struggled with her own emotions. She had to keep a cool head and above all keep things in perspective. Sure, he bore a certain physical resemblance to her brother at heart, but he wasn't Naruto. I told you. The blonde began before being interrupted this time by the pink-haired woman who took the time to articulate her same question. What? Is. Motivating you? I don't know, the man admitted this time. He didn't know what he was, he didn't know what he wanted, he didn't even know if he had ever wanted to live. Do you have anything that matters to you? Sakura asked this time as Madara looked in another direction. In an instant he pulled out a kanai and threw it at a crawling man. As soon as the weapon hit its target, the man stopped moving. My village, replied the Jinchuriki automatically, this time looking at the dark-haired man. He had not lost a bit of what the Uchiha had just done and he had then recognized him, he was the very famous trainer of Beej, Uchiha Madara. The Jinchuriki put his eyes on the weapons they were carrying and he noticed that they had no headbands, they did not belong to any village but that did not prevent him from being suspicious of them. Go on, then. Finish me off, that's what you're here for anyway. We're not here for that, Sakura reassured him and gently placed her hand on the injured man's cheek to draw his gaze towards her and not the dark-haired man. Then what? The blonde asked without understanding. What's really important to you? Sakura rephrased once she had his full attention again. My. The man began out of habit but stopped immediately as he realized what he was about to say. Are you sure? Sakura interrupted once more a little more harshly. So that's all that matters. A village that tortured you. A village that deprived you of your freedom, your feelings, your family. For what? To become a weapon to be sacrificed. The woman stopped for a moment before adding, isn't that right? The Jinchuriki could not answer as she had described so well his life in the service of this village that had never considered him anything but a weapon. The shinobi then took advantage of this silence to resume her tirade. So I'll ask you again, what is important to you? She repeated again. Sakura was somehow taking advantage of the fact that the blonde was weakened by his injuries to manipulate him psychically. Indeed, repeating the same question to him while rephrasing it sometimes, insidiously allowed to orient the person's answer towards what was expected of him. Once again, the man remained silent, he was lost in thought. He had never been given the opportunity to express his feelings. Never had anyone, let alone a woman, given him the opportunity to think for himself and especially for himself. Seeing that he was thinking at full speed, Sakura continued her manipulation. She sensed that he was about to give in and finally let his own will be expressed. What would you do to have a family? People who love you. A place to truly protect? Asked the young warrior. That's impossible, the blonde retorted. He had come to terms with the fact that he would never be loved, that he would never have a family and that he would never be able to call a place his home. He was just a weapon to be used and discarded once it was broken. Whether he died today from his wounds did not matter in the end. By becoming the host of a Yanbi, his fate was already set, a certain death, and surely much faster than normal. Nothing is impossible, Sakura insisted. She was in a good position to say that nothing was impossible because since her meeting with the Rikid Sennin, almost nothing surprised her anymore and she understood that anything could happen. Why me? Questioned the Jinchuriki more for himself than for his audience as he felt death approaching fast. Why you and not someone else? Sakura replied wondering if this man had been selected like Naruto. Her answering him with another question caused the blonde man to have a burst of energy and regain the strength to speak. You know what I am. He shouted in rage. Tell me why I had to have this life. I didn't want it. Who would want it? You'd have to be crazy or suicidal to want it. The man raged as tears began to roll down his cheeks. Because life is a bitch. Sakura said firmly. Life is hard, unforgiving and especially in this day and age. But it's up to us to fight to make it better. So I'll ask you again. 
what would you do to have the life I described to you? Absolutely anything, the blonde breathed, closing his eyes. He was tired of talking and he was getting very tired of it all. He only wanted to fall asleep and accept that this life of suffering would finally end. Who was she to torture him like this, making him dream of a future he knew was impossible? This discussion had been much crueler than a clean and brutal death. But just as he was about to welcome death with open arms, he felt two hands rest on his chest and a pulse of chakra penetrate him. It was warm, soft, pleasant, comforting. Gradually the pain lessened, the suffering receded and the fatigue began to disappear. He opened his eyes and wondered if he was seeing an angel. The pink-haired woman's hair fluttered slightly in the wind while her face was lit by a soft green light. Was this what dying was all about? But his mind seemed far too conscious to have passed into the other world. What are you doing? Asked the man who was no longer sure what was real and what was not. I'm giving you a second chance, Sakura replied as she shot another burst of chakra into the man's body. The doctor knew that she had almost gone to the limit of the blonde man's abilities, but she had gotten the result she wanted. He would join them willingly, for they had a better future to offer him, and more importantly, he would have the assurance of being respected as an individual no longer considered merely a weapon of war. This wave of healing chakra was intended to close all of the shinobi's non-lethal wounds in no time. The Jintriki looked at the warrior's hands and was stunned by what he saw, she was saving his life. No one had ever done that and even less since he had become a host. Why? He finally asked when she had finished treating him. He was still in shock at what he had just seen. Go to Ta no Kuni. Seek out Haiwa City. There you will be accepted as a hero for what you are and also for what you hold inside. There you will have a new life, you can start over without being judged for your past. Sakura explained with a warm smile. Hearing this, the blonde felt like crying again, but not for the same reasons as before. Why? The Jinchuriki repeated anyway. Because the victims of life are entitled to a second chance. Now go. Go live your new life and don't forget, you owe me a life debt, Sakura said as she helped the man to his feet, all under Madara's inquisitive gaze behind her. If you want to live up to it and pay me back, don't waste this chance and live your life the right way. The man looked into the eyes of the woman he called an angel for being able to do what she had done. After all, he saw no lies in her eyes, only compassion and sincerity. Without having any guarantees, he had this inner voice that assured him that she was surely telling the truth. He deserved to have the life she had described to him, a home, a family, the respect of a village, a real goal to accomplish. So he did something he never thought he would do, he undid his Tsuchi no Kuni headband before staring at it for a few moments. His village. No. This had never been his village, but rather his fetters. Without any regret, without any backward glance, he let them fall to the ground, free. What is your name? He finally asked the rose. Sakura, she replied, still smiling brightly. And what's your name? Akihiko. Well Akihiko, I have just one more thing to say to you. I'm listening. Our meeting is not a coincidence, Son Goku would make his father proud, Sakura pronounced with a more than enigmatic tone. Neither Akihiko nor Madara understood the meaning of it and even remained rather confused. Except that this message was intended for the beige in the blonde's body. And when he heard the last part of Sakura's sentence, he immediately understood the meaning of the message. Nobody knew the real names of the beige except their father Hagoromo Tsutsuki, and if someone said this kind of sentence it could only be true. Day 291. After the discussion with Akihiko, Sakura and Madara spent the rest of the evening scouring the battlefield for weapons, armor, and anything else that might be useful and usable for their next objective. So it was not until the next day, around one o'clock in the morning that the couple found a cave to spend the night in. As soon as they were settled, Sakura conjured up a medium-sized scroll in a puff of smoke, from which she pulled out a minimum of furniture. In view of the huge mission they had to accomplish, sleeping on the floor was out of the question. Indeed, it was counterproductive as they had to be in shape to ensure victory. So she had sealed a mattress, some pillows and a blanket, as well as a kit for cooking on a campfire. 
She placed all these items in a corner while the dark-haired man arranged a pile of wood surrounded by stones. Katan. Madara whispered without waving. He simply manipulated the chakra into a very fine ball of fire that flared up on the wood gathered in front of him. The young woman positioned a cast iron tripod over the fire before placing a pot in which was a vegetable broth. Hooray for the finjutsu that allowed one to preserve pre-cooked dishes. Sure, they had to be reheated, but they were already ready to be eaten. Madara and Sakura undid their armor and weapon straps and placed them near the mattress, all in a soothing silence. Then, as Madara lay down in a semi-sitting position, Sakura placed a small stick of their own creation at the entrance to the cave the stick was a warning system, so there would be no surprises during the night. Once she had put it down, she walked over to the man she loved and curled up against him while he read a book about the First Shinobi War. He placed his arm around her as she cradled her head against his chest. She breathed in deeply to intoxicate herself with his scent, God, she loved this man. While the vegetable broth warmed up, Sakura allowed herself a moment of relaxation by closing her eyes in Madara's arms as he let his thumb caress her arm. Sakura, the Uchiha whispered softly, he had removed the suffix san since they had become much more intimate. They had exchanged many kisses, they had discovered the pleasures of the flesh together, and since then they had both slept in the same bed. So naturally intimacy appeared in the way they addressed each other. However, neither Sakura nor Madara ever showed any affectionate gestures outside of private life. But the young woman was able to discover, in this private context, that the man could be tender and affectionate. But when he was outside of this private sphere, he was still the same as he always was, the great Uchiha Madara, impassive, authoritarian and uncompromising. And out of love for him, she respected that side of his personality. Yes Madara? Sakura asked softly as she curled up against the dark-haired man. What would you have done if he had remained loyal to his village? The brunette asked, never taking his eyes off the book. His Sharingan ability had long since allowed him to do two things at once without the slightest difficulty. I would have freed him in another way and would have waited for his beach to materialize, Sakura explained straightforwardly, referring to the fact that she would have let him die, even though it went against many of her moral principles. Who is Son Goku? Madara asked curiously. The real name of the Yanbi, Sakura answered mechanically and that's what Madara liked since his meeting with the Rikid Sinin. She had no secrets from him anymore, she confided in him, she wasn't manipulating him anymore, she was moving forward by his side. His father. Hagoromo. Madara asked by way of elimination. Yes. Tsutsuki-sama was the first Jinchuriki of the Jubi. When it was his time to leave this world, he split this chakra being into nine creatures he considered his children, and he gave them each a name. Sakura explained, opening her eyes slowly as she recalled the moment Sasuke had imprisoned all the beach with his Rinnegan. It was the men who called them Yanbi, Kaibi etc. Just by counting the number of their tails. The Jubi, Madara repeated softly, stopping his reading for a moment. It was information that suddenly came naturally to him. It was one of the abilities he had acquired through the appearance of his Rinnegan. Don't even think about it Madara. Sakura said, knowing full well what the dark-haired man might be thinking with all this new information. You died trying to resurrect him and control him, she thought it was worthwhile to make him aware of the things she knew about his future self. H.N. Madara couldn't help but gasp and Sakura hugged him a little tighter. She had learned over time that this was his way of saying that he was giving in on the subject of discussion without actually saying so openly. Sakura pulled out of the dark-haired man's embrace to check on the dish on the fire from which a delicate smell of vegetables was emanating, it smelled really good. Madara couldn't help but make a gurgling sound from his stomach. It'll be ready soon, Sakura said and gently stirred the draft with a wooden spoon. She took a small portion and brought it to her lips, it was warm. She put the spoon down and went back to snuggling with Madara who had resumed reading. How do you know Kakuzu? Asked the Uchiha, who, even though they were sharing a moment of sweetness and tranquility, was still inquiring about their common goal, peace. Because he's immortal, Sakura said with a little bit of coldness, remembering the man in the future. How so? Madara asked a little too interested in this information. By whatever process, he managed to graft five hearts to his soul to keep him alive, 
Sakura explained, remembering her battle with that monster. A heart for each element, torn from his enemies. That's why. Madara said, understanding how he had managed to survive against it. Yes. And as long as a heart remains intact, it can't be killed, Sakura added remembering her sensei who had to kill him five times with Naruto's help. But he's a man who only lives for money, she concluded with a slight scorn in her voice. I understand. What was he doing in the future? Madara continued, gently stroking the young woman's arm with his hand. He was part of a criminal organization of mostly Nukneen listed in the bingo book, Sakura said and she knew what she was talking about. She herself had fought and survived Sasori. Was I one of them? The man asked, curious to hear the answer. In a way you are the founder of this organization, she replied with a certain weariness in her voice. It wasn't that she wanted to withhold information from him, but she was quite tired and talking about the Akatsuki wasn't necessary in light of what lay ahead for them. I see, we'll talk about it later, the Uchiha replied, he could tell when the young woman was trying to keep things quiet. He had complete confidence in her and her judgment. There was no need to burden his mind with unnecessary details at the moment. So he resumed his reading while delicately caressing the skin of his companion. After about ten minutes, Sakura stood up once more to check on the food on the fire, it was hot enough. She picked up two large soup plates before pouring steaming broth into them. Oh, interesting, Madara said as she read a page about the First Shinobi War. What was that? Sakura asked as she walked back to the bed with the two plates and two spoons. She settled into a cross-legged position before handing one of the plates to Madara who gladly took it. Yuzushio will be destroyed. Yes, the Tri-Alliance sent enough men to overwhelm the Uzumaki clan, who even though they were powerful, they couldn't hold out since Kanoha arrived too late, Sakura explained, remembering her history classes at the academy. Very interesting, Madara said once more before taking a bite of his food. He enjoyed the taste on his taste buds and let out a slight sigh of relief as he felt the warm broth run down his throat. After all, it was wintertime and there was nothing like a good hot meal to invigorate you. Why is that? Sakura asked curiously. We'll be heading to Yuzushio tomorrow. If we can get the Uzumaki clan as an ally, it will only make us stronger, Madara explained with a very thin smile. That will be very difficult, Sakura said with a very slight frown. The alliance made between Kanoha and Yuzushio is very strong. The marriage between Hashirama Senju and Mito Uzumaki means that the clan will remain loyal to the leaf. It will be almost impossible to convince them to turn away from Kanoha and join us. I'll make it my business, Madara said, setting his empty plate on the stone floor. He also put down the history book before turning to the woman he loved. Sakura couldn't help but blush slightly at the hot, lust-filled look the dark-haired man was giving her. And without her understanding of how it happened so quickly, she found herself being kissed passionately by the Uchiha. The kiss lasted a long time, before continuing with the next one as hands roamed her body with desire. There was no doubt about what was to come next, the couple would have another night of passion and love. Chapter 28 Day 292 Toborama Senju was currently sitting behind his desk leaning back in his chair, arms crossed as he pondered all the events that had taken place lately. And, despite the events in their favor, he couldn't help but feel that it was all a mess. It was like a feeling that something was slipping away from him but he couldn't put his finger on it. The Kanoha troops had struck a blow in the first battle by quickly setting up a front line south of Hai no Kuni. This kept the Suna troops at bay as they tried to penetrate the land of fire. However, all these attempts were in vain and the Naidame Hokage was sure of it as he received almost daily reports of the numerous attempts of the Sand Ninja to get through, without success. On the northern side, their position was secured by Yuzushio's troops who kept the attacks from the Land of Lightning at bay. Toborama knew that this side would also be very difficult to pass. After all, Yuzushio was the hidden village of the Land of Whirlwinds where their armed strength lay in the power of the Uzumaki clan's techniques and it would take a miracle for this clan to be decimated by the armed force of the Land of Lightning. Indeed, the Uzumaki had earned their reputation as valiant opponents thanks to their mastery of Finjutsu, and as such, they were capable of anything and everything to defeat their enemies. 
Moreover, the Hokage knew that the troops of his second ally, Mizu no Kuni, should be landing within a few days towards the coast of Kaze no Kuni. If everything went well, the front should turn in their favor and thus destabilize Suna's position. But in spite of all this, Tobarama was not happy, indeed very upset. His country was still suffering from raids whose perpetrators were still unknown. He had sent his ninjas to gather information on these exactions, but none of his elite troops could get their hands on them. It was even worse, he had lost an umbu unit in the manhunt. And in the current conditions, losing ninjas of this value was a bad blow. Especially since training good ninja was simply difficult. Losing manpower was absolutely unthinkable. Especially since he also had to send troops towards the land of rain which was being ravaged by Tsuchi no Kuni. For in this war, there were three great countries, against two and their vassals. And one had to admit that the leaf troops were clearly outnumbered, and if the Nidame didn't do anything, he risked losing this war, even if the start had taken a favorable turn. So, after many hours of reflection, Tobarama understood that he would have to find a solution to fill the gap as quickly as possible, and he found it, women. When Hashirama became the first Hokage of Kanoha no Sato, Tobarama and his brother set up a shinobi system that allowed them to have exceptional ninja. But to get these ninja, you had to select them from many people. Tobarama, during his brother's tenure, set up a system that allowed for this selection, the Shinobi Academy. The clans known and reputed for their mastery of chakra and techniques could send their children there from the age of five. For six years, these children would learn to become weapons of war. But not all would succeed in becoming ninja. Only the most skilled had the opportunity to become accomplished shinobi. At the end of the first year, some of the children could already join a master who could train them in a specific branch. While the others were either returned to civilian life, or for the luckiest ones, trained in the rudiments of combat without having the status of ninja. At the time of the provincial wars, women were not allowed to go into battle, but Hashirama and Tobarama considered this a terrible mistake. For them, a woman, just like a child, could be just as deadly as a man. Moreover, they had proof of this when they met Mito Uzumaki and some other women of her clan. And so, Kanoha no Sato was the first village to have a few rare female ninja in its ranks without elevating them to the same level as the men. But at least they were recognized for their value in battle. But despite all this, Tobarama was forced to give an order that would allow him to last longer in this war, every aspiring ninja, regardless of age or sex, was now a ninja requisitioned for the war effort. By this decree many children and women filled the ranks. They were going to do specific missions, espionage, assassination, infiltration. But would this be enough? The Naidame Hokage had no idea, especially since he had to consider another fact that was just as disturbing as his numbers. The day before, Danzo Shimura had come to him with a most disturbing analysis for the future of his people and the war, their reserves. Danzo had been adamant that if the war went on any longer, they would simply lose it for lack of resources. Indeed, their reserves were really low compared to previous years. Was this a coincidence, or was it premeditated? Tobarama did not believe in coincidences and immediately thought that it had something to do with the numerous raids that had taken place on his land. This idea could only irritate him more, but he was suddenly interrupted in his thoughts by a person knocking on the door. Come in. The Senju ordered without opening his eyes. He didn't need to open them to identify the people who were now entering his office, his student Sarutobi Hiruzen accompanied by his team members Tsunade, Jiraiya and Orochimaru. This was also something unique in the world, the Kanoha Ninja Team System. It was based on the principle of a group consisting of one Jnin accompanied by three Genin, thus allowing weaker troops to be led on missions. These groups were trained to work together as a team and to form bonds of trust between them. This saved many of their fellow soldiers from being lone shinobi. This team was one of the most promising in Kanoha and Tobarama was confident that they would change the world when they grew up. After all, Tsunade had been trained in the shinobi arts from a young age as a member of the Senju clan. Orochimaru was a shinobi child, and he had shown considerable talent in his exams. And then there was Jiraiya. He was an orphan who was nothing special, but he had the will to succeed and protect his people. The three of them were ten years old and had been under the tutelage of Sarutobi Hiruzen for four years now. 
The four of them were Team 7 and Tobarama had high hopes for the future. If there was a future at all. Master, Sarutobi greeted with respect, quickly followed by his students. Hokage-sama, Jiraiya and Orochimaru said, bowing slightly. Hi great uncle Tobarama. Tsunade exclaimed happily, royally ignoring the normally required protocol. Tsunade. Sarutobi exclaimed at the blatant lack of respect. However, the remark drew a very thin smile from Tobarama. He was losing members of his clan every day and it was nice to see joy and good humor somewhere. Especially since his brother had died, he had taken on the responsibility of taking care of his brother's descendants. But Sensei. Tsunade sighed sulkily. There are no buts. That's no way to greet the Hokage, Sarutobi explained as the Hokage opened his eyes. Negneg, Tsunade grumbled, making a face when her sensei didn't look at her. Listen to your sensei Tsunadeheim, Tobarama said in a calm voice with a thin smile on his lips. Fine, great uncle, Tsunade relented and bowed slightly, but still didn't say the famous Hokage-sama. Sarutobi, you and your team are going on a mission, said the Hokage more seriously than before. Destination? He asked, grabbing a scroll from his military leader. The rear guard of the front line that is being set up in the Land of Rain, Tobarama explained as Sarutobi opened the scroll to read the details. Danzo is already there, waiting for you to take over. As the Naidame Hokage explained this, Sarutobi's face was focused as he read the orders on the scroll. He took a good minute to read everything thoroughly before staring at his master. Are you sure they are ready Hokage-sama? The dark-haired man asked, glancing discreetly at his students. We are at war Hiruzen and unfortunately exceptional measures must be taken, the man in his late forties explained. But master. Hiruzen, your team is extremely promising, Tobarama interrupted, remembering his own youth. Where were you when you were their age? Weren't you already defending your clan? I understand, Hiruzen finally relented. He understood all too well what his commander had just asked him. He too had had to fight from a young age and he knew that Tobarama Senju had been confronted with the horrors of combat during the provincial wars at an even younger age. As soon as you get there you will take command and wait for the next orders, the Naidane continued. Good Hokage-sama. I have complete confidence in the four of you, Tobarama reassured with a thin smile before looking at each member of this team. All four of them were unique in their own way, be it the mysterious Orochimaru, the perverted Jiraiya, and the descendants of Hashirama. Looking at Tsunade, Tobarama had a moment of nostalgia. He thought of his brother and his wife. His wife. You may go. As the team left the office, Tobarama pinched his eyebrow and sighed. To him this war was a piece of shit. And looking at Tsunade Senju reminded him of the news from the day before, one of his most prestigious and important shinobi was missing. An essential person who, through her marriage and her presence, allowed him to maintain an indispensable alliance. So when Tobarama Senju heard this news, he ordered the announcer not to reveal this information to anyone under penalty of death, Mito Uzumaki had disappeared. Day 300 It had been eight days since Team 7 had traveled through the lands of Hai no Kuni towards the Land of Rain. The cold of late winter slowed down the group's movement because of the icy wind. For a normal person, walking in this cold would not be a problem, but moving at high speeds by chakra propulsion made you penetrate the air with force. And so, the cold air was three times as sharp as normal. Sensei, Orochimaru began, jumping from tree to tree with his chakra. Yes Orochimaru? Hiruzen asked alertly. They might be in the land of fire, but they could still suffer an attack from the enemy. Do you think this war will last long? Asked the white-skinned teenager. I couldn't tell you, Orochimaru, Hiruzen began, I don't know for sure. This is a war like we've never seen before. A world war. I think it's the same principle as in the provincial wars. Until one side gives in. Tsunade asked, remembering her great-uncle talking about their many wars in the old days. Yes and no. It is true that if Tobarama Senju were to die tomorrow it would greatly impact the war. Just as if the Naidame Tsuchikage were to die, the war would take a completely different turn, the team leader explained to his students. 
However, there are other factors to consider. What are they? Jiraiya asked. Resources, troops, but also morale. At some point, fatigue will set in, as well as fear, and that may lead to a ceasefire. At least I hope so, Sarutobi replied hopefully. You say that as if we can't win this war, remarked Orochimaru, who was the most attentive of the three. Let's just say we're heading into the unknown Orochimaru, and there's no point in hiding the fact that we're outnumbered, Sarutobi said truthfully, if one of our allies were to fail, we'd be done for. And then the negotiations would come. Negotiations? Jiraiya asked without understanding. After all, as an orphan, he hadn't received the same education as his two comrades. Negotiations so that Kanoha would not be raised to the ground, so that the people would not suffer. Basically. Negotiations for survival, Sarutobi said with a hard look on his face. This was a scenario to be expected and he definitely did not want it. He wanted his village as well as his country to be strong, powerful, and great in order to protect himself from the rest of the world. But we haven't lost the war yet. He added calmly. Of course not, because we're going to kick their asses. Jiraiya enthused a little too enthusiastically. Don't be in too much of a hurry to get to the front, Jiraiya, Hiruzen said, remembering his many battles and casualties. Why not? Jiraiya asked and Sarutobi turned his gaze to his three students. He saw himself in each of them, the future of the village. Who is the king of Kanoha? Sarutobi asked. What? Jiraiya said stupidly, not expecting such a question. Ah. The Hokage. He's the strongest man in the village, so it must be the king. The young Sarutobi remembered the teachings of his master Tobarama. Tobarama had also asked him this question and he had answered exactly the same as Jiraiya. Except that with time, Sarutobi had understood the true meaning of the question and especially what the right answer was, the children of Kanoha. They were the future of the leaf and were therefore the most precious thing. We'll have this conversation another time, Jiraiya, the team leader closed and raised his right fist in the air. The four of them stopped on a tree branch waiting. The team leader had his warrior face on. He had felt something and it worried him greatly. He was not a sensory type ninja, but he was an extremely observant shinobi and his sixth sense told him something was wrong. Sensei. Tsunade whispered and pulled out a kanai, ready to fight. Her two teammates had done the same, listening for the slightest noise from the surroundings. This went on for several seconds as the hearts of the four leaf shinobi sped up to a full minute. Then Sarutobi lowered his hand. It was nothing after all, and the three students each breathed a small sigh of relief. Covered. Sarutobi shouted as he heard the unmistakable sound of a sharp weapon piercing the air. The three students reacted quickly as they heard their sensei shout the order. When your superior gives an order, you obey, especially if you want to stay alive. They all managed to take cover in extremis before a huge number of projectiles reached their former position. Not two seconds after the projectiles were fired, enemy shinobi appeared. Seeing this, Sarutobi had a single thought. Ambush. Orochimaru, the wind. Sarutobi ordered as he saw a large number of earth ninja before them. He quickly composed the hand signs before channeling a reasonable amount of chakra into his lungs as he took a breath. Katan, Gokakya no Jutsu. Futon, Detapa. Orochimaru uttered right after his master while needing a large amount of chakra. They had done this exercise many times, they had to surprise their enemy with a devastating attack from the beginning. And this combination of elements made Sarutobi's fireball really big and dangerous. Orochimaru only knew this ninjutsu technique and he had to put as much chakra as possible into it each time so that he could only use it once. The fireball was fast, but as soon as the wind technique mixed with it it tripled its speed, taking many enemy shinobi in. Seeing this Sarutobi realized that there couldn't be too many dangerous shinobi in the mix, but he remained wary nonetheless. In support. Assist me and watch our backs, Sarutobi ordered before throwing a kunai in front of him. Cage main kunai no jutsu. It was normally a kinjutsu, but against the enemy all moves were allowed, that was the essence of being a shinobi, cheating. 
As the soldiers in front of them dodged the devastating fireball, many did not see the projectiles coming towards them. There were a few more casualties before they finally came upon the Leaf team. Even though they were ten-year-olds, anyone could tell that their teamwork made up for their lack of skill and speed. Each of the three had a simplistic and insignificant role at first glance. But it was a great relief to Sarutobi, who could concentrate on a 180 angle rather than a 361. At nine o'clock, Tsunade said, announcing that an enemy was coming around their flank. Hiruzen swung his katana and forced his opponent to dodge, and Jiraiya took advantage of it. He crouched down and passed between his sensei's legs to stab his opponent in the stomach, disabling him. By Tsunade's announcement, they moved back so that Sarutobi could face the one coming from the left. Kunai. Orochimaru shouted at his sensei's back. The latter spun around as he heard this announcement. By his experience and their exercise he parried the kunai coming from his back without any problem before facing the one in front of him again, it was a teenager. However, when it came to protecting his own, Sarutobi showed no mercy. He made a feint with his weapon, which made his opponent hesitate and not focus on Tsunade. Tsunade grabbed his arm and prepared to stab him with a kunai. Instinctively, the shinobi went to strike her with his sword, but it was parried by their sensei and could not prevent the weapon from penetrating his torso. Get down! Jiraiya shouted this time as he saw a large Fuma shuriken coming in their direction. Not that he doubted his sensei could parry or deflect it, quite the contrary. But it was always safer to dodge such an attack. The four of them ducked, letting the weapon pass over them. Two to nine o'clock. Tsunade said as she straightened up. One to six, Orochimaru continued as he prepared to greet his opponent. Jiraiya with Orochimaru. Sarutobi ordered as he couldn't handle two fronts at once. Out of the corner of his eye he had seen the age of the one at six o'clock and his two students would have to get through it together while he dealt with the two facing him with Tsunade. Hi. They both said at the same time before Orochimaru stepped forward very slightly being the more agile of the two. 7. Announced the white-skinned young man to his teammate Jiraiya who didn't dispute the formation at all. As Orochimaru came into contact with his opponent, the white-haired youth pulled two shuriken from his backpack and threw them at his teammate's sides. They passed him and his enemy with whom he had been having an exchange of arms. As soon as the two shuriken were far enough away, Jiraiya pulled on the two thin wires attached to them to bring them back to the back of the earth ninja who never saw the blow coming. During the war, no one bragged about their techniques, their skills, or even their dutsu. All that mattered was to kill the enemy as quickly as possible in order to stay alive. And as Sarutobi sliced the head off his last opponent, Jiraiya shouted another warning. Ninjutsu at twelve o'clock. Sarutobi immediately placed his hand on the blonde's chest to propel her towards her comrades, away from the path of the ground ninjutsu. At the same time, he immediately extricated himself from his position by channeling chakra into his legs. He had just saved his student from a gruesome death, but now had to dodge the attacks of three opponents. This was not a problem for him, he was after all Tobarama Senju's student, and even though he was only twenty-three, he was still an extremely talented shinobi. He knew his students were competent and prayed that they would manage without him while he was separated from them. We're buying time. We're not standing still said Orochimaru who was to take command when their sensei was gone. And that was the best chance they had of getting out of there, considering the number of opponents approaching their position. And for the next few minutes, it was a game of cat and mouse between the three students and the Tsuchi no Kuni ninjas. Except that the mouse was dangerous this time. It set a trap from time to time, threw projectiles, placed explosive tags, everything was good to gain time until the return of their sensei. However, after a while, a series of kunai was sent towards the three and unfortunately seemed too late. Announcing it would do no good, so Jiraiya acted accordingly, he pushed Tsunade's body with his and caught one of the kunai normally intended for the blonde in his chest. Arg, Jiraiya groaned as he felt the metal pierce his flesh. Jiraiya! Tsunade exclaimed as she realized that her teammate had taken a projectile instead. Orochimaru immediately stopped his run before positioning himself in front of his two teammates who were on the ground. The future snake summoner prepared himself mentally, 
calculating in his head how to fake his opponent approaching him at full speed. This one would be on him in barely five seconds. However, just as the latter was about to cross swords with him, an individual stepped in. A woman slammed her fist into the face of the earth soldier and Orochimaru heard the unmistakable sound of his neck snapping, accompanied by the dislocation of his jaw. The man didn't have time to understand what was happening as the life left his body as the three teenagers watched in amazement as a woman killed and propelled a man easily. This person exuded an aura of power, strength and at the same time danger. No sooner had she neutralized this man than she turned to the next ones who were attacked in the back for a second person. Who were they? It didn't take more than ten seconds for the two protagonists to kill the three other shinobi on their tail. One had long black hair that was lost under a straw hat that hid his face, while the other was a woman with pink hair. The dark-haired ninja stayed at a distance as the woman slowly approached them with her arms at her side and her weapons at the ready. Orochimaru remained on guard even though he knew he had absolutely no chance against these two people. They were so fast, so strong and it had seemed so easy for them. Not one more step. Said the teenager, trying his best to look intimidating. Peace, leave Shinobi, Sakura replied as she looked at the boy who was going to make his team suffer in the future and conduct horrible experiments. The young woman put her thoughts aside as this had not happened yet and perhaps never would. Then she turned her gaze to the blonde and the young man. The boy had a nasty wound in his chest and Sakura analyzed its severity by the amount of blood on the ground as well as on the weapon. It was something her future master should be able to handle. But, she had to reshape the future to her advantage. We are friends. If you are friends, then go help our sensei, Orochimaru demanded, still on guard. Who is your sensei? Madara asked from a distance. Hiruzen Sarutobi, Orochimaru answered. Then you should be more worried about his opponents than him, Madara reassured him, remembering the young Sarutobi that Tobarama had taken under his wing. It's going to be okay, Jiraiya, Tsunade announced. Hey, girls love scars, Jiraiya joked in order to relax the one he loved. Don't laugh at that baka. Tsunade retorted before placing both hands on the wound and activating her IRY ninjutsu. This was the first time she had used this technique in front of someone. It was something she had tried to replicate after reading one of the books made by her clan and more specifically by Hashirama Senju. She had understood the basics and practiced on small animals and hoped with all her heart that she could save her teammate or at least stop the bleeding and bandage him up afterwards. Both of her hands glowed with a faint green light as Jiraiya looked on dumbfounded. Very slowly the wound stopped bleeding, but the wound was still wide open. What you are trying to do is something extremely dangerous and at the same time noble young lady, Sakura said as she watched from afar. I can help you. How could you help me? Tsunade asked skeptically, after all, no one in her clan knew about this book written by Hashirama. She got no answer, except for Sakura approaching them. Don't come any closer. Orochimaru warned. Sakura ignored the threat and continued forward. The white-skinned teenager cocked his arm to strike, but was overpowered in no time by the young woman who disarmed him. She threw his weapon away from him before stepping around him to go directly to Tsunade's side. She put a knee to the ground and a hand on the wound of Naruto's future master. Sakura channeled her chakra and a pulse went through the wounded man's body. Her hand lit up with a bright green light and the wound closed in a matter of seconds as the three teenagers watched in amazement. The pink-haired woman took out a small cloth to clean the wound, there was not even a scar. Ho! How? Tsunade asked in complete shock. What you want to become is admirable young lady, but extremely difficult, Sakura said with a serious face. Sakura, Madara began as he felt Sarutobi's chakra speeding towards them. We have to leave. She conjured up a green-covered book in a puff of smoke and held it out to Tsunade who took it in her hands. When you're ready, come and see me, Sakura said cryptically before standing up and walking off with the second protagonist in another direction. Seeing these two people disappear, Tsunade wondered if these two people were not the two ninjas who were helping the needy through this war. The blonde and Jiraiya both looked at the cover of the book to read the title as their sensei appeared beside them, How to Become a Ninja Medic Volume 1 by Sakura Haruno. 
Chapter 29 Once these young ninjas had been saved, and especially once the couple had gone far enough to avoid running into their sensei, Madara asked the question that was close to his heart. Why did you save the leaf shinobi? Madara asked. Since the beginning of their plan, they had saved many civilians and had even started recruiting ninjas. But until now, never a Elaf shinobi. Because she was my teacher, Sakura replied, thinking back to Tsunade's teachings. I became what I am today in large part because of her. With this information in mind, Madara focused his thoughts on the events that were supposed to take place during this war. He knew the story he had read in Sakura's history books perfectly well and with his powerful analysis. He concluded that in order to ensure a solid foundation in his own peace project, Madara had to avoid the destruction of Yuzushio and thus avoid the eradication of the Uzumaki. In a sense, he had to save them from their doom while persuading them to leave the leaf for Haiwa. But he knew that this would not be easy, their leader was someone who was formidable in every way, especially in terms of his moral rectitude. Ashina Uzumaki was someone who was very difficult to influence and manipulate. Moreover, he was known to be of a stubborn temperament, he would therefore be complicated to convince, especially since this would mean disavowing Kanoha. But the Uchiha had to admit one thing, any great man has at least one weakness. And with the Uzumaki clan leader, he would not stand the idea of acting or being considered a traitor. And more particularly on his word given when Mido, his daughter, was given in marriage to Hashirama Senju. Moreover, the patriarch had refrained from demanding the return of his daughter to them after her husband was declared missing. After all, Mito Uzumaki was not only a very powerful kunoichi thanks to her very high mastery of finjutsu, but she had also inherited her father's character and morals. As a result, even as a widow, Mito could not bring herself to turn her back on the village that had welcomed her. And so it was because of her principles that she did not return to the land of whirlwinds. Sakura. Are you sure Yuzushio will be attacked? The great Uchiha Madara asked for at least the twentieth time. Yes, I'm sure, the pink-haired woman answered once more. How can it be possible that Kanoha didn't intervene in this massacre? Madara wondered as he couldn't find any detailed explanation in the history books. Especially since this event was only days away, and the Uchiha was desperate to get the members of this clan back. I don't know, it's something that was somehow overlooked, Sakura added, remembering her history classes. It seemed like Kanoha was making sure to forget who that clan was. At least it wasn't mentioned in my time. Strange. As you say, the pink-haired woman agreed. Besides, I don't know how you intend to convince Ashina Uzumaki to join us, especially since they will soon be beset by ninjas from Kumo, IWA and Suna at the same time. As she said this, Sakura realized that if the land of whirlwinds was attacked, there would be a lot of casualties as the clan would be overwhelmed before they were completely decimated. How could she ensure that none of these people would die without being saved? It was then that she knew what she needed. Madara, do you trust me? Sakura asked in a voice that was both serious and soft. I thought I'd proven to you by now that I trust you, Madara retorted, inwardly suspecting that this woman must have some sort of plan, but that she couldn't tell him about it right away. Why are you telling me this? We're still two three days away from the land of whirlwinds and there's something I need to accomplish, but I can't take you with me, the young woman began as she saw a worried pout appear on the dark-haired man's face. Don't start playing protector with me Madara, I'm not afraid of anything and what I intend to do, only I can accomplish. All I can tell you is that it will be necessary for the future you and I wish to build. So you want me to wait for you? Ask the man, not very happy about this possibility. Indeed, although he was focused on their objectives, Madara could not do without the young woman at his side. She had become indispensable to his life. He would do anything for her, but above all, he feared that she would be taken away from him in any way. But, the Uchiha couldn't say it out loud, a hint of pride still present in his temperament. Hi, I won't be long, I promise, she replied before moving closer to the dark-haired man so that he could hug her. She nestled against him for a good moment before placing a delicate kiss on his lips. How long? Madara asked as she watched Sakura pull away from him. Less than an hour, Sakura assured him before biting her thumb until it bled. The blood flowed from the wound and down her finger. 
Then she waved her hand, which Madara recognized in an instant. Kuchiyos no Jutsu A large seal of Finjutsu appeared on the ground as soon as her hand touched the ground. The formula drew chakra into itself to activate and the gift of blood allowed the technique to work. And so Sakura disappeared in a puff of smoke, targeted by a reverse summons. For yes, at this time, Sakura had not yet signed a contract with the slugs. Madara picked up a few pieces of dead wood nearby. He assembled them after removing the snow near a tree. He channeled chakra into his lungs before blowing a small fireball. Katan The Uchiha sat down on the ground in a cross-legged position before sinking into his thoughts. He was thinking about how to convince the Uzumaki clan and more specifically Ashina Uzumaki to join Haiwa. And Madara was going to use one of his most powerful abilities, manipulation. Meanwhile, Sakura found herself transported halfway around the world to the legendary Shikatsu forest. It was one of the most mysterious and terrifying forests in existence. No one knew exactly where it was, and for good reason, it was on a continent all its own. The winter weather disappeared and the air became very heavy for Sakura. The temperature changed by almost 25 degrees, mixed with the humidity Sakura suddenly felt very hot. No doubt about it, she had come to the right place. Seeing this forest brought back memories to the young woman who remembered her signing the slug contract thanks to her master. But she didn't have time to let her thoughts take her back to the past. Movement Sakura turned her head slightly in the direction she had thought she saw movement. But nothing. The sun was setting and the foliage brought a darkness to the forest that prevented Sakura from seeing it more clearly. The atmosphere wasn't eerie, but the onset of darkness added even more mystique to the surrounding area. Katsuyusama Sakura spoke loudly to the vegetation. I have come to this place to ask for your help. The Kunoichi knew that the entity was somewhere and that she could hear it. She didn't have to beat about the bush and knew that the giant slug didn't like pretense. So she might as well announce immediately the reasons for her coming to this place. However, no sooner had she spoken than her voice echoed in the immensity that surrounded her before disappearing, quickly replaced by the noise of the local fauna. The seconds passed, quickly turned into a minute. Two minutes. The silence around him was beginning to feel heavy and combined with the falling night it could create a certain uneasiness. It was completely different from her first time in this place. Sakura wondered, did Tsunade have to face this tension the first time she came here? And just as she was about to call out to the giant slug again, a soft voice from all sides came out. Who are you? Hearing her former friend's voice, Sakura flinched slightly and looked around to see where the voice was coming from, but to no avail. My name is Sakura. How did you get here? Asked the legendary slug. Reverse summoning, Sakura said bluntly as she understood the principle of summoning thanks to the research of her time. The first ones who had summoning contracts were shinobi who had experienced reverse summoning. It had been discovered that it was necessary to concentrate one's mind to meet a type of creature, the reverse summoning was not an unconscious phenomenon, but a real mentalization of the mind. So Sakura knew exactly who she wanted to meet when she used the reverse summoning technique. And why come here? The slug asked, suddenly intrigued by the young woman. Because I need help Katsuyusama, I need your help in guiding humanity towards lasting peace despite the cycle of hatred. I need your wisdom, your strength, and your chakra to help me accomplish what Tsutsuki-sama did before us. Sakura explained with determination and passion. That name. Katsuyu knew it well. Just like her, this being had crossed the ages and had become a legendary being. The giant slug had simply heard the hermit's name over the centuries. But what surprised the slug was not hearing the name, but rather that this young woman knew of his existence. How do you know this name? Katsuyu asked even more curiously than before. She had the reputation of being a quiet and very thoughtful creature. Many would underestimate its abilities because the slug was not devastating like its counterparts on Mount Mayaboku or in the Ryuchi cave but Katsuyu was just as dangerous in her subtlety and analysis of situations. As she was in projecting a powerful and deadly jet of acid when necessary. He came to me, Sakura replied, remembering her conversation with the Rikid Sennin at the Valley of the End. He came to you. Katsuyu questioned skeptically, 
but at the same time interested. Why would he do that? To guide the child of prophecy, Sakura said honestly. The child of prophecy. Katsuyu had heard about it many times. The one who would bring balance to this land and guide them all to lasting peace. Many people had boasted of having found the child of prophecy one day, of having trained him, of having guided him. Before realizing that he was nothing more than a fool among many others. So knowing that the wicked Senmin had designated the child of the prophecy changed everything. And how does that concern me? Katsuyu asked, his voice still echoing around Sakura. Because I can't do such an act alone Katsuyu-sama, Sakura explained, feeling that she was being judged by her words. This whole conversation was just a test to see if she would be worthy of using the legendary slug's power. The cycle of hatred is deeply ingrained in the world's mind and I couldn't break it without help. And why me? Katsuyu continued, seeing no trace of deceit or trickery in the young woman's eyes. Because to preserve mankind, I will have to protect it from itself. And what's the point of bringing peace if there's no one left to enjoy it, Sakura continued, remembering how much mankind had suffered from all those world wars. For me to deign to help you. You would have to possess the ability to heal physical wounds. Few have mastered it, said the giant slug, who in her lifetime had not seen many people capable of such a feat. Or at least, people who hadn't exploited it enough to get her attention. I've already mastered IRY Ninjutsu Katsuyusama, Sakura assured before quickly pulling a kunai from her backpack. She presented the weapon on her forearm so that it wouldn't cut anything too important, then she hurt herself. The blade cutting into her tissues, however, made her wince slightly. She quickly channeled her chakra into her hand and set about the task of healing her wound, which closed very quickly under the very attentive eyes of the slug who was truly impressed. Firstly, the young woman had injured herself in a very localized manner and secondly, she was showing very advanced abilities. How? Katsuyu demanded this time, knowing that to reach such a level of speed, you must have been trained. Because I was trained by the most formidable of masters, and... And... Sakura tried to say, but she hesitated to reveal the rest. And... The slug encouraged. And because you helped me in the past Katsuyu-sama, the young woman finally admitted, thinking that no one would get that kind of information out of Katsuyu. By your words, you seem to know me and imply that we have met before, yet. The voice paused for a moment like an old person searching the depths of his memory for any recollection that might remind him of a past event. I don't remember ever meeting you or even hearing about you, the legendary Katsuyu concluded, watching as she pulled out a cloth to clean her arm, which was dripping with blood from her previous injury. For the first version of the future was reset by Tsutsuki-sama, Sakura said with a look of pain in her eyes. She remembered her old time, her friends, her village, her family, her old life that she would never dream of again. And with that simple phrase Katsuyu understood what the wicked Senmin had potentially accomplished. Time travel, the giant slug whispered, but it still echoed around Sakura. I've missed you so much Katsuyu-sama, Sakura said with a half-broken voice. Thinking about her old life brought back that pain she had buried deep inside. And seeing such a familiar face felt good, but at the same time so bad. Tell me about it, Sakura-sama, Katsuyu asked gently, adding the suffix Sama to Sakura's name. She felt the truth of it and her distress deep inside and she revealed herself to this woman. She was mixed in with the local flora and despite her titanic size she was not noticeable until she moved. Her huge head moved closer to Sakura to better analyze her with its two bulging eye sockets. The kunoichi closed her eyes as she sat on the ground while slowly letting the breath of her exhale escape from her mouth. She then began to tell her story, focusing on the most important elements, her meeting with her former master Tsunade, her former initiation with Katsuyu, her fight against pain, as well as her use in the Fourth Great Shinobi War. This is why I need you so much Katsuyu-sama. I need you as a weapon, as a support, but also as a friend, Sakura finished as she looked the slug in the eyes. Through her eyes she transmitted a call for help, for as strong as she was, she needed a pillar to keep her from breaking. Hitomi was her first pillar, Madara her second, and she hoped Katsuyu would be her third. No words were added. The only thing that moved were two dog-sized slugs that approached Sakura with a large scroll on their backs. 
What was surprising about these creatures was the fact that although they were slugs, they didn't move slowly. Sakura stood her ground and when she saw the scroll placed right in front of her, she knew she had succeeded and the slug was accepting her as a summoner and friend. The young woman knelt down to unroll the large scroll and saw that this time she would not be the second summoner. But the first slug summoner. Sakura pulled a kunai from her satchel at the base of her kidneys before cutting her thumb. She signed her first and last name in blood on the first summoner square. Then she applied blood to each of her fingers before pressing them onto the parchment under her name. It's done Sakura-sama, Katsuyu said as she felt the bond being created as soon as she placed her fingers on the paper. You are now a summoner of the slug clan. Arigato Katsuyu-sama, Sakura replied as she made a light IRY ninjutsu on her thumb. Allow me to accompany you on the rest of your quest, Katsuyu said as a hand-sized slug detached itself from its large body and landed on Sakura's shoulder. As soon as it touched Sakura's skin, Katsuyu got a lot of information about the individual through her sensory sensors and she discovered something. But? Why didn't you explain your condition to me? Said the giant slug, who would have felt bad for killing someone in her situation if she had known this information. My condition? Sakura asked without understanding. Don't you know? Katsuyu asked and seeing the questioning look on the young woman's face she had her answer. You'll understand it soon enough Sakura-sama. Then, without warning the large slug retreated into the vast forest, leaving Sakura with a smaller copy of her summons on her shoulder. And as Sakura's thoughts turned to the slug's words, it disappeared from the legendary Shikatsu forest in a puff of smoke to reappear at Madara's side. Meanwhile, Madara was most worried. She had assured him that she would be gone for less than an hour, but it had been nearly three hours since she disappeared. Although his sensory abilities were highly developed, Madara could not detect her and his anxiety grew with every minute of delay. He was deeply concerned for her, for he could not help her if she was in danger. And while he had all his senses on alert, he recognized Sakura's chakra immediately when she reappeared at his side. His eyes were hard and stern as it was unusual for him to have to wait like this without knowing why. The young woman gave him a soothing smile but it had no effect. On the contrary, the man seemed totally upset and even angry. Sakura found it hard to read the emotions of the man she loved at that moment. Madara, I. The young woman began, not to apologize for being late, but to explain the situation. Where have you been Sakura? I've been waiting for over three hours, what were you doing for something that should have taken you less than an hour? Madara interrupted in a voice much drier than he would have liked. When suddenly, he felt the presence of a different and unknown chakra near the woman. You are not alone. I feel a different and powerful chakra by your side, he exclaimed, all his senses on alert and ready to fight. Madara, calm down. I'll explain, the rose began, but couldn't continue as Katsuyu's soft but firm voice was heard. You should listen to Sakura-sama and you should be gentle with her, if you say you love her, protect her and don't push her around. It won't do her any good. The man froze in shock as he heard the slug address him and especially when he saw her standing on his beloved shoulder. Madara, this is Katsuyu-sama, a friend and ally, Sakura explained. Day 303 The Edge of the Land of Whirlpools At last they had reached their destination. In front of them was a large expanse of water that looked normal, but that was the subtlety and danger of these waters. Many ships had sunk with their cargo and crew to the bottom of the ocean. This was simply because the island of Yuzushio was surrounded by a constantly changing whirlpool. Normally, a whirlpool would be almost stationary because of the fluctuation of sea currents by cold and warm air. But these currents were moving, making it impossible to map the area around the island and especially making it very difficult to access. The Uzumaki clan used one of the techniques they mastered the most, Finjutsu. They were the best when it came to this art which was limited only to the imagination of the user and his intelligence. And that was one of Yuzushio's defenses, relying on Finjutsu. So what did the members of this clan do? They used their art for anything and everything. They inscribed seal formulas on crustaceans around the island that were intended to change the temperature of the water in order to create whirlpools. And because the crustaceans were alive, they were constantly moving. A living defense. 
Yuzushio, Madara said, looking at the island in the distance. He had only been here once before, and that was for the wedding of his old friend, Hashirama. I've never had the chance to see this place, Sakura admitted, even on my many missions, I've never been here. At the same time, the only thing she knew about this place was that it was in ruins. From now on, let me do the talking and don't interfere, Sakura, Madara warned as he looked at the sun looming over the horizon. Forward. Then, as one, they jumped onto the water before running over it. The movement of the water created by the whirlpools required each user to have excellent chakra control to even hope to hold on. For Sakura this was not a problem at all, and Madara used just a little more chakra than usual to stay steady. Occasionally a huge whirlpool would force the two to take a diversion, as even good control would not be enough to hope to get through this unleashing of nature. They advanced for many minutes before Madara felt chakra signatures approaching their position. However, it was not visible. Probably underwater. Then, emerging from the water, three purple barriers grew high into the air surrounding the couple in a perfect triangle. Sakura instantly recognized this barrier, it was the same one that Orochimaru had used to fight the Sandame during his Chunin exam. Furthermore, it was also used by the first four Hokage during the battle against the Jubi. The two warriors immediately stopped at the center of this barrier and waited. It wasn't long before a shinobi with flaming red hair emerged from the water. They were, after all, in the middle of a war, and seeing two shinobi running towards Yuzushio was anything but normal. You have ten seconds to declare your identity. The man announced very seriously. If your answer doesn't meet my approval, you will perish. 10. 9. 8. We wish to speak with Ashina Uzumaki, Madara said quietly and counted three shinobi underwater holding the barrier. Plus the one in front of them, that made four potential opponents. 7. And why should our clan leader listen to potential deserters? 6. The red haired man continued, wanting a real reason to stop. 5. 4. We're not deserters, Madara added before reaching for his straw hat. 3. Oh yeah. And who are you? 2. 1. The man questioned, still counting. Then, the dark haired man removed his straw hat from his head while deactivating the genjutsu on his face. Uchiha Madara. The dark haired man replied, and that had the desired effect on the Uzumaki, he fell silent. After all, Uchiha Madara was supposed to be dead and here he was in front of him, in flesh and blood. This was a complete game changer and he was faced with a dilemma. They had very little chance of winning against a shinobi of his ilk. But was it a good idea to fight him when he wanted to talk to his clan leader? But at the same time, he was a traitor who had attacked Kanoha no Sato without scruples. What to do? Don't decide for your clan leader, Madara warned as he began to walk towards the Uzumaki, so, lead us to Ashina Uzumaki or else. Or what? Challenged the man who looked to be the same age as Madara. Or die trying to stop me, it's up to you. But I advise you to choose quickly, Madara replied, walking slowly towards the man. 10. 9. 8. It was all about manipulation and fear, all mixed with his reputation. Madara was one of the most powerful shinobi the world had ever known and he knew it. So when he threatened you with death, it created a very palpable tension, especially as he turned the previous threat against the Uzumaki. Well, follow us, the man who didn't want to die relented. But make sure we're watching you, Achiha. HN. And so, the purple barrier surrounding them disappeared as if it had never been there and the three visible ninjas headed towards Yuzushio. It was much faster to go through this part than the previous one. Probably because an Uzumaki had to feel his own creations and make them create less of a whirlwind until they approached the island. Nevertheless, in barely ten minutes they arrived in the hidden village of the whirlwinds, Yuzushio. It was a village that was quite large and easily numbered close to two thousand people, and more than half of its inhabitants were Uzumaki. Of course not all of them were shinobi, for not everyone could become a ninja or even master finjutsu. They didn't bother taking the civilian routes, so Sakura and Madara followed the Uzumaki ahead of them as he jumped from rooftop to rooftop. Madara's trained eye saw the hand signals of their guide. 
He was giving directions to his comrades and this was confirmed when he felt and saw Shinobi following them as they surrounded them. They arrived in front of a huge stone building that was covered with numerous finjutsu formulas. In fact, the whole town seemed to be made up of them, the Uzumaki were crazy about finjutsu. They passed through the gate guarded by soldiers, but no one asked for the newcomer's weapons. At the same time, a shinobi was a weapon on his own, so with or without a weapon. What was the difference? Yuzukich-sama, I'm sorry to interrupt your meditation, but I have two people who would like to speak with you, the guide said softly to his military leader who was standing cross-legged in the middle of a large room. There was a large pool in the center and the atmosphere was filled with a light smoke. Send them in, Ashina replied in a neutral voice without opening his eyes. Hi, Yuzukich-sama, the man said with a final bow. No sooner had Madara and Sakura entered the room than Ashina opened his eyes wide. You! Ashina almost shouted as she recognized Madara's chakra. It was completely impossible for him to be alive. He was supposed to have died against his son-in-law at the Valley of the End. How is it that a scum like you is still alive? The same way you're still standing, you old piece of trash, Madara retorted just as scathingly as he walked forward. Sakura was puzzled and surprised by the exchange. She was used to cordial exchanges, filled with honorific titles. And here. She saw two of the most powerful beings insulting each other as if they were talking about rain and shine. And how dare you come before me, you traitor. Chapter 30 A traitor? Madara repeated in disgust as he recalled that famous day against Hashirama Senju. In the eyes of the world he was a traitor, but deep down the traitor was Hashirama. It was the Senju, under his air of a wise man who was responsible, he had poisoned the spirit of his clan and he had made the Uchiha inferior to the Senju. That is why it was normal, even inevitable that Madara would defend the honor of his clan. Hence the retaliation that had followed, leading them to clash at the Valley of the End. Your son-in-law is the traitor, the dark-haired man added through clenched teeth. Hashirama. You want me to believe that my son-in-law is a traitor, you, the specialist in illusions and deceit? Ashina said angrily as she rose from his sitting position. He didn't like it when people questioned his honor, and even less that of his family and clan. As far as I know you were the one who attacked Kanoha. You who unleashed a beach on Kanoha no Sato. You who forced my girl. To become a Jinchriki. The last words were said with so much rage and bitterness that no one could deny not feeling it. So much so that Sakura wondered if it was a mistake to come here after all. Ashina approached Madara and the two were soon within a meter of each other, increasing the tension around them even more. Mito chose herself to become a Jinchriki. No one forced her to, least of all me, Madara retorted to the Uzumaki leader who was exuding a heavy dose of killing intent. All the ninjas hidden in the room were sweating and on the lookout, ready to intervene if necessary. Bullshit! Ashina shouted, waving his arm as if trying to brush off such an excuse with his hand. And seeing this kind of reaction, Madara had confirmation that Mito was indeed this man's weakness. He would not hesitate to use this fact against the patriarch in front of him. You regret it, don't you, old man? Madara asserted with a hint of insolence in his voice. What are you talking about? Asked the Uzumaki patriarch, who at the moment had only one desire, to fight the Uchiha. For arranging this wedding, the dark-haired man said with a sly smile, for forcing your only daughter to do what? He paused for a moment, just so that his interlocutor's full attention was on him. Oh yes. Sacrificing yourself. Was that what you wanted for your beloved daughter? Shut up. Ashina replied coldly, frowning as his blood boiled from having to hear words so close to the truth. If you hadn't forced her to marry Hashirama, she wouldn't have had to intervene and thus wouldn't have become a Jinchriki, the dark-haired man continued despite the old man's more than obvious threat. And he reacted accordingly, he closed the gap between the two legendary warriors before grabbing the collar of Madara's brown kimono. Madara did nothing to stop him and plunged his visible eye into the steel-gray one of his interlocutor. You're playing a dangerous game Madara, Ashina began through gritted teeth before he spotted the woman accompanying the dark-haired man approaching them. Madara placed his arm in front of her as if to prevent her from interfering. You come into my house, into my home, 
strutting around like you're invincible while insulting me. Don't forget that an Uzumaki is twice as dangerous when he's at home. Then Ashina turned his attention to the young woman anyway as something immediately caught his eye, her forehead seal. This was too much for him, his anger rose again, his Uzumaki blood boiled, and Sakura understood where Naruto got his temper from. I don't know how you did it, but I will not tolerate such an insult, Ashina began before looking Madara in the eye again. You dare to bring a whore and a thief with you? Where is your honor, Uchiha? Upon hearing this sentence, the Uchiha clan leader saw red. He hated it when Sakura was attacked and hearing Ashina insult her like that made him lose his temper. Madara drew his sword from his belt in an instant, aiming to strike the Uzumaki before him. But the blow was parried by a wakizashi from the old man. Watch out old man. Another wrong word to this woman and clan leader or not, I will kill you without warning. No sooner had he made the gesture and uttered the sentence than all the ninjas hiding in the room appeared armed and ready to go. Madara did not move, his gaze plunged into the ancestors. Sakura, on the other hand, saw the ninja and pulled out a kunai of her own making before moving into a defensive position, ready to fight. I'd like to see that, Ashina challenged. Just give me a chance, ancestor, the dark-haired man continued, and Sakura frankly wondered if he was trying to get them both killed in this game of provocation. It was as if everything was frozen around them. Ashina Uzumaki despite his advanced age was holding the great Madara Uchiha in awe. The latter did not move a millimeter, always fixed on the old man, all his senses on the alert, ready to detect the slightest offensive action from the other. Everyone was holding their breath, you could almost hear the heartbeat of every person present, so heavy was the silence in the room. The soldiers waited for their leader's orders, whether verbal or by gestures imperceptible to the untrained eye. If Ashina Uzumaki asked them to attack these two intruders, they would do their duty without a second's hesitation, defend their leader and the clan. The seconds passed slowly without anyone moving or uttering a single word. But against all odds, the Uzumaki leader continued the conversation. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't have you both executed right now. How do you know, old man, that will let this happen? The dark-haired man laughed proudly. A reason. Ashina ordered, his tone unmistakable, and this was the last chance they had. Sakura had to restrain herself from interfering, not to answer the Uzumaki leader, but to rebuke the Uchiha for his smug and arrogant nature. Prevent the eradication of your people, Madara announced with great seriousness. Ashina stared at the Uchiha for another long, silent moment before saying. Put away your weapons. Ashina ordered the soldiers, who complied while inwardly wondering if this was wise. In fact, it was very disturbing coming from the Uzumaki. Sakura huffed inwardly as the killing intent became less oppressive around them, though they were all still on the alert, ready to fight if it was a ruse on the Uchiha's part. She watched Ashina Uzumaki's facial expressions, he seemed to believe in the reason Madara gave. Indeed, the leader of the Uzumaki clan had not detected any form of lie in the dark-haired man's words. Moreover, he had not detected any variation in the face of his interlocutor as he told him the reason for their coming to them. And when it came to the safety and security of his people, Ashina Uzumaki knew how to temporarily put aside any grievances he had for another person if that person had potentially vital information to give him. Even if that other person bore the name of Uchiha Madara. Moreover, the old man had to admit that a small voice deep inside of him was telling him that he had to learn more about this woman who bore the same frontal seal as his beloved daughter. Especially since she must have been of some importance to the Uchiha, given the different reactions he had been able to hint at. If Ashina could admit that his weakness was his daughter Mido, it seemed obvious to Hai that Madara Uchiha also had one, this pink-haired woman. All of the shinobi in the room put away their weapons, some reluctantly and others relieved. They repositioned themselves in their places, which were no longer hidden, the tapestries were now torn away and they could all be seen. Sakura remained wary though and kept her modified kanai in hand. Madara and Ashina looked at each other for a few more seconds before they too put their weapons back in their scabbards. The leader of the Uzumaki clan took a step back before turning his back on the Uchiha and returning to his old place. The two Haiwa shinobi followed the old man before settling in front of him in an almost religious silence. Explain yourself, Ashina, 
who was sitting cross-legged, demanded directly. In three days, your city and your people will be wiped off the map, the dark-haired man said, knowing that there was no need to make his words too convoluted. Ashina was not like all those politicians who had to be petted. No, it was necessary to get straight to the point in a concise manner, even if convincing him would be another matter. Why should I believe you? You are a traitor to your village. Who knows if you're not manipulating me? Ashina retorted, though he couldn't see any trace of deceit on the Uchiha's face. However, he refused to believe his words so easily. I already told you, I wasn't the traitor. Madara repeated, frowning slightly. Ashina Uzumaki could really be stubborn when he put his mind to it, and the Uchiha was beginning to think that their exchange would almost turn into a one-sided discussion. To sway the conversation in his favor, Madara had no choice but to resort to what he did best after the war, lying. He had devised a whole host of strategies to convince the patriarch to easily join their cause, but with each plan he came up with, only manipulation was the most viable option. And lying was one of the essential elements of successful manipulation. Besides, the Uzumaki's behavior only confirmed his idea. And even if the old man had himself hypothesized an attempt at manipulation, Madara knew how to get him to believe that he alone would make the decision to believe him and follow him for their peace project. But while waiting for this result, Madara and Sakura had in front of them the typical example of an overinflated ego. Why should I believe you? Ashina repeated once more, his arms now crossed. The patriarch was difficult to influence and he was not known to trust others easily. It would have been surprising if he had accepted without any resistance, especially when he had Madara Uchiha in front of him. The Uzumaki had a reputation to uphold, especially since the dark-haired man was accompanied by this woman whose forehead was adorned with a seal similar to that of his own daughter. The patriarch couldn't help but pass his gaze from Madara to Sakura and it was clear that the young woman was not at all impressed by them and even less by the tense atmosphere that reigned in the room. This deserved a certain respect and the patriarch was even admiring the young woman's calm and impassive attitude. For before my confrontation with your son-in-law, I awoke to the truth. Madara said cryptically. Hearing this sentence, Sakura turned very slightly towards the man she loved. He had the most serious expression and Sakura understood that he was manipulating the facts to carefully distill the information so that Ashina Uzumaki would come to the conclusion they were hoping for, that the Uzumaki would join them on their own. However, she wondered how far the dark-haired man would go, would he reveal his Rinnegan and how he had obtained it? But for the moment, the two protagonists were moving in the right direction since it was enough to arouse curiosity as well as an entirely different feeling in the old man, frustration. What truth? Ashina asked uncertainly, hating not being in control of events and information. What could the Uchiha possibly have that would give him this power? It was then that Madara turned his gaze behind the Uzumaki to assess the distance of the surrounding ninjas and to their great interest, they were all too far away. Seeing this, the patriarch realized that the dark-haired man had something to show him and that it had to be kept secret. Swear on your honor that you will not reveal to anyone what I am about to show you, Madara demanded and this greatly reinforced Ashina's original idea. For this type of request was never made lightly and even less so when it was asked of him. Indeed, the Uzumaki was respected by everyone around the world because he was known for his uprightness in all circumstances but also as someone who was curious, even very curious, to the point that it could be sickening. And because of all this, the old man took a moment of silence to analyze the situation before saying. I promise not to reveal what you are about to show me. As soon as the promise was made, Madara grabbed a strand of his hair and lifted it. The Uzumaki's eyes widened as he saw something he had only heard in the farthest legends of the Uzumaki heritage, the Rinnegan. Indeed, there was a book that was passed down from clan leader to clan leader so that this secret would never be forgotten, but at the same time known to as few people as possible. But Ashina would never have thought one day to see this jutsu. How? Ashina whispered in amazement. I don't know myself, Madara began as he pulled his hair back in front of his purple pupil, I once woke up like this and when I got this pupil. I was able to glimpse the future and what Hashirama and Tobarama were planning to do, he then added with a hint of anger in his voice. What were they planning to do? Ashina asked with great suspicion. 
Sakura could see that he was asking questions more out of curiosity so that he could make up his own mind about what Madara was telling him. Sure, he had the legendary Rinnegan, but the Uzumaki didn't forget who he was dealing with, the most deceitful and manipulative ninja the earth had ever known. To subjugate my clan like animals only to eradicate them in time. And that was out of the question for me. The Uchiha replied angrily. Ashina took a deep breath when he heard this answer. He couldn't deny that the Senju, whether it was Hashirama, his late son-in-law, or Tobarama, the current Hokage, could have strong opinions. Some decisions left no room for flexibility except death when you opposed them. Okay. Let's say that what you're telling me is true. Why are you telling me all this? Said the old man. Because I have seen the future in its broadest outline and I have seen your clan and your people annihilated, Madara revealed once more. This announcement had the desired effect, some of the surrounding soldiers shivered with concern, while others, like their leader, were skeptical. Bullshit. You think you can convince me with this nonsense, Ashina quickly replied, not believing that anyone could have this kind of gift. Even if he was forced to admit that the jutsu possessed by his interlocutor must hold many secrets, and why not such an ability? But what he couldn't admit was the fact that the Uchiha announced the pure and simple eradication of his clan. Who could defeat an entire clan? And even more so his own, the Uzumaki could not be wiped out with a simple flick of the wrist. I remind you that we have the Kumo ninjas under control, and it is only a matter of time before our allies win against Kaze no Kuni and Tsuchi no Kuni, he added confidently, which caused positive nods from the ninjas in the room. With these answers, Madara recognized the stubborn temperament of his opponent. True, the Uzumaki were formidable warriors and that was why he wanted them to join them. But the Uchiha had understood with time and experience that resting too much on one's achievements could be deleterious for the future of a clan or even a village or a nation. Without expressing it, the brunette had understood that sometimes, showing humility led to greater wisdom and to making the right decisions. Ashina, don't you think it's strange that everything goes so smoothly? Didn't you wonder why this war is still going on when you've had the advantage all along? Madara retorted without hiding his annoyance at the old man's adamant attitude. In three days, troops from Kaze no Kuni, Tsuchi no Kuni and Kaminari no Kuni will lay siege to your beloved city and eradicate it. This reply increased the tension in the room and had the merit of making Ashina think, as he gently stroked his white mustache. He was deep in thought. Silent, which accentuated the tense atmosphere of his ninjas posted around. But as they all hung on the lips of their leader, who was still saying nothing, the silence was interrupted by a completely different commotion, a shinobi had entered the room and was talking to one of the guards. He was whispering information very quickly, which made the soldier on duty go wide-eyed. The exchange continued for a few seconds before the guard approached the three protagonists. Yuzukich sama the guard began as he dropped to one knee, I'm sorry to disturb you, but our scouts have just returned with some very disturbing news. Madara smiled inwardly as he saw a potential element that could support his revelations and work in their favor to bend the clan leader. Approach. Ashina ordered the shinobi who hurried over to his military leader. He bowed before making his report. Several of our scouts posted in the vicinity have counted a massive troop movement in our direction, the blood-red-haired man explained. Which direction? Ashina asked his subordinate. All directions Yuzukage sama there is a large gathering from the west, many ships from the south and east, and the northern front is still occupied by Kumo troops. Has Kiri betrayed us? The Uzumaki patriarch asked worriedly, his attention now focused on the information he was receiving. Sakura could see that she was looking at a man well versed in military analysis and strategy. No, those are Kaze no Kuni ships, the scout replied. How could they have a fleet? Ashina asked more to himself than to the rest of the world. Maybe because they've been planning this invasion for a long time, Madara interjected, seizing the most opportune moment to continue manipulating the leader. How do I know you're not on their side? That your so-called clairvoyance isn't a plot to make me bend over and betray Kanoha too. Ashina accused sharply, looking up at the dark-haired man again. Seriously? I know you're old. But coming out with such nonsense is not like you. Madara said with a concealed compliment. 
He was acknowledging his counterpart's intelligence and he knew that the latter would not be insensitive to this roundabout way of acknowledging his qualities as clan leader. But still, he needed more to convince him to believe the Uchiha. Send a message to Kanoha. Tell them we need immediate reinforcements. Ashina shouted to his scribe who hurriedly grabbed an official scroll. The old ninja had no choice but to ask for help, and he naturally turned to the village with which he had made the alliance. Kanoha could not abandon them, that was the deal when he had given his daughter to that senju. They're not coming, Madara immediately retorted sharply. What do you know? The other asked, annoyed that the Uchiha was also questioning the leaf's honor. I know that. Said the dark-haired man, pointing to his camouflaged Rinnegan. The seconds passed in another heavy silence. No one said anything, the scout and the guards didn't know if they should stay or go, and the only sound was the sound of the quill on the parchment. The two men were still staring at each other, one looking for the loophole while the other had a determined expression. Remove any doubt from my mind Madara. If you're not with them, why is this woman in possession of a copy? Albeit different. But nonetheless similar to my daughter's forehead seal. Ashina questioned, now turning his inquisitive gaze to the pink-haired woman who flinched very slightly. From the beginning she had been discreet and she didn't think all the attention would be on her now. The Uzumaki aren't the only ones who are skilled in Finjutsu Uzumaki Dano, Sakura said respectfully. Unlike the man she loved, she had been raised to always respect her elders. Not that level, my daughter is a virtuoso of Finjutsu, Ashina continued before being interrupted by a raised hand from Sakura. She rolled up both sleeves and revealed to the clan leader numerous Finjutsu seals drawn on her forearms. This proves nothing, your forehead seal is beyond such trifles. Ashina retorted before seeing the young woman conjure up a kunai and a small wooden stick in a puff of smoke. She gently placed the two objects in front of the Uzumaki who gently took the weapon between his fingers. He analyzed the many seal formulas inscribed on the kunai that glowed ever so slightly in royal blue, it was a beautiful creation. He had too much honor and pride to say so out loud, but it was a fine piece of work, a very dangerous weapon on the battlefield. He continued to watch the kunai for a long time, concentrating on deciphering the inscribed formulas and mentally visualizing the effects if it were used. Permission to borrow this formula? Ashina asked, unable to resist. This weapon enhanced like this was spectacular. The young woman nodded slightly. What an honor it was for her that her work could please the head of the Uzumaki clan. The man put the weapon down before focusing on the second object which seemed more complex. As he detailed it, the old man realized that it was much more than a simple funjutsu formula, it was an assembly of formulas that allowed for the transmission of genjutsu over a great distance without affecting anyone in the vicinity. The Uzumaki found this very interesting, even ingenious, that he almost forgot why Madara was there. We're not here to watch you rave about Finjutsu, Madara interjected after several minutes of watching the old man take notes of Sakura's two creations. We're here to find out if you want to save your people or see them die with their mouths open. The Uzumaki put the objects and his quill down before looking up at the dark-haired man. He didn't like being told what to do and true to form he replied. I hear your arguments Madara. But they are insufficient for me. I married my daughter, the most precious person I have for this alliance. I have kept all my commitments, so believe me Kanoha has more than enough interest in keeping theirs and they know it. That's where you're wrong, old man, Madara retorted wearily. You don't intend to change your mind, do you? He added, convinced that this battle was lost, the stubborn old man would not give in, at least not yet. The missive is ready Yuzukich-sama, the scribe said as he approached with a message. Ashina applied his Kage seal to the still warm wax. Once that was done, the scribe rolled up the parchment before placing it in a case. You have understood everything, I will not break my principles and commitments for your fears Madara. My people are one of the most powerful of all the elemental nations and I intend to kill anyone who dares to attack my people. Then I have wasted a lot of valuable time here. Madara resigned himself before standing up quickly followed by Sakura. But. Madara-san, Sakura said unable to believe that the dark-haired man would not try anything more to convince him. The young woman knew for a fact that if they didn't do anything, 
all of these people would die and she couldn't bring herself to do that. They were innocent and she couldn't let that happen. But she also trusted the man she loved surely he had another idea to kill two birds with one stone, ally with the Uzumaki and save their people. He's stubborn Sakura-san. He prefers his honor to his people, Madara retorted, pointing disdainfully at the still-seated Ashina. My only consolation will be that you will be consumed with remorse when you know I was right and see your beloved village burn. And with that, Madara and Sakura left the room. Day 306 It had been three days since Madara and Sakura had left and Yuzushio was under attack from all sides. Despite the traps, the sorties, the raids, the enemy was still holding their ground and that made Ashina very angry. His clan was superior to its enemies, but they were outnumbered and that was what was going to lead to their downfall. Despite the Finjutsu defenses put in place, the city looked like a ruinous field by the hour, with the amount of rubble piling up everywhere. One could hear the explosions, the panicked cries of the civilians as well as those of the shinobi who were doing their best to fight and defend the inhabitants. If Kanoha had reached them to assist them, they would have long ago repelled and destroyed these attackers. But the leaf troops were not among them and probably never would be. Yet, as soon as he had sent his message requesting reinforcements, the allied ninja would have had plenty of time to reach them. But Ashina Uzumaki could only make this bitter realization, Kanoha had not responded to their request for help. Moreover, his inner anger only increased as he began to think that perhaps he should have listened to Uchiha Madara's warning. Especially when he received a letter two days earlier that he hoped he would never receive. When he had concluded the union between his daughter and Hashirama Senju, Ashina had placed her under the protection and supervision of one of his shinobi. And he had returned to tell his that his daughter had simply disappeared. Why had Kanoha failed to send him this information? The old man speculated that Tobarama had preferred to remain silent in order to keep his precious alliance intact. This thought made him grow increasingly resentful of Kanoha's methods. From where he stood he swept his gaze across the scene before him and lingered in the distance, all those approaching ships could only mean one thing, his people and his clan were going to be eradicated. He thought back to Madara's words about why he had turned against the leaf village and Ashina Uzumaki could only understand how his counterpart, as a clan leader, must have felt about his people. Betrayal, that was how the clan leader truly felt inside. The old shinobi swallowed slowly as he accepted his unfortunate fate. Sure, he felt ashamed for having naively believed in this alliance with Kanoha, but he would not surrender without a fight to the end. It was all a matter of honor. You see. I didn't lie to you, said a voice that Ashina really hadn't expected to hear again. He turned his head and saw Achiha Madara with the pink-haired woman behind him. How did you get here? Ashina asked incredulously. Well, they're weak for the most part, Madara said dismissively, moving his hand as if he were trying to swat away a fly. Now Uzumaki. Are you going to remain a stubborn old fart with a sense of honor? Or will you decide to save your people? Ashina didn't know how to answer at first, but he had to admit that the Achiha hadn't lied to him. Kanoha wasn't there, his people had been under a massive assault for far too long and if this continued they would all die. So Ashina Uzumaki swallowed his pride for the first time in his life. How do you plan to defeat this army? Ashina asked, gesturing with his arm to encompass the entire fleet. Also, there was some fighting in the city as some shinobi had managed to break through the defenses. I never said I was going to defeat this army. I said we were here to save your people, Madara retorted, not seeming the least bit concerned by what was happening around him. In fact, while they were talking, a shinobi had dashed towards them with an exit weapon in an attempt to take them by surprise. But this was without counting on the sensory abilities of the two clan leaders as well as Sakura's increased vigilance. It was she who reacted first to greet this shinobi from Kaze no Kuni. The young woman pretended not to have spotted him and when he was within striking distance, she hit her opponent before he knew what was happening. Sakura was easily using the advantage of having improved her body's reflexes and her physical abilities thanks to her chakra mastery. The punch to the chest shattered the armor into a thousand pieces as the shinobi spat out a great spray of blood before being blown away by the blow. Ashina was so taken aback by the speed and power of the attack that he forgot about Madara and the battle around him. 
was it even human to be able to accomplish something like this? Then Ashina quickly came to his senses and turned his attention back to Matter A, he had no time to rave about the young woman's abilities. How are you going to get us out of here then? The Uzumaki asked. I can't. I sense a large portion of your people are under the ground though, Madara remarked, concentrating on his sensory ability. Right, we have a safety basement just in case, Ashina said bitterly as a building further down collapsed, hit by a stone projectile. Do a general evacuation Ashina, said Madara. What? The Uzumaki said in surprise. You heard me, the dark-haired man retorted almost exasperated. Every second was important and they didn't have much time for further strategy. If I do this, I'll doom my people even faster than I planned. Ashina protested. So that's your plan, to exterminate us underground and erase the evidence of your misdeeds. Added Ashina, who found it hard to trust a man he had considered a traitor a few days before. Trust me, you old fool. Sighed the dark-haired man. I've proven to you that I'm telling the truth. Your city is being razed, your people are being decimated. Kanoha is not here to honor its alliance. What more do you need? Madara stared at his counterpart before adding, from the beginning I have told you the truth. Then trust me, Madara stated, beginning to get annoyed at having to argue with this man again. Fine, Ashina relented before turning to ten of his men who were reinforcing the protection of Finjutsu. Shinobi. Retreat to any point in the city and order the immediate evacuation of everyone to the underground. Hi. All the shinobi shouted as one before heading off in several different directions. What now? Ashina asked, wondering how the Uchiha was going to save his people. Sakura-san, how many people can you protect and save? Madara asked, turning to the woman he loved. A lot. Do it. The dark-haired man added with a nod of his head. With that nod she knew what she had to do. She turned towards the center of the city before channeling a large amount of chakra into her legs to propel herself as far as possible. She bent her legs and the ground cracked under the pressure as Sakura jumped high into the air. As she was about to land in the main square of Yuzushio, she bit her thumb to the bone before making the proper signs for her next technique. Kuchiyos no Jutsu. Sakura shouted, pointing her hand downwards. She unloaded an insane amount of chakra into this technique to summon the legendary Katsuyu right into Yuzushio. A huge cloud of white smoke appeared in the city center. When it cleared, everyone could see a huge slug towering above most of the buildings, and at the top of it was a pink-haired woman. Katsuyu-sama, it's time, Sakura said to her summoner. Hi, Sakura-sama, Katsuyu replied before her body imploded and split into a thousand copies of herself. All the slugs scurried around the city looking for any survivors, injured people, or anyone else who wouldn't be safe before the fateful hour. Who is this woman? Ashina asked as she saw Sakura doing this from a distance. The old man was simply in awe of the young woman, there was no doubt she must be a formidable kunoichi, a far cry from the whore he had thought she was when he had seen her a few days earlier. She's my wife, Madara replied with undisguised pride. Seeing Sakura in action was always impressive and the Uchiha was not ashamed to show his attachment to the young woman. It was also a way of letting the old shinobi know that she was not available. In other words, Uchiha Madara was clearly marking his territory with the young woman. Anyone who would consider seducing her would have to first cross paths with the dark-haired man who would not allow any such attempt. Is she an Uchiha? Asked the old man surprised by this frank and direct admission. There was no doubt about it, the dark-haired man had chosen the one who would stand at his side to lead the clan and above all to ensure his descendants. That will happen soon, Madara said, he had every intention of marrying this woman and making her the Uchiha matriarch, but for now, he had something to accomplish to put his plan into action. Ashina. Either you go with your people, or I advise you to have a more than powerful finjutsu to witness what is to come. I want to stay and see what you intend to do to save my people, Ashina said defiantly. As you wish, the dark-haired man said before looking around for the tallest building in the city, and he found it. He jumped from roof to roof in seconds before arriving at the structure that overlooked Yuzushio and the surrounding armies and fleets. 
Madara placed both hands in the sign of the ram before channeling chakra. A lot of chakra. Too much chakra some would say. He was taking his time to allow Sakura to protect as many people as possible. And after a minute Madara activated one of the Rinnegan's abilities. The entire sky lit up with an intense light that made almost everyone in the surrounding miles close their eyes. Everyone could feel the density of chakra that was being used as a shrill noise could be heard everywhere. Then, as the concentric circles of Madara's eye widened, there was silence for two seconds. Shinra Tensei. Madara shouted. And from the Uchiha emanated a huge shockwave that devastated Yuzushio and the enemy shinobi troops within it in seconds. Madara's attack continued over a portion of the water before creating huge waves that crashed into the ships. Yuzushio no longer existed. Chapter 31 Time seemed to stand still for a fraction of a second before everyone started to panic about what had just happened in the city. But everyone had the same thought, what exactly had just happened? Hadn't they been leading the assault on Yuzushio a few minutes before? Wasn't the city about to give way? But suddenly, without anyone expecting it, an extremely bright light suddenly lit up the sky, accompanied by a shrill noise followed by silence. The silence was heavy and at the same time deafening, suggesting that something terrible was about to happen. And it didn't take long, not even a second had passed between the light and the silence before a shock wave was felt throughout the region. Everyone in the vicinity of the town could only watch, stunned and transfixed, as Yuzushio disappeared in an instant. The shock wave was so strong that it continued into the ocean, creating enormous waves with its breath. These waves carried with them many ships which had no possibility of escaping this fatal fate. By the force of the blast, many men had fallen into the water and most of them had perished under the waters, swept away and sucked into the whirlpools of the region. Some of the ships still afloat were engulfed in flames caused by the probable fall of torches on the sails. The paralysis of the surviving troops was short-lived, and the instinct to survive and provide help was not long in coming. The shinobi, although in shock, were working to help those they could save from certain death. But one sentence was on everyone's lips. What just happened? However, moments before Uchiha Madara's technique was executed, many were focused on their fight, their weaponry, their technique. But others were able to observe certain details. Some people saw a huge whitish creature appear between the buildings and although partially hidden by them the creature looked very much like a slug, a giant slug. But it was not so much the immensity of the creature that really caught the eye of the few observers, but rather the individual who was standing on what appeared to be the animal's head, a female figure with pink hair. And this was not the first time that a person with this hair color had been mentioned during this war. Many civilians, soldiers and even shinobi claimed to have seen a person with pink hair in the past after a violent battle. Was this the same person that was mentioned since the beginning of this war? Or was it just a coincidence? But there was something else that caught the attention of the few people watching what was happening in the city under attack by the armed forces. An imposing figure stood out from the commotion and stood on the highest building still standing. This person was no stranger, for he too had been in the news since the war began. Many, among civilians and soldiers alike, described him as a monster that no one could hope to beat. What was he doing there? But they did not really have the answer to this question because the great flash of light came to dazzle them all and put them in this state of intense expectation. Of course, more than 99% of the attackers wondered if it was someone on their side who had just unleashed this ultra-destructive technique or if the Uzumaki on the verge of despair, had finally opted for their own eradication. But only the last 1% of the people had seen and understood that it was this figure placed at the highest point of the city who had launched this terrible technique that was unknown to all. So, to see these two people in the middle of the battle suggested that they were Kanoha's allies. But this assumption had been completely blown out of the water when some people realized that one of them had just raised Yuzushio to the ground. And this act led to many questions among the attackers, who were these two people that were talked about on the battlefields? Who were they working for if they were not allied with Kanoha? But this was no longer the time to wonder and speculate. State of the troops. Execute. Ordered one of the leaders who was leading the attack. Once the shock of the attack had passed, the orders were relayed everywhere, allowing the organization of the rescue of the troops at sea. 
And after half an hour, a semblance of organization and stability settled in as everyone could see the huge cloud of dust and smoke emanating from Yuzushio. Or rather from what was left of it, ruins. Commander, we've lost nearly 30% of our equipment and 20% of our armed troops, a San Shinobi replied after doing the math with some of his fellow Shinobi. Damn it! The man swore loudly as he looked ahead. Do we even know what just happened? We don't know, the subordinate replied immediately, turning his gaze back to the ruins. There were occasional flashes of chakra, a sign that some of the Finjutsu formulas were failing. Did that come from us? The commander wondered. No, it couldn't have been from them, it wasn't in their plan to raise Yuzushio like this. And as the commander of this attack, he would have been informed. Perhaps a suicide commander? Suggested one of the sailors at the helm of the ship. Would they have been that bad? To die rather than face us, while killing as many of our own as possible? Asked the military leader. That doesn't make sense, they would have waited until we were closer, he then quickly analyzed. This type of strategy was not impossible, but it could not be that choice. What are the orders? Asked the subordinate, seeing the concentrated look on his superior's face. Send out several scouts to see what he has, the commander ordered before another shinobi landed beside him. Permission to speak, commander, the newcomer said with one knee to the ground. Report, he ordered without delay. I think we have a third faction, commander, the earth shinobi said flatly. What do you mean? The commander took offense at the announcement. It didn't come from us, and certainly not from the Uzumaki clan, the bald man continued to his superior. I've seen them again, sir. This simple sentence made the military leader growl in frustration. This wasn't the first time he'd heard about them. Throughout this war he had had reports that two people were potentially responsible for many of their deaths. They probably had a lot of raiding, looting, and killing to their credit that it was alarming. Why? Because no one could survive long enough to speak clearly about them. No concrete description was available, they were like two specters whose characteristics one could not grasp. For they were always seen from a great distance in order to get a clear picture of them, or the few victims who were left behind after their passage were just babbling incoherent words. Everyone knew of the existence of these two protagonists but no one had any reliable information about them. It was enough to make all the greatest army commanders rage, knowing about the existence of the enemy without knowing anything about him. Explain yourself, the man with the Kaze no Kuni turban demanded immediately. I had a very brief glimpse of the pink-haired one. But I'm positive about the second one. I had time to recognize his outfit, as well as his hair with my long sight. And the attack came from him. You are telling me that only one man. Did this. The commander half shouted, pointing at Yuzushio. It was absolutely unthinkable that anyone in the world was capable of something so devastating. Only Hashirama Senjun Uchiha Madara could have been capable of such a feat and that would have been in multiple attacks. Affirmative my commander. The man persisted without lowering his gaze from his superior. He was telling the truth and he knew it. Around them many were whispering and fear was beginning to settle in the ranks. And this was understandable, who could this man be with his extraordinary abilities, which were probably close to, if not superior to, the ancient shinobi gods. This could greatly frighten any accomplished shinobi. Send a second scouting squad. If they are still there, have them retreat immediately. Take a sensory shinobi with you, if there are no survivors, come back, the mission will somehow be accomplished. Move the fleet and the army back a good half kilometer in case he makes another attack like that, the man ordered after a moment's thought. Hi. All the men said in unison before setting to work. Someone get me a scroll and some writing materials. Added the commander. He needed to write messages to his superiors and very quickly. And as the ships and the army retreated slightly, two squads dashed in fear towards the ruins of Yuzushio. There were many bodies as they approached the island, fellow soldiers and Uzumaki. But soon their vision was filled with nothing but ruins and rubble, there was nothing left standing. Scatter and always in pairs. If one gets attacked, don't be a hero and do a visible ninjutsu quickly, the squad leader said before watching his unit scatter through what was left of the city. 
Occasionally they saw dead bodies between two rocks, sometimes they found a severed limb. But they found no survivors or enemies. At the same time, who would have survived such an attack? Now. Any casualties on our side? Asked the leader to a teenager at his side who had his eyes closed and was concentrating on his sensory ability. None of our scout troops died, chief, the boy replied to his superior. Do you sense any survivors? He added. No, I don't. So the Uzumaki clan was well and truly eradicated. Day 315. Tobarama Senju had rarely been in such an angry state as he was at the moment. The only times he had been in such a state was when he had to agree to a truce with Uchiha Madara and when Madara attacked Kanoha. But this time it was totally different, this war was a piece of shit. They had managed to win the southern front and were heading for the hidden village of Suna while his troops in the west were trying to break through the defenses of Tsuchi no Kuni. But when he had received the missive from Yuzushio asking for help, Tobarama could not gather enough troops and especially not fast enough. This was the distressing fact that he had to accept, Yuzushio was no more. Kanoha had lost a very precious ally. Tobarama looked at the two men standing in front of him, reporting to him. One had been sent with reinforcements to rescue Yuzushio. He had returned to Kanoha and was explaining in detail what they had found when they arrived as the rest of the army had continued their advance towards the Kaminari no Kuni front. The other man was a shinobi on an infiltration mission with the enemy. Indeed, Tobarama knew that such methods were sometimes necessary to accomplish certain missions. And the use of espionage was one of them, the proof today, since this shinobi was present during the eradication of the Uzumaki. His testimony was therefore invaluable to the Naidame Hokage. Unfortunately we arrived too late Hokage-sama, the village was nothing but a pile of ruins filled with corpses. The enemy army was gone when we arrived, the first soldier explained. How many survivors? Tobarama immediately asked, his throat closing and his heart clenching at the news of the elimination of this precious ally. None. I beg your pardon. Tobarama said, completely surprised. How could this be possible? Any confrontation, no matter how violent, did not lead to the annihilation of an entire population. There should normally be some wounded, some survivors. Incomprehensible, moreover, coming from his ally, Ashina Uzumaki, with his experience in war, would have necessarily asked for the evacuation of his city if he had understood that it was doomed. They must have surrounded the town to prevent any evacuation Hokage-sama, that's the only possible explanation for the fact that there are no survivors, the Jnin added immediately. Do you agree? The Senju asked, turning his gaze to the spy. Correct, the troops had surrounded Yuzushio, but a breakthrough could have been made if Uzumaki Dano had sent a heavily armed troop, the second man answered. So why? Tobarama asked himself, looking at his desk. Something eluded him, these Uzumaki with their talent in Finjutsu and their fighting abilities should have escaped. So how could they have simply been wiped off the map without trying to save themselves? They didn't have time, the city was targeted by S-rank ninjutsu, the undercover shinobi added, understanding perfectly the silent questions Tobarama was asking in his mind. Was that scum of the earth M with them? Tobarama asked in surprise. So that was the most rational explanation, the Naidame Tsuchikage was known for using techniques that were totally out of the ordinary. But how could he be on this side when he was supposed to be in the land of rain according to the last report Tobarama had received regarding the position of his enemies? It wasn't from them, the shinobi corrected in a calm voice, knowing full well what the Naidame Hokage's reaction would be. Say that again, Tobarama interrupted coldly. This outburst of harshness was not directed at the reporting shinobi, but at his enemies. Which one, then, had been able to bring about the fall of Yuzushio to weaken Kanoha? for it was obvious that the loss of this ally would have enormous consequences not only on this war but on the leaf's power towards other countries. Yuzushio was not destroyed by Iwa, Suna, or Kumo, repeated the man who had heard the rumors of the army after the Uzumaki clan was eradicated. Ashina would never have tolerated suicide. He had too much honor for that, Tobarama said to himself. If none of the other three countries were responsible, that left the Uzumaki absurd and unlikely option. It didn't come from the Uzumaki clan either Hokage-sama, 
the shinobi added as he waited for permission to continue his report completely. Hearing this sentence the senju was puzzled for a moment and stared at the shinobi spy. Who could have decided to wipe out an entire town like Yuzushio? Who and why? Who? The night aim asked sharply, desperate to get to the bottom of this dark affair. No one knows who they are, or who they work for, began the man who immediately saw a gleam of rage in his leader's eyes. But these are the same two people we've been hearing about since the war started. Some even speak of a third faction. Toborama Senju felt a dull anger rise up inside him when he understood that the shinobi was referring to these two oddballs that he couldn't get a hold of and for whom he had no solid enough information to track down and arrest. So they were not alone. Who are they acting on behalf of? Toborama asked, desperate to know who these two were working for. It was time for this to stop and for someone to take care of them and especially those who employed them. However, the shinobi could clearly feel that the atmosphere in the office had become considerably tense and he knew for a fact that what happened next would not please his superior. In any case, who could take what he had to say? The shinobi had never had so much trouble making a report as this one, but he announced without trembling. They were likely still alone in their actions Hokage-sama. The pink-haired individual appeared at the head of a huge creature in the middle of the city's buildings. And. He hesitated as he searched for words to try and convey the attack the troops had suffered. And what? Speak. Ordered Toborama, who was losing control of his resentment for these two strangers who had been in his way all along. And the other was seen on top of a building and he unleashed a technique that not only ravaged the city but also sank several ships in the vicinity. In one attack Yuzushio was gone, along with many of the enemy shinobi. And the scouts who were sent to the scene were clear, there were no survivors from the land of the whirlwinds. They were all annihilated, civilians and shinobi alike. All of them. Not a single living soul left. I thought it best to return here immediately to give you all this new information, the shinobi finally announced. The night aim didn't answer, too busy organizing his thoughts. So these two individuals were capable of wiping out an entire village. This was the last straw. Toborama Senju could not let this humiliation go unpunished, let alone let them do as they pleased. Today it was Yuzushio and tomorrow who? There was no way he would let these scoundrels roam the various countries with impunity any longer, and above all, he would not take any risk of them coming to attack Kanoha. If none of his elite ninjas had succeeded in capturing them, Toborama decided that it was time for him to go to the front. The war had to end immediately and with it the exactions of these two people whom he now considered to be the ones to eliminate first. If he had had their identities he would have had them entered in the bingo book immediately. But now this detail was insignificant, the Naidame Hokage swore to himself to eliminate them. This had gone on too long, their insolence and impertinence had to end. He dismissed the ninjas and set about preparing for his imminent departure for war, one in which he could only emerge victorious no matter what the cost. Day 320 It had been almost a month since Hiruzen Saratobi had been on the front lines with his team on the outskirts of the Land of Rain. A month that he was leading the troops alongside his best friend Danzo Shimura. They had many tactics to get past and weaken the enemy, but one thing had to be admitted, when a ninja from the Land of Earth wanted to hold a position. He held it firmly. After all, the shinobi of Tsuchi no Kuni were specialists in Dotan Ninjutsu, the element of choice for defense. So it was more than difficult to make a breakthrough in their ranks. But for three days, the Kanoha troops had not attacked once. It was like a ceasefire between the two sides, and this was enforced by Hiruzen when he received a letter from Toborama Senju that sent a great chill through the troops. Hiruzen. Yuzushio is no more, it is time for this war to end, I will be there in four days. Toborama Senju. As he read this letter Hiruzen was so stunned that he did not realize that he had repeated the contents aloud so that not only Danzo Shimura heard it, but also all those around him. The news that Yuzushio had simply been wiped off the map spread like wildfire through the ranks of the Leaf Ninja. On the one hand, the announcement of their leader's arrival was good news, since things would probably go their way. But it could also mean that they were in a very bad position and that the Nidame had to be there to ensure a clear and definitive victory in order not to suffer the same fate as their newly disappeared allies. 
I still can't believe that Yuzushio doesn't exist anymore, Danzo said softly as he sat by a fire with his friend Hiruzen and a few other ninjas. Like you, Danzo. It seems we greatly underestimated our enemies, Sarutobi added with some form of shame. He remembered the conversation he'd had a month ago with his students about how losing one of their allies could be dangerous for them. Sometimes I wonder if what we're doing is really the answer. What do you mean? Danzo asked surprised to hear his friend speak like this. All the ninja gathered around the fire were listening to the conversation Hiruzen had started. They were among the few ninja who had the full confidence of their Hokage. He had carefully selected and trained most of them and among them was an Achiha. Yes, as surprising as it may seem, Tobarama Senju had learned to appreciate an Uchiha for his qualities and values. But this one was the only one who deserved his attention and respect. He was not like the other members of his clan, he had a broader, more global vision. Where the other Uchiha saw family and clan, he saw village and country. So when he heard such a phrase coming from Hiruzen Sarutobi, Kagami Uchiha, the future father of the legendary Shirsue Uchiha, listened very carefully. Despite his young age, he was a more than competent ninja and his analytical skills were extremely advanced. That's one of the reasons why he could see further than most of his clan. Killing each other, Sarutobi explained at his friend's question. That's our job, Hiruzen, Danzo replied mechanically. I know, but this world war is creating what we experienced on a smaller scale in the provincial wars. And the desire for revenge is only growing in the hearts of many people, Hiruzen replied, unable to help the bitter feeling in the back of his throat. When I think of our allies, our friends, our brothers who died because of. Of. In short, it makes me angry and I only want to make them suffer in my turn. There's something else, isn't there? Kagami asked, entering the conversation. Many people turned their heads in his direction surprised at his intervention. He was usually a quiet ninja. Just a bad feeling, Hiruzen said, thinking back to the ambush he and his students had suffered. Do you want to tell us about it? Danzo asked before his friend sighed, massaging his eyebrows. On our way from Kanoha my team and I were ambushed, Hiruzen began. Tsuchi no Kuni Ninja Danzo questioned, not surprised that there were potential enemies behind their line. Hi, but technically I probably should have arrived here alone, my students should have perished by now, he added, repressing a shiver at the thought. Even though it was typical for ninja to die in battle, Hiruzen couldn't imagine it happening to his own students who still had a whole life ahead of them. What do you mean you should have been the only one to arrive? Asked another ninja around the fire. There's no point in pretending, we all know that there are two people somewhere in the elemental nations that are making news. And without those two people my students would probably be dead as we speak, Sarutobi revealed to the assembly. So it's not just a rumor, Danzo said, stroking the scar on his chin. What do they look like? I don't know, I'm just going by my students' descriptions which match what we already know and I think we're dealing with two ninjas of at least A rank, if not S rank. That bad? Asked another man before sipping a hot drink. Our opponents were not extraordinary, but according to Orochimaru their attackers were overpowered in the blink of an eye, I know they're just children, but I trust their judgment. Why did you help your students? Danzo asked, still deep in thought. I don't know, conceded Hiruzen, who had to admit that he was still wondering why they had intervened to save his students. Probably because they're children, Kagami Uchiha interjected as he too was deep in thought. He had been analyzing the potential threat of these two people for a while. Every rumor was based on some truth and not having information was a potential way to get killed. So Kagami set out to gather as many testimonies as possible from his comrades or from civilians he came across. The Uchiha had many questions, why the loss of resources? Why all these raids? Why all these destroyed villages and towns without finding a single body? Why all these disappearances? Who was capable of doing all this and not getting caught? Kagami Uchiha did have a name. But was it even possible? Maybe, but I don't like the idea of two ninjas like that running around like that without anyone knowing who they are, Sarutobi added to Kagami. How did they describe them? The Uchiha asked. 
A woman with pink hair and green eyes wearing a bright red outfit, she has no distinguishing marks that affiliate with any clan or country. And the second one, no one can describe it correctly. Jinjutsu, Kagami thought immediately, seeing it as a simple but effective ability to avoid being recognized. How tall is he? Five feet, maybe less, long hair, the usual stuff, Hiruzen replied as he described the information they already had on these two people. However, having this confirmation for Kagami was important. For to him it was undeniably consistent with one of his more complex theories. He had analyzed the descriptions, the techniques used in the villages and towns. It was ninjutsu practiced by very few people, it was methods that few knew and what gave even more weight to his hypothesis was the size of the individual. At first, Kagami Uchiha didn't want to believe it, but with the elements in front of him, he couldn't help but think that it was more than likely, many things matched each other. After all, no one had found Uchiha Madara's body. And the only living person capable of all this could only be the clan leader declared dead. Chapter 32 Day 324 Genjetsu Zuki, better known as the Naide Mizukage, was one of the most powerful ninjas of his time thanks to his extraordinary abilities in the ninja arts and more particularly in Genjutsu and Ninjutsu. This man was reputed to be invulnerable, not that he had indestructible armor, on the contrary, he was so confident that he only wore cloth clothes. And he could afford it, indeed, his fetish genjutsu technique consisted of using a giant clam capable of releasing a smoke that altered the perception of opponents. The Mizukage and his clam thus became mirages used to protect each other. It was then impossible to know exactly where the summoner of the summons was, making the attacks completely bizarre as no one could reach the real body of either the clam or the Naide Mizukich. Genjutsu techniques were reinforced by the mastery of a particular kind of chakra, Intan or In chakra. This last one allows to create illusions from nothingness or rather thanks to spiritual energy and Genjutsu Zuki was one of the rare ninja to master such an ability. But Genjutsu was not his only skill. Indeed, the Naide Mizukich belonged to the Zuki clan, who were reputed to have the ability to liquefy their bodies into water. Genjetsu had succeeded in mixing oil with water, thus allowing him to obtain more than varied effects on his opponents. This was notably the case of a formidable technique which consisted in transforming the water of his clones into explosive steam before becoming liquid again in an endless cycle, thus making it impossible to stop. Knowing the abilities of this man but also of his famous swordsman, it was better not to have Kiri as an enemy. And this Tobarama Senju was perfectly aware of. At the beginning of the war, the Naidame Hokage had not hesitated for one second to make Kiri his ally. He had managed to easily convince the Mizukage to join him by using his deep hatred against the Naidame Tsuchikage. Indeed, Genjetsu Zuki had a boundless enmity towards them who had only one objective, to make IWA the most powerful and this whatever the way he would succeed. This is why, when the Senju proposed an alliance against Tsuchi no Kuni, the Mizukage did not think for a second and accepted. For as long as he had the possibility of reducing the Tsuchikage to dust, he was ready to accept anything. But before he could face his enemy, Genjetsu Hozuki had left Kiri a month ago and headed for Suna. His troops went through the barren land until they finally reached their goal, Suna, the capital of Kaze no Kuni. The Naide Mizukage intended to take the capital from the rear, taking advantage of the fact that the majority of the wind country's troops were on the side of Yuzushio or on the fronts of Hai no Kuni. On the other hand, he did not imagine that his opponents would have been so imprudent as to let only a few hundred ninja ensure the safety of their village and their kage. Thanks to the surprise effect, the obvious outnumbering of the Kiri ninja against the Suna ninja and the undeniable efficiency of Jinjetsu Zuki, the city fell only after a few hours. They took the Kazakage and his family hostage, forcing the leader of Sunakage no Sato to surrender. The Mizukage obtained the surrender of Kaze no Kuni on all fronts where they were engaged, allowing for a better balance of power in this never-ending war. Once assured that the area was secure and under control, the Hozuki left part of his army behind and headed for the Tsuchi no Kuni front in the hope that perhaps his longtime enemy would be there. Day 325 Fifteen days had passed since Madara had annihilated Yuzushio with his Rinnegan technique. At that point, no life form could have survived the power of the ninjutsu employed unless they were prepared or hidden. 
Thanks to the vast basements of the city and the many finjutsu formulas that had been applied there, the population had been kept safe. For the civilians and soldiers who had not had time to reach the underground, Sakura had worked with Katsuyu's help to protect them from the massive chakra attack. Once the attack was over, Madara had placed sticks mixing finjutsu and genjutsu all over the city. This gave the illusion that there was no longer a living soul in the area, and above all it erased the chakra signatures, even though the ninjas had the ability to camouflage their own presence. So they had all become invisible to the rest of the world. Ashina Uzumaki, who had been so insistent on watching what the Uchiha would do to save them from certain death, had first had the overwhelming urge to reduce the brown-haired man to nothing for daring to destroy his town. His home. And although he had to restrain himself from expressing his rage at the desolate sight before him, the old man could only admit this undeniable truth, Uchiha Madara had just saved his people. He swallowed his pride and remained silent, he was now indebted to this man he had long considered a traitor. And now what? The Uzumaki asked once the entire city was placed in this bubble of illusion. Let's be careful Ashina, any hasty move could lead to our downfall. Let's go back to the underground now, the dark-haired man replied, preferring to make sure no enemies were left around before heading for Haiwa. How long will we stay hidden? The old shinobi asked. As long as it takes. Fifteen days. Maybe twenty, the Uchiha thought, truly fearful that they would be spotted. So they stayed that way, hidden in the basement for several days like caged rodents. A rationing protocol had been put in place to ensure the survival of the 2,000 people crammed there. But Sakura intervened and brought out food supplies for the entire population. No one lacked anything and everyone had only one thought, long live the Finjutsu. Sakura also stood out among the people. Remembering what she had experienced during the Fourth Great Shinobi War, she quickly organized a health center for all the people present, civilians, soldiers, and shinobi. With the help of Katsuyu and her medical skills, the young pink-haired woman set about helping anyone who needed it. She gave priority to all the wounded, which caused astonishment among the crowd. At the same time, nobody knew IRY ninjutsu and some thought that the young woman was practicing magic. But beyond these unusual medical techniques, what caught the attention of the people was Sakura's attitude. Indeed, the young woman never stopped caring for people and she did it with a smile, with gentleness and sincere empathy. It was a rare attitude in these times of war, but it brought comfort to the people and eased their stress of being trapped underground until they were finally allowed to leave this hideout. Taking advantage of being trapped underground, Ashina and Madara discussed what to do next and what would be best for the people. Sakura and Madara mentioned Haiwa, a place of peace, a refuge for the victims of war, a place to start over. But to reach it, they had to make sure that all the people who were here could move around without being seen or heard. This was the new challenge to ensure that their journey went smoothly. Ashina actively participated in a way to guarantee the protection of his people when they could finally leave these ruins and was inspired by Sakura and Madara's sticks. It was imperative to increase the range and stability that the wooden stick emitted. Two thousand people to travel by land would create a population exodus of several miles. The old Uzumaki took into account all the possible parameters, civilians do not move as fast as a seasoned shinobi, and the arrival date at the destination will surely be spread over several days. Taking all these parameters and adding them to those already taken into account by Sakura and Madara's formulation, he created a more complex and above all more reliable system. The Finjutsu allowed for a range of possibilities that would make anyone swoon and the Uzumaki opted for a substance more rigid than a piece of wood so that there would be no worries of involuntary breakage. He proposed his plan to the duo, who approved of this alternative, to use the plates of the shinobi's headbands as a support. This would then allow the seal to be deactivated by another seal that would cancel the technique. Thus, the inhabitants of the now defunct Yuzushio learned of their imminent departure for their next home, a place where peace reigned. All that remained was to organize this exodus. They formed groups of people who would be supervised by shinobi to ensure their safety and especially to ensure the protective wave of illusion around them. Everyone was told to take only a few things with them so as not to slow down the convoy. This was sometimes heartbreaking for the inhabitants because, although they were grateful to be alive, it was still one of the traumas of the war, losing everything. 
And when everyone was ready to leave the basement, the shock was even greater. They discovered that their city was a pile of ruins, their whole life reduced to nothing. Many wept but were quickly called to order, silence was the order of the day. Even if they were under the protection of the illusion technique, they could not be sure that spies were not always posted to ensure that they did not survive. It was better to be cautious and wary, for even if their savior spoke of this safe haven to start a new life, until they got there they had to keep a low profile to hide and preserve themselves. The convoy then set off, and it had already been a week since the crowd had been moving at a steady pace towards Tano Kuni. Ashina stayed close to the Uchiha with whom he regularly conversed. What else do you know? Ashina asked Madara as they walked at a civilian pace. What do you mean Ashina? The dark-haired man asked in return. I still find it hard to believe in this fortune-telling stuff, but the facts are in. You were right about Kanoha's betrayal, you were right about our enemies attacking us, and you're offering my people refuge, the old man said reluctantly. What else do you know about the future? The Uzumaki clarified. Madara recognized in these questions the analytical mind of his counterpart. He intended to be honest with him while avoiding revealing Sakura's secret, her going back in time and her knowledge of a past that had already happened. The brunette had to be quite subtle in his answers but he was used to manipulating words to better lead his interlocutors where he wanted. The war is almost over, Madara sighed. How can you say that? The other questioned, surprised by such a statement. How? Because both armies are running out of steam. This conflict has gone on for far too long and resources are running out. Don't tell me you didn't notice that detail. Said the dark-haired man. Yes, now that you mention it, we have heard reports of food shortages in some areas. But we've also heard that there's been a lot of looting, the Uzumaki said before making the connection between the dark-haired man and the pink-haired woman. It was you, wasn't it? H.N., the dark-haired man replied, which was more than enough for the other to understand everything that had happened since the beginning of this conflict. However, the Uchiha anticipated his counterpart's words by adding with a weary tone. Let me stop you right there in your thoughts, I didn't start the war. I just took advantage of it for my project of a safe haven for all people who want to live in peace. So why do I get the impression that you are not happy that the war is coming to an end? Ashina immediately remarked. Because World War II will soon follow after it's over, Madara stated as if it were a logical and indisputable fact. Seriously, Ashina said in surprise at his tone. Ashina. It's not my job to explain to you how a conflict works. Certainly, I interfered in it to serve my own interests, and I admit that destroying your city will shake up more than one of the elemental nations. Suspicion will be born within the alliances and as everyone has already lost a lot in this conflict, it is inevitable that each Kage will end up getting personally involved on the different fronts in order to end it. But. Madara paused to make sure his interlocutor was following his logic and especially that he was listening carefully to his words. But by choosing this option, most of the Nidame will perish. How can you say such a thing Madara? The current Kage are outstanding ninjas with monstrous techniques. Don't think that you and Hashirama were the only ones scaring the world. The old man snapped, taking the previous words as the Uchiha's legendary arrogance. Didn't I predict that your town would be destroyed? Ashina I told you, I have seen what the future holds for the world. He retorted, pointing to his Rinnegan hidden under his hair. The old man frowned slightly, if the legendary ward conferred this power then it was obvious that Madara could indeed be many steps ahead of his opponents. But the Uzumaki wanted to understand why his interlocutor was assuring that the next war would soon begin. That he had seen it through his eye power was one thing, but the old man was a man who needed concrete evidence, substantial elements to reach that same conclusion. Ashina, give me your opinion, how do you think the elemental nations will feel once the armistice is signed, because it will be signed? All wars end at some point. Even you, as a clan leader who has lost everything because of this war and Kanoha's betrayal, how would you instinctively react? The Uchiha asked innocently. The Uzumaki was beginning to understand what he was getting at. Of course he was grateful that his people had been saved, but the fact remained that it had only been possible because of the dark-haired man's intervention. In other words, if he hadn't intervened. 
and just the thought of Kanoha abandoning them to their sad fate plus the fact that the leaf had deliberately concealed the disappearance of his only daughter. One feeling came over the old man, vengeance. The desire for revenge will motivate the elemental nations to react, the Uzumaki announced calmly in a cold voice. Right, the dark-haired man simply agreed, confirming that his interlocutor understood his way of thinking. But it's Kanoha that will start the hostilities. Of course, a climate of hatred and resentment will be created in every elemental nation, but it is through Kanoha that the second war will begin. I don't know the real motivations that will lead the leaf to behave like a bitch, but Kanoha will try to stir up trouble and cause tensions. All of this will benefit the Sandame Hokage who. The Sandame? Ashina exclaimed, which made his counterpart smile. I repeat, the Naidame will perish in this conflict and even Tobarama will lose his life. Believe me, this is a certainty that cannot be changed. The dark-haired man added, not without concealing the satisfaction he felt at knowing that that bastard Senju would die. So be it. But finally Madara, what exactly is your goal in all this? What's the point of you playing the good Samaritan? And don't give me any of your stories about wanting a safe haven for the victims of war, Ashina demanded, not believing in the utopia the Uchiha was defending at all. Peace. Madara replied harshly. Peace. Ashina repeated in disbelief. You, who are older than me, should understand my feelings. How many of your people have you seen die in your very long life? Too many, isn't it? Imagine me, since we were children we have been confronted with the horrors of conflict and confrontation. And for what? Because some self-important fool has ambitions of conquest. I am tired of it all, Ashina. I'm tired of seeing everyone I love die. I'm tired of doing nothing to change this worldview. So I decided to act, to change this world that is only ruled by hate. Madara had not taken his eyes off the Uzumaki for a moment and continued with conviction. I want to subdue the world and force it to be at peace, this is what I have wanted for so long. But since history is written by the victors, I am the one who is described as the fool, the traitor. The villain, he finally said in a jaded tone. Uzumaki Ashina understood everything his sidekick had just said. How he had wished for peace to be established in the elemental nations for good. But every time a semblance of peace and stability was established, it was shattered again by yet another conflict. War alliances and peace treaties. That's all the old man had known in his lifetime. So yes, a global peace project might be reason enough to embrace the Uchiha's vision. I can understand that, Ashina replied, turning his gaze to his people. He would do anything to preserve and protect them, even adhere to a plan like the Uchiha was proposing. Day 340. Yui's eyes widened at what she saw before her, an architectural marvel like nothing she had ever seen before. It was beyond anything she had ever seen in her short life. Indeed, when she arrived in the land of Tano Kuni, what struck her immediately was the state of the roads. They were well marked and even paved. Even the most developed cities did not have this kind of infrastructure, including such detailed signage. Each town was clearly marked and one detail could not escape those who stopped in front of the various signs offered, Haiwa was the landmark, the central point of all the other destinations. When the young woman arrived with her parents in the valley before the capital, they were overwhelmed by the vastness that stretched for many kilometers. Several villages were being built in various places, and rice fields could be seen spreading out over the valleys. All these small details proved that the region was in full expansion. But what was even more striking when one let one's eyes wander over the region was the immense wall that rose up in the distance. It was impossible to miss it because it was several meters high and undoubtedly served to protect the larger city behind it. And what was equally impressive was that both the wall and the city were still growing, a clear sign of the constant development of the region. It's beautiful, Yui said aloud as they were about to pass through the portcullis of the main gate. The gate was guarded by fifteen or so guards who kept an eye on the world coming in and out of the gate. From time to time, they checked the identity and the reasons why people had come to this place. Are you sure about this, Yui-chan? Asked the woman in her fifties who accompanied the brunette. Yes, Ka-chan, the young woman assured immediately, looking around. Ever since she had met the woman who had saved her from that fateful fate, 
Yui had only one idea in mind, to follow in the footsteps of that savior. So she had done everything to convince her parents to follow her for Haiwa. And as they passed the guards, she looked over her head and saw a large bell and archers positioned inside the wall. The young woman had no fear of seeing them, on the contrary she felt strangely safe within these walls. There was an atmosphere of plenitude in this city. Of peace. Yet outside there was war, countries were ravaging each other, arable land was trampled, deformed, towns and villages assaulted, destroyed and pillaged. But here, the atmosphere was totally different, like a bubble out of time and unaffected by the climate of terror outside. How could a place like this be untouched by war? How was it possible that the people present were so serene, without the slightest sign of worry on their faces or in their attitudes? Yui even wondered if all these people were also victims of war just like her. It's a real anthill, to say the least, said Yui's father over a rather imposing hubbub. Indeed, the main aisle was gigantic and allowed the crowd to come and go without anyone jostling each other. The traffic of people was very fluid in spite of their large number. It was as if the architects had foreseen that the place would receive so many people and that they had anticipated the development of the city. All the structures were made of stone, from the paved floors to the surrounding buildings and the imposing wall that encircled the city. There was no doubt that there was a quarry nearby, so the architects chose this material as a priority. Suddenly, a horn sounded in the city for a few seconds and the population became agitated very quickly without showing any panic or anxiety. What's going on? Yui's mother exclaimed, unaccustomed to such agitation and the muffled sound of the horn. I have no idea, mother, Yui replied immediately, looking around. People were scrambling out of the middle of the road and positioning themselves against the buildings. Get out of the way! shouted a man in the distance before the sound of hooves on stone could be heard. Yui and her parents followed suit and moved out of the way just before a troop of fifty horsemen in formation rode out of town. If she still had any doubts about her choice to come here, Yui had none. Sakura hadn't lied to her. Yui knew that in coming to Haiwa she had finally found what she was looking for, a place she could call home, a place where her family would be safe. But on top of all that, the young woman knew that she could have the opportunity to protect them, something that would never have been possible if they had stayed in their small village. Once the troop of horsemen had left, it took no more than thirty seconds for the activity of the town to resume with its ambient hubbub. Yui and her parents blended back into the crowd until the beautiful brunette spotted a patrol of soldiers. Excuse me sir, Yui exclaimed as she approached the man who appeared to be the leader of the patrol. He was recognizable because he was the only one with a weapon in his scabbard while the others had Asta weapons in their hands. The young woman, although confident, was slightly apprehensive about how she would be treated. She knew that she was physically very pleasing to the eye and that she appealed to the male population. One only had to remember the horror she had almost suffered if Sakura hadn't intervened in time. Besides, she was used to men treating women as objects and not as human beings. But she was once again surprised by the behavior of the man she had just challenged. For the first time in her life, Yui was not subjected to the lustful looks of men. On the contrary, he answered her with such respect and concern that she wondered if all women were treated in the same way. Yes miss. What can I do to help you? I've come on behalf of Sakura-sama. She told me to ask for Suzuki-sama so that I could meet him, she explained bluntly, because she didn't want to get into trouble with the local authorities. Upon hearing these two names, many of the soldiers turned their gaze to the young woman who suddenly felt intimidated by being the center of attention. The patrol leader stared at the young woman and her family with squinted eyes, then looked the beautiful woman up and down as he tried to figure out why Sakura-sama would ask this person to see Suzuki-sama. He had to make sure it wasn't a trap since the possibility of assassination couldn't be ruled out, Sakura's fame had been growing ever since the war began. Did she tell you why you had to meet him in person? I wish to take up arms. This answer had been uttered with force and conviction by the young woman, but it triggered the amazement of her parents. Indeed, Yui had deliberately lied to her parents about her real motives for joining Haiwa. They would never have agreed to follow her and even less to leave their village, especially for this reason. What parents could have accepted that their daughter learn the art of combat knowing that it was something very frowned upon in today's society? Moreover, 
her mother did not fail to exclaim with a voice full of despair. But Yui, my dear, you're not thinking about it. You told us you wanted to run away from the war and make a new life in this town, not join the army. Mother. Please, the young woman pleaded, her heart aching from having to lie to her parents. She was torn between the pain she had just caused them and the visceral urge to feel useful in keeping her people safe. The patrol leader did not let himself be disturbed by the obvious concern of the people accompanying the young woman and asked if they were also moving to the city. Yui did not let her parents answer and took advantage of the shock of her announcement to nod in agreement. Although inwardly puzzled that such a person would wish to take up arms, the man did not express his opinion but gave the following instructions. Follow the main path. When you reach the marketplace, turn left and go straight up the alley to another gate. Tell the guards there what you told me and that you have already been checked. The guards will take you to Suzuki-sama. However, your parents will not be able to follow you. Why is that, sir? Asked the father, who didn't like the idea of leaving his only daughter alone surrounded by so many men. Because as a newcomer and future citizen of this country you have to report and register with the administration. It's a big building, you can't miss it, it's on the same street as the one where you go to see Suzuki-sama. If you can't find it, follow the queue, good day to you, the patrol leader explained before taking his men back to continue their work. As the family began to walk down the designated path, Yui's mother called out to her daughter who was walking ahead. Yui. When were you going to tell us about your plans? Ka Chan, you know very well that you would have done anything to stop me if I had told you in Kaze no Kuni, she replied, pushing her way through the crowd. And it's not too late to turn back, the old woman added, convinced that this idea was an aberration. No mother, you know what happened out there. I never want to be so helpless in a situation like that again. I want to be able to defend myself and the people I love. I don't want to be a woman who is just good for marriage. No mother, I don't want this imposed fate, she defended herself strongly. Indeed, even though she was far too focused on her goal, Yui could see what she was used to when she went somewhere, the furtive looks in her direction. Thanks to the fine features of her angelic face, but also thanks to the feminine aura she naturally gave off, the young woman made men and women alike turn around as she passed. Her mother could not bring herself to let her daughter make such a decision that she called on her husband to intervene and reason with their child. Darling, say something. You're not going to accept this, are you? What do you want me to say? Let her do it, life will bring her to her senses if necessary, retorted the father, who knew that he would not make his beloved daughter change her mind. He was willing to accept her choices as long as she was happy. This ended the conversation and they walked for many minutes before arriving at a huge square which could only be the marketplace. Numerous stalls and shops were spread out over the area where a large crowd was swarming and shopping. Moreover, the hustle and bustle of the area was a noisy mixture of the voices of merchants and customers, some baiting the crowd with advertisements and haggling, others negotiating prices in search of the best deals. This market was unlike any other in the world, as it was overflowing with wealth, both in terms of basic foodstuffs and much more exotic products. This opulence was in stark contrast to the reality of the world outside, where famine and deprivation were the order of the day. This did not escape Yui's father who had stopped in front of so much abundance, he even wondered if he was not dreaming as it seemed so surreal. Could it be that the daimi of this country was much richer than that of Kaze no Kuni? At first sight, the answer was obvious, yes, this country was undoubtedly rich. It wasn't gold or precious stones, but the development of the infrastructure spoke for itself. No elemental nation had such large and well-made walls. But the most important indicator of the wealth of the country and its capital was the serene atmosphere that reigned there. Without any hesitation, the choice of neutrality towards the current conflict had allowed this region to develop and prosper. The girl's father was interrupted in his contemplation and reflections when he heard his daughter's soft but determined voice. I'll meet you later. Indeed, they had arrived in front of the famous administration building, in front of which there were already four queues. There were many soldiers to watch over and ensure the security of the place. People were first searched before they could be invited to wait in one of the queues. Yui was about to leave her parents and head in the direction the soldiers had indicated when her mother hugged her tightly and whispered in her ear. 
Be careful my daughter. Once the embrace was over, the young woman walked with a confident step towards the door she had to use. Yui then noticed that there was a second wall within the city itself. It was three times less high than the one that encircled the capital, but it was probably used to delimit the different districts of the city. And obviously, the young woman was approaching a district reserved for the nobles. Just the quality of the clothes of the people passing through the control gate indicated that they were people with higher incomes than the modest citizens. Moreover, the guards let them pass without checking them more than necessary, whereas the more soberly dressed people were subjected to more scrutiny. Yui did not escape this treatment as she approached this second door. A guard moved slightly towards her and prevented her from going any further. She did not wait for him to ask her why she was here and repeated what she had already said at the first check. As with his colleagues, hearing the name Sakura and Suzuki called out to the guard, who frowned slightly before glaring at the young woman. If she had passed the first check, then she had already been asked the right questions. However, Yui had not expected to be subjected to a body search. She had imagined that mentioning the name Sakura and Suzuki would be enough to get her through. But when she heard the guard call one of the other men behind him and order a search, she felt her body tense with fear, the memories of her attack still fresh in her mind. Reflexively, she closed her eyes tightly as she felt the man's hands come up to her body and rest over her clothes. The guards, as keen observers, understood from this attitude that this woman had surely been confronted with physical or even sexual violence. That is why the man in charge of the search was careful not to make too many gestures, although he was obliged to check that she was not concealing anything that could be a weapon. Nothing to report, boss, the man finally said, sliding his hands down the young woman's trousers from her groin to her ankles. Yui still had her eyes closed and was trying to calm the pounding of her heart following this body search. She had to admit that she had feared that the man would take the opportunity to feel certain areas of her body more intensely, such as her breasts or her crotch. But no inappropriate gestures had been made, which confirmed what she had already perceived, men treated women differently in this city. Suzuki and Hashiba were clear about the army, discipline. Well, Katsuo will guide you to Suzuki-sama, announced one of the guards before moving to another person who approached the large door. Yui reopened her eyes when she heard that she would finally meet the one who would teach her to defend herself and fight. She followed the man named Katsuo and they continued their journey in silence in a neighborhood a little less crowded than the previous one. The buildings were undeniably better worked and more artistic architecture. They walked at a fast pace but she had time to look around until she saw a little higher up a very large building, it must be the home of the daimi. But this was not their destination, they went to another place, much less imposing but nevertheless out of the ordinary. The owner of the place seemed to love art, for many sculptures adorned the building in question. Two men stood in front of the front door and opened it as soon as they recognized Katsuo. Yui could see a spacious and refined interior without being sophisticated. However, they were interrupted in their progress by the pleas of a man behind them. He was dragged by two soldiers who held him by one arm each and they entered the building, passing Yui and Katsuo. The latter had mechanically stopped before entering the premises where they heard one of the guards address the man framed by the other two. Save your breath you scoundrel! shouted a city guard. I didn't do anything. I'm telling you I didn't do anything, the girdled man almost shouted. But of course, sighed the second guard, who then entered a large room. A man was there, sitting cross-legged in the middle of the room, seemingly in the middle of a mediation session. The two guards knelt respectfully before the individual, even as the third man gesticulated heavily between them. Yui was about to enter the room in turn, but she was interrupted by Katsuo, Wait was the only word he said before ordering silence in a single glance. My lord, forgive us, but this man. Began one of the guards still kneeling. What is the crime that has been committed? Suzuki asked bluntly, keeping his eyes closed. Shoplifting, Suzuki-sama, the other soldier answered at once. On hearing this sentence Suzuki opened his eyes thinking he had heard wrong. He had been called in for a simple shoplifting incident. Usually he was called in for more serious crimes, not just a simple theft. Suzuki opened his eyes and looked menacingly at the guards before him. One of the guards was quick to elaborate on the threatening look they were receiving. 
This man has robbed the city jeweler, my lord, he said, placing a purse before his leader. The latter made an imperceptible movement of the head to allow the contents to be revealed to him, there were a good dozen emeralds of all sizes, representing a small fortune. My lord, please, it's not me. The thief defended himself as best he could, but he stopped short as Suzuki raised a hand to silence him. Then he clapped his hands twice and a servant rushed into the room with a wooden log. The two guards saw this and immediately placed the man's right wrist on the log, sleeve uncovered. Suzuki drew his katana from the scabbard and moved towards the man to place the edge of the blade gently on the skin of his wrist. Do you know the punishment for a thief? Suzuki asked, even though everyone in Haiwa knew the punishment for thieves. No. Please. Begged the man who was sweating profusely in front of the sharp fate that awaited him. Suzuki remained silent for a few seconds, which seemed to be terribly long for the thief as well as for Yui who felt the tension around her. She understood that she was in front of the man she was supposed to meet and she was simply impressed by the charisma and strength he exuded. However, this is Haiwa and no one is supposed to ignore the law that applies here. So you have a choice, your hand or three months of hard labor at the stone quarry? Suzuki said in a calm voice. And as expected, since he was not the first to make this choice and they all did, the thief opted for the three months hard labor. Of course, the law was clear, everyone was given a second chance, but if they were to commit crimes again the sentence would be much less lenient. Moreover, the law offered these alternatives for redemption but only for crimes considered minor. The law was uncompromising when it came to unpardonable crimes such as rape and murder. No sooner had the thief made his act choice than he was taken out of the room while Suzuki was quietly sliding his katana into its sheath. Katsuo then took the opportunity to address the man. Suzuki-sama, I bring you someone who wants to talk to you in person. The man looked at the soldier and the beautiful young woman at his side. The latter, although impressed by the man and despite the jerking of her heart, took courage and managed to say in a strong and intelligible voice. I come on behalf of Sakura-sama and I wish to take up arms. Chapter 33 Day 350 The Calm Before the Storm Tobarama knew this expression only too well, having experienced it many times in his life. He was currently with his troops in the land of rain for a battle that was to be decisive. It had been almost a week since both sides had been waiting for action, neither side had engaged in any attacks. And as the days passed, the tension in the ranks increased. This status quo became almost unbearable as everyone was on the alert for the slightest move from the other side. Inevitably, the leaf shinobi began to voice their concerns. Would the enemy strike and when? Would they lay a trap for them? Would they survive? And all these questions did not go unnoticed as Tobarama could feel or even hear them by amplifying his hearing. And it was because of all these feelings and conversations that Tobarama realized that it was high time he intervened in this war. Morale had fallen, supplies were low and the number of casualties had increased, especially since the eradication of Yuzushio. But right now, on this battlefield, there was only one thing to do, wait. Even if he understood perfectly well the state of stress in which his troops found themselves, this latency phase was important. It was even what would make all the difference against the enemy and as a good military strategist, Tobarama Senja knew that he and his troops had to go through this stage. He just had to be patient, just a little longer. Just wait for daylight, wait for the trap to close on their enemies. Only a few more minutes, Tobarama whispered as he saw very fine reflections of light on the horizon. The moment was near, very near. If he wasn't such a shinobi, he might have been overwhelmed by the excitement of his impending plans and the end of this endless wait. But with all the control he had over himself and his emotions, he was unperturbed, focused on the objective he had set himself. He had given precise orders to his soldiers and shinobi and all were in place for potentially the ultimate battle. The one that would decide the victory or defeat of this war. Although they were all aware that they had arrived at the turning point of this confrontation and that they trusted their leader's judgment. None of them dared to clearly formulate the only question that was on everyone's lips, why wait for daybreak in this case? Tobarama could indeed have explained to them why they all had to be ready while waiting for daybreak. But this was also part of the combat strategy, 
maintaining this state of alertness among his men was essential for the future, but not only. Indeed, if they all had to comply with this meteorological requirement, there was a simple reason that had to remain secret for the good of all and to tip the balance in their favor, the Mizukich's army. Genjetsu Zuki, the current Mizukich Naidame of Kiri village, had made this alliance with Tobarama and as such, they were on their way and had to catch the enemy off guard while Kanoha no Sato was busy distracting them. The ninjas of Mizu no Kuni had a reputation for being the best assassination men and that would make the difference on this day. And patience always paid off. The proof would be in the pudding on this day and Tobarama knew it, especially when the moment he had been waiting for finally arrived as the sun was rising. Execute Phase 1, Tobarama calmly ordered two of his subordinates. The two ninjas immediately jumped with their chakra in two different directions to relay the orders. And barely ten seconds later, regular drumming sounds could be heard throughout the area. Usually, a shinobi should make as little noise as possible, but not today. These were the orders given earlier. Tobarama knew, as anyone who had ever fought in their life, that making noise before a battle was a sign of arrogance and self-confidence in order to destabilize the enemy. All means were good to show him that the troops were not at all afraid of him and that whatever the cost, they would be on him. And the desired effect was there, the Naidame Hokage could feel it very clearly thanks to his sensory capacity, panic. The small truce of a week had paid off and that reassured Tobarama. All of his enemies were flailing around lost and confused by the noise, while for seven days there had been such silence on the battlefield. The enemy had lowered their guard very slightly and that would be enough for the leaf ninja. Taking advantage of the enemy's disorganization due to the panic effect, Tobarama waved his hand. Mixed with the din of drums, the sound of hundreds of kanai split the air in the direction of the enemy position, they had been launched almost simultaneously over a width of 200 meters. And once in the air, some wind manipulators used their jutsu to propel the projectiles even further. But in addition to all this ambient noise, one thing caught the eye of the opposing camp. It was too late to dodge, they were going to receive the full force of the attack in progress. Indeed, to each kunai that was crossing the kilometer separating them, was attached an explosive scroll. And in the gradually disappearing night, hundreds of papers lit up the space as they were being ignited to inevitably land on the enemy. Katsu. These were the words of the Naidame Hokage, words that only the leaf ninja heard just before the deafening sound of explosions rang out from both sides. And despite the distance between them, the din of the scroll's detonation did not disguise the screams of the victims who could not escape the technique. Then, with another movement of Tobarama's hand, the real battle could finally begin. The shinobi of Kanoha no Sato charged towards the enemy who was totally disorganized in their actions following the explosive technique. Some of the more seasoned shinobi, who had come to their senses, were positioning themselves for the assault by the opposing troops. Others were busy putting out the fires that had broken out, while others were busy pulling a fellow countryman out of the rubble caused by the detonations. And all of this, the Senju had considered, and he had every intention of taking advantage of the situation and doing as much damage as possible in the enemy ranks. Out of duty. Out of revenge. Because during this war, Tobarama had lost almost all the members of his clan. There were only a handful of Senju left alive and they were all present during this battle. And for this one, the Naidame Hokage had no other option, surround himself with the best. The Uchiha. He had swallowed his pride and put aside his resentment towards this clan. Always a fine strategist, he knew when he needed the necessary skills to achieve his goal. The Uchiha, with their Sharingan, were the most likely to anticipate and do the most damage if sent to the front. As the ninja charged towards the enemy a second burst of wind-propelled kunai passed over their heads and before the weapons even hit the ground, Katsu could be heard behind them. Same technique, same result, explosion soon followed, once again accompanied by the enemy's screams. The crashing noise sounded like sweet music to the majority of Kanoha's ninja, Vengeance. Turning his head back slightly, the Hokage saw his army charging in that direction as well. The military strategy he had decided upon was unfolding perfectly. Indeed, in this kind of world war, it was not only shinobi who were fighting, but also soldiers who did not practice the shinobi arts. A large group of men in armor was trotting along after the ninjas. 
they were samurai, soldiers, militiamen. This was not a new procedure, as it was already in use during the provincial wars. The ninjas fought each other while the armed troops fought separately, as a kind of implicit and rational code of honor. Indeed, it would have been completely absurd to ask a soldier not trained in the ninja arts to go after a simple genin. He would not have been able to keep up with the aspiring ninja's speed and he would have simply lost sight of him, so to engage in combat was purely and simply inconsistent. However, the countries had not given up on training non-shinobi armed troops, as there was one unchangeable rule regarding ninja. Without chakra, ninjas became a much easier target for the enemy to kill. The ninjas were then happy to have an army behind them to rely on. Moreover, even if during a conflict, only the members of the army were left on one side, the army would not venture to attack the enemy still composed of its ninjas and soldiers. Just as it was unthinkable that the ninjas would attack the opposing army first, since they would inevitably suffer the attacks of the opposing ninjas. Projectile! shouted one of the men, Sharingan active. The choice to send the Uchiha to the front of the line had this advantage, they were able to deflect or parry the majority of the weapons thrown in their direction although some were not so lucky and perished under the blow of a kunai. But despite the losses, the shinobi of Kanoha reached the enemy in force. The carnage was finally about to begin. In the middle of the fight, it was impossible to establish a precise strategy because once in the middle of the action, the only desire present was to cause the maximum damage to the opposing camp. This desire could be summarized as follows, two combatants were fighting hard against each other, two sides, two different policies. They were present on the battlefield because their leader had forced them to fight. For their homeland. And today, on one side there was Hai no Kuni who relied on his teamwork and the abilities of the Sharingan and on the other, Tsuchi no Kuni who compensated for this detail by their outnumbering. Of course, any attack led to its share of horrors and atrocities. Everything was going very fast, there was no time to observe in detail what was going on around them at the risk of perishing at the hands of the enemy. And that was what was happening to these earth ninjas. An aspirant who had stayed close to his master had seen him in trouble and had wanted to help him. But because of his lack of experience and reactivity, he did not see the Uchiha's feint that fell on him. The earth ninja had no time to react, so much so that the speed of execution had caught him off guard. In a fraction of a second the apprentice's throat was slit, taking his life in the process. No. No Akira. Shouted the ninja who had just seen his student die before his eyes. You scum. He was just a child son of a bitch. At times like this, even the most highly trained shinobi could be overwhelmed by anger and rage. They were still human beings with emotions. And the earth ninja was so angry and upset at losing the student he had trained for years, with whom he had bonded, that he charged the Uchiha without further thought. He had forgotten that emotional control was key on the battlefield, it wasn't for nothing that they had always been taught to let go of feelings and impulsiveness. Letting anger get the better of you could be very dangerous, especially when the enemy has mastered the art of teamwork. He focused his hatred only on the Uchiha without seeing the third person who stabbed him in the liver. The pain was so great that it paralyzed him, giving the brown-haired man time to quickly decapitate the earth ninja, without a word, without scruples. At the same time, a few hundred meters away, an Uchiha was killed, surrounded by five Tsuchi no Kuni ninjas. As much as shinobi had to know how to control their emotions in order not to act on impulse, they should not be too rash either. The leaf shinobi forgot that although he belonged to a clan with prestigious techniques, he was still a man. He was so presumptuous and confident in his abilities that it cost him his life. Such was the game at the heart of the battle, die or stay alive. And as the battle went on, the battlefield was littered with this, death. But on this day of battle, there was something different on both sides, the active presence of each of the Naidaim. M. the Naidaim Tsuchikage and Tobarama the Naidaim Hokage. And the participation of the Kage within their own troops had the sole purpose of eradicating the opponent as quickly as possible. This war had gone on too long, it had to end, even if it meant taking care of it yourself. Jean Tun Kai Ransu. M pronounced as he floated slightly in the air, aiming at a group of leaf shinobi. From his hand appeared a bright light encircled by a translucent film before a beam of the same light shot from his hand to its destination. 
everything the light touched imploded. The Tsuchikij was one of the most devastating ninjas in this battle thanks to his Jintan ability. Unfortunately, he couldn't abuse it, as it was extremely chakra intensive, but it did allow him to do immense damage to the opposing side. Each technique of Jintan launched by M made a minimum of 50 deaths. The second most devastating person present was Tobarama Senju who was in constant movement thanks to his teleportation technique. He would appear out of nowhere and slice someone before dropping an explosive tag on the ground or on the enemy. Then this same tag would split with one of his techniques creating a domino effect of explosion across the battlefield. Suetun, Yari no Kakatoku. Tobarama uttered as water also materialized out of nowhere and three condensed spears shot forward, skewering and cutting through anyone in front of him. With this technique Tobarama killed dozens of earth shinobi. As the battle raged throughout the area, a light mist began to appear as the seconds passed. It could be mistaken at first for smoke made by a fire technique, or steam resulting from the contact of a fire and water technique. But it was nothing of the sort, it was indeed mist. Suddenly, in the middle of the battle, a thin blade pierced a man, then two, then three, followed by a dozen others in only a few seconds before being planted in a tree. This thin blade, more like a long needle, was attached to a wire and the weapon suddenly turned around and returned to its owner. A man carrying a sword twice his size appeared behind a group of earth ninja as if from nowhere. He lowered his weapon, which must have weighed a ton, with such speed that three men were cut down in one blow. Their bones and entrails were shredded from their bodies before scattering to the ground in a great spurt of blood. Another man materialized in the middle of a combat zone and struck with his very large sword, which was parried in extremis by his opponent. The swordsman was surprised but extremely pleased by this parry, it meant an explosion. From his weapon, a group of explosive parchment detached itself to come and stick on his opponent before everything exploded, reddening the surroundings. It seems that Kiri has finally arrived, Tobarama remarked as he felt many signatures approaching from the south. But more importantly, he felt many shinobi perish at once as seven rather large signatures entered the battle, the seven swordsmen of mist were in the place. They were considered the most deadly ninjas of the elemental nations, but also the most sadistic. It was said that they took pleasure in killing their enemies, in making them suffer. So a rush of fear began to grip the earth ninja as many of their own began to die. Hokage-sama shouted a leaf ninja as he dodged a number of attacks to get to his military leader. What? A message. Do you honestly think this is the time for paperwork? Tobarama shouted as he killed another shinobi in front of him. That's the rakage seal on it. The paper shinobi insisted and it had the desired effect, Tobarama glared at his subordinate. The rakage writing to him. For what reason? Tobarama concentrated a lot of chakra in his lungs and mouth before making some kanji with his hands. Swaitan, Swishoda! exclaimed the Naidame Hokage as he unleashed one of his most powerful ninjutsu techniques. From his mouth came a veritable tidal wave of water designed to propel all of his enemies in front of him and hopefully drown a number of them. This would also give them some respite on this side of the battlefield. The Senju then turned to his ninja to grab the scroll. To the attention of the Naidame Hokage Tobarama Senju. By the presence of this missive, I.A. Naidame Rakage desire a truce in this war which brings only death to our respective sides. I am ready for a meeting to sign a temporary alliance until this war is over. If you are interested, I await you in Kumo. A. Naidame Rakage. This letter changed a lot of things for Tobarama Senju, especially since this missive was signed by a blood signature, which testified to the veracity of its contents. He was thinking fast about what to do, so he looked around. The battle was going quite well and the arrival of the Mizukij's army should allow them to win this battle. So Tobarama Senju did not hesitate and gave many orders for the continuation of this battle and also to indicate who would take his place as leader during his absence. Sarutobi Danzo Kagami Hamura Koharu Tobarama shouted to his five most promising students. They all turned in his direction as they called out to him and all reached his side in an instant. Hokage-sama. We are leaving to sign a truce with Kumo. 
Tobarama announced and gave no further explanation before hurrying off towards the land of lightning. At the same time, in the middle of this mass grave, a man under Genjutsu moved peacefully forward before making an invocation. Kuchios no Jutsu. In a puff of smoke, a giant clam appeared in the middle of the battlefield, the Mizukage Genjetsu Zuki was there. As soon as his summons was present, he revealed himself and when everyone recognized him, many tried to kill him. Everything was used, kunai, shuriken, ninjutsu, explosive tags. But nothing did, he was invulnerable. Such a kitch. Come and fight, you coward. Genjetsu shouted in the middle of the battlefield. Many tried to attack him in a treacherous manner, but none of the attacks aimed at him did anything to him. Every ninjutsu, every weapon, every finjutsu was ineffective against him, for he was only an illusion. And in the midst of all this chaos, his voice echoed everywhere as he used the chakra of the mist to make it resonate over the entire battlefield, I know you're there. Come and fight. Or shall I execute every one of your men? Eradicate your city so you'll deign to come out of your hidden. Jean Tun, Kujo. Utter them who was standing on a pile of earth, unseen. The technique landed right on Genjetsu's position and its surroundings. If he could not touch him, then M was going to try to get him by reaching a large area in the hope of injuring him. At the Mizukage's location, an intense light appeared surrounded by a translucent film that grew for three seconds before imploding over a radius of nearly fifty meters. Everything in the place had been eradicated, earth, plants, weapons, enemies. Allies. A deadly silence had settled over the battlefield. At the same time two of the greatest ninjas of the time were fighting and one had probably just died. A very slight smile appeared on the Tsuchikage's lips when he heard no more sound from the Mizukage. There was only a large cloud of dust that was slowly fading away. But the silence was broken by the burst of laughter of Genjetsu Hazuki who was completely intact in the center of the crater made by M. Is this all you have to offer me? Is this all the power that Tsuchi no Kuni has to offer me? Taunted the Mizukage in the face of his opponent whom he hated. Fear could be felt in the battlefield as he heard this man's words. He deserved his reputation as an invulnerable man. Normally, no one survived an attack by Jean Tun. TCH. You're just a big mouth. The man covered in bandages retorted. Ha ha ha, but unlike you, I can afford to be a loudmouth. Genjetsu ironically turned on himself, so that his opponent could see him well and especially to detect him, because after all, M was invisible to all. Then suddenly, the Mizukage stopped in one direction before extending his arm forward with his hand in the shape of a pistol. Many people's eyes widened as they recognized the legendary technique of Genjetsu. M reacted at the quarter turn when he knew that he had been spotted. Sweitun, Suisei Tei. Said the musicage and from his index finger shot a small ball of water that crossed the battlefield in a second at the very spot where his opponent was. The water projectile pierced the mound of earth that was about five meters thick as if it were butter. Attack him. The tsuchikage ordered as he dodged a second water shot. Ha ha ha. They can't reach me you idiot. Genjetsu mocked as many weapons hit him but did not touch him. Behind him, his clan was suffering the same fate but it was also in a genjutsu and thus did not suffer any damage as long as the illusion was attacked. M had no choice but to run on the battlefield to dodge numerous water shots launched by his opponent. He knew it, it only took one shot to be finished with him. Just look at what the Mizukage's technique was doing behind him. Anyone unfortunate enough to be hit by the Mizukage's ninjutsu was literally pierced through and through. And a game of cat and mouse began between the two kages. M tried several stratagems during the next few minutes to defeat his opponent but he could not find out the true position of the Naide Mizukich. Then, while this maneuver had been going on for a while, Genjetsu Hozuki stopped shooting. He was tired of playing cat and mouse with his enemy. No. This is not humiliating enough for the execrable being that you are, said the Mizukich, lowering his arm along his body. Then Genjetsu split and a clone emerged from his body. Another of his legendary techniques. Let's see if you even stand a chance against a mere Tsuchikage clone. Boasted the Kage of Kiri sarcastically. The oil and water clone rushed at full speed towards M who also charged the clone. 
In the Tsuchikage's memory, his opponent was incompetent in the field of Taijitsu and he was right, the Naide Musikage was weak in Taijitsu. M thus quickly took the advantage on the clone. However there was something strange and particularly disturbing with this clone, his sadistic smile. M was more flexible, more agile and managed to dodge and parry the weak attacks of Jinjetsu, but it was before he understood what was the mistake he had made by engaging in this hand-to-hand -hand combat. With his mastery of Yin and Suetun, the clone was able to alter his own body to create growths. In a single blow, the clone's right arm was transformed into a blade that narrowly missed M's body, who dodged in extremis with eyes wide open. It was therefore a less confident man who attacked the clone. URG. Moaned M after having hit the head of the clone. He felt the bones in his hand break under the impact and didn't understand why it was so solid, it felt like hitting iron. The technique of the Mizukage allowed him to modify the density of his clone with oil to make its head or any other part of its body as hard as steel. So M just started to dodge for the next few seconds attacks coming from unlikely places of the clone's body. If this continued too long, he would exhaust himself for nothing, so M did something normally dangerous, he made his gene ton at short range. A light appeared in the back of the clone before it imploded. Except that the technique of the Hozuki clan had a second effect, when the clone was in movement, the oil inside started to heat to extreme temperatures. So when Jin Tun blew it up, the boiling water and oil shot out at everyone around, Suchikage included. All of them screamed in pain as the bubbling rain washed over them. After a few seconds, the air cooled down and hundreds of small drops of water and oil gathered in one spot to reform the clone of Jinjetsu Hozuki under the frightened gaze of all his enemies. You are pathetic to call yourself Kageem. Jinjetsu taunted with a smile. Pathetic? That I know of, it is you who hides behind your illusion techniques. Not once did you really confront me face to face. Of the two of us, you are the coward. M shouted at his opponent. He wanted to provoke him, to force him to make a mistake that would allow him to potentially take the advantage, he only needed a tiny moment. And as his eyes searched for the real Jinjetsu, a deafening noise resounded behind him as a spike of pain shot through him. He stood there uncomprehending for a few seconds before he felt heat on his chest. He looked down to see his bloody torso with a hole in the center. He slowly turned his head and saw the real Jinjetsu Hoski looking at him with an arrogant smile and his hand shaped like a gun. I've been by your side since the beginning you fool. You're just like all the others, not paying attention. He had played with him since the beginning and he could not do anything against that. M suddenly lost his balance when almost all the fighting had stopped, Akage was going to die soon. The Tsuchikage collapsed on his back before seeing his long-time enemy above him with his arrogant smile. Your weak little worm, Jinjetsu began before looking up at the assembly, and it's your turn. But the Mizukage had forgotten an immutable rule in combat, never underestimate your opponent until they are actually dead. As soon as Jinjetsu turned his attention from his person, M took advantage of it. He was going to die, it was a certainty. But he would be damned if he did not take this man with him to the grave he very quickly channeled his chakra to mold it into Jin Tun and a bright light appeared near Jinjetsu's torso who saw the technique only too late. It exploded and the Mizukage's torso was blown to smithereens. Nearly a quarter of his torso was gone with the disintegration technique. Pieces of organs, bones, and spurts of blood spilled out all around Jinjetsu as he collapsed to the ground dead, killed by his own arrogance. Die little shit. M said before feeling his heart stop beating and his eyes blink. Two of the greatest shinobi legends had just killed each other. Chapter 34 Day 355 Tell me Haruno-san, did you copy my daughter's seal? Said the Uzumaki patriarch bluntly. They had been walking through Tano Kuni territory towards Haiwa for a week. At first, Ashina had focused on Madara and his legendary ward to get an idea of what the future would hold, but now he wanted an answer about this famous seal. It was very rare to meet a Finjutsu genius outside of the Uzumaki clan and the design of this frontal seal was unique, never seen before. No Uzumaki Dano, Sakura answered honestly. In a way it was the truth since it was her sensei, Tsunade Senju, who had applied the forehead seal to her. It was later improved by the Rikid Senin. Ashina. 
I beg your pardon. Call me Ashina, the Uzumaki repeated. On the condition that you call me Sakura. I will. You don't seem satisfied with my answer Ashina-san. Let's just say I have a hard time swallowing that someone I've never heard of is wearing my daughter's seal, the patriarch explained, staring at the pink-haired young woman. This seal is not of my making Ashina-san, it was placed by my master as a reward for surviving his teaching, Sakura revealed. Then I had to learn Finjutsu by myself, my mother didn't have time to pass on all her knowledge, I can only understand certain mathematical sequences. Did your mother master Finjutsu? Ashina asked suspiciously. Hi, mother was an extremely competent person. Are you affiliated with my clan in any way Sakura-san? Ashina asked casually. After all, there were a few of her members who had disappeared in the past. So it wasn't impossible that these members had children. If that was the case, she never mentioned it. Sakura could feel the Uzumaki's piercing gaze on her and more specifically on her forehead seal. She suspected that he was trying to decipher the few formulas present that only a master of Finjutsu could see with the naked eye. However, the improvement of the Rikid Senin made this seal impossible to understand for anyone. After all, Hagoromo Tsutsuki had over a thousand years of experience and perhaps he had seen that the Uzumaki would rally to Madara if Sakura chose to guide the Uchiha on the right path. And that assumption only the hermit could deny or deny. Ashina-san, I know that you have many questions for me and they are well founded. However, just like Madara, I desire only one thing, peace. So, do you think you could disregard my frontal seal and believe me when I tell you that I did not steal your daughter's work? Listening to the young woman, Ashina understood why Madara liked this woman, she was one of a kind. She was a person who didn't let herself be impressed, who wasn't afraid to assert herself and as he watched her act since the attack on Yuzushio he couldn't help but see his daughter through her. Independent, confident, powerful, loving. How did you know Madara? Sakura really hadn't expected this question, and it took her a while to answer. Ashina Uzumaki was not the type to be interested in sentimental stories, the question must have had a deeper meaning, the man was waiting for the reasons why she shared the same vision of peace as the Uchiha. I saved his life, Sakura replied, remembering her arrival in the Sengoku era. Ashina returned his gaze to the woman at his side. Saving the life of a shinobi of Madara's caliber was no small task, especially since there weren't many ninja capable of taking down this man. Ashina thought and cross-checked all the information and theories he had to come to one conclusion, this woman had come into the brown man's life when he was about to die. And there was only one ninja who could say that he had finished off the Uchiha. Against Hashirama, wasn't it? Sakura simply nodded to confirm what the Uzumaki patriarch had just said. He wanted to learn more about her medical ninjutsu abilities that he had seen in action during and after the destruction of his city, but he didn't have the time to ask her about it. They had reached a cliff turn that revealed a huge valley before them. Welcome to Haiwa Ashina-san, Sakura said with a smile as she looked ahead. This was nothing like her last visit and she was as impressed as the Uzumaki people were at what lay ahead. Winter had finally ended and the beginning of spring had taken its place. The vegetation was gently budding and a shade of green dotted the valley. Seeing the villages, the crops and the great wall in the distance, Sakura knew they had done the right thing in proposing this alternative to Hashibushita. You should order your men to cancel the illusion seal on their headbands, it might create problems for the people of this place, Madara advised as he arrived at their side. Ashina did not reply except to give a few orders to his men, who quickly dispersed throughout the convoy. After five minutes, all the illusion seals were deactivated. How long have you been preparing this? Ashina asked with a mixture of admiration and suspicion. A project like this couldn't be decided in five minutes, it needed a precise plan and above all time and means to achieve it. The Uzumaki knew very well, cities weren't built in a snap of the fingers whether your name was Madara Uchiha or not. Almost a year, Madara replied as he looked at the Haiwa wall. He realized how well the city had developed and how right they had been to rely on Haiwa to establish their peace project. At the same time on the Haiwa wall, the panic reached its peak when suddenly from nowhere, a gigantic grouping that was several kilometers long appeared on the road. The alarm was quickly sounded, a long horn was heard throughout the valley. 
It was one of the warning signals set up within the city. Indeed, as the city was constantly growing, a defense and warning system had been set up to react to any threat. A promontory had been built on the side of the mountain where the capital was located. From there, almost at the top, a viewpoint had been set up in order to have an overview of the whole valley. Then three huge horns were built and transported to the top. Three horns, for three levels of alert. Each of these alarms could only be sounded in specific places and by specific people who were authorized to do so. The first was sounded directly by the sentries to announce the arrival of a large caravan, allowing the army to act accordingly and all the inhabitants of this valley to know that something new was about to arrive in the capital. The second alert could only be ordered by an officer by ringing a bell, thus giving the order to activate the second horn in the shape of a wolf's head. This alert mobilized the entire army, signaling a more than likely threat. The inhabitants had to go home until they heard the horn again. And it was this horn that had been activated and was sounding in the Hiwa Valley. People were quickly packing up their belongings in order to return home as soon as possible. Numerous horsemen were gathering at strategic points, and to a trained eye movement could be seen at the top of the wall. The city was preparing for a potential attack. As for the third alert. It could only be activated by a rope in the council chamber. It was ringing a bell that had never been heard before in the capital. What is the state of the place? Suzuki ordered as he climbed the stairs quickly accompanied by soldiers. A tide of people just appeared out of nowhere on the main road, explained one of the soldiers who had taken a seat beside Suzuki. How many? Several thousand at first glance, Suzuki-sama. Armed force? A lot of it is an armed force and some of it seems to be shinobi. Shit! Suzuki exclaimed, he wasn't about to be assaulted by shinobi in any way. Sure, thanks to Sakura and Madara they now had a few ninjas in their camp, but it wouldn't be enough to compete with several thousand people. Suzuki hoped with all his heart that these people were sent by the two protagonists they hadn't heard from in a while. How fast are they moving? Asked an officer beside Suzuki. Civilian. How long before the trebuchet is armed? Within a few dozen minutes. Soldier, a long sight. Suzuki demanded once he reached the top of the wall. When he saw the swarm of people on the road in the distance, he felt a drop of sweat run down his neck. And it was with a certain amount of fear that Suzuki raised the spyglass to his one good eye. He took a quick glance at the road to gauge their strength before finally looking to the front of the road. Blow the horn again, Suzuki said in a more relieved voice. Sound the horn. Shouted one of the officers towards a tower before a bell sounded, followed by the long sound characteristic of the second alert, but this time signaling its end to the inhabitants. A thin smile appeared on Suzuki's face as he recognized Madara Uchiha and Sakura Haruno side by side. So they were back and they weren't alone. They were stepping out in front of an entire people, an army, shinobi. A future. During the hour that followed the arrival of this convoy of more than 2,000 people, the whole city was in organization mode. They had to be placed, housed, and fed for the next few days before they could be given an entire area of the city. Or rather of the city for these people who had just swelled the ranks of Hiwa. So it was late in the evening that a council meeting was called. It was composed of the regulars as well as Madara, Sakura and Ashina. Achihadano, Sakura Dano, I must admit that when you told me about welcoming people, I wasn't expecting so many, said Hashiba, who was still having trouble getting used to the idea of newcomers. Never underestimate an Uchiha, Madara replied with his arms crossed. Always so pretentious Madara, Ashina said, royally ignoring protocol. He was, after all, older than anyone else in the room and a legendary ninja to boot. Let me introduce you to Ashina Uzumaki, Yuzukage of her people, Madara introduced, ignoring the previous little dig. It's good to know that the information we received about Yuzushio's disappearance was just a rumor, said Ramaji, stroking his long white beard. Unfortunately, this rumor is anything but a rumor, Ashina retorted resentfully, frowning. You knew it was necessary Ashina-san, Sakura said reassuringly as she gently placed her hand on his shoulder. Thanks to this, your people are safe. I know Sakura-san, but you can't blame me for having a more than bitter taste in my throat that several generations of history have been swept away in an instant. 
As he said this, Ashina's gaze shifted slightly to the Uchiha who remained as neutral as possible. The future belongs to those who move forward and do not look back, Madara said. Upon hearing this sentence, Sakura twitched her right eyebrow slightly. In a way, this sentence could be aimed directly at her. Hadn't she left her present in order to look back and change it? But it is by learning from the past that we learn not to commit them again, Ashina added, creating a slight tension in the room. Gentlemen, please, this is not the time to settle your differences, Sakura interjected, not wanting to hear yet another deaf conversation between these two men. Even if they were both right and their arguments were completely fair, this was neither the time nor the place to have such a debate. But it was stronger than they were, obviously. He shouldn't have destroyed my town, Ashina retorted, crossing his arms. H.N. The council members, and especially Hashiba, didn't know how to react to such a situation. Two of the greatest ninjas the world had ever known were acting like children. On top of that, they were being reprimanded and diplomatically put in their place by a woman. The daimi took an additional note in the back of his head, for her to have the respect of these two men of character, it was important not to antagonize the young woman. The latter had to make a considerable effort not to let her anger out and send them both over the edge like she used to do with Naruto when he made her lose her temper. Ashina-san, I present to you the daimi of Ta no Kuni, Hashibushita. It's partly thanks to him that this project we're putting together came about, Sakura introduced, trying to divert the conversation to something more important than their childish fight over why Yuzushio was destroyed. You're either very brave or suicidal to associate yourself with an Uchiha, Ashina remarked. The latter did not try to spare his words, he had always been like that, frank and direct, without filter and without pretense. If the daimyo had been offended by this half-insult he did not show it in any way. Let's just say that Uchiha Dano had the arguments to convince me of Uzumaki Dano, Hashiba answered simply. Nah. Don't bullshit me Hashiba-san, Ashina said with a wave of his hand. Even if Madara is a pretentious little prick, the fact remains that we are all here for one purpose. My country is in the hands of the enemy, my capital has been reduced to dust, and the world has been killing each other for far too long. My people mean everything to me, so I would do anything to preserve them, and I am sure you would too. As far as I'm concerned, we are men with great responsibilities on our shoulders, so spare me your protocol bullshit. After such a tirade, silence fell in the room and with such an insolent and spontaneous attitude, Sakura understood where Naruto got his temper from. You're one of a kind of Shina-san, Hashiba replied after a long minute of pondering the old man's words. The daimi was not at all upset by the Uzumaki's frank attitude, on the contrary, he found it refreshing. As the lord of his country, he was used to the mannered protocol of politicians and he really appreciated the bold and honest behavior of this old man. And I hope I did the right thing in entrusting the future of my people to your city, the Uzumaki added with a hint of skepticism in his voice. I ask myself this question every day regarding the proposal of your two friends, but the results are there and with your arrival, my country, which was insignificant at the time, is now one of the most powerful without the world knowing about it, Hashiba reassured him, who had long doubted his choice by trusting Madara. Now that you're back, what's next? He asked the Uchiha, who had remained silent throughout Ashina's speech. The war is coming to an end and it will soon be time to make ourselves known to the rest of the world, not on a military level, but on its prosperity, thus attracting even more people to us. However, we will have to be careful and rigorous about counterespionage and control of new people coming here, Madara said, thinking about the question. What about my people? Ashina asked, thinking first of her clan. The western part of the city will be made available to you and your people, Hashiba explained, and at the moment he was practically the only one to answer. You'll have to choose the ones you trust the most to serve as your advisors, Ashina, Madara interjected. Why is that? Because Haiwa has a unique military and administrative system. As soon as the war is over, power will be divided into several segments to preserve a balance for future generations. A kage for all military matters, a daimi to manage the country administratively and economically, each composed of a triumvirate. These two triumvirates will advise and elect a new daimi and a new kage when both die. Each of these two triumvirates will then be advised and supported by a larger council, 
which will allow for a more efficient management of the country and where corruption will not occur, Madara explained. I assume you will be the Kage of Haiwa Madara, Ashina said more in affirmation than questioning. Hi, I have too much invested to see what we are doing swept away by an incompetent, but know Ashina that in this future I want you by my side as much as Sakura-san. So I would like you to choose the right people to support you militarily and others who can support our beloved Daimi administratively and economically. Should I call you Kagesama? The Uzumaki asked, reluctant to bow to the Uchiha. He had already accepted many things from the dark-haired man, but to stoop to this point was out of the question. No, for me Ashina you remain Yuzukage and of the same ilk as myself, you remain the leader of your people, but when it comes to the preservation of this country, it will be my responsibility and by extension yours. I do not intend to stop here Ashina. What do you mean? As I told you before, the Second World War will come soon. Excuse me. Suzuki exclaimed for the first time, having been listening very carefully to the conversation from the beginning. If you hadn't eradicated all your enemies during the Muromachi War Suzuki-san what do you think would have happened to your country? Madara asked, turning his attention to the army leader. The man concerned tilted his head slightly forward to ponder the question. And the answer came to him quickly, they had gotten rid of all their enemies so they wouldn't have any revenge. I understand, Uchihadano, the man replied humbly. It is the same thing that is going to happen in the world, hatred, revenge, resentment, and I do not intend to wait for it to happen. This country will become a reference point where people will know that it is a good place to live and that they are safe. I intend to recruit other shinobi clans, I also intend to rally my clan to Haiwa when the time comes and I intend to eradicate all those who oppose me. The Uchiha announced harshly. Everyone in the room except Sakura and Ashina swallowed as they heard the Uchiha speech, he exuded such presence. Charisma and at the same time threat that none of them would have imagined that it could be otherwise with what he had planned to do. However, as she listened to Madara Sakura felt fear come over her, she heard the old Madara speak and she began to fear that he would make the same mistakes he had made in the past. She quietly placed her hand in the hand of the man she loved and he looked into the eyes of the pink-haired woman. He saw in the emerald of her eyes, doubt, fear and he quickly understood her fears. He didn't push her hand away, but rather stroked it very slowly with his thumb to reassure her, no. He would not make the same mistakes as his alter ego from the future. But for the moment, it was time to strengthen himself internally. The council lasted a long time where all the administrative questions were discussed for the management of all this little world. The meeting finally came to an end and everyone was tired with a lot of new information to digest and put in place quickly. But they were all delighted with the way things were going, the future looked big and prosperous. The council members gradually left the room until only Hashiba, Madara and Sakura were left. The daimi then approached the Uchiha and informed him. Uchiha Dano, I have taken the liberty of setting up flats in my house for you and Sakura Dano. You'll find all the comforts you need and I've also provided you with servants who can attend to your needs, make yourself at home here, the daimi explained before turning to his own quarters. The dark-haired man merely nodded in the direction of their host as a sign of acceptance. They were led, as they had been the last time, by a servant to the rooms that were intended for them. Unlike last time, Madara no longer hid his face, for everyone here knew and understood that it was for their own safety not to reveal the identity of the two people present here. Another difference was that the daimi had reserved several living rooms for them to feel comfortable. But what had not changed were the two servants who were waiting with dignity for the couple, Amaya and Hannah. Amaya, the older one, waited calmly for the two to arrive and greet them, but Hannah could hardly contain her joy at seeing their friend Sakura again. Amaya had to gently but firmly remind the other woman to calm down. Hannah. Behave yourself, this is no way for a servant to behave, she breathed through her teeth as the couple now stood before them. My lords, she said as they both bowed, you are welcome, we are at your service, ask us what you wish and we will provide it. We have had your chambers prepared my lords, your room is this way Lord Dano, Amaya announced as she pointed with a delicate wave of her hand to the door on her right, and the door on. But the maid was interrupted by the hard, but non-aggressive voice of the dark-haired man, Dot. Sakura will occupy my room as well. This simple sentence triggered a slight hint of tension in the atmosphere, 
the two maids and even less the pink-haired woman had not expected such a statement from the man. Indeed, it was unusual in those days for a couple not bound by marriage to be allowed to share a room. Especially since Sakura did not have the status of a concubine, only this case could have been tolerated if it had been previously accepted by the Lord. But the tone used by the Uchiha left no doubt, what he had just stated was indisputable and should be applied as such. After all, the maids were not in the confidences of their daimi and if it was so agreed, they had no opinion to offer anyway. Amaya bowed respectfully to Madara, who had already begun to make his way to the room in question, Hana also following suit a little more hesitantly. It will be as you say, the older girl replied soberly. Sakura was puzzled for a moment, but as soon as the dark-haired man closed the door on her she felt a warm embrace. Hannah couldn't contain herself any longer and let her joy at seeing the young woman she considered a dear friend express itself. Oh Sakura-san! I'm so happy to see you back with us, safe and sound. We were so worried about you, weren't we Amaya-chan? The blonde said as she hugged Sakura tightly like Eno would have in the old days. The thought flashed through the rose's mind and she shivered slightly with nostalgia, causing the young woman to release her fear that she had hurt her. Something wrong, Sakura-san. Did I hurt you by holding you against me? No, don't worry Hana-san, the way you acted reminded me of a friend I had a long time ago, Sakura confessed softly, I'm glad to see you both again too. I'm glad to see you again, madam. We've heard so much about your exploits in the lands where there is war. We have not stopped fearing for your safety, but my heart is finally at peace knowing you are back with us, especially since a woman has no place on a battlefield, she added in a sanctimonious tone. Sakura sensed this immediately and remembered perfectly their last conversation about the place women were supposed to have she wanted to object but was whisked away by the energetic blonde to a separate room. Come with us Sakura-san, we'll take care of you. After all, I don't suppose you've had much time to take care of your body during your journey with your lord, Hannah asked as she took her friend's hand and led her away. Besides, something very interesting must have happened for your lord to demand that you leave. Hannah. The brunette exclaimed sharply, don't forget who you're talking to. Sakura-sama is not one of your domestic friends. That's not something to ask and it's none of your business, Amaya scolded with a stern look. The blonde automatically lowered her eyes at her elder's admonishment, she knew she had crossed the line and the joy of seeing Sakura again didn't excuse her familiar behavior. Forgive my impropriety Sakura-sama, the blonde implored as she bowed in respect and humility before entering the bathroom reserved for her personal use. It's nothing Hana-san, the rose reassured before following the two young women who were inviting her into the room. Like the other time, the room contained a silver bathtub, a dressing table and this time a table with cushions and towels. Sakura remembered that special moment when she had to let these women take care of her, like a princess. It wasn't an unpleasant memory even though she was always a little embarrassed that other people could take care of her toilet. But she also knew that it made these women happy to be able to do so. Hana-chan. Would you please finish preparing the bath water? Amaya asked as she motioned for Sakura to come next to her. Sakura-sama, please take off your clothes, after these long days away from comfort you deserve to be taken care of properly. Sakura undressed slowly, a hint of embarrassment at being naked in front of other people, but the brunette handed her a garment that was close to a kimono but was extremely thin and rather transparent. Put this on madam while the bath is at the right temperature and I get you ready, Amaya said as she waited for Sakura to come and sit on the chair in front of the dressing table. What are you going to do Amaya-san? The hairdresser was carefully untangling the pink-haired girl's hair. Nothing more than you deserve, madam. And your lord will be pleased to see you in something other than your battle dress. A woman must have soft and perfumed skin to please her husband, the brunette said, not without concealing the question behind her words. We are not married, Amaya. It. It's true that. Sakura hesitated not knowing how to deal with these intimacy issues. Madam, far be it from me to judge you, for I have no right to do so, but a woman who shares a man's bed without being either his wife or concubine is rather frowned upon. And even if Lord Shta is a tolerant person, it is not the same for the other men who advise him or who live in Hiwa. And I fear for your reputation, madam. 
It is of utmost importance for women that their reputation not be tainted by slander of this nature, the servant explained softly, taking care to weigh her words. Sakura remained silent as she pondered the words of the woman who was now applying oil to her face to remove all traces of dust. All this time spent with Madara had not made her see things that way. Indeed, they had become intimate like a married couple, but they had never mentioned the possibility of making it official. She herself had not thought at all that cohabitation was almost a forbidden practice in Madara's time. She lived every moment with the dark-haired man without questioning what people would say, since they were very discreet about their private relationship. And knowing the man, he was not the type to brag and talk about such things with the few people they met. The only one he could have mentioned the subject to was Ashina Uzumaki since the two of them had spent long moments alone talking. But to be honest, she couldn't imagine either Madara or the Uzumaki talking about women's issues. Sakura was lost in thought as she took a moment to realize that the two maids were calling her to take a dip in the bath. Sakura-sama. Are you alright? Hana asked as she regained some composure. Yes Hana-san, I realize it's been weeks since I've had the leisure of a nice hot bath to relax my body, I think it will do me a world of good. The blonde laughed softly as she helped the pink girl remove the garment covering her. Sakura immersed herself in the water and greatly enjoyed the warmth of the bath. The scent of it was also a delight to the senses. But as she entered the water, she did not notice that she was being watched from every angle by the brunette, who had a slight smile on her face. Just like the first time they had taken care of her, Sakura let herself be carried away by the moment until, once she was dry, she was led to the table in the room. The women asked her to put on only an undergarment and to sit belly down on the table. The young woman was then covered with a sheet and waited for the next step. Hana-chan, I'll leave it to you to get the belongings transferred from the madam's room to the lord's. Well Amaya-chan, Sakura-sama you will see Amaya has golden fingers for massage. Enjoy it, I'll be back later with your outfit for dinner tonight, the blonde exclaimed before leaving the two women alone in the room. The maid proceeded to massage Sakura's shoulders and back, she was really enjoying this moment. The last few weeks had been really rough and intense, both emotionally and physically. She felt totally relaxed although she was now feeling a slight discomfort. She hadn't really realized it before, as she'd had very little experience of having her chest pressed against a hard surface. But now she felt that there was something different, but she couldn't tell. Just then, the maid asked her a question she had not expected. Does the lady know how long she has been carrying her lord's child? Sakura immediately opened her eyes at this question. What did she mean by her lord's child? She half straightened up before turning her gaze to the brunette while reflexively covering her chest with her arm, a gesture that made her realize that it was much more sensitive than before and even slightly tense. What do you mean? No, I'm not. The kunoichi stammered, knowing that it was impossible for her to be pregnant. Some signs don't deceive madam and as a woman doctor, you should have noticed shouldn't you? She added with a slight smile on her face. Sakura was still silent, trying to gather her thoughts and figure out how to refute the statement the brunette had just told her. But nothing was coming, at least nothing concrete. The young woman realized that she had never considered contraceptive techniques since she and the brunette had been intimate. Besides, as a seasoned ninja, the female cycle was itself under great strain and the stress of combat did nothing for nature. Normally. And so it had been since she had accepted the Rickett Senen's proposal, her menstrual cycle was non-existent but she had not worried about it at all. Amaya-san, I can't be pregnant. I haven't. Well you know, she finally said. Forgive me, madam, for insisting, but didn't you tell me that you and your lord had become closer? A man like that doesn't seem to be willing to wait for a woman's favor. Of course, but what I want to explain to you is that as a ninja my body is kind of blocked for the things of nature, Sakura explained, convinced of the truth of her words. But madam, nature doesn't choose the time to manifest itself. And I can assure you from experience that I have the immense joy of telling you that you will give birth in a few months. Sakura froze, her brain refusing to accept the possibility. How can you know that, Amaya-san? You're not a doctor and you haven't examined me. Have you not noticed any changes in your body? In particular your breasts, madam, are they not more sensitive than usual? A little more tense. 
Don't you sometimes feel a strong desire to sleep even though you had a perfect night's sleep? Don't you find certain smells more unpleasant than others? Perhaps you feel slightly smeared in the morning when you wake up. The more the maid stated the symptoms, the more the rose began to turn pale. It all fit together and she suddenly realized that Katsuyu had said something strange to her several weeks ago, why didn't you explain your condition to me? The slug had already detected the presence of this developing fetus. Sakura needed to know for sure so she conjured up a green glow on her hand and applied it to her lower abdomen. She needed to detect the presence of a mass of cells different from her own and she didn't have long to search. Indeed, she felt the life growing inside her. There was no doubt about it, she was pregnant with Madara Uchiha. She removed her hand from her lower abdomen and looked up at the servant who was looking at her with a hint of fear as she had never seen any ninjutsu or IRY ninjutsu in her life. Amaya had even wondered if Sakura's magic would harm the child she was carrying. Sakura, on the other hand, felt overwhelmed by a flood of the most contradictory emotions, from joy to anguish. Tears even clouded her eyes, which disturbed Amaya who hurried to embrace the young woman. Madam, aren't you delighted with this news? Becoming a mother is a blessing for us women. Especially if you give your lord a son, he'll love you even more, the maid comforted as she covered Sakura with a towel so she wouldn't catch a cold. Amaya-chan, you don't understand. I have to stay with him because we are still at war. A pregnant woman has no place on a battlefield and... Madam. A woman, pregnant or not, has no place in war. But you can't risk your life at the risk of losing the fruit of your love because you love it, can you? At this question of feelings, Sakura froze once again. Her relationship with this man had changed so much in all these months, from hatred she had gone to love. Yes she loved him, she had discovered what loving meant and especially being loved in return. She also knew that the dark-haired man's feelings towards her were sincere. But how would he react when he learned that she was pregnant? Would it change all their plans for their true peace? Yes I love him but. Your lord also seems to care for you to demand that you share his chambers. Not even wives let alone concubines have that privilege, what do you fear Sakurasama? I don't know, Amaya-chan, but I can't tell him this now, the war is not over and it might distract him from the right course of action. But indeed, I cannot accompany him to the battle because I do not want to worry him about my condition or affect the evolution of our future child. Don't delay in telling him the news, madam. The arrival of a child can change a man's heart and make him give up his ideas of glory. Why can't you settle down peacefully and make your home in peace? In peace? This was an idea that took on a totally different meaning now in the mind of the cherry blossom. But wouldn't it be selfish of her to want to give up the peace of the world just to live a simple life surrounded by the man she loved and the child they would have? How could they be at peace if the world was still subject to war and conflict of all kinds that brought only death and desolation? But did they have to give up the happiness of being a family in order to save humanity from its failings? So many questions that had no solid answers flooded Sakura's mind, but she was interrupted by Hannah's return with a beautiful kimono. Sakura silently looked at Amaya to let her know not to reveal this news to the younger girl. The brunette bowed very slightly to show her that she understood and that this conversation would remain a secret. Hannah didn't even notice that her friend was a little preoccupied and she took it upon herself to prepare her carefully for the dinner planned with the daimi and his guests. Just like the other time, Sakura was resplendent in beauty, which didn't escape Madara's notice when he finally saw her again. It had been a pleasant evening and unlike the other time, Daiki hadn't made any statements about Sakura. He had even been very respectful as if he had understood that he had no chance of seducing her and above all that she was no longer single or even that she was the Uchiha's companion at her side. Yet, as usual, she and Madara had not made any affectionate gestures in public or said anything that would imply that they shared much more in private. Once away from the prying eyes and ears of the Diomis residents, the couple found themselves alone in the flat set up for them, and Sakura's mind was again preoccupied. Throughout the meal she had been talking so much with Ashina Uzumaki that she had forgotten the news she had heard a few hours before. She watched as the man she loved took off the ceremonial kimono he was wearing to make himself more comfortable. She was always impressed by the charisma he could exude and she caught herself feeling her cheeks heat up as she looked at him like this, yes. 
She was in love with this man and she could never have imagined that she would ever want to become his wife and the mother of his children. Madara turned back to her and noticed that she was staring at him. Is something wrong Sakura? You seem troubled. Is it me that's causing you this? He taunted her with a smile that made her melt immediately. How could she resist this man? You're imagining things, Madara you're not confusing me, she assured with a charming smile on her lips. The man moved closer to her and hugged her tenderly before sealing his lips to hers. How could she resist? Sakura let herself be carried away by the moment of passion that was coming between the two of them, forgetting about the questions, the doubts. In the power and warmth of his arms, she forgot everything because he knew how to handle her perfectly. After this long moment of pure exaltation, they both fell asleep in the comfort of the bed they shared. Day 356 The next day, when she woke up, Sakura took the time to take stock of what her body was expressing. Indeed, since she knew the truth about her physiological state, she was able to detect the changes that were gradually taking place in her body. But what concerned her was to tell the sleeping man beside her. She did not want him to feel obliged to do anything to her. They had never discussed their future as a couple. Never had they discussed marriage, the responsibility of becoming the wife of a clan leader who for the moment was deemed dead. It meant so much to both of them and to the rest of the world. How could they not reveal to the world that he was back and alive while asserting his omnipotence as a leader? A union, if it were to take place, would have to remain a secret. And the Uchiha still loyal to the leaf, what were Madara's plans for them after bringing them to Haiwa? All of these questions they had never addressed, and perhaps it was time, especially since she couldn't hide her physiological condition indefinitely. Sakura. Are you going to tell me what's been bothering you since last night, or do I have to use my pupillary abilities to get answers? A half-asleep voice whispered to her. Your Sharingan has no effect on me, you should know that Madara. And how do you know I'm worried, you're asleep? She retorted, half amused and half surprised. I feel that you are agitated while it seems to me that you were exhausted last night. He whispered maliciously which made the rose smile. Don't get me wrong, I'm not tired of what you put me through. But it's true, I am preoccupied. He turned to her and hugged her before getting up and sitting on the bed. I'm listening Sakura. In the books I brought back the first war is coming to an end with the death of Toborama Senju. The elemental nations will be terribly weakened after this conflict and it will take time for them to recover and especially to start the second war. Yes, I know all this already, having read your future books carefully. But what are you so concerned about? Would you like me to accompany you to Kumo, since that's where everything is at stake for the grand finale? She asked seriously as she stared at the dark-haired man with her green orbs. The Uchiha thought for a moment before answering. Indeed, the outcome of the first war seemed to come down to what would happen on Kyumo between the Rakage and the Hokage. And according to Sakura's precious books, the fate of that bastard Toborama was sealed there. The man analyzed the situation very quickly and finally said. Do you trust me Sakura? Of course, why would you ask such a question? I wish you to let me go to Kyumo alone. Stay here in Haiwa and help the people settle in. You have things to accomplish here as well if we are to see our peace come about with a solid foundation. Let our peace be born. Sakura felt a slight twinge of sadness at hearing this sentence, it wasn't time to tell the dark-haired man yet. He had to stay focused on their goals, and even if they were rewriting history, some facts shouldn't change, and Toborama's death seemed to be a key element in what was to come. When do you plan to leave? Asked the cherry blossom. From today on I think, the sooner we get this taken care of the sooner we can set up the rest. And especially Sakura, I think it's time for you to officially become an Uchiha. I want the shinobi of Haiwa to know that we are training and recruiting them to know who you are to me. You deserve the respect given to the wives of clan leaders and that will only be possible if you officially become my wife. Sakura's eyes widened at this unusual announcement. He had thought about it and even though his way of proposing to her was far from romantic as she might have imagined as a child, the cherry blossom felt her heart beating wildly in her chest. It would be a great honor for me Madara to officially become your wife. But wouldn't you like to announce your return to the members of your clan first? I had thought about it, 
but the Uchiha are still too cowardly to accept my return so easily, let alone make them leave Kanoha to join us of their own free will. It will come, and I don't need them to approve of my choice of life, he stated firmly. The Cherry Blossom decided that she had had enough answers and would wait until her beloved returned to announce that she was carrying his child. During her self-assessment, she had managed to determine that she could easily hide her pregnancy for the next two or even three months. Such was the advantage of having a slender, muscular body and not to mention pregnancy denial. Sakura knew that a woman's body, when subjected to her will, could perform miracles. And for now, the mother-to-be had the requirement that her body not show the slightest outward sign of a developing life. Chapter 35 It had been a fortnight since Yui arrived in Haiwa with her family. She had taken care of the administration necessary for her integration as a volunteer in the army and once she had obtained her accommodation, she would finally be able to start her training. When she was taken to the quarters where all the people who had expressed a wish to take up arms were housed, the young woman was surprised to find that she was not the only woman. Of course, they were not the majority, but there were other women like her who wanted to do something useful for their new city. However, Yui noticed that she herself could stand out among all these people. The brunette knew that she was not at all a fighter or a warrior. But she was not discouraged by this. Of course, she perceived a few indiscreet glances and a few heads turning as she passed, but nothing inconvenient or pernicious. She didn't know anyone and the others around her didn't seem to know each other either. But she had no time to wonder further as they were all invited to stand and be quiet. Several men arrived in front of them in combat gear. Immediately there was silence, and as everyone took their places, a man stepped forward. He was blonde, with a hard, piercing gaze, and he exuded a strength that was uncommon. He commanded respect just by his presence. He swept his gaze over the assembly and everyone could have sworn that he was probing them one by one. Some lowered their heads while others held his gaze. Then he began to speak in a loud, clear voice. My name is Akihiko. For the next year I will be in charge of your training and your life. If you are still in this room after my speech your life will belong to me and there will be no turning back. The Jinchuriki left a few seconds of silence as he swept the room with his eyes to let the tension rise within the ranks. If you are here it is because you wish to take up arms to defend this city ruled by the Daimi and the Haikage. You will be a unit, partners, friends, a family. You will get to know each other, you will learn to help each other. It's either you all succeed or you all fail. If one of you is having difficulties, help him or her. There is strength in numbers and creating this kind of bond will make you trust your compatriots to defend this city. You will notice that there are also women among you. One wrong move, one inappropriate remark and it will be a month of imprisonment for insubordination. Sakura-sama proved to us all that women are also capable of doing the same things as men. No one dared to open their mouths in front of the charisma that this man exuded. The words he used were both reassuring and threatening, he made things clear. You will call me sensei and I do not want to know your names. Why sensei? Dared to ask someone in the ranks. Because if it ever occurs to you to betray this nation of Ta no Kuni. I will be the one to hunt you down and kill you. Akihiko shouted, displaying some of his demonic intent. He wanted to send a message and it would be understood. Haiwa is my house, my home, my life. Betray what Sakura-sama fought for and I will get you like vermin. As soon as Yui saw the blonde man, she, like the others, was impressed by the charisma he exuded. There was something hard in his eyes but also passionate. However, she told herself that he should not be attacked without reason and that he must be an outstanding fighter for the Lord of Tano Kuni to call upon him to train the members of the army. She then remained focused on the blonde man's words, almost drinking in his words. The moment he spoke of hunting them down, Yui felt as if she wanted to run down a rabbit hole and never come out. She heard a few muffled exclamations. The other man who accompanied the blonde then spoke. My name is Matsuo and together with Akihiko-san we will determine in the next few days in which training sessions you will belong. If you demonstrate skills in the ninja arts you will be moved to another section for another form of training. Now I want you all out in a minute. The man ordered without further ado, Akihiko having already made himself clear. And the days that followed were intense for people like Yui. 
They went through one training session after another, from endurance to weapons handling. Each one was evaluated according to their aptitudes and affinities in combat. They were gradually divided into several groups and some disappeared because they had the ability to use chakra. The young woman joined the group of archers because of her build and because the preliminary tests qualified her for such a position. She quickly saw that it was not a question of preferential treatment because some women had been chosen to join the infantry troops. So everyone was treated fairly and equally according to their skills, gender was not really a factor in the allocation of posts. Of course, they were all regularly mixed together to increase their hand-to-hand -hand skills, with the more agile helping the less skilled. During these trainings, the blonde Akihiko never hesitated to set an example. He regularly stopped and demonstrated techniques and parries. At the beginning, if some apprentice soldiers were reluctant to be trained by him, they all discovered that he was an extremely sharp fighter and that he was above all very good at giving advice. They all had a deep respect for the blonde who treated them in return in the same way. Sakura also came to see the recruits from time to time and was pleased to see that the women were treated much differently than when she arrived in the Sengoku era. Indeed, while she may have had some concerns about how these women were treated, she found that attitudes were slowly changing. Women were treated as equals to men, at least as far as the armed forces were concerned. The Cherry Blossom had once recognized Yui and she had not stopped thanking her for saving her from her attacker and especially for recommending her to come to Haiwa. Sakura had strongly encouraged her and had been particularly moved to see the diligence and determination the brunette put into improving herself. One day, she even caught the blonde in the middle of an argument with the young woman. It seemed that Yui didn't understand a certain hand-to-hand -hand routine and Akihiko was personally explaining it to her while showing her the movements to be performed. Sakura marveled at the fact that neither the young woman's nor the man's eyes showed any embarrassment. It was just a sensei and his student and it brought back many memories. How many times had she seen her former teammates of the opposite sex training like this? Whether it was Ten Ten and her teammates, or Ino and her teammates from Team Ten and even Sweet Hinata with Kiba and Shino. Thinking about her former comrades made the cherry blossom feel a little bit sad for those bygone days, but what she saw before her eyes comforted her in a way. By going back in time, she was able to speed up history in a way, women could finally become full warriors, recognized for their talents and not relegated to the rank of wives and mothers. After several attempts, Yui finally managed to grasp what the blonde had been explaining to her for a while and she couldn't help but express her gratitude. Thank you so much sensei for your patience. The brunette exclaimed. It's my duty, there's no need to thank me miss, Akihiro replied. Sensei. Hi. I have a slightly indiscreet question to ask you, Yui began, lowering her eyes slightly. Say it again. What did Sakura-sama do for you? She's allowed me to live my life, Akihiko said even so, realizing that his life had never been as fulfilling as it had been since he'd been at Haiwa. He was no longer considered a monster, but a person in his own right. He had the respect of his peers, the admiration of his men and he had even made friends. I wish I had his strength of character. No, you don't, Akihiko retorted, and Yui was surprised. Why not? Because if you were to have her strength of character, that would mean you'd have to have been through everything she's been through. I'm watching all of you, miss, and even though I don't know why you wanted to defend Haiwa, you're still an innocent woman. And it would be a shame to waste such a thing. Yui didn't know what to say to this explanation, especially since she understood that Sakura must have seen many horrors in her life. Let's get to the archery exercises. Akihiko shouted to the entire group of soldiers as Yui came back from her thoughts. When the exercises began, Yui was undoubtedly the best of all the new recruits in the army. She had a real gift for archery, her accuracy was phenomenal. She had sharp eyesight and could hit any target, no matter how far away it was. Her movement was fluid and at the same time straightforward, she did not hesitate and Akihiko wanted to test her accuracy on a moving target. Well, you can hit a static target, but what if the target is moving? He asked loudly, staring at the young woman in particular. We haven't tried Akihiko Senpai yet, explained the soldier in charge of the archers, they're only at the beginning of their training and it would be far too early to train them for that, we'd have more injuries than positive results. We don't have time to wait until they are ready. 
war can come at any time. We have to be ready, no matter what is going on outside, I volunteer to be the target. He then instructed all the archers to aim at him without fear of hitting him even fatally. Of course, most of them wondered if he was really serious but did not dare to contradict him openly. Yui thought to herself that this was the perfect opportunity to prove her worth and impress her sensei as well as Sakura-sama who was watching. She wanted to show today that even women like her belonged in the ranks of the soldiers. The exercise began and every shot that was fired in the blonde's direction was dodged without any difficulty. Only Yui had not yet executed her shot, she preferred to use her keen sense of analysis and decided to first observe the movements that the blonde man was making as he perfectly dodged the shots of his teammates. Was it because they were afraid of hurting Akihiko? But the latter finally stopped and got angry. Is that all you can do? At this rate, the city will already have been taken over by the enemies and we can't accept that. Concentrate, damn it! What are you waiting for to shoot me? All of them shuddered at the violent intention he gave off, as if he was really going to unleash his fury against them, like an enemy. Some shuddered at the almost murderous aura emanating from the man in front of them, others realized how monstrously powerful he was and how right he was, they were not here to pretend. In the potential future, their lives would depend on it, as well as their safety and that of all the inhabitants of the city. This gave them extra motivation and the archers began to shoot more assiduously. Akihiko was not in trouble, but he recognized that they were putting more effort and intention into hitting him than before. Yui had not yet fired any arrows, still analyzing the situation with her sharp eyes until a moment ago. She deciphered some sort of sequence the blonde was making in view of the situation. She then grabbed one of her arrows and put it into her bow. She prepared her shot slowly, with a supple movement, and at the moment she judged appropriate she let the weapon split the air. Time seemed to stand still and the young woman followed her arrow with her eyes to see it pass with pinpoint accuracy between two others that missed their target. Akihiko dodged two arrows, but the movement he had to make did not allow him to dodge the last one that was about to hit his skull. He then put his hand forward and it was pierced by the arrow before stopping. He winced very slightly in pain from the impact and stopped moving to look at the arrow sticking right through his hand. Immediately, everyone stopped shooting and looked around to see who had done it. Yui had stopped in her own tracks, amazed that she had succeeded with such precision. But her reason took over when she realized that she had injured the man in front of her. She instinctively cried out in fright. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to. No excuses, you passed the exercise, exclaimed the blonde before breaking the arrow and removing the wood still in his palm. He should go get that removed quickly, even if Son Goku's chakra could help him heal quickly. Besides, the demon didn't hesitate to manifest itself in the blonde's mind to mock him. A frail woman who can touch you. You're getting soft. Yes, but I hurt you. I didn't think I could do it. She said sincerely sorry as their eyes met for the first time. The young woman was confused for a split second. She had never noticed how pleasing this man's features were to the eye. She felt her cheeks flush as red chakra appeared around the Jinshriki's hand for all to see. And as everyone watched, the wound on his hand regenerated before disappearing as if nothing had happened. At the same time, at the other end of Haiwa City, Madara was staring at his battle armor on a display. It had been almost a year since he had put on the armor that so characterized him. This set of protections that had so often saved him a scar and even his life. He gently placed his hand on it as if to recall old memories by its mere touch. Soon, Madara whispered to himself. Soon he would be able to reveal himself, soon the world would know he was back. But not yet. There was one last thing he had to do to free his heart and clear his last debt, one last vendetta. The dark-haired man had put on his famous kimono in the brown hues that had made him a legend during the First Great Shinobi War. This outfit would be the last time he would wear it, in a few days it would be a thing of the past and only those who deserved it would know the man behind it. Madara took one last look at his armor and his gun by before turning back towards the exit of his flats. From that moment on, his mind was focused on one goal and it showed on his face, it was closed and cold. By the expression on his face and the way he looked, the servants moved out of his way. Madara walked to the great wall surrounding the city of Haiwa, 
he didn't really need to see the landscape to focus on his goal. But somehow being able to soak in the view and the progress of his peace project gave him the confidence he needed to accomplish what was left to do. Where are you going Madara? Said a calm and collected voice close to him. To do what I should have done far too long ago, Madara replied to Ashina who was leaning against a stone wall. The old Uzumaki was silent at first, though he wanted to tell the Uchiha what he was thinking. But something held him back, he already owed so much to this man and Ashina still had that hint of pride in him that prevented him from openly making his request. But then the cycle of hatred was stronger and Ashina overcame his pride. He would have liked to take his revenge on those who had betrayed him and taken away the person dearest to his heart. Please do it for my daughter as well, Ashina said with that harshness in his voice that left no room for doubt that he wanted his will to be done. Then he turned back and went about his business. It will be done old man, Madara whispered when Ashina was too far away to hear. Day 360 So we have an agreement. You withdraw your troops from the land of whirlwinds as well as those surrounding Hai no Kuni and you agree to pay war reparations for the next year, Tobarama recited to the rakage. The two Kage had been negotiating a truce between the two nations for nearly an hour. However, Kyumo was the loser, and it was their responsibility to pay the victor, and Tobarama was not going to let this chance pass. We agree, the Rakage reluctantly agreed. He was not happy about it, but he had no choice but to accept this truce. The war was ruining his country and they were on the verge of starvation. So it was with great bitterness in his throat that the Rakage signed the peace treaty between Kaminari no Kuni and Hai no Kuni. Inwardly Tobarama sighed with satisfaction. The war was finally coming to an end and he could concentrate on a more important problem, who was responsible for Yuzushio's disappearance. As the Kage of Kyumo was signing the bottom of the scroll, Tobarama felt a change in the air, as if chakra was being used. He quietly concentrated and barely had time to react and a ninja appeared behind the rakage, his weapon out. The man had no time to react as he was decapitated with a gesture, spilling blood on the signed peace treaty. At the same time, Tobarama had leapt backwards to dodge what was aimed at him. The weapon was dodged, but the chakra covering it hit his armor, which split open at his shoulder. What the hell? Tobarama demanded, angry and on guard. In front of him were two men of titanic size for humans. They were easily over two meters tall and had hair down to the middle of their backs. The two individuals looked alike and Tobarama understood why the attack of one of them hit him when he had dodged. He was facing the very famous Kinkaku and Ginkaku, the only two ninjas known to have survived after being swallowed by the Kaibi. This explained why Tobarama had been affected by the weapon, it was covered with the demonic chakra of the fox demon. Alert! Ginkaku shouted as his brother approached the Naidame Hokage. Tobarama couldn't understand why these two men had tried to kill him, or why they had just murdered their own Kage in cold blood. It was common knowledge that they were loyal to Kyumo, but the Senju did not think for a second as he felt fifteen chakra signatures approaching their position. Suetun, Suryudan no Jutsu. Tobarama made only two seals with his hands. He used the air around him to generate water to form a water dragon that charged the two assassins, allowing Tobarama to escape. Go after him. He murdered the rakage. Ginkaku shouted after taking the Suetun attack with his brother. So the two brothers were traitors and didn't hesitate to pass off their previous crime as Tobarama's. The latter knew that he should not linger here any longer and thanks to his extraordinary sensory abilities, Tobarama slipped through the enemy troops without any problem before going at full speed towards his men. Hokage-sama Hiruzen asked worriedly as his master suddenly appeared at their side. Normally the meeting would have lasted longer and he wouldn't have appeared like that. We're out of here. I've been ambushed. The Kage ordered and they all followed their leader without question. Tobarama passed by to guide them, they had to get out of this capital as quickly as possible. In the distance they could hear screams and bells ringing. The alarm was sounded. They now had little time to get as far ahead as possible and avoid having to fight against Kumo's shinobi and armed troops. Was this a trap by the rakage? Danzo asked as he jumped from rock to rock down the mountain in which the town was hidden. No, it was a trap by his men. 
The rakage is dead, Tobarama explained, half focused on what he was feeling. But. Why? Koharu asked in turn. I don't know what drives Kingaku and Ginkaku, but they killed their leader and tried to do the same to me. It seems that some of the men don't agree with having a truce. So what do we do? We speed up. They're gaining on us, Tobarama announced, feeling the demonic chakra of the two brothers and a squad of probably fifteen Umbu. For the next few hours it was a race for survival. The leaf ninjas knew that they would be finished if the Kumo army joined the troop that was chasing them. That was why they had not stopped to deal with their pursuers. Then, after three hours of hard running, where they were at times separated by an enemy jutsu, Tobarama ordered them to stop. Everyone caught their breath, taking up semi-defensive positions. Did we manage to lose them? Kagami Uchiha asked as he crouched beside his leader. Tobarama had two of his fingers on the ground and his eyes closed. He was very focused and silent. There are about twenty of them around and they probably have sensory abilities to follow us like this, Tobarama described. Even with you by our side master, there are only seven of us, Hamura said defeatedly. Don't be such a coward Hamura, pull yourself together, I remind you that they haven't completely located us yet. The best thing would be to ambush them and break through their line to escape, Koaru exclaimed. You can't be serious Koaru, even if it's a good plan, it implies that one of us sacrifices ourselves to create a diversion, Kagami remarked, not knowing her colleague was ready for such extremes. Like bait? Someone who wouldn't survive? Asked the Akimichi of the group to make sure he understood the proposed plan. Kagami nodded and a heavy silence fell over the group as Tobarama said nothing either. His silence implied that he agreed with the plan and that one of them would have to sacrifice himself, but who? They were all excellent ninja who had proven themselves during the world war and all had the ability to accomplish this suicide mission, but only one was dedicated to this role. I'll take care of it. Sarutobi Hiruzen said to everyone's surprise. Think carefully Hiruzen, do you know what this means? Kagami asked to be sure. Don't worry about me Kagami, I know what I'm doing and unlike you, I'll have a chance to get away with it, Sarutobi reassured him humorously. Danzo. Take care of the others for me, my friend. Stop being a hero. I intended to sacrifice myself and die as a ninja like my grandfather and father, so save your speeches, Danzo snapped, angry at himself. He hadn't found the strength to point to himself first, because he was afraid to die. I appreciate your sense of duty, gentlemen, but it is I who will sacrifice myself. You are the heirs of the will of fire, your role is to protect the village no matter what, Tobarama intervened, watching the movements of their enemy. But master! Don't you think about it? You're the Hokage, you can't sacrifice yourself, the village needs you, Danzo said. Danzo, for some time now, you've been competing with Sarutobi, when what we need more than ever is cohesion. If I let you go in the state you're in, you'll only endanger your companions. Danzo! Sarutobi, what I'm about to say applies to both of you and try to remember what I'm about to say, you are young. So don't be impatient to die, protect your own and the village, Tobarama announced before standing up to overlook his students. Master? Sarutobi, take care of these two protagonists who saved your students and know that as of tomorrow you will be the Sandame Hokage. This announcement had the effect of a bomb within the group as Tobarama turned his back on his men and began to channel chakra. Take care of Kanoha Sarutobi, Tobarama said one last time before disappearing from view. Let's get out of here. Hiruzen ordered as the Naidame Hokage provided a diversion. Katsu. Tobarama shouted as he blew up most of the trees around him. He had to draw all the enemies to him so they had a chance to escape. He was potentially going to have a dignified death defending what he had always fought for. Ah, the little worm finally came out of his hole. Ginkaku scoffed and quickly appeared followed by his entire squad. Why? Why what? Why did you kill him? Tobarama clarified. Well, let's just say that Noki had some good arguments, and personally this war amuses me. Three Ginkaku laughed out loud. By this exchange of words, the Naidame understood that they were indeed crazy sadists. Oh, that little shit, huh? I'll make sure to take care of that runt when I'm done with you, Tobarama assured. 
A ninja didn't normally talk, a ninja acted and spoke as little as possible, but today Tobarama was trying to save as much time as possible. This remark made the twin brothers laugh even more. You seem to forget who we are. Swaitan, Yari no Kakatoku. Tobarama said, making a single seal with his hands. Day 361. Tobarama was preparing his next attack, the one that would allow him to take these two monsters with him to the grave if they were each alone, he would have mastered them without any problem. But two against one was almost the equivalent of fighting a beach. He had managed to kill the entire Umbu troop that accompanied the twin brothers, but both were very tough because of their regenerative ability provided by the fox demon chakra. But they had been fighting for almost two hours now and Tobarama was beginning to weaken as the day had only just ended. He knew his men were far from the position and could take both of them to the grave. So he channeled his chakra into his body to transform it into a thousand explosive tags. He could have used his most dangerous technique and survived, but he didn't want to disturb his brother for that. He didn't want to use Edo Tensei. Suddenly, just as he was about to release his technique, Chakra approached their position at breakneck speed. Tobarama held back his technique for a few more seconds before seeing a ninja in a brown kimono come between him and his opponents. With a simple kick, the newcomer sent Ginkaku flying away before turning to Kinkaku. Who are you? Kinkaku demanded as he looked at this new opponent. It was out of the question to lose their trophy because of a savior. Seeing the outfit of the individual in front of him, Tobarama understood that it was one of the two protagonists that everyone was talking about. The one who had saved many civilians, the one who had caused many deaths. The one who had leveled Yuzushio. What did this man hope to achieve by saving him? Tobarama concentrated more on the man and something caught his eye. He had this strange feeling, something was escaping him, some information that didn't belong, but what? Then the answer came to him very quickly, Genjutsu. The Naidane quickly channeled a fine amount of chakra and expelled it into his brain to shock his eyes and senses. And suddenly, everything became clear, Uchiha Madara. No. Tobarama whispered as he recognized the chakra signature of the Uchiha clan leader. Breaking through the barely perceptible Genjutsu, he immediately recognized Madara's hair. Get out of my way. Madara ordered in a cold voice as the two Kyomo ninjas gathered themselves together. They intended to attack at the same time to neutralize this new enemy. And it was perfect for Madara, who immediately activated his Sharingan, followed by his Manjikyu Sharingan. You're dreaming! shouted one of the two brothers. He's mine! Madara shouted as he unleashed all of his killing intent towards his two enemies. Tsukuyami! With this ultimate illusion technique, Madara had just turned the two Kyomo ninjas into mere puppets who no longer knew the difference between illusion and reality. Then he turned back to Tobarama with a sadistic smile on his face. Finally. You have no idea how much I have waited for this moment, how much I have dreamed of this moment. Madara said, staring at the Senju with undisguised pleasure. Seeing this man in front of him still alive when he should have been in the realm of the dead months ago, Tobarama knew he had no choice. He had to finish what his brother had obviously failed to do. It was no longer a question of dying with honor to protect his own. It was a matter of stopping this individual from continuing to persecute the world, for he was now certain that the Uchiha was one of those he had sought since the beginning of the war. Tobarama cancelled the channeling of his ancient suicide jutsu to do the only technique that would allow him to defeat Madara in his state. The Senju began a series of kanji that made the Uchiha's eyes widen. The Uchiha immediately recognized the technique the man was planning to use and had to act quickly. He thrust himself with all his strength at the Hokage as the latter had placed his hand on the ground and Finjutsu formulas had begun to appear. Edo Tens. URG. The Kage began to say before being completely interrupted by the Uchiha who hit him in the face with his right foot. This strike propelled him several meters backwards before landing on his back. He didn't have time to react as Madara stood over him looking much more serious. Oh no Tobarama, please leave your brother in the grave. Today it's just between you and me. The Uchiha announced as he pulled out a kanai and quickly planted it in the palm of the Senju's right hand, pinning his right arm to the ground. Arg! 
The man emitted at the pain he felt as the blade pierced him with violence. He may have been a seasoned ninja, but the pain was still real and he couldn't ignore it at that moment. What a delicious sound to my ears. Madara murmured as he held his opponent down. Fukumikuchi Hari. He quickly uttered, overcoming the painful sensation of his bruised body and above all, his desire to eliminate this individual, becoming stronger than the rest. From the Senju's mouth came three needles at great speed, which Madara only managed to dodge because his Sharingan was active. The Uchiha immediately put his hand to the Senju's throat to prevent him from throwing another such technique at him and forcing him to keep his mouth shut at the same time. I always pay my debts, Madara whispered and slowly leaned towards his nemesis, Sharingan activated. Seeing that pupil, Toborama immediately closed his eyes. Oh no, look into my eyes, let me have the pleasure of piercing you into my world, let me have the pleasure of seeing you moan in pain, of hearing the sweet melody of your agonized cries. Give me this pleasure Toborama, allow me to savor your suffering. Madara expressed with these words all the satisfaction he felt from the situation in which his enemy found himself. He was really enjoying torturing him, knowing that he was only at the beginning of his revenge. Fuck you. Toborama managed to grumble as he gestured. Madara reveled in the fact that his opponent was desperately trying to break free of his grip, but the Uchiha wasn't about to give him a chance. On the contrary, he pulled out another kanai that he planted in the second hand of his prisoner who let out another groan of pain. If you insist, I have plenty of time. After all, you have to enjoy killing the last senju left alive, Madara taunted. Scum, because of you Hai no Kuni is weakened as never before. Hashirama was a fool to think you had any good in you. Toborama shouted as his throat cleared again, yet he didn't take the opportunity to launch any more murderous attacks on the Uchiha but rather to pour out all the hatred he had ever had for the brown-haired clan. I've always thought that you Uchiha deserve only one thing, to be killed at birth. My only satisfaction in all of this will be that I killed your brother. Shut up. Madara shouted, striking the Senju's face with all his might. His hatred was ignited by Toborama's words of insulting his entire clan and reminding him of his brother's death. A.H. Looks like I've struck a chord little Uchiha. So what are you going to do now? I killed the only person you cared about, you. You are. Berg. Toborama couldn't go on much longer, for all of a sudden his thoughts became confused, as if they couldn't be put in order. He felt that Madara had placed his hand against his skull and that with this gesture all his vital essence wanted to leave his body. He even had the impression that his soul wanted to follow this hand and leave his body. Open your eyes. Madara ordered. He was indeed controlling Toborama's soul with one of the Rinnegan's powers and forced him to open his eyes which then saw a swirling Manjiki Sharingan. Tsukuyami. And for the next three seconds, the Naidame Hokage endured the equivalent of three days of agony in the twisted world of Uchiha Madara. No one could survive the treatment the dark-haired man was giving. When the time was up and he had fulfilled his promise to Izuna, he removed his hand from the Senju's skull, removing the soul from his body in the process. Toborama Senju was dead. Chapter 36 Day 363 Madara had been on his way to Kyumo for seven days now and Sakura knew full well that he was going to make sure that the story unfolded as it was written in her books, Toborama had to die. The Rose knew that there was an element of revenge in the dark-haired man's intentions, and even if it went against their principle of eradicating the cycle of hatred and revenge. She couldn't stop the man she loved from bringing justice to the man who had killed his brother. The young woman clung to the certainty that she had still managed to accomplish a great deal since she had saved him from death after his fight in the Valley of the End. The cold, bloodthirsty Madara she had seen in her future was far from it, and she was proud that she had been able to bring out the best in the man. However, ever since she knew she was expecting a child from the Uchiha and he had told her that he intended to make her his wife, Sakura had been feeling disoriented. The harsh reality of the situation hit her heart again, she was alone and had no one to share her fears with as a mother-to-be and wife. She felt a pang of sorrow as she thought that she would have given anything to even hear her mother reassure her that this stage in a woman's life would be okay. She would also have liked to hear Eno's hysterical screams when she told her the news or to see Hinata's embarrassed but genuinely happy look. 
she would have liked so much if her master had taken care of the follow-up of this pregnancy. Oh yes, she missed her mother, her friends, and all the women she loved at that very moment. But then she remembered that she had someone who could very well give her the comfort she needed for all her questions related to the changes that would occur in the weeks to come. There was only one person who could replace the gentleness of a mother, the joy of friends and the reassuring experience of a woman who had already given birth, Hitomi. So it was with a lighter heart and a smile on her face that Sakura decided to visit her first friend she had met on her return to the past. On the way to her friend's modest house, the young woman realized how important Hitomi was in her life. Indeed, at every major stage of the Rose's personal life, the woman had been present. It was Hitomi who had made Sakura useful to the village. It was she who had brought up the possibility that Sakura had developed feelings for the Uchiha when she hadn't even been aware of it. It was the woman who had suggested that she confess her feelings to the dark-haired man. Hitomi was there for Sakura every time and Sakura knew that she couldn't live without this woman. She meant a lot to Sakura and she loved her deeply. It was only natural that she would share with her the latest events regarding her condition and her future. But the closer she got to the house, the more Sakura had this small apprehension that tightened her heart, would she be judged by her friend? After all, Sakura knew she hadn't done things the right way, she had become intimate with a man out of wedlock and that was something very much frowned upon in the mores of the time. Not only was there this slight detail, but from this intimacy had come the conception of this child. But her fears vanished as soon as the forty-year-old recognized her friend when she opened the door to the house. Hitomi hugged her, so happy was she to see her safe and sound. Even though she didn't live in the city under construction, the stories of the war had reached the villagers, and she knew Sakura was probably in those conflict zones with the man she had put back on her feet months before. Sakura! What a relief to see you here, when did you get back? The woman asked, inviting her into the modest home. It's not long ago Hitomi, but I wanted to come and make sure you were all right around here. Oh, how nice of you to always worry about us. I can assure you that we are fine. We are not short of work and we feel safe even though we are not directly behind the capital wall. But tell me, how are you? As the two women sat down around the kitchen table to share their traditional cup of tea, Sakura thought about the question the woman had just asked her. She hesitated, should she finally tell her about her condition? The young woman lost herself in her conflicting thoughts as she looked into the beverage she was slowly stirring with her spoon. Sakura. What's the matter? I've been worried about you ever since you arrived. Did something bad happen between? Between you and Uchiha-sama? Hitomi suspected that something was bothering her friend and that it had to do with the very handsome brunette who had lived with her for the past few months, but she also knew better than to rush the young woman into revealing herself. Sakura looked up from her cup at her friend's question, she looked at her with her big green eyes and the forty-year-old could read a certain apprehension of being judged. The mother of the family could see the youth and innocence of the rose before her. For all the strength and determination she usually exuded, Sakura now appeared to be a young woman her own age looking for support and guidance. Hitomi slid her hand to Sakura's and squeezed it tenderly without taking her eyes off of it she had an expression of extreme caring, like a mother might have for her daughter. Sakura could feel the affection of the woman in front of her in that gesture alone, and any fears she might have had at the time were immediately dispelled. Hitomi. I'm pregnant with his child, the rose confessed in a whisper as she watched for any reaction from the woman in front of her. Tell me Sakura. Is this child wanted? She asked as she saw the young woman's eyes begin to glisten with tears. Hitomi asked the question out of fear that Sakura had been forced into a relationship with this man against her will. After all, it was unfortunate for many women to be forced to satisfy the basic needs of men, and perhaps while they were away, Uchiha-sama had forced the young woman to have sex with him. Sakura then realized what her friend was hinting at and she had to set the record straight immediately. I'll stop you right there Hitomi, Madara and I. We're not officially a couple yet but we've grown very close over the past few weeks and he didn't force me into anything I promise you. The forty-year-old was silent for a very brief moment as she heard this information, before a huge joy crossed her face and manifested itself in a very big smile. But Sakura! That's wonderful news! Did you think I wouldn't be happy for you? Oh, my girl, how could I not be happy for you? 
To bear a child is a grace for us women. And it's true that it's not customary to be intimate with a man outside of marriage, but we must stop kidding ourselves, it happens more than we think. The pink-haired woman felt immediately relieved by her elder's words. And hearing her call her my daughter warmed her heart. Of course it didn't replace the absence of her real mother, but it still comforted her not to be judged for her condition. So what does the child's father think? He must be happy, right? And his plans? Is he going to marry you now? The woman continued hurriedly, but she widened her eyes when she saw that the young woman lowered her head after all the questions she had just asked. It's just that. I just found out and. What? The mother interrupted, understanding immediately what she wanted to tell her. You didn't say anything to that man. But Sakura, what are you going to do? You're not going to. Hitomi stopped herself, too horrified to contemplate that the young woman might resort to some of the barbaric methods that existed to terminate her pregnancy. The mother knew full well that women were sometimes forced to terminate their pregnancies and that it was done in horrific and excruciatingly painful ways both physically and mentally. Besides, she had seen Sakura at work with her magic to heal the wounded, so she could only imagine what she could do to interrupt that physiological process. Understanding once again the concern that was running through her friend, Sakura realized that she needed to immediately explain the situation more clearly and stop being afraid of being misjudged. Hitomi had proven to her more than once that she was an open and understanding person. Hitomi, I haven't actually told Madara I'm expecting our child yet because it's not the right time. We are at war and he has gone to do something about the end of this conflict that has gone on for too long. I couldn't possibly impose such a subject on him when he should be concentrating on his duties. Peace depends on it, but I intend to tell him so when he returns. Even though I admit I'm a little afraid of his reaction. Why Sakura? I know you well enough to understand that you wouldn't have given yourself to him unless you were sure he respected you enough to do so. So why are you afraid of his reaction when he finds out? We haven't even talked as children. We've barely even mentioned our upcoming union, so I don't know if that's part of his plan, the young woman admitted. Does that mean that Achihasama has proposed to you? The forty-year-old questioned again with a smile on her face. Sakura watched as her friend's face lit up with joy at this question. The young woman could see in this reaction what her friends of the future might have had, a certain excitement at the mention of a wedding celebration. Sakura smiled in turn, carried away by this communicative joy, and answered. She wasn't the most romantic, but yes, just before he left he assured me that he wanted to make me his wife and make sure that I got the unquestioned respect of others. He wants to make sure that everyone knows who I am to him and how important I am to him. But it's wonderful, Sakura. You can finally rebuild your life, you finally have a future to hold on to, a husband, a child. There is nothing more exciting than building a family, your own family. Oh Sakura, this is really very good news and what man would be stupid enough not to be happy that his wife is already carrying a child. A fertile marriage is a happy marriage for sure. At least that's what we usually say around here, so don't doubt for a moment that your future husband will be delighted to learn that you are going to give him a child. And with a bit of luck, Mother Nature will give you the chance that it will be a boy for a firstborn. It's because of all these questions that I'm a bit worried. I really don't know if Madara wants to have children and how important the sex of the unborn child is to him. We still have so much to do for. For nothing at all Sakura. Your priority now is no longer the others but only the family you are about to build. Interrupted the woman, not knowing what the couple's real ambitions were. It was only natural that Sakura should now focus on her duties as a mother and wife and any other side projects should be relegated to last. Sakura didn't insist on these details because she had never really explained the reasons for her arrival in Tano Kuni and she sincerely doubted Hitomi would understand much of it, and that wasn't what she expected of her. However, as they talked together, Sakura knew what she really wanted from this woman who was so precious to her heart. Hitomi, can I ask you something? Of course my child, what can I do for you? Ask me anything you want, you know I will always do my best for you, the woman assured her warmly and kindly. I don't have a family anymore and you are the closest thing I have to a friend and potentially a mother. So. I wanted to know if you would be willing to be my altar girl. 
Sakura asked with a slight distress in her eyes. She had just opened up to this woman, about not having anyone from her previous life. But also that she was asking her to come as a surrogate mother and accompany her on one of the most important events for a woman, her wedding. The mother was deeply touched by the young woman's sincere words to her. She had not imagined that she, a simple and modest country woman, could think so much of her. But Hitomi could see in Sakura's green eyes how honest she was. The forty-year-old felt the emotion flooding her, tears blurring her eyes slightly, and she slid her hand back to Sakura's and squeezed it a little tighter than before. It is with great joy that I agree to be the one to accompany you to the altar Sakura, you can count on me to help you through this stage of your life as a woman. The two women smiled at each other for a long time without exchanging any more words. All the emotion could be seen in each other's eyes. Then, once all that was over, they talked about various everyday subjects before Sakura decided to return to the city. The pink-haired woman was much lighter in heart even though she didn't know when to tell the man she loved that she was also going to provide him with a child. Day 364 The sun was slowly rising in the Hiwa Valley and Sakura was in a cross-legged position on one of the highest towers of the wall. It was a ritual she had taken up since her return here, she liked to sit on this height and watch the sun rise over the horizon. She liked to feel its warmth touching her body, her face, telling her that spring was indeed here. Sakura had figured out how to do regeneration without affecting the human body, but for some time she had been experimenting with this path of medicine for something more advanced, something more risky. Even deadly. But who could grant her so much if the situation demanded it? The rose was so focused on her meditation and her surroundings that she heard someone coming up the stone steps very softly. It was a muffled, delicate step, it could only be a shinobi approaching. The sound of footsteps stopped and Sakura estimated that the person behind her was three meters away. Unlike Madara, Sakura was not a sensory type and was unable to determine who was behind her, so she turned her head slightly to the side and saw the person who had come up to her. I didn't mean to disturb you Sakura-sama, Akihiko said quickly as she saw the young woman looking at him. What do you want Akihiko-san? Sakura asked gently as she looked ahead again. I wanted to thank you again for everything you've done for me. It was my pleasure and as I told you the first time, life's victims are entitled to a second chance, Sakura replied, knowing all too well that everyone was entitled to a second chance. The proof was that Sakura had given Uchiha Madara that same chance. Was there something else you wanted to tell me Akihiko-san? Hi, the Jinchuriki said but he hesitated. Don't be ashamed of your request, I'm ready to hear a lot of things, Sakura reassured his as the man still didn't answer after several seconds of silence. When we were on the battlefield, you said that our meeting was no accident. This sentence was intended for your beach so that he would change his attitude towards you, so that he would understand that times are changing, Sakura explained without going into too many details. How did you do it? How did you do it? Sakura asked not sure she understood. How did you, in one sentence, calm one of the plagues of the elemental nations? Because I do not consider your beach as a plague, but rather as a person having feelings, a personality. The beach are living beings with a conscience, therefore who are we to say that they are a plague? What the story doesn't say is that the human being hunted the beach in order to exploit them for their power and their chakra, so they retaliated, bringing us to fear them. Tell me Akihiko-san, what would you do if we were attacked right now? I will defend us. I understand what you mean Sakura-sama, said Akihiko who saw his prisoner in a completely different light. Had you met him before? No, but let's just say that my path led me to meet a person with greater ambitions than ours. Silence settled again between the two protagonists before being suddenly broken by a new person. You're not easy to find, said a voice that made Sakura frown. If this person was able to approach her so silently it was because she had been careless and still had work to do. You! Akihiko exclaimed and began to build up chakra in his legs to propel himself towards the newcomer in order to confront him. In the blonde's eyes, this man could only be there to hurt Sakura because of his reputation. Peace Akihiko! Sakura ordered as she pointed her hand in his direction, confusing him completely. But! Sakura-sama! You don't do things by halves I see, the newcomer remarked in Sakura's direction. As I told you the first time, 
I'm the richest person in all the elemental nations and I intend to make my goal a reality. Kakuzu, Sakura replied, ignoring Akihiko's sentence. You may go, Akihiko-san, this man works for me, you don't have to worry about it. As you wish, Sakura-sama, the man said before leaving with one last scornful look at Kakuzu. Sakura waited until the Jinchuriki was out of range before conjuring up a bag in a puff of smoke. Here, a payment for your labor, Sakura said, placing the bag on one of the stones of the wall. I still don't like you. I'll have you know the feelings mutual, Kakuzu, Sakura retorted, trying her best to look intimidating. She had become a dangerous kunoichi, but Kakuzu was still a dangerous ninja to joke around with and especially to be wary of. Who are you? Kakuzu asked after opening the linen bag and seeing its contents, this was more than the first time. Sakura will suffice for you Kakuzu. Hmm. It pisses me off that someone knows so much about me, the immortal man insisted. And this secret will be taken with me to the grave, as long as you work for me, there's no reason to worry about your immortality, Sakura explained, she had every intention of keeping this individual under her pay. You're lucky I only have one word, otherwise I would have impaled you on a spike long ago. Kakuzu admitted angrily. If you ever get the idea to try, please do so and you'll understand why I have Uchiha Madara's respect. Although the tone left no doubt as to the seriousness of what they were saying, neither of them gave off any killing intent. Kakuzu didn't want to be detected and Sakura respected that. She was using one of her trump cards, to maintain the mystery of her person and not reveal anything more than necessary about her. Kakuzu didn't know anything about her, and it wasn't today or any other day that he would learn more. TCH. Let's be clear Kakuzu, you don't like me and it's mutual, but I respect you a little as a shinobi. You're in a category that few can claim to be in, and it would be unfortunate to waste such potential, because after all, our interests converge. In what way? The man asked suspiciously. I want peace and you want to be immensely rich. You have the skills to help me achieve that and I have the means to make your dream a reality. Except that your goal is about to arrive and my dream is far from being fulfilled, he retorted sharply. How would you like a challenge worthy of your reputation? Sakura asked with a thin smile on her lips. Sakura understood that with this kind of person you have to use manipulation to get something out of them. She wanted to arouse his curiosity and get him to not refuse her request, even if it meant flattering his ego. You can say, he answered, intrigued by what the young woman had to offer him. Go in search of the beach and eliminate anyone who tries to capture them. Payment? Five times what you have now, Sakura offered, having already thought about it. Not enough, the ninja retorted sharply. For each beach, the rose added calmly, she could see in the man's attitude that he was calculating what he would get if he accepted. Kakuzu crossed his arms, but still stared at the rose. He was exasperated that this little wisp of a woman could know so much about him. It was as if she knew in advance that he would not be able to refuse such a proposal. It was a dangerous, even suicidal thing to do alone. But he was an intelligent and very competent person. With a good preparation as well as his network of informers he should be able to locate the beach and potentially capture some of them. And that would make him a very large sum in the end. Once found, what will I do with them? You send us a courier immediately and we'll come, but if it's a Jinchuriki, neutralize him and try to bring him back to Haiwa, alive. The man winced at this detail, he wasn't used to fighting and leaving his victims alive, but if he wanted his reward he would do as she asked. The rest of the world won't like it. Absolutely, but that's not your problem, Sakura added firmly to end the subject. Kakuzu put his new booty away before turning his back on the young woman ready to go do what he was paid to do. One last thing Kakuzu, as much as I dislike you, if you ever need a place of exile, Haiwa will welcome you without question, Sakura said before leaving the wall, leaving the nuke in his thoughts. Year 1 It had been a year since Sakura had decided to put aside her hatred and guide Uchiha Madara to fulfill his destiny. After a year at his side, Sakura was proud of what they had accomplished together. They now had a country, a people, an army, and all the resources necessary to bring peace to this world. Today was a special day, but it was like the first step in making their peace project real and concrete. 
The young woman was proud to stand beside Uchiha Madara as Daimi Hashibashita placed the traditional Kage hat on his head. Madara was given the role of Haikaichi of Ta no Kuni. The ceremony had all the official codes of such a rite, yet it was quite different from traditional inductions. For one thing, the other elemental nations had not been notified, let alone invited to the ceremony. Madara had insisted that the announcement of his return to the world was not to take place yet. Moreover, for the sake of their project, Tano Kuni still had to appear to the other elemental nations as a peaceful nation. Therefore, no one was to know that they had a much larger armed force, let alone the presence of shinobi forces. Even the people of the city did not know the intricate details of Hiwa's political and military organization, all that mattered to them was that they were safe in this country that welcomed them and offered them a peaceful life. The shinobi had been told that the existence of their haikaj had to be kept secret, for the sake of everyone. This day was just as special because it was the entire political organization of the country that was being reshuffled. Although for the rest of the world, the daimi was at the head of Ta no Kuni, in reality it was quite different. Indeed, everything Madara Uchiha had proposed had been put in place to ensure that their peace project would endure for generations to come, the triumvirate had been newly appointed as well as the sub-council. The Kage headdress itself was different from that of the other elemental nations as it was entirely white with the symbol of Ta no Kuni inscribed on it. Hashiba Shita was thus solemnly placing the Kage hat on Madara. There was no form of submission in this gesture, it was a form of tradition between two people of power. It was a form of tradition between two people of power, each one acknowledging his place and functions at the head of the country. Even if the daimi represented the administrative power and Madara Uchiha the military power, everyone knew clearly that the authority of the current haikage was somehow superior because Uchiha Madara was capable of everything. But for the future generations, the administration will need a military leader and vice versa. Once this ritual was performed, the first meeting could begin. Madara then turned to Ashina Uzumaki before placing a slightly bloody symbol of Kanoha in front of the man. I always keep my promises, he said without any further emotion in his voice. Ashina recognized the symbol immediately, it was that of Tobarama Senju. So it was with a slightly lighter heart that the Uzumaki focused on the meeting. Her daughter had been avenged. Chapter 37 Day 371 the time had come to decide what was to become of this long-running conflict. All the elemental nations were very much affected by the damage of the war. Beyond the deaths which numbered in the tens of thousands, the balance of these nations was completely destabilized. Yuzushio had been wiped off the map, Suno was under siege as was IWA, and Kumo had suffered an internal rebellion led by the Golden and Silver Brothers. Strangely, the latter had been found dead in a strange way. Of all the Kage who had participated in the conflict, only the Naidame Kazakage was still alive. All the other Naidame had finally perished in this war in which it was almost impossible to know who was the enemy of whom. Only two countries, Hai no Kuni and Mizu no Kuni could still claim to continue the conflict because they had managed to gain the upper hand over their enemy. But it would have been completely suicidal to try to attack the hidden villages, as the loss of life would have been far too great. The most logical and sensible solution was the armistice. Tobarama having clearly promoted Hiruzen Sarutobi as his successor, the new Sandame Hokage decided to propose a truce to his enemies. He had messages of peace sent to the various elemental nations. However, peace had a price and was only possible under certain conditions imposed by the Kage of the Leaf. Everything had to be done in favor of the country to repair the damage caused by the war. Kyumo had no choice but to accept this armistice since the first peace treaty signed by their late Naidame Rakage had been found. It was bloodstained, but his signature was on it. For Suna, this armistice proposal came at the right time. Indeed, the late Mizukage had imprisoned the Kazakage's family as a security measure, thus preventing any attempt at rebellion on the part of the Wind Country. On the side of IWA, the signing of the peace treaty was much more bitter as they were forced to accept it. They no longer had any allies, especially as they had not foreseen that Tobarama Senju would destroy Kumo's elite troops with Kinkaku and Ginkaku. So it was without apparent victory for either side that the First Great Shinobi War ended. Now the elemental nations were at peace and all had to rebuild. 
messages were sent to the four corners of the world so that the world would be aware of the armistice, allowing life to resume, especially economic life between the nations. This was essential as there was a severe shortage of resources and it was vital to react as quickly as possible to provide for the needs of the population before there were internal revolts or even exoduses to other more prosperous countries. The only country among them to have escaped this terrible human material disaster was Ta no Kuni. From an external point of view, Ta no Kuni was in a way rewarded for having clearly shown its intentions of neutrality by choosing to pay its neighbors and by forbidding any military access. And the country of the rice fields decided to use this explanation to justify how they had managed to maintain themselves despite the war. The truth was quite different, but for the moment Ta no Kuni had to act cautiously while keeping its objective secret, to become the largest country of the elemental nations by being the essential platform for trade between nations. The country's fame would continue to spread like a rumor, but it would have to arouse enough interest and curiosity to attract more and more people. In addition, the aim was also to offer work and, above all, a life that was guaranteed to be safe. This would inevitably allow the people who came to them to make the choice to stay. But as the various countries signed the armistice, each armed troop, or rather what was left of them, returned to their respective villages. The advantages of peace made it possible to move around without fear of being attacked at the bend in the road. And among all these shinobi returning home, Tsunade Senju was one of them. Along with her team members Orochimaru and Jiraiya, she had participated in many assaults against the enemy, though they often only had small missions without much danger. They were still young to be in the middle of a battlefield and Hiruzen Saratobi would not have forgiven the loss of his students. So they were somehow spared during the conflict. As the leaf shinobi walked through the gates of the village, relief could be read on their faces, they had finally made it home alive. Like everyone else she had made her way home with, Tsunade headed for her clan's neighborhood, the Senju estate. She hoped to be able to find her family and friends, especially since they were the last troop to return to the village. They had all been assigned to different shinobi troops and she hadn't seen them since the war started. By the time she reached her home, she was so eager to see them again that she ran down the driveway, shouting to signal her arrival. Ka Chan. Tu Chan. She arrived in front of her house, opened the door hastily and took off her sandals at the entrance. Her voice betrayed her eagerness to hug them. Ka Chan. I'm home. She shouted to indicate that she was there so that they would not fear an unwanted intrusion. However, the young teenager couldn't imagine for a second what she was about to discover next. Something suddenly caught her attention, the house was completely silent, without any presence of life inside. The furniture was in its place, nothing had changed, it was her home, but she had this strange feeling that something was wrong. Anxiety began to rise little by little in the hollow of the young blonde stomach when she realized that a thin layer of dust covered the furniture, but also the floor. From the thickness she could clearly see, it could only mean one thing, the house had been empty for a while. Ka Chan. Called the blonde again, her voice unsettled and slightly shaky. Once again, the silence echoed her own voice. Despite her growing discomfort, she decided to inspect the premises. The house was definitely empty of its legitimate inhabitants. She decided to go outside and meet other members of her clan so that they could inform her of the whereabouts of her parents. However, something else struck Sonate. As she walked through the streets of the estate, the young girl noticed that there was also silence throughout the estate. Only the sound of the wind or the rare birds that flew by gave a little life to the place. It was clear that the Senju quarters were terribly empty. The streets were deserted, the houses closed and empty of their inhabitants. No matter how hard she looked, not a single living soul was present. She didn't see her cousins or her friends. Anyone from her immediate or distant family, there was no one. No one. It was at that precise moment that she realized that all around her was silence and the absence of life. The young girl understood this terrible truth, the war had probably taken much more than she had imagined. Her entire clan. Another reality dawned on her, man's selfishness and vanity had just made her the last senju in the world. She would never see any of her people again, and this sad realization shook the young teenager to the core, and she couldn't help but be overwhelmed with grief. Ka-chan, Tsunade cried softly. 
she fell to her knees in the middle of the street, hugging herself. Tears quickly welled up in her eyes and she let the sobs run through her without her being able to hold back, and more importantly, without anyone being able to do anything about it. She was totally distraught and devastated to realize the obvious fact that she was now the last and only heir of the Senju clan. Wouldn't it have been better if she too had fallen on the field of honor like all those in her family? At least she wouldn't have had to experience the unbearable pain that gripped her heart and guts. Tsunade was in such a state of legitimate prostration at this news that she did not feel a figure approaching. She just felt a pair of arms come around her and hold her tight. At first glance, his arms could not have belonged to an older man, they must have belonged to a teenager like her. The young teenager's head was pressed against the man's chest and as she opened her tear-filled eyes, Tsunade saw a white hair. I'm here Tsunade, Jiraiya whispered in a voice the blonde had never heard from her partner. There was no trace of humor or flirtation, only sincerity. She actually felt less lonely in that moment as she let herself go for the first time into the arms of this boy she thought was just a heartless fool. She and Jiraiya used to bicker all the time, no matter what the subject. But today everything seemed different, there was no trace of teasing or even childishness. It was as if the discovery of the Senju clan's disappearance had changed them from the carelessness of childhood to the responsibility of being adults. She clutched at his clothes and let the grief out in many loud sobs. Jiraiya remained kneeling without flinching, without saying anything. Just giving her the silent comfort of that embrace. He was just present and shared her pain. Why? Was the first question Tsunade finally asked as her sobs subsided. I don't know, Haim. Why this damn war? The blonde cried in grief and Jiraiya only tightened his arms around her. He wanted so badly to be able to take this grief away from her, to numb the heartbreak she was experiencing at this awful realization. His heart ached to hear the pain of the girl he loved. In a way, he understood her pain, but he could not entirely put himself in her shoes. For even though he was an orphan who had never known his parents, he had never known what she was experiencing now, the loss of loved ones. Because adults are stupid, the boy whispered, gently stroking the blonde's hair. If I'd been stronger. She suggested, so intense was the despair. It's not your fault Haim. It's not your fault, Jiraiya interrupted, recognizing the first signs of the unnecessary guilt she was about to inflict on herself. You're a wonderful and very talented girl Haim. You've already done your best in this war. There was nothing more you could have done. You couldn't have known Haim. No one could have predicted this. And. He said as he searched for the right words to comfort her before being interrupted. If I had been like her. This wouldn't have happened, Tsunade added. The last of the Senju had had some sort of epiphany as she cried against Jiraiya, one person had popped into her mind, that famous pink-haired woman. Why had the image of this woman appeared to her? No one could explain it, but Tsunade understood that this woman who had eradicated their enemy with the help of her companion embodied everything she herself wanted to be powerful. The girl was convinced that if she had had the same skills, she could have saved members of her clan but also those of her village. If she had been much stronger, she could surely have allowed the course of the war to be completely different. What's stopping you from being strong? The teenager asked gently. What do you mean? Tsunade questioned, pulling away from her comrade's embrace to look him in the eye. He didn't answer right away, he simply stared at the girl with a look so tender and understanding that Tsunade was turned around, so much so that her heart missed a beat. The teenager slowly and gently placed his thumbs on the girl's cheeks to wipe away the remaining tears. This woman saw a bright future in you, she said it herself, what you are trying to do is admirable. I don't doubt for a moment that you will be perfectly capable. You already have that strength within you Haim, you succeed in everything you do, Jiraiya reassured her with a very thin smile. His voice was unusually calm, he was so casual at this moment that Tsunade wondered if she had misjudged her comrade in all the years they had been teammates. I'm scared Jiraiya, the blonde admitted after a moment. I know you will succeed Tsunade and I will help you become as strong as this woman, Jiraiya comforted with that unwavering certainty in his voice. What's the point of going on without anyone, the blonde sighed as she lowered her eyes, feeling sorrow again at the thought that she would do all of this without any of her family members being able to see what she would accomplish. 
Tsunade look at me, the teenager demanded softly as he saw the pain the girl was feeling. The girl looked up before looking back into the boy's eyes as he held her in his arms before he continued. You're not alone, you have us, your team, we're here for you. I'm here for you Tsunade. I can be your family. He announced sincerely. Tsunade knew he wasn't lying to her, that he wasn't just saying this to comfort her and ease her current grief. He was promising her in hushed tones that he would always be there for her because she was already everything to him. Day 390 The war had been over for a month now, the countries were licking their wounds and it was time to take stock, to ask questions and to make assumptions. And that was what was being discussed that evening in one of the districts of Kanoha where an assembly was being held in a place dedicated to important meetings concerning the affairs of the village and especially the clan. Gentlemen, if I have gathered you all here tonight, it is because we must address certain points that I have deemed essential to discuss together. As clan leader, I could not ignore the arguments presented to me by one of our own yesterday. The last Uchiha clan leader who had been appointed after Madara's death looked at the assembly before him. There were still many of them present despite the war. This was due to their Sharingan which had allowed them to suffer the least amount of casualties possible, which had not been the case with the Senju who had paid the highest price during the conflict. The brown-haired man looked around at all the heads of the families that made up his clan, their faces were closed and hard. This kind of meeting was never a good omen and the tension was palpable in the room, each one looking at his neighbors out of the corner of his eye. I needn't remind you that everything that is said tonight is punishable by death if you reveal to anyone what is going to be discussed. Added the leader in a tone that left no doubt about the importance of the subjects to be discussed later. This reminder of the rules made many people wince, as they did not like being reminded of their obligations to the clan. Why is Kagami with us then? Spat one of them, glaring at the man who remained neutral at the mention of his name. Yes. Why is he here? It's common knowledge that Kagami always puts the interests of the village before those of the clan. Another Uchiha added to echo the first one who had made this remark. The tension was at its highest in the ranks of the Uchiha who were beginning to heat up even though nothing had been said yet. The clan leader knew that this meeting would be complicated and he couldn't drag it out if he wanted everyone to understand the importance of what was going to be revealed. For it was he who asked to convene the council tonight, the man replied before inviting Kagami to stand up as he himself sat down on the floor. The young Uchiha who had been one of the Naidame Hokage's personal students stood up before looking around the assembly. While some clearly had an accusatory look towards him, others were watching him with curiosity while the majority kept their gaze neutral waiting to make up their own minds by listening to what he had to say. It's true, I don't deny the accusations made against me. As you all know, I am a ninja who has always put the village before his family, and I don't hide it. But the last events we have just gone through as well as the elements I have noticed during this conflict have made me think differently. I have come to ask myself this first question, is Kanoha really capable of guaranteeing our safety? And by safety, I mean our individual safety as well as the safety of the entire clan. All of them, without exception, were looking at the young Kagami attentively as he had just stated his thoughts. The question was far from trivial, and it was very pertinent from the start, for they all knew how the Leaf Village had treated their members since the beginning of time. Despite the period of peace established at the time of the village's creation, the Uchiha had never really been integrated as a clan within the village. To change this, they had turned their backs on their former leader, the all-powerful Uchiha Madara. But despite this, when he attacked the village anyway, the clan was singled out. And it was known that the Naidame Hokage did not hold them in his heart, indeed he did not trust them at all. What do you mean? Asked Izumi Uchiha, one of Madara's former lieutenants. How come no one asked about the sudden disappearance of Mito Uzumaki? She lived in the very heart of the village and yet overnight no one hears from her or cares about her. The same goes for Yuzushio, how is it possible that this village was completely razed to the ground or rather, how could Kanoha have arrived too late to avoid this disaster? I know, some will tell me that I was wrong to adhere to the ideology of my late master Tobarama Senju, and that is still true. However, what I can't help but notice is that he failed to keep his commitments, not only to his ally but also to the protection he was supposed to give to a clan heiress such as Mido. As he spoke, the members of the assembly began to think more intensely about the points he was making. 
Some of the Uchiha crossed their arms and scowled more and more as their internal thoughts were in turmoil. What are you trying to prove here? Asked one of the older Uchiha in the assembly after a moment. Who's to say that Kanoha won't do the same thing to the Uchiha clan? The more time passes, the more I think that maybe Uchiha Madara was right and that we should have followed him. Who are you? A man suddenly asked after standing up and staring at Kagami in amazement. What do you mean? said the young man, who didn't understand his counterpart's question. The Kagami I know could never have made that kind of speech, let alone adhere to Madara's vision that we should take up arms against this village he built, the man said, causing several members of the assembly to shake their heads. How can you turn your back on us all of a sudden? I did not turn my coat as you seem to want to believe. I'm still the same person and without wishing to offend you, I'm not like most of you, navel-gazing and feeling superior to the other clans in the village. No, I'm someone who can see things that most people can't, he said, raising his voice. I have always been careful to analyze situations, contexts, issues and risks. That's what makes me think more broadly. More broadly than my family and even more broadly than the village itself. And although I am a shinobi, I hate war. Yes, I hate fighting, especially when the cause stops no further than personal interests. And as some say, yes I protect my village, putting it before my family. But still. Still I love my parents, my sister, and every member of my clan. And it is also for them. To preserve them that I am willing to overlook many things. Like putting my family before the village. And it is by considering all these points that I hope to preserve those I love and eventually one day bring lasting peace. Let's face it, conceded the Uchiha who had asked him the last few questions, what elements have you gathered to make you change so much? So before I answer that question, I would like to ask you another one, who among us would be able to compete with Uchiha Madara? Everyone was surprised by the question, but looking at Kagami's attitude it was a real question that caused many whispers in the assembly. All knew the power of their former leader and all had this evidence on the tip of their tongues. No one, finally said the clan leader who had not reacted since the young man began to speak. This statement silenced the murmurs and silence suddenly fell on the room, like an icy shower. So who in the world would be able to oppose him? Kagami continued, taking advantage of the surrounding silence. Hashirama, a man in the room said sharply. Yes, but Hashirama Senju is dead. And you will agree with me that apart from him, no one we know of is capable of competing with him. So now I'd like to ask you one last question, if we were to face Uchiha Madara all together, do you think we would have any chance of winning? What are you getting at, Kagami? Izumi asked completely confused by the young man's unanswered questions. The other members of the assembly were in the same state and doubtful looks were exchanged from both sides of the room. What am I getting at? During the war I had a lot of time to observe, think and analyze what was around me, what people were saying. The first point is that there were many guerrilla wars not only on our territory but also in other countries. Secondly, all these guerrilla wars seem to be provoked by a duo that nobody ever managed to identify, let alone apprehend. Thirdly, the techniques employed by one of them quickly enabled me to eliminate many candidates who could be these two people wanted by all. It didn't take long for the clan members to begin to formulate in their minds what this young Uchiha was telling them. Are you implying that? I'm not implying it, I'm saying it. Interrupted Kagami who had everyone's attention on his lips. You're not thinking about it, it's impossible. One of them objected, even though Kagami had given no specific indication that the unthinkable was possible. If it is so unlikely, then answer me. Who in all the elemental nations is capable of doing a ninjutsu katan on the scale of a large village? Who is capable of holding an army at bay by himself? Who is able to annihilate a city with a single technique? Just one person is able to do all of the above. Madara is dead. One of the members shouted. But as far as I know, no one has ever found our leader's body, so how do we know that Uchiha Madara isn't out there doing what he's always fought for? Kagami paused in what he had just said, for it was like having a sword of Damocles hanging over his head. The reason I called for this special clan meeting is because I wish to protect not only my village, but also my family and my entire clan. 
For if Madara is behind the destruction of Yuzushio and with a single technique he is capable of this feat, what is to stop him from doing the same to Kanoha? The silence was such that one could hear everyone's breathing. Minds were focused and searching for answers to everything the young Uchiha had brought up. What are you proposing, Kagami? If Madara is indeed alive, why hasn't he contacted the clan again? Why hide? Maybe so we can find out for ourselves. The meeting went on for almost an hour before it ended, leaving each of the members prey to numerous questions that had few answers. For if indeed their former leader was alive, it was a safe bet that Uchiha or not, all those who had dared to defy him by refusing to follow him would have to pay the consequences. And many of them feared the terrible wrath of Uchiha Madara who was not known for forgiving easily. Chapter 38 Day 430 It could have been just another day as the sun began to rise, but today was going to be a unique day for two people and especially for Sakura Haruno. Indeed, this was the last morning that Sakura would wake up as a girl with the name Haruno, for in the middle of the day her womanhood would change. Like many others before her, she was going to experience what many women cherished and dreamed of having, marriage. She was going to go from being a girl to a woman, but Sakura knew that she was one of the few who could say that it was not a marriage of reason or politics. However, like many brides before her, Sakura was filled with questions. Early in the morning she had gotten up and headed to the Haiwa Wall, her favorite place for meditation and as usual she was sitting on the wall watching the city slowly waking up under the sun. But today, meditation was not the order of the day as she knew she didn't have the mind to do it. Sakura was no exception to the common rule of all girls in her situation, she was filled with doubts and questions as she was about to commit the rest of her life to this man. Was this the right thing to do? Would she be happy with him? Did she really want to get married? The questions were the most legitimate ones and even more so for the young cherry blossom who was thinking intensely to find the answers to the questions that were filling her head. She loved Achiha Madara, she had been sure of it for a few months now. She was happy to experience what she shared with this unique man, but she couldn't help but wonder if he loved her as much as she did. Madara, like the vast majority of men in the Sengoku era, did not express their attachment and love verbally. Therefore, he had never pronounced to her this simple phrase, but so desired by young women and especially considered as the ultimate proof of a man's feelings, I love you. Yet deep down she knew that he loved her. It remained to be seen how he himself defined love, but once again Sakura was left without an answer and she couldn't see herself saying that with this man. Although he had proven to her time and time again that he could be open to any kind of discussion. The cherry blossom had once again made the personal observation that she was alone and that no one was there to guide her, to comfort her or even to tell her that everything would be alright. She wanted so much to have her mother with her on this unique day. To see her cry with joy because her dear daughter was getting married, to see her best friend Eno teasing her because she had finally found a man for her, to see her master encouraging her and probably threatening her future husband. This thought drew a small laugh from her as she imagined Tsunade Senju threatening Achiha Madara. Shouldn't you be preparing for the ceremony instead of being here? Ashina Uzumaki's voice said. Sakura gasped at the old man's voice, she hadn't expected to find someone around here so early. Heyo, Ashina-san. I'm sorry I startled you, Ashina said before sitting down beside Sakura at the edge of the wall. What are you thinking about? Everything and nothing Ashina-san. Do you want to talk about it? Ashina asked, suspecting what the young woman was going through. He remembered only too well the state his daughter Mito had been in when the day of her wedding to Hashirama Senju came. This memory gripped his heart but he did not let it show. He had a lot of respect for this young woman who was about to live an important stage in her life and he didn't want to spoil this moment with his own memories. Female fears Ashina-san, I wouldn't want to bore you with that, the rose said with a gentle smile. I think I'd be in the same state as you if I knew I had to marry Madara. Though I'd rather not even imagine. The man added, wincing at having dared to say such a thing. But this remark relaxed Sakura and she couldn't help but let a laugh escape her mouth. It would obviously be something really incongruous to see you two married, Sakura teased happily. Stop it, I'll have nightmares. The old Uzumaki retorted with a half-amused, half-disgusted look on his face. 
Sakura had come to appreciate this man as different from all those pompous clan leaders and politicians. Ashina was a simple, friendly and funny person. He reminded her a lot of Naruto. She thanked him inwardly for diverting her anxieties with this surreal moment before adding a little more seriously. I wonder how Madara is doing. She was worried about her future husband because they hadn't seen each other since the day before. Tradition dictated that Sakura had no choice but to sleep in separate rooms the night before, so she hadn't run into her beloved at daybreak. Probably worse than you, Ashina replied, looking at the horizon. Are you sure? The Rose worried at this frank statement. She could hardly imagine the great Madara Uchiha being as distressed as she was and especially asking the same type of questions. I still remember how I was before I married my late wife, I didn't know where to turn and I was just running around in circles, the man confessed with a touch of nostalgia in his voice. So, to keep my mind occupied, I did what I was good at, I went to train. The young woman smiled at the memory the Uzumaki was willing to share with her. She appreciated even more this man and the confidence he had in her to share such personal confidences. I must admit, I'm not sure what to make of this day Ashina-san, Sakura conceded, looking down at her hands in apprehension. The woman reminded his so much of his own daughter, but even though the situation was quite different, the patriarch was acting towards her as he would have done with Mito if the circumstances were similar to today. Sakura-san. He began in that paternalistic tone Sakura had never heard before. Hi. The only thing I can tell you is that you have this chance to have a love marriage and not a political one, so don't worry about it. It is so rare these days to see this kind of union. As he said this, Ashina Uzumaki had this bitter regret that he had married his only daughter to that Senju. He wished he could go back in time and prevent this union. Arigato Ashina-san. The old man nodded silently and they both let a few more minutes pass, enjoying the sunrise over the city. You should go home, the maids are probably looking for you to get ready, Ashina added before standing up. What are you going to do? The rose asked out of curiosity. Me? I'm going to go kick that dumb beetle Madaris asked to keep his mind occupied. See you later Sakura-san, Ashina said before disappearing into a shunshin no jutsu. Sakura stayed on the wall for a few more minutes, inwardly thanking the man who had eased her heart a bit with his presence, advice and humor. It was then more confident that Sakura jumped from roof to roof in the direction of the Daimi's house where Amaya, Hana and Hitomi were probably waiting for her. No sooner had she arrived in the corridors of the estate than she heard Amaya's voice exclaiming. Sakura-sama. Where the hell have you been? We've been looking for you everywhere. Goman Amaya-san, I needed some fresh air, she added with a sorry look on her face for having worried her friends. This is an important day for you and we have a lot of work to do, let's not dawdle. The brunette said seriously before grabbing the rose's wrist and dragging her down the corridors. Sakura had no choice but to comply with the actions of these women who suddenly seemed to have a specific mission, to sublimate her for the wedding ceremony. The atmosphere was peculiar and unlike anything she had ever experienced with these women, who now had one more woman among them, Hitomi. No sooner had she entered the room intended for her preparation than Sakura found herself surrounded by Amaya, Hana and Hitomi who surrounded her so as to help her undress. So Sakura-sama, not too nervous. Hana asked as she helped remove the rose's clothes. Out of the corner of her eye Sakura could see the outfit she would have to wear. It was very traditional, but it was made to beautify the wearer no matter what her build. It was custom made and at first glance Sakura thought it looked pretty good. It was a pure white kimono with long sleeves that allowed her to hide her finjutsu seals. It was accompanied by an over kimono which normally would have been red, but it had been decided that it would be pale pink to evoke Sakura's hair. The whole thing was studded with gold thread embroidery. These details were a sign of the importance of the rank to which she would be placed. It couldn't have been any other way since she was going to be the future matriarch of one of the greatest clans in the world. A little, Sakura whispered shyly as she stood fully naked before the three women. Here's Sakura-sama, your underwear, Amaya presented as she held out some very finely crafted lingerie. It was nothing like regular underwear and as Sakura saw the pieces of fabric she couldn't help but blush. They were clearly meant to arouse desire in a man. Uchiha-sama won't be able to resist you, 
Hitomi teased, wearing a lovely dress that had been made for her as a surrogate mother for the occasion. Hitomi! Sakura exclaimed, embarrassed that anyone would approach the subject so casually. She's right, Sakura-sama, the younger girl said in turn. Hannah! They're teasing you, madam, Amaya reassured with a soft smile on her lips. It was obvious that Sakura was still struggling to feel comfortable with such matters and she couldn't think of anything better to say than to pout before pulling on the underwear presented in front of her. Did you talk to him about it Sakura? Hitomi asked as she saw the bride-to-be's belly starting to round out slightly. I plan to tell him tonight. As a wedding present, the cherry blossom announced calmly. I don't think he could have asked for a better gift, an offspring, remarked Amaya, who had grabbed the white kimono with Hannah. I can't wait to see his little face, said Hannah, who had been jumping up and down after Sakura had told her she was pregnant. And so am I, Sakura nodded, running her hand over her belly with a soft smile on her lips. She was so looking forward to holding her child, a part of her soul and her future husband. Raise your arms, madam, Amaya asked, so that she could tie the kimono around the mother-to-be. It took two minutes to adjust the outfit so that Sakura was as comfortable as possible before putting on the pink over kimono. You're so beautiful Sakura, Hitomi said as she watched the young woman like a mother would watch her child. Arigato. Please sit down, Amaya asked before addressing the younger woman, Hannah I'll leave you to do the makeup. Right away, Amaya-chan, the blonde girl enthused before asking some questions. Do you think we should do something traditional? Amaya looked carefully at Sakura's face and the colors of the outfit she was wearing. She thought for a moment before deciding. Hmm, I think we'll change. How? Not white, Sakura doesn't have dark eyes like many women in Tano Kuni, so it would be a shame to contrast her skin with her eyes. So I accentuate her eyes? The young maid asked. Yes, try an orange peel to brighten her skin evenly, Amaya said as she pulled Sakura's face free of all her hair so she could see the whole of her face. Sakura was completely in unfamiliar territory and had no idea what the two women were talking about. She had never worn makeup in her life and the only time she had makeup on was because of a henjin or because of these two maids. But she wasn't worried because she knew they would do something extraordinary for her. What do you recommend for the eyes, Amaya-chan? Pink. Pale. Yes, that'll do just fine, Amaya analyzed, as this seemed to be her first time with makeup. And for almost an hour, Sakura gave herself over completely to these women and as time went by, she felt much more confident. Indeed, she was being made up, styled, and pampered in a way that she had never been pampered before. In addition, these three wonderful women had the right words, the right little touches to comfort and encourage her. She was surrounded by Hitomi who she could practically consider a mother, she had Hannah who was the equivalent of a friend and she had Amaya who was close to a big sister. Thinking about this made Sakura want to cry with sadness and happiness at the same time. In fact her eyes began to moisten and glisten. No tears. Hannah suddenly exclaimed, she had almost finished her makeup. You'll have the luxury of crying tomorrow, child, Hitomi added, taking Sakura's hand in hers. I know. But. It's just that I'm lucky to have you three. It was hard for Sakura, because as she looked at herself in the mirror she wished so badly that there were other faces in the place of these three women. But she couldn't let herself grieve over this lost future. She had to concentrate on the happiness she felt at the moment. She was happy to have them with her on this special day. We're lucky to have you too, Sakura, Hitomi comforted with a gentle smile. Now pull yourself together. The forty-year-old ordered, knowing full well the torment the young woman was going through. You can't appear before your future husband with tears in your eyes. Hi. So it was a smiling but stressed Sakura who got up and headed for the ceremony that would make her a woman, a wife and a matriarch. This kind of ceremony was usually private and was reserved for close friends and family. In a way this suited Madara's wishes, as he did not wish to reveal his comeback to the world just yet. As a result, there were only about ten people who had been invited since neither Sakura nor Madara had any family present at the event. Hitomi grabbed Sakura's arm and comforted her with a wide smile before walking beside her to the altar ere the daimi was already in his official clothes talking with Madara. 
He was dressed in a traditional Sengoku era outfit, hakana, a sort of long skirt and breeches in the dark greys accompanied by a black jacket with his coat of arms clearly displayed, Achiha. The few guests bowed as they saw the bride approaching the altar. The atmosphere was completely different from what Sakura had experienced in her future. There was no music, no laughter, no shouting. Instead, it was a quieter, more heartfelt wedding. Much more intimate as only those who deserved to be there were present. Sakura felt her heart race as she approached the man who was to become her husband. He had turned around and was looking at her in such a way that it threw her off balance, she blushed with embarrassment. In fact, she had the impression that he was undressing her with his eyes. She had never thought that one day she would meet a man who could look at her so lovingly. Her heart was beating so hard in her chest at that moment that she knew she was not making a mistake, she really loved this man and was ready to seal her fate with his. For his part, Madara, who may have had a few questions about this engagement, had none left. The fact that he'd had a friendly fight with Ashina in the morning had already helped him not to worry unnecessarily. But seeing Sakura so beautifully dressed coming towards him, her eyes shining with emotion, convinced the Uchiha that he wasn't making a mistake. It was time for him to take this step in his life and he was doing it of his own volition, not to meet the demands of the clan. Hitomi introduced Sakura to the dark-haired man before stepping aside for the ceremony to begin. Madara then gently took hold of his fiancé's hand. He slowly and gently stroked her hand with his thumb. Somehow he wanted her to know that he was ready to become her husband and that he wanted her by his side. He then turned to the daimi who was to officiate as master of ceremonies. It was a great honor to be united by a person of his status. Rarely did a daimi celebrate this kind of ceremony and when it did it was for members of the very highest nobility. No one to witness your union Achihadano? Hashiba asked, looking at the bride and groom. No, Madara answered softly, but with a slightly closed look. You need someone to represent you, added the daimi, who was annoyed by this breach of protocol. I unfortunately have no one, Madara added. There was silence for a few seconds before movement occurred and Madara saw someone standing to his right. He turned his head in the person's direction and recognized Ashina Uzumaki. I will testify for him, the old man said to the daimi. The Uchiha did not say a word, but he did nod his thanks to the old man for agreeing to take on this role. The wedding ceremony could then begin, and it took place according to several rites during which the couple had to purify themselves and promise each other in various ways fidelity and love for the rest of their lives. At that time, the bride did not choose the rings to be exchanged, as the groom was responsible for providing them. She was then presented with a beautiful gold ring which she placed on Madara's left ring finger and he smiled fondly. When it was her turn to hold out her left hand, Sakura was overwhelmed by the beauty of the ring that Madara was slowly sliding down her finger. The jewel was splendid, very delicate and above all the symbol of the Uchiha clan was represented by a subtle assembly of precious stones on the gold ring. After nearly half an hour of ritual, Hashiba Shita pronounced the sentence that concluded this ceremony. You are now husband and wife. Then Madara bowed to Sakura and placed his lips gently on her lips in a gentle kiss. She was now Sakura Uchiha. Day 431. It had been a very trying day, and very emotional. But they were officially married, Sakura was now an Uchiha. True, she hadn't married the man she'd always thought would be his wife, but strangely enough, the thought hadn't crossed her mind. As much as she might miss her family and friends from time to time, and especially on this day of intense joy, she hadn't thought about Sasuke Uchiha since she had realized her feelings for Madara. Even though she knew that Sasuke had been a part of her life and that she had loved him in some way, Sakura had all but forgotten about Sasuke. After all, Madara had introduced her to love in all its definitions. She discovered what it felt like to be loved and inevitably, the love she felt for the Uchiha was nothing like what she thought she felt in the past. This was a whole new level and she could tell today, as she had taken her vows only hours earlier, that it was Madara she saw her life with. She wanted to walk by his side, she had chosen him for what he totally was, with his bright sides as well as his shadows. The couple went to their flats to celebrate their wedding in private as it was past midnight. Madara was silent and took advantage of the newfound calm to sort out his own emotions. He could never have imagined that he would ever find love, 
and he couldn't help but think of his beloved mother's words, when you find it, you'll understand. So yes, he knew he had made the right choice in Sakura. She was everything he'd been looking for without ever having to find it before. And while the ceremony was necessary for Sakura to be officially recognized as his wife, Madara had considered her as such for much longer. But protocol demanded it, and even though he was Madara Uchiha, he couldn't change common ways of thinking with a snap of his fingers. As he closed the door to their rooms behind them, the dark-haired man couldn't help but breathe loudly, dot. Finally this day ends, I have nothing against protocol stories, but it bores me rather quickly, he confided, looking at the young woman who became his wife. Is this how the day ends Madara? Don't you want to celebrate your wedding with your wife? The rose asked mischievously. The brunette raised an eyebrow at the young woman's proposal, oh yes he loved her. Sakura was the perfect woman for him, she was talented in many ways and over time she had proven to be a particularly delightful lover. A toothy grin stretched across the man's face as he approached his wife like a feline on its prey. What do you have to offer me Sakura? Madara asked as he grabbed her waist with one hand and lifted her chin with the other to gently place his lips on hers. The kiss quickly ignited between the two and as they struggled to separate and catch their breath, Sakura laughed lightly. Lucky for you we've had plenty of practice in the past to make this day end on the best of terms. The man laughed back at the remark before they both let go of the passion that consumed them each time they embraced. Once they were content and fulfilled with each other, Sakura had snuggled up against her husband's bare chest while he held her tightly against him. They were happy and fulfilled but Sakura felt she had to tell him the truth about her condition. After thinking about it, she realized that there was no better time to do it. Madara? Hmm. I have to tell you something, she said, slowly caressing the contours of the brunette's muscles. What do you have to say to me Sakura at this late hour of the day? He suddenly asked, more worried than he wanted to show. After all, when Sakura started her sentences this way it was to talk about something important. I didn't give you a wedding present, Sakura stated in a calm yet serious voice. A gift? The dark-haired man was surprised and didn't understand what she was getting at. He was even rather puzzled by this custom she seemed to be referring to. It's been a few weeks since I've had to tell you, but we've been busy between the end of the war, the expansion of the city and the preparation of our wedding. And we haven't really had time to discuss what we're going to do next. Do you really want us to talk about what happens next? The dark-haired man asked again. In a way, yes, I would like us to talk about what we're going to do, since in a few months we won't be two, but three, she announced, not really knowing how to broach the subject of her pregnancy. The two of them were now in a sitting position and the man looked at her perplexed, he was frankly wondering if his wife had not abused the sake during the banquet in honor of their marriage. Yet he was sure that he had not seen her drink any alcohol all evening. He was even wondering if he was the one who was drunk or perhaps asleep and that this surreal conversation was just a trick of his mind. 3. He repeated anyway as Sakura gently grabbed his hands and placed them palm down on his lower abdomen. Yes. The three of us Madara. She hadn't taken her eyes off Madara as she made her moves to observe his reaction. Madara had let the young woman take his hands and place them on her naked body and as his brain processed the phrase, the three of us, Madara, he immediately understood what she was trying to get him to admit. His heart began to beat wildly, was this possible? Of course it was, he thought inwardly, she and he had been intimate for weeks but they had never discussed children. Meeting Sakura and learning to love her, the idea of perpetuating his offspring had obviously crossed his mind but they were in the middle of a world war. They were not yet married and above all they had never spoken of it. Through his contact with the young woman, he had understood that she was not like all the women of his time and that she was certainly not willing to give birth at all costs to meet the demands that society imposed on the female condition. Madara was prepared to wait until she decided on her own to bear his children. But with what she was just telling him, it completely overturned everything he had imagined, but it made him even happier. He couldn't stop the smile from stretching across his face, and when Sakura saw him smile, she immediately felt relieved. Are you sure about this Sakura? Yes, I am carrying our child and it goes back to the destruction of Yuzushio. Why didn't you tell me then? I would never have let you come into battle with me if. But I didn't know that at the time. 
I thought my body was not ready to conceive a life. I didn't know that until we got back, Sakura interrupted to put things in perspective. The man looked at the young woman and his brain was racing. You knew before I left for Kumo, didn't you? Yes, I didn't want to burden your mind with it. I knew there were things you had to do and you wouldn't have been focused enough if I had told you the truth then. H.N. Was all he said at the mention of this truth. Sakura knew him well and he only liked her more. Are you angry with me for hiding this from you? The young woman asked anyway, worried that her husband would blame her for this little secret. In response, Madara, who had taken his hands from his wife's belly, brought his face close to hers and kissed her passionately. You make me the happiest of men Sakura and it doesn't matter if this child is a girl or a boy, you are the woman I want to sire my offspring.